Chapter One of the Deer Slayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Smith. The Deer Slayer by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter One. The pleasure in the pathless woods. There's a rapture on the lonely shore. There's society where none intrudes. By the deep sea and music in its roar. I love not man the less, but nature more. For these are interviews in which I steal. From all I may be, or have been before. To mingle with the universe and feel. What I can never express, yet cannot all conceal. Child Herald on the human imagination events produce the effects of time thus he who has travelled far and has seen much is apt to fancy that he has lived long and the history that most abounds in important incidents soonest assumes the aspect of antiquity in no other way can we account for the venerable air that is already gathering around american annals when the mind reverts to the earliest days of colonial history the period seems remote and obscure the thousand changes that thicken along the links of recollections, throwing back the origin of the nation to a day so distant as seemingly to reach the mists of time, and yet four lives of ordinary duration would suffice to transmit, from mouth to mouth in the form of tradition, all that civilized man has achieved within the limits of the Republic. Although New York alone possesses a population materially exceeding that of either the four smallest kingdoms of Europe, or materially exceeding that of the entire Swiss Confederation, it is little more than two centuries since the Dutch commenced their settlement, rescuing the region from the savage state. Thus what seems venerable by accumulation of changes is reduced to familiarity when we come seriously to consider it solely in connection with time. This glance into the perspective of the past will prepare the reader to look at the pictures we are about to sketch with less surprise than he might otherwise feel, and a few additional explanations may carry him back in imagination to the precise condition of society that we desire to delineate. It is a matter of history that the settlements on the eastern shores of the Hudson, such as the Claverack, Kinderhook, and even Poughkeepsie, were not regarded as safe from Indian incursions a century since, and there is still standing on the banks of the same river and within musket shot of the wars of Albany, a residence of a younger branch of the Van Rensselaers that has loopholes constructed for defense against the same crafty enemy, although it dates from a period scarcely so distant. Other similar memorials of the infancy of the country are to be found, scattered through what is now deemed the very center of American civilization, affording the plainest proofs that all we possess of security from invasion and hostile violence is the growth of but little more than the time that it is frequently fulfilled by a single human life. The incidents of this tale occurred between the years 1740 and 1745, when the settled portions of the colony of New York were confined to the four Atlantic counties, a narrow belt of country on each side of the Hudson, extending from its mouth to the falls near its head, and to a few advanced neighborhoods on the Mohawk and the Schoharie. Broad belts of the virgin wilderness not only reached the shores of the first river, but they even crossed it, stretching away into New England, and affording forced covers to the noiseless moccasin of the native warrior as he trod the secret and bloody warpath. A bird's-eye view of the whole region east of the Mississippi must then have offered one vast expanse of woods, relieved by a comparatively narrow fringe of cultivation along the sea, dotted by the glittering surfaces of lakes, and intersected by the waving lines of river. In such a vast picture of solemn solitude, the district of country we design to paint sinks into insignificance, though we feel encouraged to proceed by the conviction that, with slight and immaterial distinctions, he who succeeds in giving an accurate idea of any portion of this wild region must necessarily convey a tolerably correct notion of the whole. Whatever may be the changes produced by man, the eternal round of the seasons is unbroken. Summer and winter, seed time and harvest, return in their stated order with sublime precision, affording to man one of the noblest of all the occasions he enjoys of proving the high powers of his far-reaching mind, 
encompassing the laws that control their exact uniformity, and in calculating their never-ending revolutions. Centuries of summer suns had warmed the tops of the same noble oaks and pines, sending their heats even to the tenacious roots. When voices were heard calling to each other in the depths of a forest of which the leafy surface lay bathed in the brilliant light of a cloudless day in June, while the trunks of the trees rose in a gloomy grandeur in the shades beneath. The calls were in different tones, evidently proceeding from two men who had lost their way and were searching in different directions for their path. At length a shout proclaimed success, and presently a man of gigantic mold broke out of the tangled labyrinth of a small swamp. Emerging into an opening that appeared to have been formed partly by the ravages of the wind and partly by those of fire, this little area which afforded a good view of the sky, although it was pretty well filled with dead trees, lay on the side of one of the high hills or low mountains into which nearly the whole surface of the adjacent country was broken. "'Here is room to breathe in,' exclaimed the liberated forester, as soon as he found himself under a clear sky shaking his huge frame like a massive that has just escaped from a snowbank. Hurrah! Deerslayer! Here is daylight, at last, and yonder is the lake. These words were scarcely uttered when the second forester dashed aside the bushes of the swamp and appeared in the area. After making a hurried adjustment of his arms and disordered dress, he joined his companion who had already begun his disposition for a halt. Do you know this spot? demanded the one called Deerslayer, or do you shout at the sight of the sun? Both, lad, both. I know the spot, and I'm not sorry to see so useful a friend as the sun. Now we have got the points of the compass in our minds once more, and it will be our own fault if we let anything turn them topsy-turvy again, as just happened. My name is not Hurry Harry, if this be not the very spot where the land hunters camped the last summer and passed a week. See, I yonder are the dead bushes of their bower, and here is the spring. Much as I like the sun, boy, I have no occasion for it to tell me it is noon. The stomach of mine is as good a timepiece as to be found in the colony, and it already points to half-past twelve. So open the wallet, and let us wind up for another six hours' run. At this suggestion, both set themselves about making the preparations necessary for their usual frugal but hearty meal. We will profit by this pause in the discourse to give the reader some idea of the appearance of the men, each of whom is destined to enact no insignificant part in our legend. It would not have been easy to find a more noble specimen of a vigorous manhood than was offered in the person of him who called himself Hurry Harry. His real name was Henry March, but the frontiersmen having caught the practice of giving sobriquets from the Indians, the appellation of Hurry was far oftener applied to him than his proper designation, and not unfrequently he was termed Hurry Scurry, a nickname he had obtained from a dashing, reckless, off-handed manner and a physical restlessness that kept him so constantly on the move as to cause him to be known along the whole line of scattered habitations that lay between the province and the Canadas. The stature of Hurry Harry exceeded six feet four, and being unusually well proportioned, his strength fully realized the idea created by his gigantic frame. The face did no discredit to the rest of the man, for it was both good-humored and handsome. His air was free, and though his manners necessarily partook of the rudeness of a border life, the grandeur that pervaded so noble a physique prevented it from becoming altogether vulgar. Deerslayer, as Hurry called his companion, was a very different person in appearance, as well as in character. In stature he stood about six feet in his moccasins, but his frame was comparatively light and slender, showing muscles, however that promised unusual agility, if not unusual strength. His face would have had little to recommend it except youth were it not for an expression that seldom failed to win upon those who had leisure to examine it, and to yield to the feeling of confidence it created. This expression was simply that of guileless truth, sustained by an earnestness of purpose and a sincerity of feeling that rendered it remarkable. At times this air of integrity seemed to be so simple as to awaken the suspicion of a want of the usual means to discriminate between artifice 
and truth. But few came in serious contact with the man without losing his distrust and respect for his opinions and motives. Both these frontiersmen were still young, Hurry having reached the age of six or eight and twenty, while Deerslayer was several years his junior. Their attire needs no particular description, though it may be well to add that it was composed in no small degree of dressed deerskins, and had the usual signs of belonging to those who passed their time between the skirts of civilized society and the boundless forest. There was, notwithstanding, some attention to the smartness and picturesque in the arrangements of Deerslayer's dress, more particularly in the part connected with his arms and accoutrements. His rifle was in perfect condition. The handle of his hunting knife was neatly carved. His powder horn was ornamented with suitable devices lightly cut into the material, and the shot pouch was decorated with wampum. On the other hand, Hurry Harry, either from constitutional recklessness or from a secret consciousness how little his appearance required artificial aids, wore everything in a careless, slovenly manner, as if he felt a noble scorn for the trifling accessories of dress and ornaments. Perhaps a peculiar effect on his fine form and great stature was increased rather than lessened by this unstudied and disdainful air of indifference. Come, Deerslayer, fall to, and prove that you have a Delaware stomach as you say you have had a Delaware education, cried Hurry, setting the example by opening his mouth to receive a slice of cold venison steak that would have made an entire meal for a European peasant. Fall to, lad, and prove your manhood on this poor devil of a doe with your teeth, as you have already done with your rifle. Nay, nay, Hurry, there's little manhood in killing a doe, and that too out of season though there might be some in bringing down a painter or a catamount, returned the other, disposing himself to comply. The Delawares had given me my name, not so much on account of a bold heart as on account of a quick eye and an active foot. There may not have been a cowardice in overcoming a deer, but sartain there is no great valor. The Delawares themselves are no heroes, muttered Hurry through his teeth, the mouth being too full to permit it to be fairly opened or they never would have allowed them loping vagabonds, the Mingos, to make them women. That matter is not rightly understood, has never been rightly explained, said the deer-slayer earnestly, for he was as zealous a friend as his companion was dangerous as an enemy. The Mangwe fill the woods with their lies and misconstruct words and treaties. I have now lived ten years with the Delawares, and I know them to be as manful as any other nation when the proper time to strike comes. Hark ye, Master Deerslayer, since we are on the subject, we may as well open our minds to each other in a man-to-man -man way. Answer me one question. You have had so much luck among the game as to have gotten the title, it would seem, but did you ever hit anything human or intelligible? Did you ever pull the trigger on an enemy that was capable of pulling one upon you? This question produced a singular collision between mortification and correct feeling in the bosom of the youth that was easily to be traced in the workings of his ingenuous countenance. The struggle was short, however, uprightness of heart soon getting the better of false pride and frontier boastfulness. To own the truth, I never did, answered Deerslayer, seeing that a fitting occasion never offered. The Delawares have been peaceable since my sojourn with them and I hold it to be unlawful to take the life of a man except in open and generous warfare. What? Did you never find a fellow thieving among your traps and skins, and do the law on him with your own hands, by way of saving the magistrate's trouble in the settlements, and the rogue himself the cost of the suit? I am no trapper, Hurry, returned the young man proudly. I live by the rifle, a weapon at which I will not turn my back on, any man of my years between the Hudson and the St. Lawrence. I never offer a skin that has not a hole in its head besides them which nature made to see with or to breathe through. Ay, ay, this is all very well, in the animal way, though it makes but a poor figure alongside of scalps and ambushes. Shooting an Indian from an ambush is acting up to his own principles, and now we have what you call lawful war on our hands. The sooner you wipe that disgrace off your character, the sounder will be your sleep, if it only come from knowing that there is one enemy the less prowling in the woods. 
I shall not frequent your society long, friend Natty, unless you look higher than four-footed beasts to practice your rifle on. Our journey is nearly ended, you say, Master March, and we can part to-night if you see occasion. I have a friend waiting for me who will think it no disgrace to consort with the fellow creature that has never yet slain his kind. I wish I knew what has brought that skulking Delaware into this part of the country so early in the season, muttered Hurry to himself, in a way to show equally distrust and recklessness of its betrayal. Where did you say the young chief was to give you the meeting? At a small round rock near the foot of the lake, where they tell me the tribes are given to resorting to making their treaties and to bury their hatchets. This rock I have often heard the Delawares mention, though lake and rock are equally strangers to me. The country is claimed by both Mingos and Mohicans, and is sort of common territory to fish and hunt through. In time of peace, though, what it may become in wartime, the Lord not only knows. Common territory? exclaimed Hurry, laughing aloud. I should like to know what floating Tom Hutter would say to that. He claims a lake as his own property, in virtue of fifteen years' possession, and will not likely to give it up to either Mingo or Delaware without a battle for it. And what will the colony say to such a quarrel? All this country must have some owner, the gentry pushing their cravings into the wilderness, even where they never dare to venture in their own persons to look at the land they own. That may do in other quarters of the colony, Deerslayer, but it will not do here. Not a human being, the Lord accepted, owns a foot of sile in this part of the country. Pen was never put to paper concerning either hill or valley hereaway, as I've heard old Tom say time and again, and so he claims the best right to it of any man breathing, and what Tom claims he'll be very likely to maintain. By what I've heard you say, Hurry, this floating Tom must be an uncommon mortal, neither Mingo, Delaware, nor Paleface. His possession, too, has been long, by your tale, and altogether beyond frontier endurance. What's the man's history and nature? Why, as to old Tom's nature, it's not much like other men's human nature, but more like a muskrat's human nature, seeing that he takes more to the ways of that animal than to the ways of any other fellow creature. Some think he was a free liver on the salt water in his youth, and a companion of a certain kid who was hanged for piracy long afore you and I were born or acquainted, and that he came up into these regions thinking that the king's cruisers could never cross the mountains, and that he might enjoy the plunder peaceably in the woods. Then he was wrong, hurry, very wrong. A man can enjoy plunder peaceably nowhere. That's much as his turn of mind may happen to be. I've known them that never could enjoy it at all, unless it was in the midst of a jollification, and them again that enjoyed it best in a corner. Some men have no peace if they don't find plunder, and some if they do. Human nature is crooked in these matters. Old Tom seems to belong to neither set, as he enjoys his. If plunder he has really got with his daughters in a very quiet and comfortable way, and wishes for no more. Aye, he has daughters, too. I've heard the Delawares who've hunted this away tell their histories of these young women. Is there no mother, Hurry? There was once, as in reason, but she has now been dead and sunk these two good years. Anon, said Deerslayer, looking up at his companion in a little surprise. Dead and sunk, I say, and I hope that's good English. The old fellow lowered his wife into the lake by way of seeing the last of her, as I can testify, being an eyewitness of the ceremony. But whether Tom did it to save digging, which is no easy job among roots, or out of a conceit that the water washes away sin sooner than earth is more than I can say. Was the poor woman uncommon wicked, that her husband should take so much pains with her body? Not unreasonable, though she had her faults. I consider Judith Hutter to have been as graceful and about as likely to make a good end as any woman who has lived so long beyond the sound of church bells. And I can conclude old Tom sunk her as much by way of saving pains as by way of taking it. 
There was a little steel in her temper, it's true, and as old Hutter is pretty much flint, they struck out sparks once in a while. But, on the whole, they might be said to live amicable-like. When they did kindle, the listeners got so much insights into their past lives, as one gets in the darker parts of the woods, when a stray gleam of sunshine finds its way down to the roots of the trees. But Judith I shall always esteem, as it's recommended enough to one woman to be the mother of such a creature as her daughter, Judith Hutter. Ah, uh, Judith was the name the Delawares mentioned, though it was pronounced after a fashion of their own. From their discourse, I do not think the girl would much please my fancy. Thy fancy, exclaimed March, taking fire equally at the indifference and at the presumption of his companion. What the devil have you to do with a fancy, and that, too, concerning one like Judith? You are but a boy, a sapling, that has scarce got root. Judith has had men among her suitors ever since she was fifteen, which is now near five years, and will not be apt even to cast a look upon a half-grown creature like you. It is June, and there is not a cloud atween us and the sun, hurry, so all this heat is not wanted, answered the other, altogether undisturbed. Anyone may have a fancy, and a squirrel has the right to make up his mind touching a catamount. I... But it might not be wise always to let the catamount know it, growled March. But you're young and thoughtless, and I'll overlook your ignorance. Come, dear Slayer, he added, with a good-natured laugh, after pausing a moment to reflect. Come, dear Slayer, we are sworn friends, and we will not quarrel about light-minded, jilting Jade, just because she happens to be handsome, more especially as you have never seen her. Judith is only for a man whose teeth show the full marks, and it is foolish to be afeard of a boy. What did the Delaware say of the hussy? For an Indian, after all, has his notions of womankind, as well as a white man. They said she was fair to look on, and pleasant of speech, but overgiven to admirers, and light-minded. They are devils incarnate. After all, what schoolmaster is a match for an Indian? and looking into nature. Some people think they are only good on a trail or the warpath, but I say they are philosophers, and understand a man as well as they understand a beaver, and a woman as well as they understand either. Now that Judith's character is to a ribbon, to own the truth to you, dear Slayer, I should have married the gal two years since, if it had not been for two particular things, one of which is this very light-mindedness. And what may have been the other, demanded the hunter, who continued to eat like one that took very little interest in the subject. The other was an uncertainty about her having me. The hussy is handsome, and she knows it. Boy, not a tree that is growing in these hills is straighter, or waves in the wind with an easier bend, nor did you ever see the doe that bounded with more natural motion. If that was all, every tongue would sound her praises but she has such failings that I find it hard to overlook them, and sometimes I swear I'll never visit the lake again. Which is the reason that you always come back. Nothing is ever made more sure by swearing about it. Ah, dear Slayer, you are a novelty in these particulars, keeping as true to education as if you never left the settlements. With me the case is different, and I never want to clinch an ID that I do not feel a wish to swear about it. If you know all that I know concerning Judith, you'd find a justification for a little cussing. Now the officers sometimes stray over to the lake from the forts on the Mohawk to fish and hunt, and then the creature seems beside herself. You can see in the manner which she wears her finery, and the air she gives herself with the gallants. That is unseemly in a poor man's daughter, returned Deerslayer gravely. The officers are all gentry, and can only look on such as Judith with evil intentions. There's the uncertainty, and the damper. I have my misgivings about a particular captain, and Jude has no one to blame but her own folly, if I am right. On the whole, I wish to look upon her as modest and becoming, and yet the clouds that drive among these hills are not more uncertain. Not a dozen white men have ever laid eyes upon her since she was a child and yet her heirs with two or three of these officers are extinguishers. 
I would think no more of such a woman, but turn my mind altogether to the forest. That will not deceive you, being ordered and ruled by a hand that never wavers. If you know Judith, you would see how much easier it is to say this than it would be to do it. Could I bring my mind to be easy about the officers, I would carry the gal off to the Mohawk by force, make her marry me in spite of her whiffling, and leave old Tom to the care of Hetty, his other child, who, if she be not as handsome or as quick-witted as her sister, is much the most dutiful. Is there another bird in the same nest? asked Deerslayer, raising his eyes with a species of half-awakened curiosity. The Delaware spoke to me of only one. That's natural enough, when Judith Hutter and Hetty Hutter are in question. Hetty is only comely, while her sister, I tell thee, boy, is such another as not to be found between this and the sea. Judith is as full of wit and talk and cunning as an old Indian orator, while poor Hetty is at best but compass meant us. Anon? inquired again the deerslayer. Why, what the officers call compass meant us which I understand to signify that she means always to go in the right direction, but sometimes does not know how. Compass for the pint, and meant us for the intention. No, poor Hetty is what I call on the verge of ignorance, and sometimes she stumbles on the side of the line, and sometimes on the other. Them are beings that the Lord has in his special care, said Deerslayer, solemnly for he looks carefully to all who fall short of their proper share of reason. The redskins honor and respect those who are so gifted, knowing that the evil spirit delights more to dwell in an artful body than in one that has no cunning to work upon. I'll answer for it, then, that he will not remain long with poor Hetty, for the child is just compass men us, as I have told you. Old Tom has a feeling for the gal, and so has Judith, quick-witted and glorious as she is herself. Else would I not answer for her being altogether safe among the sort of men that sometimes meet on the lake shore. I thought this water was an unknown and little frequented sheet, observed the deerslayer, evidently uneasy at the idea of being too near the world. It is all that, lad. The eyes of twenty white men never have been laid on it. Still, twenty true-bred frontiersmen hunters and trappers and scouts and the like can do a deal of mischief if they try twould be an awful thing to me dear slayer if i did find judith married after an absence of six months have you the gal's faith to encourage you to hope otherwise not at all i know not how it is i'm a good-looking boy that much i can see in any spring on which the sun shines and yet i could not get the hussy to a promise or even a cordial, willing smile. Though she will laugh by the hour, if she has dared to marry in my absence, she'd be like to know the pleasures of a widowhood afore she is twenty. You would not harm the man she has chosen, Hurry, simply because she found him more to her liking than yourself. Why not? If an enemy crosses my path, will I not beat him out of it? Look at me. Am I a man like to let any sneaking, crawling skin trader get the better of me in a matter that touches me as near as the kindness of Judith Hutter? Besides, when we live beyond law, we must be our own judges and executioners, and if a man should be found dead in the woods, who is there to say who slew him, even admitting that the colony took the matter in hand and made a stir about it? If that man should be Judith Hutter's husband, after what has passed— I might tell enough, at least, to put the colony on the trail. You, half-grown venison-hunting bantling, you dare to think of informing against Hurry Harry in so much as a matter of touching a mink or a woodchuck? I would dare to speak truth, Hurry, concerning you or any man that ever lived. March looked at his companion for a moment in silent amazement, then seizing him by the throat with both hands, he shook his comparatively slight frame with violence that menaced the dislocation of some of the bones. Nor was this done jocularly, for anger flashed from the giant's eyes, and there were certain signs that seemed to threaten much more earnestness than the occasion would appear to call for. Whatever might be the real intention of March, and it is possible there was none settled in his mind, it is certain that he was unusually aroused, 
and most men who found themselves throttled by one of the mold so gigantic in such a mood and in a solitude so deep and helpless would have felt intimidated and tempted to yield even the right not so however with deerslayer his countenance remained unmoved and his hand did not shake and his answer was given in a voice that did not resort to artifice of louder tones even by way of proving his owner's resolution you may shake hurry until you bring down the mountain he said quietly but nothing besides truth will you shake from me it is probable that judith hutter has no husband to slay and you may never have a chance to waylay one else would i tell her of your threat in the first conversation i held with the gal march released his grip and sat regarding the other in silent astonishment i thought we had been friends he at length added but you've got the last secret of mine that will ever enter your ears i want none if they are to be like this i know we live in the woods hurry and are thought to be beyond human laws and perhaps we are so in fact whatever it may be in right but there is a law and a law-maker that rule across the whole continent he that flies in the face of either need not call me a friend damn dear slayer if i do not believe you are at heart a moravian and no fair-minded plain-dealing hunter as you pretended to be fair-minded or not hurry you will find me as plain-dealing in deeds as i am in words but this giving way to sudden anger is foolish and proves how little you have sojourned with the red man judith hutter no doubt is still single and you spoke but as the tongue ran and not as the heart felt there's my hand and we will say and think no more about it hurry seemed more surprised than ever then he burst forth in a loud good-natured laugh which brought tears to his eyes after this he accepted the offered hand and the parties became friends twould have been foolish to quarrel about an idea march cried as he resumed his meal and more like lawyers in towns than like sensible men in woods they tell me deerslayer much ill blood grows out of ideas among the people in the lower counties and that they sometimes get to extremities upon them that do they that do they and about other matters that might better be left to take care of themselves i have heard the moravians say that there are lands in which men quarrel even concerning their religion and if they can get their tempers up on such a subject hurry the lord have mercy on em Howsoever, there is no occasion for our following their example and more especially about a husband that this judith hutter may never see or never wish to see for my part i feel more curiosity about the feeble-witted sister than about your beauty there's something that comes close to a man's feelings when he meets with a fellow creature that has all the outward show of an accountable mortal and who fails of being what he seems only through a lack of reason this is bad enough in a man but when it comes to a woman and she a young and maybe a winning creature it touches all the pitiful thoughts that nature has god knows hurry that such poor things be defenseless enough with all their wits about them but it's a cruel fortune when that great protector and guide veils them hark deerslayer you know what the hunters and trappers and peltry men in general be and their best friends will not deny that they are headstrong and given to having their own way without much bethinking them of other people's rights or feelings and yet i don't think the man is to be found in all this region who would harm hetty hutter if he could no not even a redskin therein friend hurry you do the delawares at least and all their allied tribes only justice for a redskin looks upon a being thus struck by god's power as especially under his care i rejoice to hear what you say however i rejoice to hear it but as the sun is beginning to turn towards the afternoon sky had we not better strike the trail again and make forward that we may get an opportunity of seeing these wonderful sisters hurry march giving a cheerful assent the remnants of the meal were soon collected then the travellers shouldered their packs resumed their arms and quitting the little area of light they again plunged into the deep shadows of the forest end of chapter one 
Recording by Josh Smith. Chapter Two of the Deerslayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter Two Thou art passing from the lake's green side and the hunter's hearth away. For the time of flowers, for the summer's pride, daughter, thou canst not stay. Mrs. Hemans Edith, A Tale of the Woods, Part Two, One Ninety One to Ninety Four. Our two adventurers had not far to go. Hurry knew the direction as soon as he had found the open spot in the spring, and he now led on with the confident step of a man assured of his object. The forest was dark, as a matter of course, but it was no longer obstructed by underbrush, and the footing was firm and dry. After proceeding near a mile, March stopped, and began to cast about him with an inquiring look examining the different objects with care, and occasionally turning his eyes on the trunks of the fallen trees, with which the ground was well sprinkled, as is usually the case in an American wood, especially in those parts of the country where timber has not yet become valuable. "'This must be the place, dear Slayer,' March at length observed. "'Here is a beech by the side of a hemlock, with three pines at hand, and yonder is a white birch with a broken top and yet I see no rock, nor any of the branches bent down, as I told you would be the case. Broken branches are unskillful landmarks, as the least experienced know that branches don't often break of themselves," returned the other, and they also lead to suspicion and discoveries. The Delawares never trust to broken branches unless it is in friendly times and on an open trail. As for the beeches and pines and hemlocks, why, they are to be seen on all sides of us, not only by twos and threes, but by forties and fifties and hundreds. Very true, dear Slayer, but you never calculate on position. Here is a beech and a hemlock. Yes, and there is another beech and a hemlock, as loving as two brothers, or for that matter more loving than some brothers. And yonder are others, for neither tree is a rarity in these woods. I fear me, hurry. You are better at trapping beaver and shooting bears than at leading on a blindish sort of a trail. Ha! There's what you wish to find after all. Now, dear Slayer, this is one of your Delaware pretensions, for hang me if I see anything but these trees, which do seem to start up around us in a most unaccountable and perplexing manner. Look this away, hurry. Here, in a line with the black oak, don't you see the crooked sapling that is hooked up in the branches of the basswood near it? Now, that sapling was once snow-ridden, and got the bend by its weight, but it never straightened itself, and fastened itself in among the basswood branches in the way you see. The hand of man did that act of kindness for it." "'That hand was mine!' exclaimed Hurry. "'I found the slender young thing bent to the earth, like an unfortunate creature borne down by misfortune, and stuck it up where you see it. After all, dear Slayer, I must allow you're getting to have an uncommon good eye for the woods. "'Tis improving, Hurry. "'Tis improving. "'I will acknowledge. "'But tis only a child's eye compared to some I know. "'There's Tamanund now, though a man so old that few remember when he was in his prime. "'Tamanund lets nothing escape his look, which is more like the scent of a hound than the sight of an eye. "'Then Uncas, the father of Chingachgook, and the lawful chief of the Mohicans, "'is another that it is almost hopeless to pass unseen. "'I'm improving, I will allow.' I'm improving, but far from being perfect, as yet. "'And who is this Chingachgook, of whom you talk so much, dear Slayer?' asked Hurry, as he moved off in the direction of the righted sapling. "'A loping redskin at the best, I make no question.' "'Not so, Hurry, but the best of loping redskins, as you call him. If he had his rights, he would be a great chief. But as it is, he is only a brave and just-minded Delaware. Respected, and even obeyed in some things, tis true, but of a fallen race, and belonging to a fallen people. Ah, Harry March, 'twould warm the heart within you to sit in their lodges of a winter's night, 
and listen to the traditions of the ancient greatness and power of the Mohicans. "'Hark ye, friend Nathaniel,' said Hurry, stopping short to face his companion, in order that his words might carry greater weight with them. If a man believed all that other people choose to say in their own favour, he might get an oversized opinion of them, and an undersized opinion of himself. These redskins are notable boasters, and I set down more than half of their traditions as pure talk. There is truth in what you say, Hurry. I'll not deny it, for I've seen it, and believe it. They do boast, but then that is a gift from nature, and it's sinful to withstand natural gifts. See, this is the spot you come to find. This remark cut short the discourse, and both the men now gave all their attention to the object immediately before them. Deerslayer pointed out to his companion the trunk of a huge linden, or basswood as it is termed in the language of the country, which had filled its time and fallen by its own weight. This tree, like so many millions of its brethren, lay where it had fallen, and was mouldering under the slow but certain influence of the seasons. The decay, however, had attacked its centre, even while it stood erect in the pride of vegetation bellowing out its heart as disease sometimes destroys the vitals of animal life, even while a fair exterior is presented to the observer. As the trunk lay stretched for near a hundred feet along the earth, the quick eye of the hunter detected this peculiarity, and from this and other circumstances he knew it to be the tree of which March was in search. Aye, here we have what we want, cried Hurry, looking in at the larger end of the linden. Everything is as snug as if it had been left in an old woman's cupboard. Come, lend me a hand, dear Slayer, and we'll be afloat in half an hour. At this call the hunter joined his companion, and the two went to work deliberately and regularly, like men accustomed to the sort of thing in which they were employed. In the first place Hurry removed some pieces of bark that lay before the large opening in the tree and which the other declared to be disposed in a way that would have been more likely to attract attention than it could seal the cover, had any straggler passed that way. The two then drew out a bark canoe, containing its seats, paddles, and other appliances, even to fishing lines and rods. This vessel was by no means small, but such was its comparative lightness, and so gigantic was the strength of hurry, that the latter shouldered it with seeming ease, declining all assistance even in the act of raising it to the awkward position in which he was obliged to hold it. "'Lead ahead, dear Slayer,' said March, "'and open the bushes. The rest I can do for myself.' The other obeyed, and the men left the spot, dear Slayer clearing the way for his companion, and inclining to the right or to the left, as the latter directed. In about ten minutes they both broke suddenly into the brilliant light of the sun on a low gravelly point that was washed by water on quite half its outline. An exclamation of surprise broke from the lips of Deerslayer, an exclamation that was low and guardedly made, however, for his habits were much more thoughtful and regulated than those of the reckless hurry, when on reaching the margin of the lake he beheld the view that unexpectedly met his gaze. It was, in truth, sufficiently striking to merit a brief description. On a level with the point lay a broad sheet of water, so placid and limpid that it resembled a bed of the pure mountain atmosphere, compressed into a setting of hills and woods. Its length was about three leagues, while its breadth was irregular, expanding to half a league or even more, opposite to the point, and contracting to less than half that distance, more to the southward. Of course, its margin was irregular, being indented by bays and broken by many projecting low points. At its northern or nearest end it was bounded by an isolated mountain, lower land falling off east and west, gracefully relieving the sweep of the outline. Still the character of the country was mountainous, high hills or low mountains rising abruptly from the water on quite nine-tenths of its circuit. The exceptions, indeed, only served a little to vary the scene, and even beyond the parts of the shore that were comparatively low, the background was high, though more distant. But the most striking peculiarities of this scene were its solemn solitude and sweet repose. On all sides, wherever the eye turned, nothing met it but the mirror-like surface of the lake, the placid view of heaven, and the dense setting of woods. So rich and fleecy were the outlines of the forest, that scarce an opening could be seen, the whole visible earth from the rounded mountain-top to the water's edge, presenting one unvaried hue of unbroken verdure. 
as if vegetation were not satisfied with a triumph so complete the trees overhung the lake itself shooting out towards the light and there were miles along its eastern shore where a boat might have pulled beneath the branches of dark rembrandt looking hemlocks quivering aspens and melancholy pines in a word the hand of man had never defaced or deformed any part of this native scene which lay bathed in the sunlight a glorious picture of affluent forest grandeur softened by the balminess of june and relieved by the beautiful variety afforded by the presence of so broad an expanse of water this is grand tis solemn tis an education of itself to look upon exclaimed deerslayer as he stood leaning on his rifle and gazing to the right and left north and south above and beneath in whichever direction his eye could wander not a tree disturbed even by a redskin hand as i can discover but everything left in the ordering of the lord to live and die according to his own designs and laws hurry your judith ought to be a moral and well-disposed young woman if she has passed half the time you mention in the centre of a spot so favoured that's naked truth and yet the gal has the vagaries all her time has not been passed here howsoever old tom having the custom afore i knowed him of going to spend the winters in the neighbourhood of the settlers or under the guns of the forts no no jude has caught more than is for her good from the settlers and especially from the gallantifying officers if she has if she has hurry this is a school to set her mind right again but what is this i see off here abreast of us that seems too small for an island and too large for a boat though it stands in the midst of the water why that is what these galantine gentry from the forts call muskrat castle and old tom himself will grin at the name though it bears so hard on his own nature and character tis the stationary house there being two this which never moves and the other that floats being sometimes in one part of the lake and sometimes in another the last goes by the name of the ark though what may be the meaning of the word is more than i can tell you it must come from the missionaries hurry whom i have heard speak and read of such a thing they say that the earth was once covered with water and that noah with his children was saved from drowning by building a vessel called an ark in which he embarked in season some of the delawares believe this tradition and some deny it but it behooves you and me as white men born to put our faith in its truth do you see anything of this ark tis down south no doubt or anchored in some of the bays but the canoe is ready, and fifteen minutes will carry two such paddles as yourn and mine to the castle." At this suggestion Deerslayer helped his companion to place the different articles in the canoe which was already afloat. This was no sooner done than the two frontiermen embarked, and by a vigorous push sent the light bark some eight or ten rods from the shore. Hurry now took the seat in the stern, while Deerslayer placed himself forward and by leisurely but steady strokes of the paddles the canoe glided across the placid sheet towards the extraordinary-looking structure that the former had styled muskrat castle several times the men ceased paddling and looked about them at the scene as new glimpses opened from behind points enabling them to see farther down the lake or to get broader views of the wooded mountains the only changes however were in the new forms of the hills the varying curvature of the bays and the wider reaches of the valley south the whole earth apparently being clothed in a gala dress of leaves this is a sight to warm the heart exclaimed deerslayer when they had thus stopped for the fourth or fifth time the lake seems made to let us get an insight into the noble forests and land and water alike stand in the beauty of god's providence do you say hurry that there is no man who calls himself lawful owner of all these glories none but the king lad he may pretend to some right of that nature but he is so far away that his claim will never trouble old tom hutter who has got possession and is like to keep it as long as his life lasts tom is no squatter not being on land i call him a floater i envy that man i know it's wrong and i strive agin the feeling but i envy that man don't think hurry that i'm consorting any plan to put myself in his moccasins for such a thought doesn't harbor in my mind but i can't help a little envy tis a natural feelin and the best of us are but natural a'ter all and give way to such feelins at times you've only to marry hattie to inherit half the estate cried hurry laughing 
the gal is comely. Nay, if it wasn't for her sister's beauty, she would be even handsome. And then her wits are so small that you may easily convert her into one of your own way of thinking, in all things. Do you take Hetty off the old fellow's hands, and I'll engage he'll give you an interest in every deer you can knock over within five miles of his lake. Does game abound? suddenly demanded the other, who paid but little attention to March's raillery. It has the country to itself. Scarce a trigger is pulled on it. And as for the trappers, this is not a region they greatly frequent. I ought not to be so much here myself, but Jude pulls one away, while the beaver pulls another. More than a hundred Spanish dollars has that creature cost me in the last two seasons, and yet I could not forego the wish to look upon her face once more. "'Do the red men often visit this lake, Hurry?' continued Deerslayer, pursuing his own train of thought. "'Why, they come and go, sometimes in parties, and sometimes singly. The country seems to belong to no native tribe in particular, and so it has fallen into the hands of the Hutter tribe. The old man tells me that some sharp ones have been wheedling the Mohawks for an Indian deed, in order to get a title out of the colony, but nothing has come of it, seeing that no one heavy enough for such a trade has yet meddled with the matter. The hunters have a good life-lease still of this wilderness. So much the better, so much the better, hurry. If I was king of England, the man that felled one of these trees without good occasion for the timber should be banished to a deserted and forlorn region, in which no four-footed animal ever trod. Right glad am I that Chingachgook appointed our meeting on this lake, for hitherto I of mine never looked on such a glorious spectacle. That's because you kept so much among the Delawares, in whose country there are no lakes. Now, farther north and farther west, these bits of water abound. And you're young, you may yet live to see em. But though there be other lakes, dear Slayer, there's no other Judith Hutter. At this remark his companion smiled, and then he dropped his paddle into the water as if in consideration of a lover's haste. Both now pulled vigorously until they got within a hundred yards of the castle, as Hurry familiarly called the house of Hutter, when they again ceased paddling, the admirer of Judith restraining his impatience the more readily, as he perceived that the building was untenanted at the moment. This new pause was to enable Deerslayer to survey the singular edifice, which was of a construction so novel as to merit a particular description. Muskrat Castle, as the house had been facetiously named by some waggish officer, stood in the open lake, at a distance of fully a quarter of a mile from the nearest shore. On every other side the water extended much farther, the precise position being distant about two miles from the northern end of the sheet, and near, if not quite, a mile from its eastern shore. As there was not the smallest appearance of any island, but the house stood on piles, with the water flowing beneath it, and Deerslayer had already discovered that the lake was of a great depth, he was fain to ask an explanation of this singular circumstance. Hurry solved the difficulty by telling him that on this spot alone a long, narrow shoal, which extended for a few hundred yards in a north and south direction, rose within six or eight feet of the surface of the lake, and that Hutter had driven piles into it, and placed his habitation on them for the purpose of security. The old fellow was burnt out three times, between the Indians and the hunters, and in one affray with the redskins he lost his only son, since which time he has taken to the water for safety. No one can attack him here, without coming in a boat, and the plunder and scalps would scarce be worth the trouble of digging out canoes. Then it's by no means sartain which would whip in such a scrimmage, for old Tom is well supplied with arms and ammunition, and the castle, as you may see, is a tight breastwork again light shot. Deerslayer had some theoretical knowledge of frontier warfare, though he had never yet been called on to raise his hand in anger against a fellow creature. He saw that Hurry did not overrate the strength of this position in a military point of view, since it would not be easy to attack it without exposing the assailants to the fire of the besieged. A good deal of art had also been manifested in the disposition of the timber of which the building was constructed, and which afforded a protection much greater than was usual to the ordinary log cabins of the frontier. The sides and ends were composed of the trunks of large pines, 
cut about nine feet long, and placed upright instead of being laid horizontally, as was the practice of the country. These logs were squared on three sides, and had large tenons on each end. Massive sills were secured on the heads of the piles, with suitable grooves dug out of their upper surfaces, which had been squared for the purpose, and the lower tenons of the upright pieces were placed in these grooves, giving them secure fastening below. Plates had been laid in the upper ends of the upright logs, and were kept in their places by a similar contrivance, the several corners of the structure being well fastened by scarfing and pinning the sills and plates. The doors were made of smaller logs, similarly squared, and the roof was composed of light poles firmly united and well covered with bark. The effect of this ingenious arrangement was to give its owner a house that could be approached only by water, the sides of which were composed of logs closely wedged together, which were two feet thick in their thinnest parts, and which could be separated only by a deliberate and laborious use of human hands, or by the slow operation of time. The outer surface of the building was rude and uneven, the logs being of unequal sizes but the squared surfaces within each gave both the sides and door as uniform an appearance as was desired, either for use or show. The chimney was not the least singular portion of the castle, as Hurry made his companion observe, while he explained the process by which it had been made. The material was a stiff clay, properly worked, which had been put together in a mould of sticks and suffered to harden, a foot or two at a time, commencing at the bottom. When the entire chimney had thus been raised, and had been properly bound in with outward props. A brisk fire was kindled and kept going until it was burned to something like a brick red. This had not been an easy operation, nor had it succeeded entirely, but by dint of filling the cracks with fresh clay, a safe fireplace and chimney had been obtained in the end. This part of the work stood on the log door, secured beneath by an extra pile. There were a few other peculiarities about this dwelling which will better appear in the course of the narrative. "'Old Tom is full of contrivances,' added Hurry, and he set his heart on the success of his chimney, which threatened more than once to give out altogether. But the perseverance will even overcome smoke, and now he has a comfortable cabin of it, though it did promise at one time to be a chinky sort of a flue to carry flames and fire. "'You seem to know the whole history of the castle, Hurry.' "'Chimney and sides,' said Deerslayer, smiling. "'Is love so overcoming that it causes a man to study the story of his sweetheart's habitation?' "'Partly that, lad, and partly eyesight,' returned the good-natured giant, laughing. "'There was a large gang of us in the lake, the summer the old fellow built, and we helped him along with the job. I raised no small part of the weight of them uprights with my own shoulders, and the axes flew, I can inform you, Master Natty, while we were being it among the trees ashore. The old devil is no way stingy about food, and as we had often eat at his hearth, we thought we would just house him comfortably, afore we went to Albany with our skins. Yes, many is the meal I've swallowed in Tom Hutter's cabins, and Hetty, though so weak in the way of wits, has a wonderful particular way about a frying-pan or a gridiron. While the parties were thus discoursing, the canoe had been gradually drawing nearer to the castle, and was now so close as to require but a single stroke of a paddle to reach the landing. This was at a floored platform in front of the entrance, that might have been some twenty feet square. "'Old Tom calls this sort of a wharf his dooryard,' observed Hurry, as he fastened the canoe, after he and his companion had left it. "'And the gallants from the forts have named it the castle court though what a court can have to do here is more than I can tell you, seeing that there is no law. "'Tis as I supposed, not a soul within, but the whole family is off on a voyage of discovery." While Hurry was bustling about the dooryard, examining the fishing-spears, rods, nets, and other similar appliances of a frontier cabin, Deerslayer, whose manner was altogether more rebuked and quiet, entered the building with a curiosity that was not usually exhibited by one so long trained in Indian habits. The interior of the castle was as faultlessly neat as its exterior was novel. The entire space, some twenty feet by forty, was subdivided into several small sleeping-rooms, the apartment into which he first entered serving equally for the ordinary uses of its inmates, and for a kitchen. The furniture was of the strange mixture that it is not uncommon to find in the remotely situated log tenements of the interior, 
Most of it was rude, and to the last degree rustic. But there was a clock, with a handsome case of dark wood, in a corner, and two or three chairs, with a table and bureau, that had evidently come from some dwelling of more than usual pretension. The clock was industriously ticking, but its leaden-looking hands did no discredit to their dull aspect, for they pointed to the hour of eleven, though the sun plainly showed it was some time past the turn of the day. There was also a dark, massive chest. The kitchen utensils were of the simplest kind, and far from numerous, but every article was in its place, and showed the nicest care in its condition. After Deerslayer had cast a look about him in the outer room, he raised a wooden latch, and entered a narrow passage that divided the inner end of the house into two equal parts, frontier usages being no way scrupulous, and his curiosity being strongly excited, the young man now opened a door and found himself in a bedroom. A single glance sufficed to show that the apartment belonged to females. The bed was of the feathers of wild geese, and filled nearly to overflowing, but it lay in a rude bunk raised only a foot from the door. On one side of it were arranged on pegs various dresses of a quality much superior to what one would expect to meet in such a place, with ribbons and other similar articles to correspond. Pretty shoes, with handsome silver buckles, such as were then worn by females in easy circumstances, were not wanting and no less than six fans of gay colors were placed half open in a way to catch the eye by their conceits and hues even the pillow on this side of the bed was covered with finer linen than its companion and it was ornamented with a small ruffle a cap coquettishly decorated with ribbons hung above it and a pair of long gloves such as were rarely used in those days by persons of the laboring classes were pinned ostentatiously to it, as if with an intention to exhibit them there if they could not be shown on the owner's arms. All this Deerslayer saw, and noted with a degree of minuteness that would have done credit to the habitual observation of his friends, the Delawares. Nor did he fail to perceive the distinction that existed between the appearances on the different sides of the bed, the head of which stood against the wall. On that opposite to the one just described, everything was homely and uninviting except through its perfect neatness the few garments that were hanging from the pegs were of the coarsest materials and of the commonest forms while nothing seemed made for show of ribbons there was not one nor was there either cap or kerchief beyond those which hutter's daughters might be fairly entitled to wear it was now several years since deerslayer had been on a spot especially devoted to the uses of females of his own color and race the sight brought back to his mind a rush of childish recollections, and he lingered in the room with a tenderness of feeling to which he had long been a stranger. He bethought him of his mother, whose homely vestments he remembered to have seen hanging on pegs like those which he felt must belong to Hetty Hutter, and he bethought himself of a sister, whose incipient and native taste for finery had exhibited itself somewhat in the manner of that of Judith, though necessarily in a less degree. These little resemblances opened a long hidden vein of sensations, and as he quitted the room it was with a saddened mien. He looked no further, but returned slowly and thoughtfully towards the dooryard. "'If old Tom has taken to a new calling, and has been trying his hand at the traps,' cried Hurry, who had been coolly examining the borderer's implements, "'if that is his humour, and you're disposed to remain in these parts, we can make an uncommon comfortable season of it for, while the old man and I outknowledge the beaver, you can fish, and knock down the deer, to keep body and soul together. I've always give the poor hunters half a share, but one as active and sartain as yourself might expect a full one. Thank ye, Hurry. Thank ye, with all my heart. But I do a little beavering for myself as occasions offer. Tis true the Delawares call me Deerslayer, but it's not so much because I'm pretty fatal with the venison as because that while I kill so many bucks and does, I've never yet taken the life of a fellow-creature. They say their traditions do not tell of another who had shed so much blood of animals that had not shed the blood of man. I hope they don't account you chicken-hearted, lad. A faint-hearted man is like a no-tailed beaver. I don't believe, Hurry, that they account me as out-of-the-way timorsome, even though they may not account me as out-of-the-way brave. But I'm not quarrelsome and that goes a great way towards keeping blood off the hands among the hunters and redskins and then harry march it keeps blood off the conscience too 
Well, for my part, I account game, a redskin, and a Frenchman as pretty much the same thing. Though I am as unquarrelsome a man, too, as there is in all the colonies, I despise a quarreler as I do a cur-dog. But one has no need to be over-scrupulsome when it's the right time to show the flint. I look upon him as the most of a man who acts nearest the right, hurry. But this is a glorious spot, and my eyes never a weary looking at it. "'Tis your first acquaintance with a lake, and these ideas come over us all at such times. Lakes have a gentle character, as I say, being pretty much water and land, and points and bays." As this definition by no means met the feelings that were uppermost in the mind of the young hunter, he made no immediate answer, but stood gazing at the dark hills and the glassy water in silent enjoyment. "'Have the governors or the king's people given this lake a name?' he suddenly asked, as if struck with a new idea. If they've not begun to blaze their trees and set up their compasses, and line off their maps, it's likely they've not bethought them to disturb nature with a name. They've not got to that yet, and the last time I went in with skins, one of the king's surveyors was questioning me concerning all the region hereabouts. He had heard that there was a lake in this quarter, and had got some general notions about it, such as that there was water and hills, but how much of either he knowed no more than you know of the Mohawk tongue. I didn't open the trap any wider than was necessary, giving him but poor encouragement in the way of farms and clearings. In short, I left on his mind some such opinion of this country as a man gets of a spring of dirty water with a path to it that is so muddy that one mires afore he sets out. He told me they hadn't got the spot down yet on their maps though I conclude that is a mistake, for he showed me his parchment, and there is a lake down on it where there is no lake in fact, and which is about fifty miles from the place where it ought to be, if they meant it for this. I don't think my account will encourage him to mark down another, by way of improvement." Here Hurry laughed heartily, such tricks being particularly grateful to a set of men who dreaded the approaches of civilization as a curtailment of their own lawless empire. The egregious errors that existed in the maps of the day, all of which were made in Europe, were, moreover, a standing topic of ridicule among them, for, if they had not science enough to make any better themselves, they had sufficient local information to detect the gross blunders contained in those that existed. Any one who will take the trouble to compare these unanswerable evidences of the topographical skill of our fathers a century since, with the more accurate sketches of our own time, will at once perceive that the men of the woods had a sufficient justification for all their criticism on this branch of the skill of the colonial governments, which did not at all hesitate to place a river or a lake a degree or two out of the way, even though they lay within a day's march of the inhabited parts of the country. "'I'm glad it has no name,' resumed Deerslayer, or at least no pale-face name, for their christenings always foretell waste and destruction. No doubt, howsoever, the redskins have their modes of knowing it, and the hunters and trappers, too. They are likely to call the place by something reasonable and resembling. As for the tribes, each has its tongue and its own way of calling things. And they treat this part of the world just as they treat all others. Among ourselves we've got to calling the place the glimmer-glass, seeing that its whole basin is so often hinged with pines cast upward to its face as if it would throw back the hills that hang over it. There is an outlet, I know, for all lakes have outlets, and the rock at which I am to meet Chingachgook stands near an outlet. Has that no colony name yet? In that particular they've got the advantage of us having one end, and that the biggest, in their own keeping. They've given it a name which has found its way up to its source, names naturally working upstream. No doubt, dear Slayer, you've seen the Susquehanna down in the Delaware country? That I have and hunted along its banks a hundred times. That and this are the same in fact, and I suppose the same in sound. I am glad they've been compelled to keep the red men's name, for it would be too hard to rob them of both land and name." Deerslayer made no answer, but he stood leaning on his rifle, gazing at the view which so much delighted him. The reader is not to suppose, however, that it was the picturesque alone which so strongly attracted his attention. The spot was very lovely, of a truth and it was then seen in one of its most favorable moments, the surface of the lake being as smooth as glass and as limpid as pure air, throwing back the mountains, 
clothed in dark pines, along the whole of its eastern boundary. The points thrusting forward their trees even to nearly horizontal lines, while the bays were seen glittering through an occasional arch beneath, left by a vault fretted with branches and leaves. It was the air of deep repose, the solitudes, that spoke of scenes and forests untouched by the hands of man. The reign of nature, in a word, that gave so much pure delight to one of his habits and turn of mind. Still, he felt, though it was unconsciously, like a poet also. If he found a pleasure in studying this large, and to him unusual opening into the mysteries and forms of the woods, as one is gratified in getting broader views of any subject that has long occupied his thoughts, he was not insensible to the innate loveliness of such a landscape, neither, but felt a portion of that soothing of the spirit which is a common attendant of a scene so thoroughly pervaded by the holy cairn of nature. End of chapter 2 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 3 of the Deerslayer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 3. Come, shall we go and kill us venison? And yet it irks me, the poor dappled foals, being native burghers of this desert city, should, in their own confines, with forked heads, have their round haunches gored. As you like it. Act 2. Scene 1, lines 21 to 25. Hurry Harry thought more of the beauties of Judith Hutter than of those of the glimmerglass and its accompanying scenery. As soon as he had taken a sufficiently intimate survey of Floating Tom's implements, therefore, he summoned his companion to the canoe, that they might go down the lake in quest of the family. Previously to embarking, however, Hurry carefully examined the whole of the northern end of the water with an indifferent ship's glass that formed a part of Hutter's effects. In this scrutiny no part of the shore was overlooked, the bays and points in particular being subjected to a closer inquiry than the rest of the wooded boundary. "'Tis as I thought,' said Hurry, laying aside the glass. "'The old fellow is drifting about the south end this fine weather and has left the castle to defend itself. Well, now we know that he is not up this away. Twill be but a small matter to paddle down and hunt him up in his hiding-place. "'Does Master Hutter think it necessary to burrow on this lake?' inquired Deerslayer, as he followed his companion into the canoe. "'To my eye it is such a solitude as one might open his whole soul in, and fear no one to disarrange his thoughts or his worship.' You forget your friends the Mingos, and all the French savages. Is there a spot on earth, Deerslayer, to which them disquiet rogues don't go? Where is the lake, or even the deer lick, that the blackguards don't find out, and having found out, don't sooner or later discolor its water with blood? I hear no good character of them, certainly, friend Hurry, though I've never been called on yet to meet them, or any other mortal, on the warpath. I dare to say that such a lovely spot as this would not be likely to be overlooked by such plunderers, for, though I've not been in the way of quarrelling with them tribes myself, the Delawares give me such an account of them that I pretty much set them down, in my own mind, as thorough miscreants. You may do that with a safe conscience, or, for that matter, any other savage you may happen to meet." Here Deerslayer protested and as they went paddling down the lake a hot discussion was maintained concerning the respective merits of the pale-faces and the redskins. Hurry had all the prejudices and antipathies of a white hunter, who generally regards the Indian as a sort of natural competitor, and not unfrequently as a natural enemy. As a matter of course, he was loud, clamorous, dogmatical, and not very argumentative. Deerslayer, on the other hand, manifested a very different temper proving by the moderation of his language the fairness of his views and the simplicity of his distinctions that he possessed every disposition to hear reason a strong innate desire to do justice and an ingenuousness that was singularly indisposed to have recourse to sophism to maintain an argument or to defend a prejudice 
Still, he was not altogether free from the influence of the latter feeling. This tyrant of the human mind, which ruses on it prey through a thousand avenues, almost as soon as men begin to think and feel, and which seldom relinquishes its iron sway until they cease to do either, had made some impression on even the just propensities of this individual, who probably offered in these particulars a fair specimen of what absence from bad example, the want of temptation to go wrong, and native good feeling can render youth. "'You will allow, dear Slayer, that a Mingo is more than half-devil,' cried Hurry, following up the discussion with an animation that touched closely on ferocity. "'Though you want to over-persuade me that the Delaware tribe is pretty much made up of angels. Now I gainsay that proposal, concerning white men, even. All white men are not faultless, and therefore all Indians can't be faultless. And so your argument is out at the elbow in the start. But this is what I call reason.' Here's three colors on earth. White, black, and red. White is the highest color and therefore the best man. Black comes next, and is put to live in the neighborhood of the white man as tolerable, and fit to be made use of. And red comes last, which shows that those that made him never expected an Indian to be accounted as more than half human. God made all three alike, hurry. Alike! Do you call a nigger like a white man, or me like an Indian? You go off at half-cock, and don't hear me out. God made us all, white, black, and red, and no doubt had his own wise intentions in coloring us differently. Still, he made us, in the main, much the same in feelings, though I'll not deny that he gave each race its gifts. A white man's gifts are Christianized, while a redskin's are more for the wilderness. Thus it would be a great offence for a white man to scalp the dead, whereas it's a signal virtue in an Indian. Then again, a white man cannot ambush women and children in war, while a redskin may. Tis cruel work, I'll allow, but for them it's lawful work, while for us it would be grievous work. That depends on your enemy. As for scalping, or even skinning a savage, I look upon them pretty much the same as cutting off the ears of wolves for the bounty, or stripping a bear of its hide, and then you're out significantly as to taking the pole of a redskin in hand, seeing that the very colony has offered a bounty for the job, all the same as it pays for wolves' ears and crows' heads. Aye, and a bad business it is, hurry. Even the Indians themselves cry shame on it, seeing it's again a white man's gifts. I do not pretend that all that white men do is properly Christianized, and according to the lights given them, for then they would be what they ought to be, which we know they are not. But I will maintain that tradition, and use, and color, and laws make such a difference in races as to amount to gifts. I do not deny that there are tribes among the Indians that are naturally perverse and wicked, as there are nations among the whites. Now, I account the Mingos as belonging to the first and the Frenchers, in the Canadas, to the last. In a state of lawful warfare, such as we have lately got into, it is a duty to keep down all compassionate feelings, so far as life goes, again either, but when it comes to scalps, it's a very different matter. Just hearken to reason, if you please, dear Slayer, and tell me if the colony can make an unlawful law. Isn't an unlawful law more again nature than scalping a savage? A law can no more be unlawful than truth can be a lie. That sounds reasonable, but it has a most unreasonable bearing, hurry. Laws don't all come from the same quarter. God has given us his'n, and some come from the colony, and others come from the king and parliament. When the colony's laws, or even the king's laws, run again the laws of God, they get to be unlawful, and ought not to be obeyed. I hold to a white man's respecting white laws, so long as they do not cross the track of a law coming from a higher authority and for a red man to obey his own red-skin usages under the same privilege. But tis useless talking, as each man will think for himself, and have his say agreeable to his thoughts. Let us keep a good lookout for your friend Floating Tom, lest we pass him, as he lies hidden under this bushy shore." Deerslayer had not named the borders of the lake amiss. Along their whole length the smaller trees overhung the water, with their branches often dipping in the transparent element. The banks were steep, even from the narrow strand, and, as vegetation invariably struggles towards the light, 
The effect was precisely that at which the lover of the picturesque would have aimed, had the ordering of this glorious setting of forest been submitted to his control. The points and bays, too, were sufficiently numerous to render the outline broken and diversified. As the canoe kept close along the western side of the lake, with a view, as Hurry had explained to his companion, of reconnoitering for enemies, before he trusted himself too openly in sight, the expectations of the two adventurers were kept constantly on the stretch, as neither could foretell what the next turning of a point might reveal. Their progress was swift, the gigantic strength of Hurry enabling him to play with the light bark as if it had been a feather, while the skill of his companion almost equalized their usefulness, notwithstanding the disparity in natural means. Each time the canoe passed a point, Hurry turned a look behind him, expecting to see the ark anchored, or beached in the bay. He was fated to be disappointed, however, and they had got within a mile of the southern end of the lake or a distance of quite two leagues from the castle, which was now hidden from view by half a dozen intervening projections of the land, when he suddenly ceased paddling, as if uncertain in what direction next to steer. "'It is possible that the old chap has dropped into the river,' said Hurry after looking carefully along the whole of the eastern shore, which was about a mile distant, and open to his scrutiny for more than half its length. For he has taken to trapping considerable of late, and barring floodwood, he might drop down it a mile or so, though he would have a most scratching time in getting back again. "'Where is this outlet?' asked Deerslayer. "'I see no opening in the banks or the trees that looks as if it would let a river like the Susquehanna run through it. Ay, dear slayer, rivers are like human mortals, having small beginnings and ending with broad shoulders and wide mouths. You don't see the outlet because it passes atween high, steep banks, and the pines and hemlocks and basswoods hang over it, as a roof hangs over a house. If old Tom is not in the rat's cove, he must have burrowed in the river. We'll look for him first in the cove, and then we'll cross to the outlet." As they proceeded, Hurry explained that there was a shallow bay formed by a long, low point that had got the name of the Rat's Cove from the circumstance of its being a favorite haunt of the muskrat, and which offered so complete a cover for the ark that its owner was fond of lying in it, whenever he found it convenient. "'As a man never knows who may be his visitors in this part of the country,' continued Hurry, "'it's a great advantage to get a good look at them before they come too near.' Now it's war, such caution is more than commonly useful, since a Canada man or a Mingo might get into his hut afore he invited him. But Hutter is a first-rate look-outer, and can pretty much scent danger, as a hound scents the deer. I should think the castle so open that it would be sartain to draw enemies, if any happened to find the lake, a thing unlikely enough, I will allow, as it's off the trail of the forts and settlements. Why, dear slayer! I've got to believe that a man meets with enemies easier than he meets with friends. It's skearful to think for how many causes one gets to be your enemy, and for how few your friend. Some take up the hatchet because you don't think just as they think, other some because you run ahead of em in the same ideas. And I once knowed a vagabond that quarrelled with a friend because he didn't think him handsome. Now you're no monument in the way of beauty yourself, dear slayer and yet you wouldn't be so unreasonable as to become my enemy for just saying so. I'm as the good Lord made me, and I wish to be accounted no better, nor any worse. Good looks I may not have, that is to say, to a degree that the light-minded and vain crave, but I hope I'm not altogether without some recommend in the way of good conduct. There's few nobler-looking men to be seen than yourself, Hurry, and I know that I am not to expect any to turn their eyes on me, when such a one as you can be gazed on. But I do not know that a hunter is less expert with the rifle, or less to be relied on for food, because he doesn't wish to stop at every shining spring he may meet, to study his own countenance in the water." Here Harry burst into a fit of loud laughter, for while he was too reckless to care much about his own manifest physical superiority, he was well aware of it, and like most men who derive an advantage from the accidents of birth or nature, he was apt to think complacently on the subject, whenever it happened to cross his mind. "'No, no, dear Slayer, you're no beauty, as you will own yourself, if you'll look over the side of the canoe,' he cried. "'Jude will say that to your face, if you start her. 
for a parter tongue isn't to be found in any gal's head, in or out of the settlements, if you provoke her to use it. My advice to you is never to aggravate Judith, though you may tell anything to Hetty and she'll take it as meek as a lamb. No, Jude will be just as like as not to tell you her opinion concerning your looks. And if she does hurry, she will tell me no more than you have said already. You're not thickening up about a small remark, I hope, dear Slayer, when no harm is meant. You are not a beauty, as you must know, and why shouldn't friends tell each other these little trifles? If you was handsome, or ever like to be, I'd be one of the first to tell you of it, and that ought to content you. Now, if Jude was to tell me that I'm as ugly as a sinner, I'd take it as a sort of obligation, and try not to believe her. It's easy for them that nature has favored to jest about such matters, hurry though it is sometimes hard for others. I'll not deny, but I've had my cravings toward good looks. Yes, I have. But then I've always been able to get them down by considering how many I've known with fair outsides who have had nothing to boast of inwardly. I'll not deny, Hurry, that I often wish I'd been created more comely to the eye, and more like such a one as yourself in them particulars. But then I get the feelin' under by remembering how much better off I am in a great many respects than some fellow mortals. I might have been born lame, and unfit even for a squirrel hunt, or blind, which would have made me a burden on myself as well as on my friends, or without hearing, which would have totally unqualified me for ever campaigning or scouting, which I look forward to as part of a man's duty in troublesome times. Yes, yes, it's not pleasant, I will allow, to see them that's more comely, and more sought at her, and honored than yourself but it may all be born if a man looks the evil in the face, and don't mistake his gifts and his obligations. Hurry, in the main, was a good-hearted as well as good-natured fellow, and the self-abasement of his companion completely got the better of the passing feeling of personal vanity. He regretted the allusion he had made to the other's appearance, and endeavored to express as much, though it was done in the uncouth manner that belonged to the habits and opinions of the frontier. I meant no harm, dear Slayer, he answered, in a deprecating manner, and hope you'll forget what I've said. If you're not downright handsome, you've a certain look that says, plainer than any words, that all's right within. Then you set no value by looks, and will the sooner forgive any little slight to your appearance. I will not say that Jude will greatly admire you, for that might raise hopes that would only breed disappointment. But there's Hetty now, would be just as likely to find satisfaction in looking at you as in looking at any other man. Then you're altogether too grave and considerate-like to care much about Judith. For, though the gal is uncommon, she is so general in her admiration that a man need not be exalted because she happens to smile. I sometimes think the hussy loves herself better than she does anything else breathin'. If she did hurry, she'd do no more, I'm afeard, than most queens on their thrones and ladies in the towns, answered Deerslayer smiling and turning back towards his companion with every trace of feeling banished from his honest-looking and frank countenance. I never yet knowed even a Delaware of whom you might not say that much. But here is the end of the long pint you mentioned, and the rat's cove can't be far off. This point, instead of thrusting itself forward, like all the others, ran in a line with the main shore of the lake, which here swept within it, in a deep and retired bay circling round south again at the distance of a quarter of a mile, and crossed the valley, forming the southern termination of the water. In this bay Hurry felt almost certain of finding the ark, since, anchored behind the trees that covered the narrow strip of the point, it might have lain concealed from prying eyes an entire summer. So complete, indeed, was the cover in this spot, that a boat hauled close to the beach within the point and near the bottom of the bay could by any possibility be seen from only one direction, and that was from a densely wooded shore within the sweep of the water, where strangers would be little apt to go. "'We shall soon see the ark,' said Hurry, as the canoe glided round the extremity of the point, where the water was so deep as actually to appear black. "'He loves to burrow up among the rushes, and we shall be in his nest in five minutes, although the old fellow may be off among the traps himself.' March proved a false prophet. The canoe completely doubled the point, so as to enable the two travellers to command a view of the whole cove or bay, for it was more properly the last, 
and no object but those that nature had placed there became visible. The placid water swept round in a graceful curve, the rushes bent gently towards its surface, and the trees overhung it as usual, but all lay in the soothing and sublime solitude of a wilderness. The scene was such as a poet or an artist would have delighted in, but it had no charm for Hurry Harry, who was burning with impatience to get a sight of his light-minded beauty. The motion of the canoe had been attended with little or no noise, the frontiermen habitually getting accustomed to caution in most of their movements, and it now lay on the glassy water appearing to float in air, partaking of the breathing stillness that seemed to pervade the entire scene. At this instant a dry stick was heard cracking on the narrow strip of land that concealed the bay from the open lake. Both the adventurers started, and each extended a hand towards his rifle, the weapon never being out of reach of the arm. "'Twas too heavy for any light creature," whispered Hurry, "'and it sounded like the tread of a man.' "'Not so, not so,' returned Deerslayer. "'Twas, as you say, too heavy for one, but it was too light for the other. Put your paddle in the water, and send the canoe in, to that log. I'll land and cut off the creature's retreat up to the point, be it a mingo, or be it a muskrat." As Hurry complied, Deerslayer was soon on the shore, advancing into the thicket with a moccasined foot, and a caution that prevented the least noise. In a minute he was in the center of the narrow strip of land, and moving slowly down towards its end, the bushes rendering extreme watchfulness necessary. Just as he reached the center of the thicket, the dried twigs cracked again, and the noise was repeated at short intervals. As if some creature having life walked slowly towards the point. Hurry heard these sounds also, and pushing the canoe off into the bay, he seized his rifle to watch the result. A breathless minute succeeded, after which a noble buck walked out of the thicket, proceeded with a stately step to the sandy extremity of the point, and began to slake his thirst from the water of the lake. Hurry hesitated an instant, then raising his rifle hastily to his shoulder, he took sight and fired. The effect of this sudden interruption of the solemn stillness of such a scene was not its least striking peculiarity. The report of the weapon had the usual sharp, short sound of the rifle, but when a few moments of silence had succeeded the sudden crack, during which the noise was floating in air across the water, it reached the rocks of the opposite mountain, where the vibrations accumulated and were rolled from cavity to cavity for miles along the hills seeming to awaken the sleeping thunders of the woods. The buck merely shook his head at the report of the rifle and the whistling of the bullet, for never before had he come in contact with man, but the echoes of the hills awakened his distrust, and leaping forward with his four legs drawn under his body he fell at once into deep water, and began to swim towards the foot of the lake. Hurry shouted and dashed forward in chase and for one or two minutes the water foamed around the pursuer and the pursued. The former was dashing past the point, when Deerslayer appeared on the sand and signed him to return. "'Twas inconsiderate to pull a trigger, afore we had reconnoitred the shore, and made sartain that no enemies harboured near it," said the latter, as his companion slowly and reluctantly complied. "'This much I have learned from the Delawares, in the way of schooling and traditions even though I've never yet been on a warpath. And, moreover, venison can hardly be called in season now, and we do not want for food. They call me Deerslayer, I'll own, and perhaps I deserve the name, in the way of understanding the creature's habits, as well as for some certainty in the aim. But they can't accuse me of killing an animal when there is no occasion for the meat, or the skin. I may be a slayer, it's true, but I'm no slaughterer. "'Twas an awful mistake to miss that buck,' exclaimed Hurry, doffing his cap and running his fingers through his handsome but matted curls, as if he would loosen his tangled ideas by the process. I've not done so unhandy a thing since I was fifteen. Never lament it, as the creature's death could have done neither of us any good, and might have done us harm. Them echoes are more awful in my ears than your mistake, Hurry, for they sound like the voice of nature calling out again a wasteful and unthinking action. "'You'll hear plenty of such calls if you tarry long in this quarter of the world, lad,' returned the other, laughing. "'The echoes repeat pretty much all that is said or done in the glimmer-glass, in this calm summer weather, 
If a paddle falls you hear of it sometimes, again and again, as if the hills were mocking your clumsiness, and a laugh or a whistle comes out of them pines when they're in the humour to speak, in a way to make you believe they can rarely converse. So much the more reason for being prudent and silent. I do not think the enemy can have found their way into these hills yet, for I don't know what they are to gain by it. But all the Delawares tell me that, as courage is a warrior's first virtue, so is prudence his second. One such call from the mountains is enough to let a whole tribe into the secret of our arrival. If it does no other good, it will warn old Tom to put the pot over, and let him know visitors are at hand. Come, lad, get into the canoe, and we will hunt the ark up while there is yet day." Deerslayer complied, and the canoe left the spot. Its head was turned diagonally across the lake, pointing towards the southeastern curvature of the sheet. In that direction the distance to the shore, or to the termination of the lake, on the course the two were now steering, was not quite a mile, and their progress being always swift, it was fast lessening under the skilful but easy sweeps of the paddles. When about halfway across, a slight noise drew the eyes of the men towards the nearest land, and they saw that the buck was just emerging from the lake and wading towards the beach. In a minute the noble animal shook the water from his flanks, gazed upward at the covering of trees, and, bounding against the bank, plunged into the forest. "'That creature goes off with gratitude in his heart,' said Deerslayer, for nature tells him that he has escaped a great danger. You ought to have some of the same feelings, Hurry, to think your eye wasn't true, or that your hand was unsteady when no good could come of a shot that was intended unmeaningly rather than in reason. "'I deny the eye and the hand,' cried March with some heat. You've got a little character down among the Delawares there, for quickness and sartainty at a deer, but I should like to see you behind one of them pines, and a full-painted mingo behind another, each with a cocked rifle and a striving for the chance. Them's the situations, Nathaniel, to try the sight and the hand, for they begin with trying the narves. I never look upon killing a creature as an exploit, but killing a savage is. The time will come to try your hand. Now we've got to blows again, and we shall soon know what a venison reputation can do in the field. I deny that either hand or eye was unsteady. It was all a miscalculation of the buck, which stood still when he ought to have kept in motion, and so I shot ahead of him. Have it your own way, Hurry. All I contend for is that it's lucky. I dare say I shall not pull upon a human mortal as steadily or with as light a heart as I pull upon a deer. Who's talking of mortals, or of human beings at all, Deerslayer? I put the matter to you on the supposition of an engine. I dare say any man would have his feelings when it's got to be life or death, again another human mortal. But there would be no such scruples in regard to an engine, nothing but the chance of his hitting you, or the chance of your hitting him. I look upon the red men to be quite as human as we are ourselves, Hurry. They have their gifts and their religion, it's true. But that makes no difference in the end, when each will be judged according to his deeds, and not according to his skin. That's downright missionary, and will find little favor up in this part of the country, where the Moravians don't congregate. Now skin makes the man. This is reason. Else how are people to judge of each other? The skin is put on over all in order when a creature, or a mortal, is fairly seen, you may know at once what to make of him. You know a bear from a hog by his skin, and a gray squirrel from a black." "'True, Hurry,' said the other, looking back and smiling. Nevertheless, they are both squirrels." "'Who denies it? But you'll not say that a red man and a white man are both Injuns?' "'But I do say they are both men, men of different races and colors, and having different gifts and traditions. But in the main with the same nature. Both have souls and both will be held accountable for their deeds in this life." Hurry was one of those theorists who believed in the inferiority of all the human race who were not white. His notions on the subject were not very clear, nor were his definitions at all well settled, but his opinions were none the less dogmatical or fierce. His conscience accused him of sundry lawless acts against the Indians, and he had found it an exceedingly easy mode of quieting it by putting the whole family of red men incontinently without the category of human rights. 
Nothing angered him sooner than to deny his proposition, more especially if the denial were accompanied by a show of plausible argument, and he did not listen to his companion's remarks with much composure of either manner or feeling. "'You're a boy, dear Slayer, misled and misconsated by Delaware arts and missionary ignorance,' he exclaimed with his usual indifference to the forms of speech when excited. "'You may account yourself as a redskin's brother, but I hold em all to be animals, with nothing human about em but cunning. That they have, I'll allow. But so is a fox, or even a bear. I'm older than you, and have lived longer in the woods, or, for that matter, have lived always there, and am not to be told what an Injun is or what he is not. If you wish to be considered a savage, you've only to say so, and I'll name you as such to Judith and the old man, and then we'll see how you'll like your welcome." Here Hurry's imagination did his temper some service, since by conjuring up the reception his semi-aquatic acquaintance would be likely to bestow on one thus introduced, he burst into a hearty fit of laughter. Deerslayer too well knew the uselessness of attempting to convince such a being of anything against his prejudices to feel a desire to undertake the task. And he was not sorry that the approach of the canoe to the southeastern curve of the lake gave a new direction to his ideas. They were now, indeed, quite near the place that March had pointed out for the position of the outlet, and both began to look for it with a curiosity that was increased by the expectation of the ark. It may strike the reader as a little singular, that the place where a stream of any size passed through banks that had an elevation of some twenty feet, should be a matter of doubt with men who could not now have been more than two hundred yards distant from the precise spot. It will be recollected, however, that the trees and bushes here, as elsewhere, fairly overhung the water, making such a fringe to the lake as to conceal any little variations from its general outline. I've not been down at this end of the lake these two summers," said Hurry, standing up in the canoe, the better to look about him. Ay, there's the rock, showing its chin above the water, and I know that the river begins in its neighborhood." The men now plied the paddles again, and they were presently within a few yards of the rock, floating towards it, though their efforts were suspended. This rock was not large, being merely some five or six feet high, only half of which elevation rose above the lake. The incessant washing of the water for centuries had so rounded its summit that it resembled a large beehive in shape, its form being more than usually regular and even. Hurry remarked as they floated slowly past that this rock was well known to all the Indians in that part of the country, and that they were in the practice of using it as a mark to designate the place of meeting when separated by their hunts and marches. "'And here is the river, dear slayer," he continued though so shut in by trees and bushes as to look more like an and-bush than the outlet of such a sheet as the glimmer glass. Hurry had not badly described the place, which did truly seem to be a stream lying in ambush. The high banks might have been a hundred feet asunder, but on the western side a small bit of low land extended so far forward as to diminish the breadth of the stream to half that width. As the bushes hung in the water beneath, and pines that had the stature of church steeples rose in tall columns above, all inclining towards the light until their branches intermingled, the eye, at a little distance, could not easily detect any opening in the shore, to mark the egress of the water. In the forest above, no traces of this outlet were to be seen from the lake, the whole presenting the same connected and seemingly interminable carpet of leaves. As the canoe slowly advanced, sucked in by the current, it entered beneath an arch of trees, through which the light from the heavens struggled by casual openings, faintly relieving the gloom beneath. "'This is a natural ambush,' half-whispered Hurry, as if he felt that the place was devoted to secrecy and watchfulness. "'Depend on it. Old Tom has burrowed with the ark somewhere in this quarter. We will drop down with the current a short distance, and ferret him out.' "'This seems no place for a vessel of any size,' returned the other. It appears to me that we shall have hardly room enough for the canoe." Hurry laughed at the suggestion, and as it soon appeared, with reason, for the fringe of bushes immediately on the shore of the lake was no sooner passed than the adventurers found themselves in a narrow stream of a sufficient depth of limpid water with a strong current and a canopy of leaves upheld by arches composed of the limbs of hoary trees. Bushes lined the shores, as usual 
but they left sufficient space between them to admit the passage of anything that did not exceed twenty feet in width, and to allow of a perspective ahead of eight or ten times that distance. Neither of our two adventurers used his paddle, except to keep the light bark in the center of the current, but both watched each turning of the stream, of which there were two or three within the first hundred yards, with jealous vigilance. Turn after turn, however, was passed, and the canoe had dropped down with the current some little distance, when Hurry caught a bush, and arrested its movement so suddenly and silently as to denote some unusual motive for the act. Deerslayer laid his hand on the stock of his rifle as soon as he noted this proceeding, but it was quite as much with a hunter's habit as from any feeling of alarm. "'There the old fellow is!' whispered Hurry, pointing with a finger and laughing heartily, though he carefully avoided making a noise. "'Ratting it away, just as I supposed, up to his knees in the mud and water, looking to the traps and the bait. But for the life of me I can see nothing of the ark though I'll bet every skin I take this season Jude isn't trusting her pretty little feet in the neighborhood of that black mud. The gal's more likely to be braiding her hair by the side of some spring, where she can see her own good looks and collect scornful feelings agin us men. You overjudge young women, yes you do, Hurry, who as often bethink them of their failings as they do of their perfections. I dare to say this Judith now is no such admirer of herself, and no such scorner of our sex as you seem to think, and that she is quite as likely to be serving her father in the house, wherever that may be, as he is to be serving her among the traps. "'It's a pleasure to hear truth from a man's tongue if it be only once in a girl's life,' cried a pleasant, rich, and yet soft female voice, so near the canoe as to make both the listeners start. "'As for you, Master Hurry, Fair words are so apt to choke you, that I no longer expect to hear them from your mouth, the last you uttered sticking in your throat, and coming near to death. But I'm glad to see you keep better society than formerly, and that they who know how to esteem and treat women are not ashamed to journey in your company." As this was said, a singularly handsome and youthful female face was thrust through an opening in the leaves, within reach of Deerslayer's paddle. Its owner smiled graciously on the young man and the frown that she cast on Hurry, though simulated and pettish, had the effect to render her beauty more striking, by exhibiting the play of an expressive but capricious countenance, one that seemed to change from the soft to the severe, the mirthful to the reproving, with facility and indifference. A second look explained the nature of the surprise. Unwittingly the men had dropped alongside of the ark, which had been purposely concealed in bushes cut and arranged for the purpose and Judith Hutter had merely pushed aside the leaves that lay before a window in order to show her face and speak to them. End of chapter 3 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 4 of The Deerslayer this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 4 And that timid fawn starts not with fear when I steal to her secret bower, and that young May violet to me is dear, and I visit the silent streamlet near to look on the lovely flower. Bryant an Indian Story, two, eleven through fifteen. The Ark, as the floating habitation of the Hutters was generally called, was a very simple contrivance. A large flat or scow composed the buoyant part of the vessel, and in its center, occupying the whole of its breadth and about two-thirds of its length, stood a low fabric resembling the castle in construction though made of materials so light as barely to be bullet-proof. As the sides of the scow were a little higher than usual, and the interior of the cabin had no more elevation than was necessary for comfort, this unusual addition had neither a very clumsy nor a very obtrusive appearance. It was, in short, little more than a modern canal-boat, though more rudely constructed, of greater breadth than common, and bearing about it the signs of the wilderness in its bark-covered posts and roof. The scow, however, had been put together with some skill, being comparatively light for its strength, and sufficiently manageable. 
The cabin was divided into two apartments, one of which served for a parlor, and the sleeping-room of the father, and the other was appropriated to the uses of the daughters. A very simple arrangement sufficed for the kitchen, which was in one end of the scow, and removed from the cabin, standing in the open air, the ark being altogether a summer habitation. The and-bush, as Hurry in his ignorance of English termed it, is quite as easily explained. In many parts of the lake and river, where the banks were steep and high, the smaller trees and larger bushes, as has already been mentioned, fairly overhung the stream, their branches not unfrequently dipping into the water. In some instances they grew out in nearly horizontal lines, for thirty or forty feet. The water being uniformly deepest near the shores, where the banks were highest and the nearest to a perpendicular, Hutter had found no difficulty in letting the ark drop under one of these covers, where it had been anchored with a view to conceal its position, security requiring some such precautions in his view of the case. Once beneath the trees and bushes, a few stones fastened to the ends of the branches had caused them to bend sufficiently to dip into the river, and a few severed bushes, properly disposed, did the rest. The reader has seen that this cover was so complete as to deceive two men accustomed to the woods, and who were actually in search of those it concealed, a circumstance that will be easily understood by those who are familiar with the matted and wild luxuriance of a virgin American forest, more especially in a rich soil. The discovery of the ark produced very different effects on our two adventurers. As soon as the canoe could be got round to the proper opening, Hurry leaped on board, and in a minute was closely engaged in a gay and sort of recriminating discourse with Judith, apparently forgetful of the existence of all the rest of the world. Not so with Deerslayer. He entered the ark with a slow, cautious step, examining every arrangement of the cover with curious and scrutinizing eyes. It is true he cast one admiring glance at Judith, which was extorted by her brilliant and singular beauty but even this could detain him but a single instant from the indulgence of his interest in Hutter's contrivances. Step by step did he look into the construction of the singular abode, investigate its fastenings and strength, ascertain its means of defense, and make every inquiry that would be likely to occur to one whose thoughts dwelt principally on such expedients. Nor was the cover neglected. Of this he examined the whole minutely his commendation escaping him more than once in audible comments. Frontier usages admitting of this familiarity, he passed through the rooms, as he had previously done at the castle, and opening a door issued into the end of the scow opposite to that where he had left Hurry and Judith. Here he found the other sister, employed at some coarse needlework, seated beneath the leafy canopy of the cover. As Deerslayer's examination was by this time ended, he dropped the butt of his rifle, and leaning on the barrel with both hands, he turned towards the girl with an interest the singular beauty of her sister had not awakened. He had gathered from Hurry's remarks that Hetty was considered to have less intellect than ordinarily falls to the share of human beings, and his education among Indians had taught him to treat those who were thus afflicted by Providence with more than common tenderness. Nor was there anything in Hetty Hutter's appearance, as so often happens, to weaken the interest her situation excited. An idiot she could not properly be termed, her mind being just enough enfeebled to lose most of those traits that are connected with the most artful qualities, and to retain its ingenuousness and love of truth. It had often been remarked of this girl, by the few who had seen her, and who possessed sufficient knowledge to discriminate, that her perception of the right seemed almost intuitive while her aversion to the wrong formed so distinctive a feature of her mind as to surround her with an atmosphere of pure morality, peculiarities that are not infrequent with persons who are termed feeble-minded, as if God had forbidden the evil spirits to invade a precinct so defenseless, with the benign purpose of extending a direct protection to those who had been left without the usual aids of humanity. Her person, too, was agreeable, having a strong resemblance to that of her sister's, of which it was a subdued and humble copy. If it had none of the brilliancy of Judith's, the calm, quiet, almost holy expression of her meek countenance seldom failed to win on the observer, and few noted it long that did not begin to feel a deep and lasting interest in the girl. She had no color in common, 
nor was her simple mind apt to present images that caused her cheek to brighten, though she retained a modesty so innate that it almost raised her to the unsuspecting purity of a being superior to human infirmities. Guileless, innocent, and without distrust, equally by nature and from her mode of life, Providence had, nevertheless shielded her from harm, by a halo of moral light, as it is said to temper the wind to the shorn lamb. "'You are Hetty Hutter,' said Deerslayer, in the way one puts a question unconsciously to himself, assuming a kindness of tone and manner that were singularly adapted to win the confidence of her he addressed. "'Hurry Harry has told me of you, and I know you must be the child?' "'Yes, I'm Hetty Hutter,' returned the girl, in a low, sweet voice, which nature, aided by some education, had preserved from vulgarity of tone and utterance. "'I'm Hetty, Judith Hutter's sister, and Thomas Hutter's youngest daughter. I know your history, then, for Hurry Harry talks considerable, and he is free of speech when he can find other people's concerns to dwell on. You pass most of your life on the lake, Hetty.' "'Certainly. Mother is dead. Father is gone a-trapping, and Judith and I stay at home. What's your name?" "'That's a question more easily asked than it is answered, young woman, seeing that I'm so young, and yet have borne more names than some of the greatest chiefs in all America.' "'But you've got a name. You don't throw away one name before you come honestly by another.' "'I hope not, gal. I hope not. My names have come naturally and I suppose the one I bear now will be of no great lasting, since the Delawares seldom settle on a man's real title, until such time as he has an opportunity of showing his true nature in the council or on the warpath, which has never behappened me. Seeing firstly, because I am not born a redskin and have no right to sit in their counselings, and am much too humble to be called on for opinions from the great of my own color, and secondly, because this is the first war that has befallen in my time, and no enemy has yet inroaded far enough into the colony to be reached by an arm even longer than mine. "'Tell me your names,' added Hetty, looking up at him artlessly, "'and maybe I'll tell you your character.' "'There is some truth in that, I'll not deny, though it often fails. Men are deceived in other men's characters, and frequently given names they by no means deserve.' You can see the truth of this in the Mingo names, which in their own tongue signify the same things as the Delaware names. At least so they tell me, for I know little of that tribe unless it be by report, and no one can say they are as honest or as upright a nation. I put no great dependence, therefore, on names." "'Tell me all your names,' repeated the girl earnestly, for her mind was too simple to separate things from professions, and she did attach importance to a name. I want to know what to think of you. Well, sartain. I've no objection, and you shall hear them all. In the first place, then, I'm Christian, and white-born like yourself, and my parents had a name that came down from father to son as is part of their gifts. My father was called Bumpo, and I was named after him, of course, the given name being Nathaniel, or Natty, as most people saw fit to term it. Yes, yes, Natty. And Hetty interrupted the girl quickly, and looking up from her work again, with a smile, "'You are Natty, and I am Hetty, though you are Bumpo, and I am Hutter. Bumpo isn't as pretty as Hutter, is it?' "'Why, that's as people fancy. Bumpo has no lofty sound, I admit. And yet men have bumped through the world with it. I did not go by this name, howsoever very long, for the Delawares soon found out, or thought they found out, that I was not given to lying, and they called me, firstly, straight tongue. That's a good name, interrupted Hetty earnestly, and in a positive manner. Don't tell me there's no virtue in names. I do not say that, for perhaps I deserve to be so called, lies being no favorites with me, as they are with some. After a while they found out I was quick of foot, and then they called me the pigeon, which, you know, has a swift wing and flies in a straight line. That was a pretty name, exclaimed Hetty. Pigeons are pretty birds. Most things that God created are pretty in their way, my good gal, though they get to be deformed by mankind so as to change their natures as well as their appearance. From carrying messages and striking blind trails I got at last to following the hunters when it was thought I was quicker and surer at finding the game than most lads, and then they called me the lapier, 
as, they said, I partook of the sagacity of the hound. "'That's not so pretty,' answered Hetty. "'I hope you didn't keep that name long.' "'Not after I was rich enough to buy a rifle,' returned the other, betraying a little pride through his usually quiet and subdued manner. "'Then it was seen I could keep a wigwam in venison, and in time I got the name of Deerslayer, which is that I now bear. Homely as some will think it, who set more value on the scalp of a fellow-mortal than on the horns of a buck. "'Well, Deerslayer, I'm not one of them,' answered Hetty, simply. "'Judith likes soldiers, and flary coats, and fine feathers, but they're all naught to me. She says the officers are great, and gay, and of soft speech, but they make me shudder, for their business is to kill their fellow-creatures. I like your calling better, and your last name is a very good one, better than Natty Bumpo. "'This is natural, in one of your turn of mind, Hetty, and much as I should have expected. They tell me your sister is handsome, uncommon for a mortal, and beauty is apt to seek admiration.' "'Did you never see Judith?' demanded the girl, with quick earnestness. "'If you never have, go at once and look at her. Even Hurry Harry isn't more pleasant to look at, though she is a woman, and he is a man.' Deerslayer regarded the girl for a moment with concern. Her pale face had flushed a little, and her eye, usually so mild and serene, brightened as she spoke, in the way to betray the inward impulses. "'Aye!' Hurry, Harry, he muttered to himself, as he walked through the cabin towards the other end of the boat. This comes of good looks if a light tongue has had no concern in it. It's easy to see which way that poor creature's feelin's are leanin', whatever may be the case with your Jude's. But an interruption was put to the gallantry of Hurry, the coquetry of his intros, the thoughts of Deerslayer, and the gentle feelings of Hetty, by the sudden appearance of the canoe of the ark's owner in the narrow opening among the bushes that served as a sort of moat to his position. It would seem that Hutter, or Floating Tom, as he was familiarly called by all the hunters who knew his habits, recognized the canoe of hurry, for he expressed no surprise at finding him in the scow. On the contrary, his reception was such as to denote not only gratification, but a pleasure, mingled with a little disappointment at his not having made his appearance some days sooner. "'I looked for you last week,' he said, in a half-grumbling, half-welcoming manner, "'and was disappointed uncommonly that you didn't arrive. There came a runner through to warn all the trappers and hunters that the colony and the Canadas were again in trouble, and I felt lonesome up in these mountains, with three scalps to see to, and only one pair of hands to protect them.' "'That's reasonable,' returned March, and it was feeling like a parent. No doubt, if I had two such darters as Judith and Hetty, my experience would tell the same story. Though, in general, I am just as well satisfied with having the nearest neighbor fifty miles off, as when he is within call. Notwithstanding, you didn't choose to come into the wilderness alone, now you knew that the Canada savages are likely to be stirring," returned Hutter, giving a sort of distrustful and at the same time inquiring glance at Deerslayer. Why should I? They say a bad companion, on a journey, helps to shorten the path. And this young man I account to be a reasonably good one. This is Deerslayer, old Tom, a noted hunter among the Delawares, and Christian-born, and Christian-educated, too, like you and me. The lad is not perfect, perhaps, but there's worse men in the country that he came from, and it's likely he'll find some that's no better in this part of the world. Should we have occasion to defend our traps and the territory, he'll be useful in feeding us all for he's a regular dealer in venison. "'Young man, you are welcome,' growled Tom, thrusting a hard, bony hand towards the youth, as a pledge of his sincerity. "'In such times a white face is a friend's, and I count on you as a support. Children sometimes make a stout heart feeble, and these two daughters of mine give me more concern than all my traps, and skins, and rights in the country.' "'That's natural,' cried Hurry. "'Yes, dear Slayer, you and I don't know it yet by experience, but on the whole I consider that as natural. If we are darters, it's more than probable we should have some such feelin's, and I honor the man that owns em. As for Judith, old man, I enlist at once as her soldier, and here is Deerslayer to help you take care of Hetty." "'Many thanks to you, Master March,' returned the beauty, in a full rich voice, and with an accuracy of intonation and utterance that she shared in common with her sister and which showed that she had been better taught than her father's life and appearance would give reason to expect. "'Many thanks to you. 
but Judith Hutter has the spirit and the experience that will make her depend more on herself than on good-looking rovers like you. Should there be need to face the savages, do you land with my father instead of burrowing in the huts under the show of defending us females, and— "'Girl, girl,' interrupted the father, "'quiet that glib tongue of thine, and hear the truth. There are savages on the lake shore already, and no man can say how near to us they may be at this very moment, or when we may hear more from them. If this be true, Master Hutter, said Hurry, whose change of countenance denoted how serious he deemed the information, though it did not denote any unmanly alarm, if this be true, your ark is in a most misfortunate position, for, though the cover did deceive Deerslayer and myself, it would hardly be overlooked by a full-blooded Injun, who was out seriously in search of scalps. I think as you do, Hurry, and wish, with all my heart, we lay anywhere else at this moment than in this narrow, crooked stream, which has many advantages to hide in, but which is almost fatal to them that are discovered. The savages are near us, moreover, and the difficulty is to get out of the river without being shot down like deer standing at a lick. "'Are you certain, Master Hutter, that the redskins you dread are real Canadas?' asked Deerslayer, in a modest but earnest manner. "'Have you seen any, and can you describe their paint?' I have fallen in with the signs of their being in the neighborhood, but have seen none of them. I was downstream a mile or so, looking to my traps, when I struck a fresh trail, crossing the corner of a swamp, and moving northward. The man had not passed an hour, and I noted it for an Indian footstep by the size of the foot, and the in-toe, even before I found a worn moccasin which its owner had dropped as useless. For that matter I found the spot where he halted to make a new one which was only a few yards from the place where he had dropped the old one. "'That doesn't look much like a redskin on the war-path,' returned the other, shaking his head. "'An experienced warrior, at least, would have burned or buried or sunk in the river such signs of his passage. And your trail is, quite likely, a peaceable trail. But the moccasin may greatly relieve my mind if you bethought you of bringing it off. I've come here to meet a young chief myself.' and his course would be much in the direction you've mentioned. The trail may have been his'n. Hurry, Harry, you're well acquainted with this young man, I hope, who has meetings with savages in a part of the country where he has never been before," demanded Hutter, in a tone and in a manner that sufficiently indicated the motive of the question, these rude beings seldom hesitating on the score of delicacy to betray their feelings. Treachery is an Indian virtue and the whites that live much in their tribes soon catch their ways and practices. True, true is the gospel, old Tom, but not personable to Deerslayer, who's a young man of truth, if he has no other recommend. I'll answer for his honesty whatever I may do for his valor in battle. I should like to know his errand in this strange quarter of the country. That is soon told, Master Hutter, said the young man, with the composure of one who kept a clean conscience. I think, moreover, you've a right to ask it. The father of two such darters, who occupies a lake after your fashion, has just the same right to inquire into a stranger's business in his neighborhood, as the colony would have to demand the reason why the Frenchers put more regiments than common along the lines. No, no, I'll not deny your right to know why a stranger comes into your habitation or country, in times as serious as these. If such is your way of thinking, friend, let me hear your story without more words. It is soon told, as I said before, and shall be honestly told. I'm a young man, and, as yet, have never been on a war-path. But no sooner did the news come among the Delawares that wampum and a hatchet were about to be sent in to the tribe, than they wished me to go out among the people of my own color, and get the exact state of things for them. This I did, and, after delivering my talk to the chiefs, on my return, I met an officer of the Crown on the Skohari who had messages to send to some of the friendly tribes that live farther west. This was thought a good occasion for Chingachgook, a young chief who has never struck a foe, and myself, to go on our first war-path in company. And an appointment was made for us, by an old Delaware, to meet at the rock near the foot of this lake. I'll not deny that Chingachgook has another object in view, but it has no concern with any here, and is his secret and not mine. Therefore, I'll say no more about it. "'Tis something about a young woman,' interrupted Judith hastily, then laughing at her own impetuosity, 
and even having the grace to color a little at the manner in which she had betrayed her readiness to impute such a motive. If tis neither war, nor a hunt, it must be love. Aye, it comes easy for the young and handsome, who hear so much of them feelin's, to suppose that they lie at the bottom of most proceedings. But on that head I say nothing. Chingachgook is to meet me at the rock, an hour before sunset to-morrow evening, after which we shall go our way together, molesting none but the king's enemies, who are lawfully our own. Knowing hurry of old, who once trapped in our hunting-grounds, and falling in with him on the Skohari, just as he was on the point of starting for his summer haunts, we agreed to journey in company, not so much from fear of the Mingos as from good fellowship, and, as he says, to shorten a long road. "'And you think the trail I saw may have been that of your friend ahead of his time?' said Hutter. "'That's my idea, which may be wrong, but which may be right. If I saw the moccasin, howsever, I could tell in a minute whether it is made in the Delaware fashion or not. Here it is, then, said the quick-witted Judith, who had already gone to the canoe in quest of it. Tell us what it says, friend or enemy. You look honest, and I believe all you say, whatever father may think. That's the way with you, Jude, forever finding out friends where I distrust foes, grumbled Tom. But speak out, young man, and tell us what you think of the moccasin. That's not Delaware made, returned Deerslayer examining the worn and rejected covering for the foot with a cautious eye. I'm too young on a warpath to be positive, but I should say that moccasin has a northern look, and comes from beyond the great lakes. If such is the case, we ought not to lie here a minute longer than is necessary, said Hutter, glancing through the leaves of his cover, as if he already distrusted the presence of an enemy on the opposite shore of the narrow and sinuous stream. It wants but an hour or so of night and to move in the dark will be impossible, without making a noise that would betray us. Did you hear the echo of a piece in the mountains, half an hour since?" "'Yes, old man, and heard the piece itself,' answered Hurry, who now felt the indiscretion of which he had been guilty, for the last was fired from my own shoulder. I feared it came from the French Indians. Still it may put them on the lookout, and be a means of discovering us. You did wrong to fire in more time, unless there was good occasion. So I begin to think myself, Uncle Tom. And yet, if a man can't trust himself to let off his rifle in a wilderness that is a thousand miles square, lest some enemy should hear it, where's the use in carrying one?" Hutter now held a long consultation with his two guests, in which the parties came to a true understanding of their situation. He explained the difficulty that would exist in attempting to get the ark out of so swift and narrow a stream, in the dark, without making a noise that could not fail to attract Indian ears. Any strollers in their vicinity would keep near the river or the lake, but the former had swampy shores in many places, and was both so crooked and so fringed with bushes that it was quite possible to move by daylight without incurring much danger of being seen. More was to be apprehended, perhaps, from the ear than from the eye, especially as long as they were in the short, straightened, and canopied reaches of the stream. I never drop down into this cover, which is handy to my traps, and safer than the lake from curious eyes, without providing the means of getting out again," continued this singular being. And that is easier done by a pull than a push. My anchor is now lying above the suction, in the open lake, and here is a line, you see, to haul us up to it. Without some such help, a single pair of hands would make heavy work in forcing a scow like this upstream. I have a sort of a crab, too, that lightens the pull on occasion. Jude can use the oar astern as well as myself, and when we fear no enemy, to get out of the river gives us but little trouble." "'What should we gain, Master Hutter, by changing the position?' asked Deerslayer, with a good deal of earnestness. This is a safe cover, and a stout defence might be made from inside of this cabin. I've never fought unless in the way of tradition, but it seems to me we might beat off twenty Mingos with palisades like them afore us. Ay, ay, you've never fought except in traditions, that's plain enough, young man. Did you ever see as broad a sheet of water as this above us, before you came in upon it with hurry?" "'I can't say that I ever did,' Deerslayer answered, modestly. Youth is the time to learn, and I'm far from wishing to raise my voice in counsel afore it is justified by experience." Well, then. I'll teach you the disadvantage of fighting in this position, and the advantage of taking to the open lake. 
Here, you may see, the savages will know where to aim every shot, and it would be too much to hope that some would not find their way through the crevices of the logs. Now, on the other hand, we should have nothing but a forest to aim at. Then we are not safe from fire, here, the bark of this roof being little better than so much kindling wood. The castle, too, might be entered and ransacked in my absence, and all my possessions overrun and destroyed. Once in the lake, we can be attacked only in boats or on rafts. Shall have a fair chance with the enemy, and can protect the castle with the ark. Do you understand this reasoning, youngster? It sounds well. Yes, it has a rational sound, and I'll not gainsay it. Well, old Tom, cried Hurry, if we are to move, the sooner we make a beginning, the sooner we shall know whether we are to have our scalps for nightcaps or not. As this proposition was self-evident, no one denied its justice. The three men, after a short preliminary explanation, now set about their preparations to move the ark in earnest. The slight fastenings were quickly loosened, and, by hauling on the line, the heavy craft slowly emerged from the cover. It was no sooner free from the encumbrance of the branches than it swung into the stream, shearing quite close to the western shore, by the force of the current. Not a soul on board heard the rustling of the branches as the cabin came against the bushes and trees of the western bank, without a feeling of uneasiness, for no one knew at what moment, or in what place, a secret and murderous enemy might unmask itself. Perhaps the gloomy light that still struggled through the impending canopy of leaves, or found its way through the narrow ribbon-like opening, which seemed to mark in the air above the course of the river that flowed beneath, aided in augmenting the appearance of the danger. For it was little more than sufficient to render objects visible, without giving up all their outlines at a glance. Although the sun had not absolutely set, it had withdrawn its direct rays from the valley and the hues of evening were beginning to gather around objects that stood uncovered, rendering those within the shadows of the woods still more sombre and gloomy. No interruption followed the movement, however, and as the men continued to haul on the line, the ark passed steadily ahead, the great breadth of the scow preventing its sinking into the water, and from offering much resistance to the progress of the swift element beneath its bottom. Hutter, too, had adopted a precaution suggested by experience which might have done credit to a seaman, and which completely prevented any of the annoyances and obstacles which otherwise would have attended the short turns of the river. As the ark descended, heavy stones attached to the line were dropped in the center of the stream, forming local anchors, each of which was kept from dragging by the assistance of those above it, until the uppermost of all was reached which got its backing from the anchor or grapnel that lay well out in the lake. In consequence of this expedient, the ark floated clear of the encumbrances of the shore, against which it would otherwise have been unavoidably hauled at every turn, producing embarrassments that Hutter, single-handed, would have found it very difficult to overcome. Favored by this foresight and stimulated by the apprehension of discovery, Floating Tom and his two athletic companions hauled the ark ahead with quite as much rapidity as comported with the strength of the line. At every turn in the stream a stone was raised from the bottom, when the direction of the scow changed to one that pointed towards the stone that lay above. In this manner, with the channel buoyed out for him, as a sailor might term it, did Hutter move forward, occasionally urging his friends, in a low and guarded voice, to increase their exertions and then, as occasions offered, warning them against efforts that might, at particular moments, endanger all by too much zeal. In spite of their long familiarity with the woods, the gloomy character of the shaded river added to the uneasiness that each felt, and when the ark reached the first bend in the Susquehanna, and the eye caught a glimpse of the broader expanse of the lake, all felt a relief that perhaps none would have been willing to confess. Here the last stone was raised from the bottom, and the line led directly towards the grapnel, which, as Hutter had explained, was dropped above the suction of the current. "'Thank God!' ejaculated Hurry. "'There is daylight, and we shall soon have a chance of seeing our enemies, if we are to feel them. "'That is more than you or any man can say,' growled Hutter. "'There is no spot so likely to harbor a party as the shore around the outlet, and the moment we clear these trees and get into open water will be the most trying time since it will leave the enemy a cover, while it puts us out of one. 
Judith, girl, do you and Hetty leave the oar to take care of itself, and go within the cabin, and be mindful not to show your faces at a window, for they who will look at them won't stop to praise their beauty. And now, hurry, we'll step into this outer room ourselves, and haul through the door, where we shall all be safe, from a surprise, at least. Friend Deerslayer, as the current is lighter, and the line has all the strain on it that is prudent, do you keep moving from window to window, taking care not to let your head be seen, if you set any value on life. No one knows when or where we shall hear from our neighbors. Deerslayer complied, with a sensation that had nothing in common with fear, but which had all the interest of a perfectly novel and a most exciting situation. For the first time in his life he was in the vicinity of enemies, or had good reason to think so. And that, too, under all the thrilling circumstances of Indian surprises and Indian artifices. As he took his stand at the window, the ark was just passing through the narrowest part of the stream, a point where the water first entered what was properly termed the river, and where the trees fairly interlocked overhead, causing the current to rush into an arch of verdure. A feature as appropriate and peculiar to the country, perhaps, as that of Switzerland, where the rivers come rushing, literally, from chambers of ice. The ark was in the act of passing the last curve of this leafy entrance, as Deerslayer, having examined all that could be seen of the eastern bank of the river, crossed the room to look from the opposite window, at the western. His arrival at this aperture was most opportune, for he had no sooner placed his eye at a crack, than a sight met his gaze that might well have alarmed a sentinel so young and inexperienced. A sapling overhung the water, in nearly half a circle, having first grown towards the light, and then been pressed down into this form by the weight of the snows, a circumstance of common occurrence in the American woods. On this no less than six Indians had already appeared, others standing ready to follow them as they left room, each evidently bent on running out on the trunk, and dropping on the roof of the ark as it passed beneath. This would have been an exploit of no great difficulty, the inclination of the tree admitting of an easy passage, the adjoining branches offering ample support for the hands, and the fall being too trifling to be apprehended. When Deerslayer first saw this party, it was just unmasking itself by ascending the part of the tree nearest to the earth, or that which was much the most difficult to overcome and his knowledge of Indian habits told him at once that they were all in their war-paint, and belonged to a hostile tribe. "'Pull, hurry!' he cried. "'Pull for your life, and as you love Judith Hutter! Pull, man, pull!' This call was made to one that the young man knew had the strength of a giant. It was so earnest and solemn that both Hutter and March felt it was not idly given, and they applied all their force to the line simultaneously, and at a most critical moment. The scow redoubled its motion, and seemed to glide from under the tree as if conscious of the danger that was impending overhead. Perceiving that they were discovered, the Indians uttered the fearful war-hoop, and running forward on the tree, leaped desperately towards their fancied prize. There were six on the tree, and each made the effort. All but their leader fell into the river more or less distant from the ark, as they came, sooner or later, to the leaping-place. The chief, who had taken the dangerous post in advance, having an earlier opportunity than the others, struck the scow just within the stern. The fall proving so much greater than he had anticipated, he was slightly stunned, and for a moment he remained half-bent and unconscious of his situation. At this instant Judith rushed from the cabin, her beauty heightened by the excitement that produced the bold act, which flushed her cheek to crimson, and, throwing all her strength into the effort, she pushed the intruder over the edge of the scow, headlong into the river. This decided feat was no sooner accomplished than the woman resumed her sway. Judith looked over the stern to ascertain what had become of the man, and the expression of her eyes softened to concern, next, her cheek crimsoned between shame and surprise at her own temerity, and then she laughed in her own merry and sweet manner. All this occupied less than a minute when the arm of Deerslayer was thrown around her waist, and she was dragged swiftly within the protection of the cabin. This retreat was not effected too soon. Scarcely were the two in safety, when the forest was filled with yells, and bullets began to patter against the logs. The ark being in swift motion all this while, it was beyond the danger of pursuit by the time these little events had occurred, and the savages, as soon as the first burst of their anger had subsided, ceased firing, with the consciousness that they were expending their ammunition in vain. When the scow came up over her grapnel, 
Hutter tripped the latter in a way not to impede the motion, and being now beyond the influence of the current, the vessel continued to drift ahead, until fairly in the open lake, though still near enough to the land to render exposure to a rifle bullet dangerous. Hutter and March got out two small sweeps, and, covered by the cabin, they soon urged the ark far enough from the shore to leave no inducement to their enemies to make any further attempt to injure them. End of chapter 4 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 5 of The Deerslayer this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 5 Why, let the strucken deer go weep, the heart ungalled play. For some must watch while some must sleep, thus runs the world away. Hamlet Act 3, Scene 2 lines 271 through 274. Another consultation took place in the forward part of the scow, at which both Judith and Hetty were present. As no danger could now approach unseen, immediate uneasiness had given place to the concern which attended the conviction that enemies were in considerable force on the shores of the lake, and that they might be sure no practicable means of accomplishing their own destruction would be neglected. As a matter of course, Hutter felt these truths the deepest, his daughters having an habitual reliance on his resources, and knowing too little to appreciate fully all the risks they ran. While his male companions were at liberty to quit him at any moment they saw fit. His first remark showed that he had an eye to the latter circumstance, and might have betrayed, to a keen observer, the apprehension that was just then uppermost. "'We've a great advantage over the Iroquois, or the enemy, whoever they are, in being afloat,' he said. "'There's not a canoe on the lake that I don't know where it's hid. And now yours is here. Hurry, there are but three more on the land, and they're so snug in hollow logs that I don't believe the Indians could find them. Let them try ever so long.' "'There's no telling that. No one can say that,' put in Deerslayer. A hound is not more sartain on the scent than a redskin, when he expects to get anything by it. Let this party see scalps afore em, or plunder, or honor according to their ideas of what honor is, and twill be a tight log that hides a canoe from their eyes. "'You're right, dear slayer,' cried Harry March. "'You're downright gospel in this matter, and I rejoice that my bunch of bark is safe enough here, within reach of my arm.' I calculate they'll be at all the rest of the canoes afore to-morrow night, if they are in rail earnest to smoke you out, old Tom, and we may as well overhaul our paddles for a pull." Hutter made no immediate reply. He looked about him in silence for quite a minute, examining the sky, the lake, and the belt of forest which enclosed it, as it might be hermetically, like one consulting their signs, nor did he find any alarming symptoms. The boundless woods were sleeping in the deep repose of nature, the heavens were placid but still luminous with the light of the retreating sun, while the lake looked more lovely and calm than it had before done that day. It was a scene altogether soothing, and of a character to lull the passions into a species of holy calm. How far this effect was produced, however, on the party in the ark, must appear in the progress of our narrative. Judith called out the father, when he had taken this close but short survey of the omens. Night is at hand. Find our friend's food. A long march gives a sharp appetite. We're not starving, Master Hutter, March observed, for we filled up just as we reached the lake. And for one, I prefer the company of Jude even to her supper. This quiet evening is very agreeable to sit by her side. Nature is nature, objected Hutter, and must be fed. Judith, see to the meal and take your sister to help you. I've a little discourse to hold with you, friends," he continued, as soon as his daughters were out of hearing, and wish the girls away. You see my situation, and I should like to hear your opinions concerning what is best to be done. Three times have I been burnt out already, but that was on the shore, and I've considered myself as pretty safe ever since I got the castle built, and the ark afloat. My other accidents, however, 
happened in peaceable times, being nothing more than such flurries as a man must meet with, in the woods. But this matter looks serious, and your ideas would greatly relieve my mind. It's my notion, old Tom, that you and your huts and your traps and your whole possessions here away are in desperate jeopardy," returned the matter-of-fact Hurry, who saw no use in concealment. According to my ideas of valley, they're altogether not worth half as much to-day as they was yesterday, nor would I give more for em taking the pay in skins. Then I've children," continued the father, making the allusion in a way that it might have puzzled even an indifferent observer to say was intended as a bait, or as an exclamation of paternal concern. Daughters, as you know, Hurry, and good girls, too, I may say, though I am their father. A man may say anything, Master Hutter, particularly when pressed by time and circumstances. You've darters, as you say, and one of them hasn't her equal on the frontiers for good looks, whatever she may have for good behavior. As for poor Hetty, she's Hetty Hutter, and that's as much as one can say about the poor thing. Give me Jude, if her conduct was only equal to her looks. I see, Harry March, that I can only count on you as a fair-weather friend, and I suppose that your companion will be of the same way of thinking," returned the other, with a slight show of pride, that was not altogether without dignity. Well, I must depend on Providence, which will not turn a deaf ear, perhaps, to a father's prayers. If you've understood hurry here to mean that he intends to desert you, said Deerslayer, with an earnest simplicity that gave double assurance of its truth, I think you do him injustice, as I know you do me, in supposing I would follow him, was he so untrue-hearted as to leave a family of his own color in such a strait as this. I've come on this lake, Master Hutter, to rendezvous a friend, and I only wish he was here himself, as I make no doubt he will be at sunset to-morrow when you'd have another rifle to aid you. An inexperienced one, I'll allow, like my own, but one that has proved true so often agin the game, big and little, that I'll answer for its service agin mortals." "'May I depend on you to stand by me and my daughters, then, Deerslayer?' demanded the old man, with a father's anxiety in his countenance. "'That may you, Floating Tom, if that's your name, and as a brother would stand by a sister, a husband his wife, or a suitor his sweetheart. In this strait you may count on me, through all adversities, and I think Hurry does discredit to his nature and wishes, if you can't count on him." "'Not he!' cried Judith, thrusting her handsome face out of the door. "'His nature is Hurry, as well as his name, and he'll hurry off as soon as he thinks his fine figure in danger. Neither old Tom nor his gals will depend much on Master March, now they know him, but you they will rely on, dear Slayer for your honest face and honest heart tell us that what you promise you will perform." This was said as much, perhaps, in affected scorn for hurry as in sincerity. Still, it was not said without feeling. The fine face of Judith sufficiently proved the latter circumstance, and if the conscious March fancied that he had never seen in it a stronger display of contempt, a feeling in which the beauty was apt to indulge, then while she was looking at him, it certainly seldom exhibited more of a womanly softness and sensibility than when her speaking blue eyes were turned on his travelling companion. "'Leave us, Judith,' Hutter ordered sternly, before either of the young men could reply. "'Leave us, and do not return until you come with the venison and fish. The girl has been spoilt by the flattery of the officers, who sometimes find their way up here, Master March, and you'll not think any harm of her silly words. "'You never said truer syllable, old Tom,' retorted Hurry, who smarted under Judith's observations. "'The devil-tongued youngsters of the garrison have proved her undoing. I scarce know Jude any longer, and shall soon take to admiring her sister, who is getting to be much more to my fancy. I'm glad to hear this, Harry, and look upon it as a sign that you're coming to your right senses. Hetty would make a much safer and more rational companion than Jude, and would be much the most likely to listen to your suit as the officers have, I greatly fear, unsettled her sister's mind. "'No man needs a safer wife than Hetty,' said Hurry, laughing, though I'll not answer for her being of the most rational. But no matter. Deerslayer has not misconceived me when he told you I should be found at my post. I'll not quit you, Uncle Tom, just now, whatever may be my feelings and intentions respecting your eldest starter. 
Hurry had a respectable reputation for prowess among his associates, and Hutter heard this pledge with a satisfaction that was not concealed. Even the great personal strength of such an aid came of moment, in moving the ark, as well as in the species of hand-to-hand -hand conflicts, that were not unfrequent in the woods, and no commander who was hard-pressed could feel more joy at hearing of the arrival of reinforcements than the borderer experienced at being told this important auxiliary was not about to quit him. A minute before, Hutter would have been well content to compromise his danger, by entering into a compact to act only on the defensive. But no sooner did he feel some security on this point, than the restlessness of man induced him to think of the means of carrying the war into the enemy's country. "'High prices are offered for scalps on both sides,' he observed, with a grim smile, as if he felt the force of the inducement at the very time he wished to effect a superiority to earning money by means that the ordinary feelings of those who aspire to be civilized men repudiated, even while they were adopted. It isn't right, perhaps, to take gold for human blood. And yet, when mankind is busy in killing one another, there can be no great harm in adding a little bit of skin to the plunder. What's your sentiments, Harry, touching these points? that you've made a vast mistake, old man, in calling savage blood human blood at all. I think no more of a redskin's scalp than I do of a pair of wolf's ears, and would just as leave finger money for the one as for the other. With white people tis different, for they've a natural aversion to being scalped, whereas your Indian shaves his head in readiness for the knife, and leaves a lock of hair by way of braggadocio, that one can lay hold of in the bargain. That's manly, however and I felt from the first that we had only to get you on our side to have your heart and hand," returned Tom, losing all his reserve, as he gained a renewed confidence in the disposition of his companions. Something more may turn up from this inroad of redskins than they bargained for. Deerslayer, I conclude you're of Hurry's way of thinking, and look upon money earned in this way as being as likely to pass as money earned in trapping or hunting. I've no such feelin' nor any wish to harbor it, not I," returned the other. My gifts are not scalper's gifts, but such as belong to my religion and color. I'll stand by you, old man, in the ark or in the castle, the canoe or the woods, but I'll not unhumanize my nature by falling into ways that God intended for another race. If you and Hurry have got any thoughts that lean towards the colony's gold, go by yourselves in search of it, and leave the females to my care much as I must differ from you both on all gifts that do not properly belong to a white man, we shall agree that it is the duty of the strong to take care of the weak, especially when the last belong to them that nature intended man to protect and console by his gentleness and strength." "'Hurry, Harry, that is a lesson you might learn and practice on to some advantage,' said the sweet but spirited voice of Judith from the cabin, a proof that she had overheard all that had hitherto been said. "'No more of this, Jude,' called out the father angrily. "'Move farther off. We are about to talk of matters unfit for a woman to listen to.' Hutter did not take any steps, however, to ascertain whether he was obeyed or not. But dropping his voice a little, he pursued the discourse. "'The young man is right, Hurry,' he said, "'and we can leave the children in his care. Now my idea is just this, and I think you'll agree that it is rational and correct. There's a large party of these savages on shore, and, though I didn't tell it before the girls, for they're womanish and apt to be troublesome when anything like real work is to be done, there's women among em. This I know from moccasin prints, and tis likely they are hunters, after all, who have been out so long that they know nothing of the war, or of the bounties. In which case, old Tom, why was their first salute an attempt to cut our throats? We don't know that their design was so bloody. It's natural and easy for an Indian to fall into ambushes and surprises, and no doubt they wish to get on board the ark first, and to make their conditions afterwards. That a disappointed savage should fire at us is in rule, and I think nothing of that. Besides, how often they burned me out, and robbed my traps, aye, and pulled trigger on me, in the most peaceful times. The blackguards will do such things, I must allow, and we pay em off pretty much in their own sin and, so far, there's reason in your ID. "'Nor would a hunter be in his war-paint,' returned Deerslayer. "'I saw the Mingos, and I know that they are out on the trail of mortal men, and not for beaver or deer.' 
"'There you have it again, old fellow,' said Hurry. "'In the way of an eye, now, I'd as soon trust this young man as trust the oldest settler in the colony. If he says paint, why paint it was.' Then a hunting party and a war party have met, for women must have been with them. It's only a few days since the runner went through with the tidings of the troubles, and it may be that warriors have come out to call in their women and children, to get an early blow. That would stand the courts, and is just the truth, cried Hurry. You got it now, old Tom, and I should like to hear what you mean to make out of it. The bounty, returned the other, looking up at his attentive companion in a cool, sullen manner in which, however, heartless cupidity and indifference to the means were far more conspicuous than any feelings of animosity or revenge. If there's women, there's children, and big and little have scalps. The colony pays for all alike. More shame to it that it should do so, interrupted Deerslayer. More shame to it that it don't understand its gifts, and pay greater attention to the will of God. "'Hearken to reason, lad, and don't cry out afore you understand a case,' returned the unmoved hurry. "'The savages scalp your friends, the Delawares or Mohicans, whichever they may be, among the rest. And why shouldn't we scalp? I will own it would be again right for you and me now to go into the settlements and bring out scalps. But it's a very different matter as concerns Indians. A man shouldn't take scalps if he isn't ready to be scalped himself, on fitting occasions. One good turn deserves another.' the world over. That's reason, and I believe it to be good religion." "'I, Mr. Hurry,' again interrupted the rich voice of Judith, "'is it religion to say that one bad turn deserves another?' "'I'll never reason again you, Judy, for you beat me with beauty, if you can't with sense. Here's the Canadas paying their engines for scalps, and why not we pay—' "'Our Indians!' exclaimed the girl, laughing with a sort of melancholy merriment. "'Father! Father! Think no more of this, and listen to the advice of Deerslayer, who has a conscience, which is more than I can say or think of Harry March." Hutter now rose, and entering the cabin he compelled his daughters to go into the adjoining room, when he secured both the doors, and returned. Then he and Hurry pursued the subject, but as the purport of all that was material in this discourse will appear in the narrative, it need not be related here in detail. The reader, however, can have no difficulty in comprehending the morality that presided over their conference. It was, in truth, that which, in some form or other, rules most of the acts of men, and in which the controlling principle is that one wrong will justify another. Their enemies paid for scalps, and this was sufficient to justify the colony for retaliating. It is true, the French used the same argument a circumstance, as Hurry took occasion to observe, in answer to one of Deerslayer's objections, that proved its truth, as mortal enemies would not be likely to have recourse to the same reason unless it were a good one. But neither Hutter nor Hurry was a man likely to stick at trifles in matters connected with the right of the Aborigines, since it is one of the consequences of aggression that it hardens the conscience, as the only means of quieting it. In the most peaceable state of the country, a species of warfare was carried on between the Indians, especially those of the Canadas, and men of their caste. And the moment an actual and recognized warfare existed, it was regarded as the means of lawfully revenging a thousand wrongs, real and imaginary. Then again there was some truth and a good deal of expediency in the principle of retaliation, of which they both availed themselves, in particular, to answer the objections of their juster-minded and more scrupulous companion. "'You must fight a man with his own weapons, dear Slayer,' cried Hurry, in his uncouth dialect, and in his dogmatical manner of disposing of all oral propositions. "'If he's fierce, you must be fiercer. If he's stout of heart, you must be stouter. This is the way to get the better of Christian or savage. By keeping up to this trail, you'll get soonest to the end of your journey. That's not Moravian doctrine, which teaches that all are to be judged according to their talents or learning. The engine like an engine and the white man like a white man. Some of their teachers say that if you're struck on the cheek, it's a duty to turn the other side of the face, and take another blow instead of seeking revenge, whereby I understand— That's enough, shouted Hurry. That's all I want, to prove a man's doctrine. How long would it take to kick a man through the colony, in at one end and out at the other, on that principle? Don't mistake me, March, returned the young hunter with dignity. I don't understand by this any more than that it's best to do this, if possible. 
Revenge is an Injun gift, and forgiveness a white man's. That's all. Overlook all you can is what's meant, and not revenge all you can. As for kicking, Master Hurry, and Deerslayer's sunburnt cheek flushed as he continued, into the colony or out of the colony, that's neither here nor there, seeing no one proposes it, and no one would be likely to put up with it. What I wish to say is that a redskin's scalping don't justify a pale-face's scalping. Do as you're done by, Deerslayer. That's ever the Christian parson's doctrine. No, Hurry, I've asked the Moravians concerning that, and it's altogether different. Do as you would be done by, they tell me, is the true saying, while men practice the faults. They think all the colonies wrong that offer bounties for scalps, and believe no blessing will follow the measures. Above all things, they forbid revenge. That for your Moravians, cried March, snapping his fingers. They're the next thing to Quakers. And if you'd believe all they tell you, not even a rat would be skinned out of Marcy. Who ever heard of Marcy on a muskrat? The disdainful manner of hurry prevented a reply, and he and the old man resumed the discussion of their plans in a more quiet and confidential manner. This confidence lasted until Judith appeared, bearing the simple but savory supper. March observed, with a little surprise, that she placed the choicest bits before Deerslayer, and that in the little nameless attentions it was in her power to bestow, she quite obviously manifested a desire to let it be seen that she deemed him the honoured guest. Accustomed, however, to the waywardness and coquetry of the beauty, this discovery gave him little concern, and he ate with an appetite that was in no degree disturbed by any moral causes. The easily digested food of the forests offering the fewest possible obstacles to the gratification of this great animal indulgence, Deerslayer, notwithstanding the hearty meal both had taken in the woods, was in no manner behind his companion in doing justice to the viands. An hour later the scene had greatly changed. The lake was still placid and glassy, but the gloom of the hour had succeeded to the soft twilight of a summer evening, and all within the dark setting of the woods lay in the quiet repose of night. The forests gave up no song, or cry, or even murmur, but looked down from the hills on the lovely basin they encircled, in solemn stillness and the only sound that was audible was the regular dip of the sweeps, at which Hurry and Deerslayer lazily pushed, impelling the ark towards the castle. Hutter had withdrawn to the stern of the scow in order to steer, but finding that the young men kept even strokes and held the desired course by their own skill, he permitted the oar to drag in the water, took a seat on the end of the vessel, and lighted his pipe. He had not been thus placed many minutes ere Hetty came stealthily out of the cabin, or house, as they usually termed that part of the ark, and placed herself at his feet, on a little bench that she brought with her. As this movement was by no means unusual in his feeble-minded child, the old man paid no other attention to it than to lay his hand kindly on her head, in an affectionate and approving manner, an act of grace that the girl received in meek silence. After a pause of several minutes Hetty began to sing. Her voice was low and tremulous, but it was earnest and solemn. The words and the tune were of the simplest form, the first being a hymn that she had been taught by her mother, and the last one of those natural melodies that find favor with all classes, in every age, coming from and being addressed to the feelings. Hutter never listened to this simple strain without finding his heart and manner softened, facts that his daughter well knew, and by which she had often profited, through the sort of holy instinct that enlightens the weak of mind, more especially in their aims toward good. Hetty's low sweet tones had not been raised many moments, when the dip of the oars ceased, and the holy strain arose singly on the breathing silence of the wilderness. As if she gathered courage with the theme, her powers appeared to increase as she proceeded. And though nothing vulgar or noisy mingled in her melody, its strength and melancholy tenderness grew on the ear until the air was filled with this simple homage of a soul that seemed almost spotless. That the men forward were not indifferent to this touching interruption was proved by their inaction, nor did their oars again dip until the last of the sweet sounds had actually died among the remarkable shores, which, at that witching hour, would waft even the lowest modulations of the human voice more than a mile. Hutter was much affected for rude as he was by early habits, and even ruthless as he had got to be by long exposure to the practices of the wilderness, his nature was of that fearful mixture of good and evil, 
that so generally enters into the moral composition of man. "'You are sad to-night, child,' said the father, whose manner and language usually assumed some of the gentleness and elevation of the civilized life he had led in youth, when he thus communed with this particular child. We have just escaped from enemies, and ought rather to rejoice. "'You can never do it, father,' said Hetty, in a low, remonstrating manner, taking his hard, knotty hand into both her own. "'You have talked long with Harry March, but neither of you have the heart to do it.' "'This is going beyond your means, foolish child. You must have been naughty enough to have listened, or you could know nothing of our talk. Why should you and Hurry kill people, especially women and children? Peace, girl, peace. We are at war, and must do to our enemies as our enemies would do to us. I heard Deerslayer say how it was. You must do to your enemies as you wish your enemies would do to you. No man wishes his enemies to kill him. We kill our enemies in war, girl, lest they should kill us. One side or the other must begin, and them that begin first are most apt to get the victory. You know nothing about these things, poor Hetty, and had best say nothing. Judith says it is wrong, father, and Judith has sense, though I have none. Jude understands better than to talk to me of these matters, for she has sense, as you say, and knows I'll not bear it. Which would you prefer, Hetty? to have your own scalp taken and sold to the French, or that we should kill our enemies and keep them from harming us. "'That's not it, father. Don't kill them, nor let them kill us. Sell your skins and get more if you can, but don't sell human blood. Come, come, child, let us talk of matters you understand. Are you glad to see our old friend March back again? You like hurry, and must know that one day he may be your brother, if not something nearer.' "'That can't be, father,' returned the girl, after a considerable pause. "'Hurry has had one father and one mother, and people never have two. "'So much for your weak mind, Hetty. "'When Jude marries, her husband's father will be her father, and her husband's sister her sister. "'If she should marry Hurry, then he will be your brother.' "'Judith will never have Hurry,' returned the girl mildly, but positively. "'Judith don't like Hurry.' "'That's more than you can know, Hetty.' Harry March is the handsomest and the strongest and the boldest young man that ever visits the lake. And, as Jude is the greatest beauty, I don't see why they shouldn't come together. He has as much promised that he will enter into this job with me, on condition that I'll consent." Hetty began to move her body back and forth, and otherwise, to express mental agitation, but she made no answer for more than a minute. Her father, accustomed to her manner, and suspecting no immediate cause of concern, continued to smoke with the apparent phlegm which would seem to belong to that particular species of enjoyment. "'Hurry is handsome, father,' said Hetty, with a simple emphasis, that she might have hesitated about using, had her mind been more alive to the inferences of others. "'I told you so, child,' muttered old Hutter, without removing the pipe from between his teeth. He's the likeliest youth in these parts, and Jude is the likeliest young woman I've met with since her poor mother was in her best days. Is it wicked to be ugly, father? One might be guilty of worse things, but you're by no means ugly, though not so comely as Jude. Is Judith any happier for being so handsome? She may be, child, and she may not be. But talk of other matters now, for you hardly understand these, poor Hetty. How do you like our new acquaintance, Deerslayer?" "'He isn't handsome, father. Hurry is far handsomer than Deerslayer." "'That's true. But they say he is a noted hunter. His fame had reached me before I ever saw him. And I did hope he would prove to be as stout a warrior as he is dexterous with the deer. All men are not alike, howsoever, child, and it takes time, as I know by experience, to give a man a true wilderness heart. Have I got a wilderness heart, father? And hurry, is his heart true wilderness? You sometimes ask queer questions, Hetty. Your heart is good, child, and fitter for the settlements than for the woods, while your reason is fitter for the woods than for the settlements. Why has Judith more reason than I, father? Heaven help thee, child. This is more than I can answer. God gives sense and appearance and all these things and he grants them as he seeth fit. Dost thou wish for more sense? Not I. The little I have troubles me, for when I think the hardest, then I feel the unhappiest. I don't believe thinking is good for me, though I do wish I was as handsome as Judith. Why so, poor child? 
Thy sister's beauty may cause her trouble, as it caused her mother before her. It's no advantage, Hetty, to be so marked for anything as to become an object of envy, or to be sought after more than others. Mother was good, if she was handsome, returned the girl, the tears starting to her eyes, as usually happened when she averted to her deceased parent. Old Hutter, if not equally affected, was moody and silent at this allusion to his wife. He continued smoking, without appearing disposed to make any answer, until his simple-minded daughter repeated her remark, in a way to show that she felt uneasiness, lest he might be inclined to deny her assertion. Then he knocked the ashes out of his pipe, and, laying his hand in a sort of rough kindness on the girl's head, he made a reply. "'Thy mother was too good for this world,' he said, though others might not think so. Her good looks did not befriend her, and you have no occasion to mourn that you are not as much like her as your sister. Think less of beauty, child, and more of your duty, and you'll be as happy on this lake as you could be in the king's palace." "'I know it, father. But Hurry says beauty is everything in a young woman." Hutter made an ejaculation expressive of dissatisfaction, and went forward passing through the house in order to do so. Hetty's simple betrayal of her weakness in behalf of March gave him uneasiness on a subject concerning which he had never felt before, and he determined to come to an explanation at once with his visitor, for directness of speech and decision in conduct were two of the best qualities of this rude being, in whom the seeds of a better education seemed to be constantly struggling upwards, to be choked by the fruits of a life in which his hard struggles for subsistence and security had steeled his feelings and indurated his nature. When he reached the forward end of the scow, he manifested an intention to relieve Deerslayer at the oar, directing the latter to take his own place aft. By these changes the old man and Hurry were again left alone, while the young hunter was transferred to the other end of the ark. Hetty had disappeared when Deerslayer reached his new post, and for some little time he directed the course of the slow-moving craft by himself. It was not long, however, before Judith came out of the cabin, as if disposed to do the honors of the place to a stranger engaged in the service of her family. The starlight was sufficient to permit objects to be plainly distinguished when near at hand, and the bright eyes of the girl had an expression of kindness in them, when they met those of the youth, that the latter was easily enabled to discover. Her rich hair shaded her spirited and yet soft countenance even at that hour rendering it the more beautiful, as the rose is loveliest when reposing amid the shadows and contrasts of its native foliage. Little ceremony is used in the intercourse of the woods, and Judith had acquired a readiness of address by the admiration that she so generally excited, which, if it did not amount to forwardness, certainly in no degree lent to her charms the aid of that retiring modesty on which poets love to dwell. I thought I should have killed myself with laughing, dear Slayer," the beauty abruptly but coquettishly commenced, when I saw that Indian dive into the river. He was a good-looking savage, too. The girl always dwelt on personal beauty as a sort of merit. And yet one couldn't stop to consider whether his paint would stand water. And I thought they would have killed you with their weapons, Judith," returned dear Slayer. It was an awful risk for a female to run in the face of a dozen Mingos. Did that make you come out of the cabin, in spite of the rifles, too?" asked the girl, with more real interest than she would have cared to betray, though with an indifference of manner that was the result of a good deal of practice united to native readiness. Men aren't apt to see females in danger and not come to their assistance. Even a Mingo knows that. This sentiment was uttered with as much simplicity of manner as of feeling, and Judith rewarded it with a smile so sweet that even Deerslayer, who had imbibed a prejudice against the girl in consequence of Hurry's suspicions of her levity, felt its charm, notwithstanding half its winning influence was lost in the feeble light. It at once created a sort of confidence between them, and the discourse was continued on the part of the hunter, without the lively consciousness of the character of this coquette of the wilderness, with which it had certainly commenced. "'You are a man of deeds, and not of words, I see plainly, dear Slayer continued the beauty, taking her seat near the spot where the other stood, and I foresee we shall be very good friends. Hurry Harry has a tongue, and, giant as he is, he talks more than he performs. 
March is your friend, Judith, and friends should be tender of each other, when apart. We all know what Hurry's friendship comes to. Let him have his own way in everything, and he's the best fellow in the colony. But head him off, as you say of the deer, and he is master of everything near him but himself. Hurry is no favorite of mine, dear Slayer, and I dare say if the truth was known, and his conversation about me repeated, it would be found that he thinks no better of me than I own I do of him." The latter part of this speech was not uttered without uneasiness. Had the girl's companion been more sophisticated, he might have observed the averted face, the manner in which the pretty little foot was agitated, and other signs that, for some unexplained reason, the opinions of March were not quite as much a matter of indifference to her as she thought fit to pretend. Whether this was no more than the ordinary working of female vanity, feeling keenly even when it affected not to feel at all, or whether it proceeded from that deeply-seated consciousness of right and wrong which God Himself has implanted in our breasts that we may know good from evil, will be made more apparent to the reader as we proceed in the tale. Deerslayer felt embarrassed. He well remembered the cruel imputations left by March's distrust and while he did not wish to injure his associate's suit by exciting resentment against him, his tongue was one that literally knew no guile. To answer without saying more or less than he wished was consequently a delicate duty. March has his say of all things in nature, whether of friend or foe," slowly and cautiously rejoined the hunter. He's one of them that speak as they feel while the tongues are going, and that's sometimes different from what they'd speak if they took time to consider. Give me a Delaware, Judith, for one that reflects and ruminates on his ideas. Enmity has made him thoughtful, and a loose tongue is no recommend at their council fires. I dare say March's tongue goes free enough when it gets on the subject of Judith Hutter and her sister," said the girl, rousing herself, as if in careless disdain. Young women's good names are a pleasant matter of discourse with some that wouldn't dare to be so open-mouthed if there was a brother in the way. Master March may find it pleasant to traduce us, but sooner or later he'll repent. Nay, Judith, this is taking the matter up too much in earnest. Hurry has never whispered a syllable again the good name of Hetty, to begin with. I see how it is. I see how it is, impetuously interrupted Judith. I am the one he sees fit to scorch with his withering tongue. Hetty, indeed. Poor Hetty she continued, her voice sinking into low, husky tones that seemed nearly to stifle her in the utterance. She is beyond and above his slanderous malice, poor Hetty. If God has created her feeble-minded, the weakness lies altogether on the side of errors of which she seems to know nothing. The earth never held a purer being than Hetty Hutter, dear Slayer. I can believe it, yes, I can believe that, Judith, and I hope earnestly that the same can be said of her handsome sister. There was a soothing sincerity in the voice of Deerslayer which touched the girl's feelings. Nor did the allusion to her beauty lessen the effect with one who only knew too well the power of her personal charms. Nevertheless, the still, small voice of conscience was not hushed, and it prompted the answer which she made after giving herself time to reflect. "'I dare say Hurry had some of his vile hints about the people of the garrisons,' she added. "'He knows they are gentlemen and can never forgive any one for being what he feels he can never become himself. Not in the sense of a king's officer, Judith, certainly, for March has no turn that away. But in the sense of reality, why may not a beaver-hunter be as respectable as a governor? Since you speak of it yourself, I'll not deny that he did complain of one as humble as you, being so much in the company of scarlet coats and silken sashes. But twas jealousy that brought it out of him and I do think he mourned over his own thoughts as a mother would have mourned over her child. Perhaps Deerslayer was not aware of the full meaning that his earnest language conveyed. It is certain that he did not see the color that crimsoned the whole of Judith's fine face, nor detect the uncontrollable distress that immediately after changed its hue to deadly paleness. A minute or two elapsed in profound stillness, the splash of the water seeming to occupy all the avenues of sound. And then Judith arose, and grasped the hand of the hunter, almost convulsively, with one of her own. "'Dear Slayer,' she said hurriedly, "'I'm glad the ice is broken between us. They say that sudden friendships lead to long enmities, but I do not believe it will turn out so with us. I know not how it is, 
but you are the first man I ever met who did not seem to wish to flatter, to wish my ruin, to be an enemy in disguise. Never mind. Say nothing to hurry, and another time we'll talk together again." As the girl released her grasp, she vanished in the house, leaving the astonished young man standing at the steering oar, as motionless as one of the pines on the hills. So abstracted, indeed, had his thoughts become, that he was hailed by Hutter to keep the scow's head in the right direction, before he remembered his actual situation. End of chapter 5 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 6 of The Deerslayer this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 6 So spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. Paradise Lost. 1. Lines 125 to 126. Shortly after the disappearance of Judith, a light southerly air arose, and Hutter set a large square sail that had once been the flying topsail of an Albany sloop, but which having become threadbare in catching the breezes of Tapan, had been condemned and sold. He had a light, tough spar of tamarack that he could raise on occasion, and with a little contrivance his duck was spread to the wind in a sufficiently professional manner. The effect on the ark was such as to supersede the necessity of rowing, and in about two hours the castle was seen, in the darkness, rising out of the water, at the distance of a hundred yards. The sail was then lowered, and by slow degrees the scow drifted up to the building, and was secured. No one had visited the house since Hurry and his companion left it. The place was found in the quiet of midnight, a sort of type of the solitude of a wilderness. As an enemy was known to be near, Hutter directed his daughters to abstain from the use of lights, luxuries in which they seldom indulged during the warm months, lest they might prove beacons to direct their foes where they might be found. In open daylight I shouldn't fear a host of savages behind these stout logs, and they without any cover to skulk into, added Hutter, when he had explained to his guests the reasons why he forbade the use of light for I have three or four trusty weapons always loaded, and killdeer, in particular, is a piece that never misses. But it's a different thing at night. A canoe might get upon us unseen, in the dark, and the savages have so many cunning ways of attacking, that I look upon it as bad enough to deal with them under a bright sun. I built this dwelling in order to have them at arm's length, in case we should ever get to blows again. Some people think it's too open and exposed, but I'm for anchoring out here, clear of underbrush and thickets as the surest means of making a safe berth. "'You was once a sailor, they tell me, old Tom,' said Hurry, in his abrupt manner, struck by one or two expressions that the other had just used. "'And some people believe you could give us strange accounts of enemies and shipwrecks, if you'd a mind to come out with all you know.' "'There are people in this world, Hurry,' returned the other, evasively, who live on other men's thoughts, and some such often find their way into the woods. What I've been, or what I've seen in youth, is of less matter now than what the savages are. It's of more account to find out what will happen in the next twenty-four hours, than to talk over what happened twenty-four years since. That's judgment, dear Slayer. Yes, that's sound judgment. Here's Judith and Hetty to take care of, to say nothing of our own top-knots. And, for my part, I can sleep as well in the dark as I could under a noonday sun. To me it's no great matter whether there is light or not to see or shut my eyes by." As Deerslayer seldom thought it necessary to answer his companion's particular vein of humour, and Hutter was evidently indisposed to dwell longer on the subject, its discussion ceased with this remark. The latter had something more on his mind, however, than recollections. His daughters had no sooner left them, with an expressed intention of going to bed, than he invited his two companions to follow him again into the scow. Here the old man opened his project, keeping back the portion that he had reserved for execution by Hurry and himself. "'The great object for people posted like ourselves is to command the water,' he commenced. 
So long as there is no other craft on the lake, a bark canoe is as good as a man of war, since the castle will not be easily taken by swimming. Now, there are but five canoes remaining in these parts, two of which are mine, and one is Hurry's. These three we have with us here, one being fastened in the canoe dock beneath the house, and the other two being alongside the scow. The other canoes are housed on the shore, in hollow logs, and the savages, who are such venomous enemies, will leave no likely place unexamined in the morning, if they're serious in search of bounties. Now, friend Hutter, interrupted Hurry, the Indian don't live that can find a canoe that is suitably wintered. I've done something at this business before now, and Deerslayer here knows that I am one that can hide a craft in such a way that I can't find it myself. "'Very true, Hurry,' put in the person to whom the appeal had been made. "'But you overlook the circumstance, that if you couldn't see the trail of the man who did the job, I could. I'm of Master Hutter's mind, that it's far wiser to mistrust a savage's ingenuity than to build any great expectation on his want of eyesight. If these two canoes can be got off to the castle, therefore, the sooner it's done the better.' "'Will you be of the party that's to do it?' demanded Hutter, in a way to show that the proposal both surprised and pleased him. "'Sartin. I'm ready to enlist in any enterprise that's not again a white man's lawful gifts. Nature orders us to defend our lives, and the lives of others, too, when there's occasion and opportunity. I'll follow you, Floating Tom, into the Mingo camp, on such an errand, and will strive to do my duty should we come to blows.' though, never having been tried in battle, I don't like to promise more than I may be able to perform. We all know our wishes, but none know their might till put to the proof." "'That's modest and suitable, lad,' exclaimed Hurry. "'You've never yet heard the crack of an angry rifle, and, let me tell you, tis as different from the persuasion of one of your venison speeches as the laugh of Judith Hutter in her best humour is from the scolding of a Dutch housekeeper on the Mohawk. I don't expect you'll prove much of a warrior, dear Slayer, though your equal with the bucks and the does don't exist in all these parts. As for the rail service, however, you'll turn out rather rearward, according to my consent. We'll see, Hurry, we'll see, returned the other meekly. So far as human eye could discover, not at all disturbed by these expressed doubts concerning his conduct on a point in which men are sensitive, precisely in the degree that they feel the consciousness of demerit. Having never been tried, I'll wait to know before I form any opinion of myself, and then there'll be certainty instead of bragging. I've heard of them that was valiant afore the fight, who did little in it, and of them that waited to know their own tempers and found that they weren't as bad as some expected when put to the proof. At any rate, we know you can use a paddle, young man," said Hutter, and that's all we shall ask of you to-night. Let us waste no more time, but get into the canoe, and do in place of talking." As Hutter led the way, in the execution of his project, the boat was soon ready, with Hurry and Deerslayer at the paddles. Before the old man embarked himself, however, he held a conference of several minutes with Judith, entering the house for that purpose. Then, returning, he took his place in the canoe, which left the side of the ark at the next instant. Had there been a temple reared to God in that solitary wilderness, its clock would have told the hour of midnight as the party set forth on their expedition. The darkness had increased, though the night was still clear, and the light of the stars sufficed for all the purposes of the adventurers. Hutter alone knew the places where the canoes were hid, and he directed the course while his two athletic companions raised and dipped their paddles with proper caution, lest the sound should be carried to the ears of their enemies, across that sheet of placid water, in the stillness of deep night. But the bark was too light to require any extraordinary efforts, and skill supplying the place of strength, in about half an hour they were approaching the shore, at a point near a league from the castle. "'Lay on your paddles, men,' said Hutter, in a low voice and let us look about us for a moment. We must now be all eyes and ears, for these vermin have noses like bloodhounds." The shores of the lake were examined closely, in order to discover any glimmering of light that might have been left in a camp, and the men strained their eyes, in the obscurity, to see if some thread of smoke 
was not still stealing along the mountainside, as it arose from the dying embers of a fire. Nothing unusual could be traced, and as the position was at some distance from the outlet, or the spot where the savages had been met, it was thought safe to land. The paddles were plied again, and the bows of the canoe ground upon the gravelly beach with a gentle motion, and a sound barely audible. Hutter and Hurry immediately landed, the former carrying his own and his friend's rifle, leaving Deerslayer in charge of the canoe. The hollow log lay a little distance up the side of the mountain, and the old man led the way towards it, using so much caution as to stop at every third or fourth step to listen if any tread betrayed the presence of a foe. The same death-like stillness, however, reigned on the midnight scene, and the desired place was reached without an occurrence to induce alarm. "'This is it,' whispered Hutter, laying a foot on the trunk of a fallen linden. "'Hand me the paddles first, and draw the boat out with care, for the wretches may have left it for a bait, after all. "'Keep my rifle handy, butt towards me, old fellow,' answered March. "'If they attack me loaded, I shall want to unload the piece, Adam, at least, and feel if the pan is full.' "'All's right,' muttered the other. Move slow when you get your load, and let me lead the way." The canoe was drawn out of the log with the utmost care, raised by hurry to his shoulder, and the two began to return to the shore, moving but a step at a time lest they should tumble down the steep declivity. The distance was not great, but the descent was extremely difficult, and, towards the end of their little journey, Deerslayer was obliged to land and meet them, in order to aid in lifting the canoe through the bushes. With his assistance the task was successfully accomplished, and the light craft soon floated by the side of the other canoe. This was no sooner done than all three turned anxiously towards the forest and the mountain, expecting an enemy to break out of the one or to come rushing down the other. Still the silence was unbroken, and they all embarked with the caution that had been used in coming ashore. Hunter now steered broad off towards the center of the lake. Having got a sufficient distance from the shore, he cast his prize loose, knowing that it would drift slowly up the lake before the light southerly air, and intending to find it on his return. Thus relieved of his tow, the old man held his way down the lake, steering towards the very point where Hurry had made his fruitless attempt on the life of the deer. As the distance from this point to the outlet was less than a mile, it was like entering an enemy's country, and redoubled caution became necessary. They reached the extremity of the point, however, and landed in safety on the little gravelly beach already mentioned. Unlike the last place at which they had gone ashore, here was no acclivity to ascend, the mountains looming up in the darkness quite a quarter of a mile farther west, leaving a margin of level ground between them and the strand. The point itself, though long, and covered with tall trees, was nearly flat, and for some distance only a few yards in width. Hutter and Hurry landed as before, leaving their companion in charge of the boat. In this instance the dead tree that contained the canoe of which they had come in quest lay about halfway between the extremity of the narrow strip of land and the place where it joined the main shore. And knowing that there was water so near him on his left, the old man led the way along the eastern side of the belt, with some confidence walking boldly, though still with caution. He had landed at the point expressly to get a glimpse into the bay and to make certain that the coast was clear. Otherwise he would have come ashore directly abreast of the hollow tree. There was no difficulty in finding the latter, from which the canoe was drawn as before, and instead of carrying it down to the place where Deerslayer lay, it was launched at the nearest favorable spot. As soon as it was in the water, Hurry entered it, and paddled round to the point, whither Hutter also proceeded, following the beach. As the three men had now in their possession all the boats on the lake, their confidence was greatly increased, and there was no longer the same feverish desire to quit the shore, or the same necessity for extreme caution. Their position on the extremity of the long, narrow bit of land added to the feeling of security, as it permitted an enemy to approach in only one direction, that in their front, and under circumstances that would render discovery, with their habitual vigilance, almost certain. The three now landed together and stood grouped in consultation on the gravelly point. 
"'We've fairly treed the scamps,' said Hurry, chuckling at their success. "'If they wish to visit the castle, let em wade or swim. Old Tom, that idea of yourn in burrowing out in the lake was high proof, and carries a fine bead. There be men who would think the land safer than the water. But, after all, reason shows it isn't. The beaver, and rats, and other larned creatures taking to the last when hard-pressed. I call our position now entrenched, and set the Canadas at defiance. "'Let us paddle along this south shore,' said Hutter, "'and see if there's no sign of an encampment. But first, let me have a better look into the bay, for no one has been far enough round the inner shore of the point to make suit of that quarter yet.' As Hutter ceased speaking, all three moved in the direction he had named. Scarce had they fairly opened the bottom of the bay, when a general start proved that their eyes had lighted on a common object, at the same instant. It was no more than a dying brand, giving out its flickering and failing light. But at that hour, and in that place, it was at once as conspicuous as a good deed in a naughty world. There was not a shadow of doubt that this fire had been kindled at an encampment of the Indians. The situation, sheltered from observation on all sides but one, and even on that except for a very short distance, proved that more care had been taken to conceal the spot than would be used for ordinary purposes. And Hutter, who knew that a spring was near at hand, as well as one of the best fishing stations on the lake, immediately inferred that this encampment contained the women and children of the party. "'That's not a warrior's encampment,' he growled to hurry and there's bounty enough sleeping around that fire to make a heavy division of head-money. Send the lad to the canoes, for they'll come no good of him in such an onset, and let us take the matter in hand at once, like men. There's judgment in your notion, old Tom, and I like it to the backbone. Deerslayer, do you get into the canoe, lad, and paddle off into the lake with the spare one, and set it adrift, as we did with the other? after which you can float along shore as near as you can get to the head of the bay, keeping outside the point, howsever, and outside the rushes, too. You can hear us when we want you, and if there's any delay I'll call like a loon. Yes, that'll do it. The call of a loon shall be the signal. If you hear rifles, and feel like soldiering, why you may close in, and see if you can make the same hand with the savages that you do with the deer. If my wishes could be followed, this matter would not be undertaken, Hurry. Quite true. Nobody denies it, boy. But your wishes can't be followed. And that ends the matter. So just canoe yourself off into the middle of the lake, and by the time you get back there'll be movements in that camp." The young man set about complying with great reluctance and a heavy heart. He knew the prejudices of the frontiermen too well, however, to attempt a remonstrance. The latter, indeed, under the circumstances, might prove dangerous, as it would certainly prove useless. He paddled the canoe, therefore, silently and with the former caution, to a spot near the center of the placid sheet of water, and set the boat just recovered adrift, to float towards the castle, before the light southerly air. This expedient had been adopted, in both cases, under the certainty that the drift could not carry the light barks more than a league or two before the return of light, when they might easily be overtaken in order to prevent any wandering savage from using them, by swimming off and getting possession. A possible, but scarcely a probable event, all the paddles were retained. No sooner had he set the recovered canoe adrift than Deerslayer turned the bows of his own towards the point on the shore that had been indicated by hurry. So light was the movement of the little craft, and so steady the sweep of its master's arm, that ten minutes had not elapsed ere it was again approaching the land, having, in that brief time, passed over fully half a mile of distance. As soon as Deerslayer's eye caught a glimpse of the rushes, of which there were many growing in the water a hundred feet from the shore, he arrested the motion of the canoe, and anchored his boat by holding fast to the delicate but tenacious stem of one of the drooping plants. Here he remained, awaiting, with an intensity of suspense that can be easily imagined, the result of the hazardous enterprise. It would be difficult to convey to the minds of those who have never witnessed it the sublimity that characterizes the silence of a solitude as deep as that which now reigned over the glimmer glass. In the present instance this sublimity was increased by the gloom of night, 
which threw its shadowy and fantastic forms around the lake, the forest, and the hills. It is not easy, indeed, to conceive of any place more favorable to heighten these natural impressions than that Deerslayer now occupied. The size of the lake brought all within the reach of human senses, while it displayed so much of the imposing scene at a single view, giving up, as it might be, at a glance, a sufficiency to produce the deepest impressions. As has been said, this was the first lake Deerslayer had ever seen. Hitherto his experience had been limited to the courses of rivers and small streams, and never before had he seen so much of that wilderness, which he so well loved, spread before his gaze. Accustomed to the forest, however, his mind was capable of portraying all its hidden mysteries, as he looked upon its leafy surface. This was also the first time he had been on a trail where human lives depended on the issue. His ears had often drunk in the traditions of frontier warfare, but he had never yet been confronted with an enemy. The reader will readily understand, therefore, how intense must have been the expectation of the young man, as he sat in his solitary canoe endeavoring to catch the smallest sound that might denote the course of things on shore. His training had been perfect, so far as theory could go, and his self-possession, notwithstanding the high excitement that was the fruit of novelty, would have done credit to a veteran. The visible evidences of the existence of the camp or of the fire could not be detected from the spot where the canoe lay, and he was compelled to depend on the sense of hearing alone. He did not feel impatient, for the lessons he had heard taught him the virtue of patience, and most of all inculcated the necessity of wariness in conducting any covert assault on the Indians. Once he thought he heard the cracking of a dried twig, but expectation was so intense it might mislead him. In this manner minute after minute passed until the whole time since he left his companions was extended to quite an hour. Deerslayer knew not whether to rejoice in or to mourn over this cautious delay, for, if it augured security to his associates, it foretold destruction to the feeble and innocent. It might have been an hour and a half after his companions and he had parted, when Deerslayer was aroused by a sound that filled him equally with concern and surprise. The quavering call of a loon arose from the opposite side of the lake, evidently at no great distance from its outlet. There was no mistaking the note of this bird, which is so familiar to all who know the sounds of the American lakes. Shrill, tremulous, loud, and sufficiently prolonged, it seems the very cry of warning. It is often raised also at night, an exception to the habits of most of the other feathered inmates of the wilderness, a circumstance which had induced Hurry to select it as his own signal. There had been sufficient time, certainly, for the two adventurers to make their way by land, from the point where they had been left, to that whence the call had come, but it was not probable that they would adopt such a course. Had the camp been deserted they would have summoned Deerslayer to the shore, and, did it prove to be peopled, there would be no sufficient motive for circling it, in order to re-embark at so great a distance. Should he obey the signal and be drawn away from the landing, the lives of those who depended on him might be the forfeit. And, should he neglect the call, on the supposition that it had been really made, the consequences might be equally disastrous, though from a different cause. In this indecision he waited, trusting that the call, whether feigned or natural, would be speedily renewed. Nor was he mistaken. A very few minutes elapsed before the same shrill warning cry was repeated, and from the same part of the lake. This time, being on the alert, his senses were not deceived, although he had often heard admirable imitations of this bird and was no mean adept himself in raising its notes, he felt satisfied that Hurry, to whose efforts in that way he had attended, could never so completely and closely follow nature. He determined, therefore, to disregard that cry and to wait for one less perfect and nearer at hand. Deerslayer had hardly come to this determination when the profound stillness of night and solitude was broken by a cry so startling as to drive all recollection of the more melancholy call of the loon from the listener's mind. It was a shriek of agony that came either from one of the female sex or from a boy so young as not yet to have attained a manly voice. This appeal could not be mistaken. Heart-rending terror, if not writhing agony, was in the sounds, and the anguish that had awakened them was as sudden as it was fearful. The young man released his hold of the rush, and dashed his paddle into the water. To do he knew not what, to steer he knew not whither. A very few moments, however, removed his indecision, 
The breaking of branches, the cracking of dried sticks, and the fall of feet were distinctly audible, the sounds appearing to approach the water though in a direction that led diagonally towards the shore, and a little farther north than the spot that Deerslayer had been ordered to keep near. Following this clue the young man urged the canoe ahead, paying but little attention to the manner in which he might betray its presence. He had reached a part of the shore, where its immediate bank was tolerably high and quite steep. Men were evidently threshing through the bushes and trees on the summit of this bank, following the line of the shore, as if those who fled sought a favorable place for descending. Just at this instant five or six rifles flashed, and the opposite hills gave back, as usual, the sharp reports and prolonged rolling echoes. One or two shrieks, like those which escape the bravest when suddenly overcome by unexpected anguish and alarm, followed and then the threshing among the bushes was renewed, in a way to show that man was grappling with man. "'Slippery devil!' shouted Hurry, with the fury of disappointment. "'His skin's greased! I shan't grapple! Take that for your cunning!' The words were followed by the fall of some heavy object among the smaller trees that fringed the bank, appearing to Deerslayer as if his gigantic associate had hurled an enemy from him in this unceremonious manner. Again the flight and pursuit were renewed, and then the young man saw a human form break down the hill and rush several yards into the water. At this critical moment the canoe was just near enough to the spot to allow this movement, which was accompanied by no little noise, to be seen, and feeling that there he must take in his companion, if anywhere, Deerslayer urged the canoe forward to the rescue. His paddle had not been raised twice, when the voice of hurry was heard filling the air with imprecations and he rolled on the narrow beach, literally loaded down with enemies. While prostrate and almost smothered with his foes, the athletic frontierman gave his loon call, in a manner that would have excited laughter under circumstances less terrific. The figure in the water seemed suddenly to repent his own flight, and rushed to the shore to aid his companion, but was met and immediately overpowered by half a dozen fresh pursuers, who just then came leaping down the bank. "'Let up, you painted reptiles! Let up!' cried Hurry, too hard-pressed to be particular about the terms he used. "'Isn't it enough that I am wise like a saw-log that you must choke, too?' This speech satisfied Deerslayer that his friends were prisoners, and that to land would be to share their fate. He was already within a hundred feet of the shore, when a few timely strokes of the paddle not only arrested his advance, but forced him off to six or eight times that distance from his enemies. Luckily for him, all of the Indians had dropped their rifles in the pursuit, or this retreat might not have been effected with impunity, though no one had noted the canoe in the first confusion of the melee. "'Keep off the land, lad!' called out Hutter. "'The girls depend only on you now. You will want all your caution to escape these savages. Keep off, and God prosper you, as you aid my children.' There was little sympathy in general between Hutter and the young man, but the bodily and mental anguish with which this appeal was made served at the moment to conceal from the latter the former's faults. He saw only the father in his sufferings, and resolved at once to give a pledge of fidelity to its interests, and to be faithful to his word. "'Put your heart at ease, Master Hutter,' he called out. "'The gal shall be looked to, as well as the castle. The enemy has got the shore. "'Tis no use to deny, but he hasn't got the water. Providence has the charge of all, and no one can say what will come of it. But if good will can sarve you and yourn, depend on that much. My experience is small, but my will is good.' "'Aye, aye, dear Slayer,' returned Hurry, in this stentorian voice, which was losing some of its heartiness, notwithstanding. "'Aye, aye, dear Slayer, you mean well enough. But what can you do? You're no great matter in the best of times and such a person is not likely to turn out a miracle in the worst. If there's one savage on this lake shore, there's forty, and that's an army you aren't the man to overcome. The best way, in my judgment, will be to make a straight course to the castle, get the gals into the canoe with a few eatables, then strike off for the corner of the lake where we came in, and take the best trail for the Mohawk. These devils won't know where to look for you for some hours, and if they did, and went off hot in the pursuit, they must turn either the foot or the head of the lake to get at you. And if old Tom here wishes to make his last will and testament in a manner favorable to his daughters, he'll say the same. "'Twill never do, young man,' rejoined Hutter. 
The enemy has scouts out at this moment, looking for canoes, and you'll be seen and taken. Trust to the castle, and above all things keep clear of the land. Hold out a week, and parties from the garrison will drive the savages off. Crump be four and twenty hours, old fellow, afore these foxes will be rafting off to storm your castle," interrupted Hurry, with more of the heat of argument than might be expected from a man who was bound and captive, and about whom nothing could be called free but his opinions and his tongue. Your advice has a stout sound, but it will have a fatal termination. If you or I was in the house we might hold out a few days, but remember that this lad has never seen an enemy afore to-night, and is what you yourself called settlement conscienced, though for my part I think the consciences in the settlements pretty much the same as they are out here in the woods. These savages are making signs, dear Slayer, for me to encourage you to come ashore with the canoe, but that I'll never do, as it's again reason and nature. As for old Tom and myself, whether they'll scalp us to-night, keep us for the torture by fire, or carry us to Canada, is more than any one knows but the devil that advises them how to act. I've such a big and bushy head that it's quite likely they'll endeavor to get two scalps off it, for the bounty is a tempting thing, or old Tom and I wouldn't be in this scrape. Aye, there they go with their signs again. But if I advise you to land, may they eat me as well as roast me. No, no, dear Slayer, do you keep off where you are, and after daylight, on no account come within two hundred yards." This injunction of Hurry's was stopped by a hand being rudely slapped against his mouth, the certain sign that some one in the party sufficiently understood English to have at length detected the drift of his discourse. Immediately after, the whole group entered the forest, Hutter and Hurry apparently making no resistance to the movement. Just as the sounds of the cracking bushes were ceasing, however, the voice of the father was again heard. As you're true to my children, God prosper you, young man," were the words that reached Deerslayer's ears, after which he found himself to follow the dictates of his own discretion. Several minutes elapsed, in death-like stillness, when the party on the shore had disappeared in the woods. Owing to the distance, rather more than two hundred yards, and the obscurity, Deerslayer had been able barely to distinguish the group, and to see it retiring. But even this dim connection with human forms gave an animation to the scene that was strongly in contrast to the absolute solitude that remained. Although the young man leaned forward to listen, holding his breath and condensing every faculty in the single sense of hearing, not another sound reached his ears to denote the vicinity of human beings. It seemed as if a silence that had never been broken reigned on the spot again, and for an instant even that piercing shriek which had so lately broken the stillness of the forest or the execrations of march would have been a relief to the feeling of desertion to which it gave rise this paralysis of mind and body however could not last long in one constituted mentally and physically like deerslayer dropping his paddle into the water he turned the head of the canoe and proceeded slowly as one walks who thinks intently towards the centre of the lake when he believed himself to have reached a point in a line with that where he had set the last canoe adrift, he changed his direction northward, keeping the light air as nearly on his back as possible. After paddling a quarter of a mile in this direction, a dark object became visible on the lake, a little to the right, and turning on one side for the purpose, he had soon secured his lost prize to his own boat. Deerslayer now examined the heavens, the course of the air, and the position of the two canoes. Finding nothing in either to induce a change of plan, he lay down, and prepared to catch a few hours' sleep, that the morrow might find him equal to its exigencies. Although the hardy and the tired sleep profoundly, even in scenes of danger, it was some time before Deerslayer lost his recollection. His mind dwelt on what had passed, and his half-conscious faculties kept figuring the events of the night, in a sort of waking dream. Suddenly he was up and alert for he fancied he heard the preconcerted signal of hurry summoning him to the shore. But all was still as the grave again. The canoes were slowly drifting northward, the thoughtful stars were glimmering in their mild glory over his head, and the forest-bound sheet of water lay embedded between its mountains, as calm and melancholy as if never troubled by the winds, or brightened by a noonday sun. Once more the loon raised his tremulous cry, near the foot of the lake, and the mystery of the alarm was explained. Deerslayer adjusted his hard pillow, stretched his form in the bottom of the canoe, and slept. End of chapter 6 
Recording by Bill Borst. Chapter Seven of the Deerslayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter Seven. Clear, placid Leman, thy contrasted lake with the wild world I dwelt in, is a thing which warns me, with its stillness, to forsake earth's troubled waters for a purer spring. This quiet sail is as a noiseless wing to waft me from distraction. Once I loved torn ocean's roar, but thy soft murmuring sounds sweet as if a sister's voice reproved, that I with stern delight should e'er have been so moved. Byron Day had fairly dawned before the young man, whom we have left in the situation described in the last chapter, again opened his eyes. This was no sooner done than he started up, and looked about him with the eagerness of one who suddenly felt the importance of accurately ascertaining his precise position. His rest had been deep and undisturbed, and when he awoke it was with a clearness of intellect and a readiness of resources that were very much needed at that particular moment. The sun had not risen, it is true, but the vault of heaven was rich with the winning softness that brings and shuts the day while the whole air was filled with the carols of birds, the hymns of the feathered tribe. These sounds first told Deerslayer the risks he ran. The air, for wind it could scarce be called, was still light, it is true, but it had increased a little in the course of the night, and as the canoes were feathers on the water they had drifted twice the expected distance, and, what was still more dangerous, had approached so near the base of the mountain that here rose precipitously from the eastern shore, as to render the carols of the birds plainly audible. This was not the worst. The third canoe had taken the same direction, and was slowly drifting towards a point where it must inevitably touch, unless turned aside by a shift of wind or human hands. In other respects nothing presented itself to attract attention, or to awaken alarm. The castle stood on its shoal, nearly abreast of the canoes, for the drift had amounted to miles in the course of the night, and the ark lay fastened to its piles as both had been left so many hours before. As a matter of course Deerslayer's attention was first given to the canoe ahead. It was already quite near the point, and a very few strokes of the paddle sufficed to tell him that it must touch before he could possibly overtake it. Just at this moment, too, the wind inopportunely freshened, rendering the drift of the light craft much more rapid than certain. Feeling the impossibility of preventing a contact with the land, the young man wisely determined not to heat himself with unnecessary exertions, but first looking to the priming of his piece, he proceeded slowly and warily towards the point, taking care to make a little circuit that he might be exposed on only one side as he approached. The canoe adrift being directed by no such intelligence pursued its proper way and grounded on a small sunken rock at the distance of three or four yards from the shore. Just at that moment Deerslayer had got abreast of the point, and turned the bows of his own boat to the land, first casting loose his tow, that his movements might be unencumbered. The canoe hung an instant to the rock, then it rose a hair's breadth on an almost imperceptible swell of the water, swung round, floated clear, and reached the strand. All this the young man noted, but it neither quickened his pulses nor hastened his hand. If any one had been lying in wait for the arrival of the waif, he must be seen, and the utmost caution in approaching the shore became indispensable. If no one was in ambush, hurry was unnecessary. The point being nearly diagonally opposite to the Indian encampment, he hoped the last, though the former was not only possible, but probable. For the savages were prompt in adopting all the expedients of their particular modes of warfare and quite likely had many scouts searching the shores for craft to carry them off to the castle. As a glance at the lake from any height or projection would expose the smallest object on its surface, there was little hope that either of the canoes would pass unseen, and Indian sagacity needed no instruction to tell which way a boat or a log would drift, when the direction of the wind was known. As Deerslayer drew nearer and nearer to the land, the stroke of his paddle grew slower his eye became more watchful, 
and his ears and nostrils almost dilated with the effort to detect any lurking danger. T'was a trying moment for a novice, nor was there the encouragement which even the timid sometimes feel when conscious of being observed and commended. He was entirely alone, thrown on his own resources, and was cheered by no friendly eye, emboldened by no encouraging voice. Notwithstanding all these circumstances, the most experienced veteran in forest warfare could not have behaved better. Equally free from recklessness and hesitation, his advance was marked by a sort of philosophical prudence that appeared to render him superior to all motives but those which were best calculated to effect his purpose. Such was the commencement of a career in forest exploits that afterwards rendered this man, in his way and under the limits of his habits and opportunities, as renowned as many a hero whose name has adorned the pages of works more celebrated than legends simple as ours can ever become. When about a hundred yards from the shore, Deerslayer rose in the canoe, gave three or four vigorous strokes with the paddle, sufficient of themselves to impel the bark to land, and then quickly laying aside the instrument of labor, he seized that of war. He was in the very act of raising the rifle, when a sharp report was followed by the buzz of a bullet that passed so near his body as to cause him involuntarily to start. The next instant Deerslayer staggered, and fell his whole length in the bottom of the canoe. A yell, it came from a single voice, followed, and an Indian leaped from the bushes upon the open area of the point, bounding towards the canoe. This was the moment the young man desired. He rose on the instant, and leveled his own rifle at his uncovered foe. But his finger hesitated about pulling the trigger on one whom he held at such a disadvantage. This little delay probably saved the life of the Indian, who bounded back into the cover as swiftly as he had broken out of it. In the meantime Deerslayer had been swiftly approaching the land, and his own canoe reached the point just as his enemy disappeared. As its movements had not been directed, it touched the shore a few yards from the other boat, and though the rifle of his foe had to be loaded, there was not time to secure his prize, and carry it beyond danger, before he would be exposed to another shot. Under the circumstances, therefore, he did not pause an instant, but dashed into the woods and sought a cover. On the immediate point there was a small open area, partly in native grass and partly beach but a dense fringe of bushes lined its upper side. This narrow belt of dwarf vegetation passed. One issued immediately into the high and gloomy vaults of the forest. The land was tolerably level for a few hundred feet, and then it rose precipitously in a mountainside. The trees were tall, large, and so free from underbrush that they resembled vast columns, irregularly scattered, upholding a dome of leaves. Although they stood tolerably close together, for their ages and size, the eye could penetrate to considerable distances, and bodies of men, even, might have engaged beneath their cover, with concert and intelligence. Deerslayer knew that his adversary must be employed in reloading, unless he had fled. The former proved to be the case, for the young man had no sooner placed himself behind a tree than he caught a glimpse of the arm of the Indian his body being concealed by an oak, in the very act of forcing the leathered bullet home. Nothing would have been easier than to spring forward, and decide the affair by a close assault on his unprepared foe. But every feeling of Deerslayer revolted at such a step, although his own life had just been attempted from a cover. He was yet unpractised in the ruthless expedients of savage warfare, of which he knew nothing except by tradition and theory and it struck him as unfair advantage to assail an unarmed foe. His color had heightened, his eye frowned, his lips were compressed, and all his energies were collected and ready. But, instead of advancing to fire, he dropped his rifle to the usual position of a sportsman, in readiness to catch his aim, and muttered to himself, unconscious that he was speaking, "'No, no, that may be redskin warfare, but it's not a Christian's gifts.' Let the miscreant charge, and then we'll take it out like men. For the canoe he must not, and shall not have. No, no. Let him have time to load, and God will take care of the right." All this time the Indian had been so intent on his own movements, that he was even ignorant that his enemy was in the woods. His only apprehension was that the canoe would be recovered and carried away before he might be in readiness to prevent it. He had sought the cover from habit 
but he was within a few feet of the fringe of bushes, and could be at the margin of the forest in readiness to fire in a moment. The distance between him and his enemy was about fifty yards, and the trees were so arranged by nature that the line of sight was not interrupted, except by the particular trees behind which each party stood. His rifle was no sooner loaded than the savage glanced around him, and advanced incautiously as regarded the real, but stealthily as respected the fancied position of his enemy, until he was fairly exposed. Then Deerslayer stepped from behind its own cover, and hailed him. "'This away, Redskin! This away! If you're looking for me,' he called out, "'I'm young in war, but not so young as to stand on an open beach to be shot down like an owl by daylight. It rests on yourself whether it's peace or war atween us, for my gifts are white gifts, and I'm not one of them that thinks it valiant to slay human mortals singly in the woods.' The savage was a good deal startled by this sudden discovery of the danger he ran. He had a little knowledge of English, however, and caught the drift of the other's meaning. He was also too well schooled to betray alarm, but dropping the butt of his rifle to the earth, with an air of confidence, he made a gesture of lofty courtesy. All this was done with the ease and self-possession of one accustomed to consider no man his superior. In the midst of this consummate acting, however, the volcano that raged within caused his eyes to glare and his nostrils to dilate like those of some wild beast that is suddenly prevented from taking the fatal leap. Two canoes, he said in the deep guttural tones of his race, holding up the number of fingers he mentioned, by way of preventing mistakes. One for you, one for me. No, no, Mingo, that will never do. You own neither, and neither shall you have as long as I can prevent it. I know it's war atween your people and mine but that's no reason why human mortals should slay each other like savage creatures that meet in the woods. Go your way, then, and leave me to go mine. The world is large enough for us both, and when we meet fairly in battle, why, the Lord will order the fate of each of us." "'Good!' exclaimed the Indian. "'My brother missionary, great talk. All about Manitou.' "'Not so, not so, warrior. I'm not good enough for the Moravians, and am too good for most of the other vagabonds that preach about in the woods. No, no, I'm only a hunter, as yet, though afore the peace is made, tis like enough there'll be an occasion to strike a blow at some of your people. Still, I wish it to be done in fair fight, and not in a quarrel about the ownership of a miserable canoe. Good. My brother very young, but he is very wise, little warrior, great talker, chief sometimes in council. I don't know this, nor do I say it, Injun, returned Deerslayer, colouring a little at the ill-concealed sarcasm of the other's manner. I look forward to a life in the woods, and I only hope it may be a peaceable one. All young men must go on the war-path, when there's occasion. But war isn't needfully massacre. I've seen enough of the last this very night to know that Providence frowns on it and I now invite you to go your own way while I go mine, and hope that we may part friends. Good. My brother has two scalp, gray hair under other, old wisdom, young tongue." Here the savage advanced with confidence, his hand extended, his face smiling, and his whole bearing denoting amity and respect. Deerslayer met his offered friendship in a proper spirit and they shook hands cordially, each endeavouring to assure the other of his sincerity and desire to be at peace. "'All have his own,' said the Indian. "'My canoe, mine. Your canoe, yourn. Go look. If yourn, you keep. If mine, I keep.' "'That's just, Redskin, though you must be wrong in thinking the canoe your property. Howsever, seein' is believin' and we'll go down to the shore, where you may look with your own eyes, for it's likely you'll object to trustin' altogether to mine." The Indian uttered his favorite exclamation of, Good! And then they walked side by side towards the shore. There was no apparent distrust in the manner of either, the Indian moving in advance as if he wished to show his companion that he did not fear turning his back to him. As they reached the open ground, the former pointed towards Deerslayer's boat and said emphatically, "'No mine, pale-face canoe. This red man's. No want other man's canoe. Want his own.' 
"'You're wrong, Redskin. You're altogether wrong. This canoe was left in old Hutter's keeping, and is his'n according to law, red or white, till its owner comes to claim it. Here's the seats and the stitching of the bark to speak for themselves. No man ever knowed an injun to turn off such work. Good. My brother little old, big wisdom. Injun no make him. White man's work. I'm glad you think so, for holding out to the contrary might have made ill blood atween us, every one having a right to take possession of his own. I'll just shove the canoe out of reach of dispute at once, as the quickest way of settling difficulties. While Deerslayer was speaking, he put a foot against the end of the light boat, and giving a vigorous shove, he sent it out into the lake a hundred feet or more, where, taking the true current, it would necessarily float past the point, and be in no further danger of coming ashore. The savage started at this ready and decided expedient, and his companion saw that he cast a hurried and fierce glance at his own canoe, or that which contained the paddles. The change of manner, however, was but momentary and then the Iroquois resumed his air of friendliness and a smile of satisfaction. "'Good!' he repeated with stronger emphasis than ever. "'Young head, old mind, know how to settle quarrel. Farewell, brother. He go to house in water muskrat house. Injun go to camp. Tell chiefs no find canoe.' Deerslayer was not sorry to hear this proposal, for he felt anxious to join the females and he took the offered hand of the Indian very willingly. The parting words were friendly, and while the red man walked calmly towards the wood, with the rifle in the hollow of his arm, without once looking back in uneasiness or distrust, the white man moved towards the remaining canoe, carrying his piece in the same pacific manner. It is true, but keeping his eye fastened on the movements of the other. This distrust, however, seemed to be altogether uncalled for and as if ashamed to have entertained it, the young man averted his look, and stepped carelessly up to his boat. Here he began to push the canoe from the shore, and to make his other preparations for departing. He might have been thus employed a minute, when happening to turn his face towards the land, his quick and certain eye told him, at a glance, the imminent jeopardy in which his life was placed. The black, ferocious eyes of the savage were glancing on him, like those of the crouching tiger through a small opening in the bushes, and the muzzle of his rifle seemed already to be opening in a line with his own body. Then, indeed, the long practice of Deerslayer as a hunter did him good service. Accustomed to fire with the deer on the bound, and often when the precise position of the animal's body had in a manner to be guessed at, he used the same expedients here. To cock and poise his rifle were the acts of a single moment and a single motion. Then aiming almost without sighting, he fired into the bushes where he knew a body ought to be, in order to sustain the appalling countenance which alone was visible. There was not time to raise the piece any higher, or to take a more deliberate aim. So rapid were his movements that both parties discharged their pieces at the same instant, the concussions mingling in one report. The mountains indeed gave back but a single echo. Deerslayer dropped his piece, and stood with head erect steady as one of the pines in the calm of a June morning, watching the result. While the savage gave the yell that has become historical for its appalling influence, leaped through the bushes, and came bounding across the open ground, flourishing a tomahawk. Still Deerslayer moved not, but stood with his unloaded rifle fallen against his shoulders, while with the hunter's habits his hands were mechanically feeling for the powder-horn and charger. When about forty feet from his enemy, the savage hurled his keen weapon, but it was with an eye so vacant, and a hand so unsteady and feeble, that the young man caught it by the handle as it was flying past him. That instant the Indian staggered and fell his whole length on the ground. "'I knowed it! I knowed it!' exclaimed Deerslayer, who was already preparing to force a fresh bullet into his rifle. "'I knowed it must come to this as soon as I had got the range from the creature's eyes.' A man sights suddenly and fires quick when his own life's in danger. Yes, I knowed it would come to this. I was about the hundredth part of a second too quick for him, or it might have been bad for me. The reptile's bullet has just grazed my side. But say what you will, for or agin him. A redskin is by no means as sartin with powder and ball as a white man. Their gifts don't seem to lie that away. Even Chingachgook, great as he is in other matters, isn't downright deadly with the rifle. 
By this time the piece was reloaded, and Deerslayer, after tossing the tomahawk into the canoe, advanced to his victim, and stood over him, leaning on his rifle, in melancholy attention. It was the first instance in which he had seen a man fall in battle. It was the first fellow-creature against whom he had ever seriously raised his own hand. The sensations were novel, and regret, with the freshness of our better feelings, mingled with his triumph. The Indian was not dead, though shot directly through the body. He lay on his back motionless, but his eyes, now full of consciousness, watched each action of his victor as the fallen bird regards the fowler, jealous of every movement. The man probably expected the fatal blow which was to precede the loss of his scalp, or perhaps he anticipated that this latter act of cruelty would precede his death. Deerslayer read his thoughts, and he found a melancholy satisfaction in relieving the apprehensions of the helpless savage. "'No, no, Redskin,' he said, "'you've nothing more to fear from me. I am of a Christian stock, and scalping is not of my gifts. I'll just make certain of your rifle, and then come back to do you what service I can. Though here I can't stay much longer, as the crack of three rifles will be apt to bring some of your devils down upon me." The close of this was said in a sort of a soliloquy, as the young man went in quest of the fallen rifle. The piece was found where its owner had dropped it, and was immediately put into the canoe. Laying his own rifle at its side, Deerslayer then returned and stood over the Indian again. "'All enmity atween you and me's at an end, Redskin,' he said, "'and you may set your heart at rest on the score of the scalp, or any further injury. My gifts are white, as I've told you, and I hope my conduct will be white also.' Could looks have conveyed all they meant, it is probable that Deerslayer's innocent vanity on the subject of color would have been rebuked a little. But he comprehended the gratitude that was expressed in the eyes of the dying savage, without in the least detecting the bitter sarcasm that struggled with the better feeling. "'Water!' ejaculated the thirsty and unfortunate creature. "'Give poor Injun water!' "'Aye, water you shall have, if you drink the lake dry. I'll just carry you down to it, that you may take your fill. This is the way, they tell me, with all wounded people. Water is their greatest comfort and delight. So saying, Deerslayer raised the Indian in his arms, and carried him to the lake. Here he first helped him to take an attitude in which he could appease his burning thirst, after which he seated himself on a stone, and took the head of his wounded adversary in his own lap, and endeavored to soothe his anguish in the best manner he could. "'It would be sinful in me to tell you your time hadn't come, warrior,' he commenced, "'and therefore I'll not say it. You've passed the middle age already, and considering the sort of lives you lead, your days have been pretty well filled. The principal thing now is to look forward to what comes next. Neither redskin nor pale-face on the whole calculates much on sleeping forever. But both expect to live in another world. Each has his gifts, and will be judged by him. And I suppose you've thought these matters over enough not to stand in need of sermons when the trial comes. You'll find your happy hunting grounds, if you've been a just Injun. If an unjust, you'll meet your desarts in another way. I've my own ideas about these things, but you're too old and experienced to need any explanations from one as young as I." "'Good!' ejaculated the Indian, whose voice retained its depth, even as life ebbed away. "'Young head! Old wisdom! It's sometimes a consolation, when the end comes, to know that them we've harmed, or tried to harm, forgive us. I suppose nature seeks this relief, by way of getting a pardon on earth. As we never can know whether he pardons, who is all in all, till judgment itself comes. It's soothing to know that any pardon at such times. And that, I conclude, is the secret. Now, as for myself, I overlook altogether your designs again my life first, because no harm came of em, next, because it's your gifts, and nature, and trainin', and I ought not to have trusted you at all, and finally, and chiefly, because I can bear no ill-will to a dying man, whether heathen or Christian. So put your heart at ease, so far as I'm concerned. You know best what other matters ought to trouble you, or what ought to give you satisfaction in so trying a moment. 
It is probable that the Indian had some of the fearful glimpses of the unknown state of being which God, in mercy, seems at times to afford to all the human race, but they were necessarily in conformity with his habits and prejudices. Like most of his people, and like too many of our own, he thought more of dying in a way to gain applause among those he left than to secure a better state of existence hereafter. While Deerslayer was speaking, his mind was a little bewildered, though he felt that the intention was good. And when he had done, a regret passed over his spirit that none of his own tribe were present to witness his stoicism, under extreme bodily suffering, and the firmness with which he met his end. With the high innate courtesy that so often distinguishes the Indian warrior before he becomes corrupted by too much intercourse with the worst class of the white men, he endeavored to express his thankfulness for the other's good intentions, and to let him understand that they were appreciated. "'Good,' he repeated, for this was an English word much used by the savages. "'Good. Young head. Young heart, too. Old heart tough. No shed tear. Hear Indian when he die, and no want to lie. What he call him?' "'Deerslayer is the name I bear now.' though the Delawares have said that when I get back from this warpath I shall have a more manly title, provided I can earn one. That good name for boy, poor name for warrior. He get better quick. No fear there, the savage had strength sufficient under the strong excitement he felt to raise a hand and tap the young man on his breast. Eye sartin, finger lightning, aim death. Great warrior soon. No deer slayer. Hawkeye, Hawkeye, Hawkeye. Shake hand. Deerslayer, or Hawkeye, as the youth was then first named, for in after years he bore the appellation throughout all that region, Deerslayer took the hand of the savage, whose last breath was drawn in that attitude, gazing in admiration at the countenance of a stranger, who had shown so much readiness, skill, and firmness, in a scene that was equally trying and novel. When the reader remembers it is the highest gratification an Indian can receive to see his enemy betray weakness, he will be better able to appreciate the conduct which had extorted so great a concession at such a moment. "'His spirit has fled,' said Deerslayer, in a suppressed melancholy voice. "'Ah's me! Well, to this we must all come, sooner or later, and he is happiest, let his skin be what color it may, who is best fitted to meet it. Here lies the body of no doubt a brave warrior and the soul is already flying towards its heaven or hell, whether that be a happy hunting-ground, a place scant of game, regions of glory, according to Moravian doctrine, or flames of fire. So it happens, too, as regards other matters. Here have old Hutter and Hurry Harry got themselves into difficulty, if they haven't got themselves into torment and death, and all for a bounty that luck offers to me in what many would think a lawful and suitable manner but not a farthing of such money shall cross my hand. White I was born, and white will I die, clinging to color to the last, even though the King's Majesty, his governors, and all his councils, both at home and in the colonies, forget from what they come, and where they hope to go, and all for a little advantage in warfare. No, no, warrior, hand of mine shall never molest your scalp and so your soul may rest in peace on the pint of making a decent appearance when the body comes to join it, in your own land of spirits." Deerslayer arose as soon as he had spoken. Then he placed the body of the dead man in a sitting posture, with its back against the little rock, taking the necessary care to prevent it from falling or in any way settling into an attitude that might be thought unseemly by the sensitive, though wild notions of a savage. When this duty was performed, the young man stood gazing at the grim countenance of his fallen foe, in a sort of melancholy abstraction. As was his practice, however, a habit gained by living so much alone in the forest, he then began again to give utterance to his thoughts and feelings aloud. "'I didn't wish your life, Redskin,' he said. "'But you left me no choice atween killing or being killed. Each party acted according to his gifts, I suppose, and blame can light on neither. You were treacherous, according to your nature, in war, and I was a little oversightful, as I'm apt to be in trusting others. Well, this is my first battle with a human mortal, though it's not likely to be the last. I have fought most of the creatures of the forest, such as bears, wolves, painters, 
and catamounts. But this is the beginning with the redskins. If I was Injun born now, I might tell of this, or carry in the scalp, and boast of the exploit before the whole tribe. Or, if my enemy had only been even a bear, twould have been natural and proper to let everybody know what had happened. But I don't well see how I'm to let even Chingachgook into this secret, so long as it can be done only by boasting with a white tongue. And why should I wish to boast of it, after all? It's slaying a human, although he was a savage. And how do I know that he was a just Injun, and that he has not been taken away suddenly to anything but happy hunting grounds? When it's uncertain whether good or evil has been done, the wisest way is not to be boastful. Still, I should like Chingachgook to know that I haven't discredited the Delawares, or my training." Part of this was uttered aloud, while part was merely muttered between the speaker's teeth, his more confident opinions enjoying the first advantage while his doubts were expressed in the latter mode. Soliloquy and reflection received a startling interruption, however, by the sudden appearance of a second Indian on the lake shore, a few hundred yards from the point. This man, evidently another scout, who had probably been drawn to the place by the reports of the rifles, broke out of the forest with so little caution that Deerslayer caught a view of his person before he was himself discovered. When the latter event did occur, as was the case a moment later, the savage gave a loud yell, which was answered by a dozen voices from different parts of the mountainside. There was no longer any time for delay. In another minute the boat was quitting the shore under long and steady sweeps of the paddle. As soon as Deerslayer believed himself to be at a safe distance, he ceased his efforts, permitting the little bark to drift, while he leisurely took a survey of the state of things. The canoe first sent adrift was floating before the air, quite a quarter of a mile above him, and a little nearer to the shore than he wished, now that he knew more of the savages were so near at hand. The canoe shoved from the point was within a few yards of him, he having directed his own course towards it on quitting the land. The dead Indian lay in grim quiet where he had left him. The warrior who had shown himself from the forest had already vanished, and the woods themselves were as silent and seemingly deserted as the day they came fresh from the hands of their great Creator. This profound stillness, however, lasted but a moment. When time had been given to the scouts of the enemy to reconnoitre, they burst out of the thicket upon the naked point, filling the air with yells of fury at discovering the death of their companion. These cries were immediately succeeded by shouts of delight, when they reached the body, and clustered eagerly around it. Deerslayer was a sufficient adept in the usages of the natives, to understand the reason of the change. The yell was the customary lamentation at the loss of a warrior, the shout a sign of rejoicing that the conqueror had not been able to secure the scalp. The trophy, without which a victory is never considered complete. The distance at which the canoes lay probably prevented any attempts to injure the conqueror, the American Indian, like the panther of his own woods, seldom making any effort against his foe, unless tolerably certain it is under circumstances that may be expected to prove effective. As the young man had no longer any motive to remain near the point, he prepared to collect his canoes, in order to tow them off to the castle. That nearest was soon in tow, when he proceeded in quest of the other which was all this time floating up the lake. The eye of Deerslayer was no sooner fastened on this last boat, than it struck him that it was nearer to the shore than it would have been had it merely followed the course of the gentle current of air. He began to suspect the influence of some unseen current in the water, and he quickened his exertions, in order to regain possession of it before it could drift into a dangerous proximity to the woods. On getting nearer, he thought that the canoe had a perceptible motion through the water, and as it lay broadside to the air, that this motion was taking it towards the land. A few vigorous strokes of the paddle carried him still nearer, when the mystery was explained. Something was evidently in motion on the off side of the canoe, or that which was farthest from himself, and closer scrutiny showed that it was a naked human arm. An Indian was lying in the bottom of the canoe, and was propelling it slowly but certainly to the shore using his hand as a paddle. Deerslayer understood the whole artifice at a glance. A savage had swum off to the boat while he was occupied with his enemy on the point, got possession, and was using these means to urge it to the shore. Satisfied that the man in the canoe could have no arms, 
Deerslayer did not hesitate to dash close alongside of the retiring boat, without deeming it necessary to raise his own rifle. As soon as the wash of the water which he made in approaching became audible to the prostrate savage, the latter sprang to his feet and uttered an exclamation that proved how completely he was taken by surprise. If you've enjoyed yourself enough in that canoe, Redskin, Deerslayer coolly observed, stopping his own career in sufficient time to prevent an absolute collision between the two boats, if you've enjoyed yourself enough in that canoe, you'll do a prudent act by taking to the lake again. I'm reasonable in these matters, and don't crave your blood, though there's them that would look upon you more as a do-bill for the bounty than a human mortal. Take to the lake this minute, afore we get to hot words. The savage was one of those who did not understand a word of English, and he was indebted to the gestures of Deerslayer and to the expression of an eye that did not often deceive, for an imperfect comprehension of his meaning. Perhaps, too, the sight of the rifle that lay so near the hand of the white man quickened his decision. At all events he crouched like a tiger about to take his leap, uttered a yell, and the next instant his naked body disappeared in the water. When he rose to take breath, it was at the distance of several yards from the canoe, and the hasty glance he threw behind him denoted how much he feared the arrival of a fatal messenger from the rifle of his foe. But the young man made no indication of any hostile intention. Deliberately securing the canoe to the others, he began to paddle from the shore, and by the time the Indian reached the land, and had shaken himself like a spaniel on quitting the water, his dreaded enemy was already beyond rifle-shot on his way to the castle. As was so much his practice, Deerslayer did not fail to soliloquize on what had just occurred, while steadily pursuing his course towards the point of destination. "'Well, well,' he commenced. "'Twould have been wrong to kill a human mortal without an object. Scalps are of no account with me, and life is sweet, and ought not to be taken mercilessly by them that have white gifts. The savage was a mingo, it's true, and I make no doubt he is and will be as long as he lives. A rail, reptile, and vagabond. But that's no reason I should forget my gifts and color. No, no. Let him go. If ever we meet again, rifle in hand, why then twill be seen which has the stoutest heart and the quickest eye. Hawkeye. That's not a bad name for a warrior, sounding much more manful and valiant than Deerslayer. Twouldn't be a bad title to begin with, and it has been fairly earned. If twas Chingachgook now, he might go home and boast of his deeds, and the chiefs would name him Hawkeye in a minute. But it don't become white blood to brag, and it isn't easy to see how the matter can be known unless I do. Well, well, everything is in the hands of Providence, this affair as well as another. I'll trust to that for getting my desarts in all things." Having thus betrayed what might be termed his weak spot, the young man continued to paddle in silence, making his way diligently and as fast as his toes would allow him, towards the castle. By this time the sun had not only risen, but it had appeared over the eastern mountains, and was shedding a flood of glorious light on this as yet unchristened sheet of water. The whole scene was radiant with beauty, and no one unaccustomed to the ordinary history of the woods would fancy it had so lately witnessed incidents so ruthless and barbarous. As he approached the building of old Hutter, Deerslayer thought, or rather felt, that its appearance was in singular harmony with all the rest of the scene. Although nothing had been consulted but strength and security, the rude massive logs, covered with their rough bark, the projecting roof, and the form, would contribute to render the building picturesque, in almost any situation, while its actual position added novelty and piquancy to its other points of interest. When Deerslayer drew nearer to the castle, however, Objects of interest presented themselves that at once eclipsed any beauties that might have distinguished the scenery of the lake and the site of the singular edifice. Judith and Hetty stood on the platform before the door, Hurry's dooryard awaiting his approach with manifest anxiety, the former from time to time taking a survey of his person and of the canoes through the old ship's spyglass that has been already mentioned. Never probably did this girl seem more brilliantly beautiful than at that moment the flush of anxiety and alarm increasing her color to its richest tints, while the softness of her eyes, a charm that even poor Hetty shared with her, was deepened by intense concern. Such, at least, without pausing or pretending to analyze motives, or to draw any other very nice distinction between cause and effect, were the opinions of the young man as his canoes reached the side of the ark, 
where he carefully fastened all three before he put his foot on the platform. End of chapter 7 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 8 of The Deerslayer this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 8 His words are bonds, his oaths are oracles, his love sincere, his thoughts immaculate, his tears pure messengers sent from his heart, his heart as far from fraud as heaven from earth. Two Gentlemen of Verona, Act Two, Scene Seven, Lines seventy five through seventy eight. Neither of the girls spoke as Deerslayer stood before them alone, his countenance betraying all the apprehension he felt on account of two absent members of their party. Father, Judith at length exclaimed, succeeding in uttering the word as it might be by a desperate effort. He's met with misfortune, and there's no use in concealing it answered Deerslayer, in his direct and simple-minded manner. He and Hurry are in Mingo hands, and heaven only knows what's to be the termination. I've got the canoe safe, and that's a consolation, since the vagabonds will have to swim for it, or raft off, to come near this place. At sunset we'll be reinforced by Chingachgook, if I can manage to get him into a canoe. And then, I think, we two can answer for the ark and the castle, till some of the officers in the garrisons hear of this war-path which sooner or later must be the case, when we may look for succor from that quarter, if from no other." "'The officers!' exclaimed Judith impatiently, her color deepening, and her eye expressing a lively but passing emotion. "'Who thinks or speaks of the heartless gallants now? We are sufficient of ourselves to defend the castle. But what of my father, and of poor Hurry Harry?' "'Tis natural you should feel this concern for your own parent, Judith, and I suppose it's equally so that you should feel it for Hurry Harry, too." Deerslayer then commenced a succinct but clear narrative of all that occurred during the night, in no manner concealing what had befallen his two companions, or his own opinion of what might prove to be the consequences. The girls listened with profound attention, but neither betrayed that feminine apprehension and concern which would have followed such a communication when made to those who were less accustomed to the hazards and accidents of a frontier life. To the surprise of Deerslayer, Judith seemed the most distressed, Hetty listening eagerly, but appearing to brood over the facts in melancholy silence, rather than betraying any outward signs of feeling. The former's agitation the young man did not fail to attribute to the interest she felt in hurry, quite as much as to her filial love, while Hetty's apparent indifference was ascribed to that mental darkness which, in a measure, obscured her intellect and which possibly prevented her from foreseeing all the consequences. Little was said, however, by either, Judith and her sister busying themselves in making the preparations for the morning meal, as they who habitually attend to such matters toil on mechanically, even in the midst of suffering and sorrow. The plain but nutritious breakfast was eaten by all three in sombre silence, but Deerslayer gave proof of possessing one material requisite of a good soldier that of preserving his appetite in the midst of the most alarming and embarrassing circumstances. The meal was nearly ended before a syllable was uttered. Then, however, Judith spoke in the convulsive and hurried manner in which feeling breaks through restraint, after the latter has become more painful than even the betrayal of emotion. "'Father would have relished this fish,' she exclaimed. "'He says the salmon of the lakes is almost as good as the salmon of the sea.' "'Your father has been acquainted with the sea, they tell me, Judith,' returned the young man, who could not forbear throwing a glance of inquiry at the girl. For in common with all who knew Hutter, he had some curiosity on the subject of his early history. Hurry Harry tells me he was once a sailor. Judith first looked perplexed. Then, influenced by feelings that were novel to her, in more ways than one, she became suddenly communicative, and seemingly much interested in the discourse. If Hurry knows anything of father's history, I would he had told it to me," she cried. Sometimes I think, too, he was once a sailor, and then again I think he was not. If that chest were open, or if it could speak, 
It might let us into his whole history, but its fastenings are too strong to be broken like pack-thread." Deerslayer turned to the chest in question, and for the first time examined it closely. Although discolored, and bearing proofs of having received much ill-treatment, he saw that it was of materials and workmanship altogether superior to anything of the same sort he had ever before beheld. The wood was dark, rich, and had once been highly polished, though the treatment it had received left little gloss on its surface, and various scratches and indentations proved the rough collisions it had encountered with substances still harder than itself. The corners were firmly bound with steel, elaborately and richly wrought, while the locks, of which it had no less than three, and the hinges, were of a fashion and workmanship that would have attracted attention even in a warehouse of curious furniture. This chest was quite large, and when Deerslayer arose and endeavoured to raise an end by its massive handle, he found that the weight fully corresponded with the external appearance. "'Did you never see that chest opened, Judith?' the young man demanded with frontier freedom, for delicacy on such subjects was little felt among the people on the verge of civilization in that age, even if it be to-day. "'Never. Father has never opened it in my presence if he ever opens it at all. No one here has ever seen its lid raised, unless it be father, nor do I even know that he has ever seen it. Now you're wrong, Judith, Hetty quietly answered. Father has raised the lid, and I've seen him do it. A feeling of manliness kept the mouth of Deerslayer shut, for while he would not have hesitated about going far beyond what would be thought the bounds of propriety in questioning the older sister, he had just scruples about taking what might be thought an advantage of the feeble intellect of the younger. Judith, being under no such restraint, however, turned quickly to the last speaker and continued the discourse. "'When and where did you ever see that chest opened, Hetty?' "'Here, and again and again. Father often opens it when you are away, though he don't in the least mind my being by and seeing all he does, as well as hearing all he says.' And what is it that he does, and what does he say?" "'That I cannot tell you, Judith,' returned the other, in a low but resolute voice. "'Father's secrets are not my secrets.' "'Secrets! This is stranger still, Deerslayer, that father should tell them to Hetty, and not tell them to me.' "'There's a good reason for that, Judith, though you're not to know it. Father's not here to answer for himself, and I'll say no more about it.' Judith and Deerslayer looked surprised, and for a minute the first seemed pained. But suddenly recollecting herself, she turned away from her sister, as if in pity for her weakness, and addressed the young man. "'You've told but half your story,' she said, breaking off at the place where you went to sleep in the canoe, or rather where you rose to listen to the cry of the loon. We heard the call of the loons, too, and thought their cries might bring a storm, though we are little used to tempests on this lake at this season of the year. The winds blow and the tempests howl as God pleases, sometimes at one season and sometimes at another," answered Deerslayer, and the loons speak according to their nature. Better would it be if men were as honest and frank. After I rose to listen to the birds, finding it could not be hurry's signal, I lay down and slept. When the day dawned I was up and stirring as usual, and then I went in chase of the two canoes, lest the Mingos should lay hands on them. "'You have not told us all, Deerslayer,' said Judith earnestly. "'We heard rifles under the eastern mountain. The echoes were full and long, and came so soon after the reports that the pieces must have been fired on or quite near to the shore. Our ears are used to these signs, and are not to be deceived.' "'They've done their duty, gal, this time. Yes, they've done their duty. Rifles have been sighted this morning, aye, and triggers pulled too, though not as often as they might have been. One warrior has gone to his happy hunting-grounds, and that's the whole of it. A man of white blood and white gifts is not to be expected to boast of his exploits and to flourish scalps." Judith listened almost breathlessly, and when Deerslayer, in his quiet, modest manner, seemed disposed to quit the subject, she rose and, crossing the room, took a seat by his side. The manner of the girl had nothing forward about it though it betrayed the quick instinct of a female's affection, and the sympathizing kindness of a woman's heart. She even took the hard hand of the hunter, and pressed it in both her own, unconsciously to herself, perhaps, while she looked earnestly and even reproachfully into his sunburnt face. "'You have been fighting the savages, Deerslayer, singly and by yourself,' she said. 
In your wish to take care of us, of Hetty, of me, perhaps, you fought the enemy bravely, with no eye to encourage your deeds or to witness your fall, had it pleased Providence to suffer so great a calamity. I've fought, Judith, yes. I have fought the enemy, and that, too, for the first time in my life. These things must be, and they bring with them a mixed feeling of sorrow and triumph. Human nature is a fightin' nature, I suppose, as all nations kill in battle, and we must be true to our rights and gifts. What has yet been done is no great matter, but should Chingachgook come to the rock this evening, as is agreed between us, and I get him off it unbeknown to the savages, or, if known to them, again their wishes and designs, then may we all look to something like warfare, afore the Mingos shall get possession of either the castle, or the ark, or yourselves. Who is this Chingachgook? From what place does he come, and why does he come here? The questions are natural and right, I suppose, though the youth has a great name already in his own part of the country. Chingachgook is a Mohican by blood, consorting with the Delawares by usage, as is the case with most of his tribe, which has long been broken by the increase of our color. He is of the family of the great chiefs, Uncas his father having been the considerablest warrior and counsellor of his people. Even old Tamanund honors Chingachgook, though he is thought to be yet too young to lead in war. And then the nation is so dispersed and diminished that chieftainship among them has got to be little more than a name. Well, this war having commenced in earnest, the Delaware and I rendezvoused an appointment to meet this evening at sunset on the rendezvous rock at the foot of this very lake, intending to come out on our first hostile expedition again the Mingos. Why we come exactly this away is our own secret but thoughtful young men on the warpath, as you may suppose, do nothing without a calculation and a design. "'A Delaware can have no unfriendly intentions toward us,' said Judith, after a moment's hesitation, "'and we know you to be friendly. Treachery is the last crime I hope to be accused of,' returned Deerslayer, hurt at the gleam of distrust that had shot through Judith's mind, and least of all treachery to my own color. "'No one suspects you, Deerslayer,' the girl impetuously cried. "No." No. Your honest countenance would be sufficient surety for the truth of a thousand hearts. If all men had as honest tongues, and no more promised what they did not mean to perform, there would be less wrong done in the world, and fine feathers and scarlet cloaks would not be excuses for baseness and deception." The girl spoke with strong, nay, even with convulsed feeling, and her fine eyes, usually so soft and alluring, flashed fire as she concluded. Deerslayer could not but observe this extraordinary emotion, but with the tact of a courtier he avoided not only any allusion to the circumstance, but succeeded in concealing the effect of his discovery on himself. Judith gradually grew calm again, and as she was obviously anxious to appear to advantage in the eyes of the young man, she was soon able to renew the conversation as composedly as if nothing had occurred to disturb her. I have no right to look into your secrets, or the secrets of your friend, Deerslayer," she continued, and am ready to take all you say on trust. If we can really get another male ally to join us at this trying moment, it will aid us much, and I am not without hope that when the savages find that we are able to keep the lake, they will offer to give up their prisoners in exchange for skins, or at least for the keg of powder that we have in the house." The young man had the words scalps and bounty on his lips, but a reluctance to alarm the feelings of the daughters prevented him from making the allusion he had intended to the probable fate of their father. Still, so little was he practised in the arts of deception that his expressive countenance was, of itself, understood by the quick-witted Judith, whose intelligence had been sharpened by the risks and habits of her life. "'I understand what you mean,' she continued hurriedly, "'and what you would say but for the fear of hurting me, us, I mean, for Hetty loves her father quite as well as I do. But this is not as we think of Indians. They never scalp an unhurt prisoner, but would rather take him away alive, unless, indeed, the fierce wish for torturing should get the mastery of them. I fear nothing for my father's scalp, and little for his life. Could they steal on us in the night, we should all probably suffer in this way. But men taken in open strife are seldom injured not at least until the time of torture comes. That's tradition, I'll allow, and it's according to practice. But, Judith, do you know the errand on which your father and Hurry went again the savages?" "'I do, 
and a cruel errand it was. But what will you have? Men will be men, and some even that flaunt in their gold and silver and carry the king's commission in their pockets are not guiltless of equal cruelty. Judith's eye again flashed, but by a desperate struggle she resumed her composure. I get warm when I think of all the wrong that men do, she added, affecting to smile, an effort in which she only succeeded indifferently well. All this is silly. What is done is done, and it cannot be mended by complaints. But the Indians think so little of the shedding of blood, and value men so much for the boldness of their undertakings, that, did they know the business on which their prisoners came, they would be more likely to honor than to injure them for it. For a time, Judith, yes, I allow that, for a time. But when that feeling dies away, then will come the love of revenge. We must endeavor, Chingachgook and I, we must endeavor to see what we can do to get Hurry and your father free, for the Mingles will no doubt hover about this lake some days in order to make the most of their success. You think this Delaware can be depended on, Deerslayer? demanded the girl, thoughtfully. As much as I can myself. You say you do not suspect me, Judith? You! Taking his hand again, and pressing it between her own, with a warmth that might have awakened the vanity of one less simple-minded, and more disposed to dwell on his own good qualities, I would as soon suspect a brother. I have known you but a day, dear Slayer, but it has awakened the confidence of a year. Your name, however, is not unknown to me, for the gallants of the garrisons frequently speak of the lessons you have given them in hunting, and all proclaim your honesty. Do they ever talk of the shooting, gal? inquired the other eagerly, after a however laughing in a silent but heartfelt manner. Do they ever talk of the shooting? I want to hear nothing about my own, for if that isn't satisfied by this time, in all these parts, there's little use in being skilful and sure. But what do the officers say of their own? Yes, what do they say of their own? Arms, as they call it, is their trade, and yet there's some among em that know very little how to use em. Such, I hope, will not be the case with your friend Chingachgook, as you call him. What is the English of his Indian name? Big Sarpent. So called for his wisdom and cunning. Uncas is his real name, all his family being called Uncas until they get a title that has been earned by deeds. If he has all this wisdom, we may expect a useful friend in him, unless his own business in this part of the country should prevent him from serving us. I see no great harm in telling you who is earned, arter all and as you may find means to help us, I will let you and Hetty into the whole matter, trusting that you'll keep the secret as if it was your own. You must know that Chingachgook is a comely Injun, and is much looked upon and admired by the young women of his tribe, both on account of his family and on account of himself. Now there is a chief that has a daughter called Watawa, which is interpreted into Histohist, in the English tongue, the rarest gal among the Delawares and the one most sought at her, and craved for a wife by all the young warriors of the nation. Well, Chingachgook, among others, took a fancy to Watawa, and Watawa took a fancy to him. Here Deerslayer paused an instant, for, as he got thus far in his tail, Hetty Hutter arose, approached, and stood attentive at his knee, as a child draws near to listen to the legends of its mother. Yes, he fancied her, and she fancied him, resumed Deerslayer, casting a friendly and approving glance at the innocent and interested girl. And when that is the case, and all the elders are agreed, it does not often happen that the young couple keep apart. Chingachgook couldn't well carry off such a prize without making enemies among them that wanted her as much as he did himself. A certain Briarthorn, as we call him in English, or Yokoman, as he is termed in Injun, took it most to heart, and we mistrust him of having a hand in all that followed. Watawa went with her father and mother two moons ago to fish for salmon on the western streams, where it is agreed by all in these parts that fish most abounds. And while thus implied, the gal vanished. For several weeks we could get no tidings of her. But here, ten days since, a runner that came through the Delaware country, brought us a message, by which we learn that Watawa was stolen from her people, we think, but do not know it, by Briarthorn's circumventions, and that she was now with the enemy, who had adopted her, and wanted her to marry a young Mingo. The message said that the party intended to hunt and forage through the region for a month or two, afore it went back into the Canadas, and that if we could contrive to get on a scent in this quarter, something might turn up that would lead to our getting the maiden off. 
"'And how does that concern you, Deerslayer?' demanded Judith, a little anxiously. "'It concerns me, as all things that touches a friend concerns a friend. I'm here as Chingachgook's aid and helper, and if we can get the young maiden he likes back again, it will give me almost as much pleasure as if I had got back my own sweetheart. And where, then, is your sweetheart, dear Slayer? She's in the forest, Judith, hanging from the boughs of the trees, in a soft rain, in the dew on the open grass, the clouds that float about in the blue heavens, the birds that sing in the woods, the sweet springs where I slake my thirst, and in all the other glorious gifts that come from God's providence. You mean that, as yet, you've never loved one of my sex, but love best your haunts and your own manner of life. That's it. That's just it. I am white, have a white heart, and can't, in reason, love a red-skinned maiden, who must have a red-skinned heart and feelings. No, no, I'm sound enough in them particulars, and hope to remain so, at least till this war is over. I find my time too much taken up with Chingachgook's affair to wish to have one of my own on my hands afore that is settled. The girl that finally wins you, dear Slayer, will at least win an honest heart, one without treachery or guile, and that will be a victory that most of her sex ought to envy. As Judith uttered this, her beautiful face had a resentful frown on it, while a bitter smile lingered around a mouth that no derangement of the muscles could render anything but handsome. Her companion observed the change, and though little skilled in the workings of the female heart, he had sufficient native delicacy to understand that it might be well to drop the subject. As the hour when Chingachgook was expected still remained distant, Deerslayer had time enough to examine into the state of the defences, and to make such additional arrangements as were in his power, and the exigency of the moment seemed to require. The experience and foresight of Hutter had left little to be done in these particulars. Still, several precautions suggested themselves to the young man, who may be said to have studied the art of frontier warfare through the traditions and legends of the people among whom he had so long lived. The distance between the castle and the nearest point on the shore prevented any apprehension on the subject of rifle bullets thrown from the land. The house was within musket-shot in one sense, it was true, but aim was entirely out of the question, and even Judith professed a perfect disregard of any danger from that source. So long, then, as the party remained in possession of the fortress, they were safe, unless their assailants could find the means to come off and carry it by fire or storm, or by some of the devices of Indian cunning and Indian treachery. Against the first source of danger Hutter had made ample provision, and the building itself, the bark roof excepted, was not very combustible. The floor was scuttled in several places, and buckets provided with ropes were in daily use in readiness for any such emergency. One of the girls could easily extinguish any fire that might be lighted, provided it had not time to make much headway. Judith, who appeared to understand all her father's schemes of defense, and who had the spirit to take no unimportant share in the execution of them, explained all these details to the young man, who was thus saved much time and labor in making his investigations. Little was to be apprehended during the day. In possession of the canoes and of the ark, no other vessel was to be found on the lake. Nevertheless, Deerslayer well knew that a raft was soon made, and, as dead trees were to be found in abundance near the water, did the savages seriously contemplate the risks of an assault, it would not be a very difficult matter to find the necessary means. The celebrated American axe, a tool that is quite unrivaled in its way, was then not very extensively known, and the savages were far from expert in the use of its hatchet-like substitute. Still, they had sufficient practice in crossing streams by this mode to render it certain they would construct a raft, should they deem it expedient to expose themselves to the risks of an assault. The death of their warrior might prove a sufficient incentive, or it might act as a caution, but Deerslayer thought it more than possible that the succeeding night would bring matters to a crisis, and in this precise way. This impression caused him to wish ardently for the presence and succor of his Mohican friend, and to look forward to the approach of sunset with an increased anxiety. 
As the day advanced, the party in the castle matured their plans, and made their preparations. Judith was active, and seemed to find a pleasure in consulting and advising with her new acquaintance, whose indifference to danger, manly devotion to herself and sister, guilelessness of manner, and truth of feeling, had won rapidly on both her imagination and her affections. Although the hours appeared long in some respects to Deerslayer, Judith did not find them so and when the sun began to descend towards the pine-clad summits of the western hills, she felt and expressed her surprise that the day should so soon be drawing to a close. On the other hand, Hetty was moody and silent. She was never loquacious, or if she occasionally became communicative, it was under the influence of some temporary excitement that served to arouse her unsophisticated mind. But for hours at a time, in the course of this all-important day, she seemed to have absolutely lost the use of her tongue, nor did apprehension on account of her father materially affect the manner of either sister. Neither appeared seriously to dread any evil greater than captivity, and once or twice, when Hetty did speak, she intimated the expectation that Hutter would find the means to liberate himself. Although Judith was less sanguine on this head, she too betrayed the hope that propositions for a ransom would come when the Indians discovered that the castle set their expedients and artifices at defiance. Deerslayer, however, treated these passing suggestions as the ill-digested fancies of girls, making his own arrangements as steadily, and brooding over the future as seriously, as if they had never fallen from their lips. At length the hour arrived when it became necessary to proceed to the place of rendezvous appointed with the Mohican, or Delaware, as Chingachgook was more commonly called. As the plan had been matured by Deerslayer, and fully communicated to his companions, all three set about its execution in concert, and intelligently. Hetty passed into the ark, and fastening two of the canoes together she entered one, and paddled up to a sort of gateway in the palisados that surrounded the building, through which she carried both, securing them beneath the house by chains that were fastened within the building. These palisados were trunks of trees driven firmly into the mud, and served the double purpose of a small enclosure that was intended to be used in this very manner, and to keep any enemy that might approach in boats at arm's length. Canoes thus docked were, in a measure, hid from sight, and as the gate was properly barred and fastened, it would not be an easy task to remove them, even in the event of their being seen. Previously, however, to closing the gate, Judith also entered within the enclosure with the third canoe, leaving Deerslayer busy in securing the door and windows inside the building, over her head. As everything was massive and strong, and small saplings were used as bars, it would have been the work of an hour or two to break into the building, when Deerslayer had ended his task, even allowing the assailants the use of any tools but the axe, and to be unresisted. This attention to security arose from Hutter's having been robbed once or twice by the lawless whites of the frontiers, during some of his many absences from home. As soon as all was fast in the inside of the dwelling, Deerslayer appeared at a trap, from which he descended into the canoe of Judith. When this was done he fastened the door with a massive staple and stout padlock. Hetty was then received in the canoe, which was shoved outside of the palisados. The next precaution was to fasten the gate, and the keys were carried into the ark. The three were now fastened out of the dwelling which could only be entered by violence, or by following the course taken by the young man in quitting it. The glass had been brought outside as a preliminary step, and Deerslayer next took a careful survey of the entire shore of the lake, as far as his own position would allow. Not a living thing was visible. A few birds accepted and even the last fluttered about in the shades of the trees as if unwilling to encounter the heat of a sultry afternoon. All the nearest points, in particular, were subjected to severe scrutiny in order to make certain that no raft was in preparation, the result everywhere giving the same picture of calm solitude. A few words will explain the greatest embarrassment belonging to the situation of our party. Exposed themselves to the observation of any watchful eyes, the movements of their enemies were concealed by the drapery of a dense forest, while the imagination would be very apt to people the latter with more warriors than it really contained, their own weakness must be too apparent to all who might chance to cast a glance in their direction. "'Nothing is stirring, howsoever,' exclaimed Deerslayer, as he finally lowered the glass and prepared to enter the ark. "'If the vagabonds do harbor mischief in their minds, they are too cunning to let it be seen. 
It's true, a raft may be in preparation in the woods, but it has not yet been brought down to the lake. They can't guess that we are about to quit the castle, and, if they did, they've no means of knowing where we intend to go." "'This is so true, dear Slayer,' returned Judith, "'that now all is ready we may proceed at once, boldly, and without the fear of being followed. Else we shall be behind our time. No, no, the matter needs management, for though the savages are in the dark as to Chingachgook and the rock, they've eyes and legs and will see in what direction we steer, and will be certain to follow us. I shall strive to baffle em, howsoever, by heading the scow in all manner of ways, first in one quarter and then in another, until they get to be a leg weary and tired of tramping after us. So far as it was in his power, Deerslayer was as good as his word. In less than five minutes after this speech was made, the whole party was in the ark, and in motion. There was a gentle breeze from the north, and boldly hoisting the sail, the young man laid the head of the unwieldy craft in such a direction as, after making a liberal but necessary allowance for leeway, would have brought it ashore a couple of miles down the lake, and on its eastern side. The sailing of the ark was never very swift though, floating as it did on the surface, it was not difficult to get it in motion, or to urge it along over the water at the rate of some three or four miles in the hour. The distance between the castle and the rock was a little more than two leagues. Knowing the punctuality of an Indian, Deerslayer had made his calculations closely, and had given himself a little more time than was necessary to reach the place of rendezvous, with a view to delay or to press his arrival, as might prove most expedient. When he hoisted the sail, the sun lay above the western hills, at an elevation that promised rather more than two hours of day, and a few minutes satisfied him that the progress of the scow was such as to equal his expectations. It was a glorious June afternoon, and never did that solitary sheet of water seem less like an arena of strife and bloodshed. The light air scarce descended as low as the bed of the lake, hovering over it as if unwilling to disturb its deep tranquillity or to ruffle its mirror-like surface. Even the forests appeared to be slumbering in the sun, and a few piles of fleecy clouds had lain for hours along the northern horizon like fixtures in the atmosphere, placed there purely to embellish the scene. A few aquatic fowls occasionally skimmed along the water, and a single raven was visible sailing high above the trees, and keeping a watchful eye on the forest beneath him in order to detect anything having life that the mysterious woods might offer as prey. The reader will probably have observed that, amidst the frankness and abruptness of manner which marked the frontier habits of Judith, her language was superior to that used by her male companions, her own father included. This difference extended as well to pronunciation as to the choice of words and phrases. Perhaps nothing so soon betrays the education and association as the modes of speech and few accomplishments so much aid the charm of female beauty as a graceful and even utterance, while nothing so soon produces the disenchantment that necessarily follows a discrepancy between appearance and manner, as a mean intonation of voice or a vulgar use of words. Judith and her sister were marked exceptions to all the girls of their class, along that whole frontier, the officers of the nearest garrison having often flattered the former with the belief that few ladies of the towns acquitted themselves better than herself, in this important particular. This was far from being literally true, but it was sufficiently near the fact to give birth to the compliment. The girls were indebted to their mother for this proficiency, having acquired from her in childhood an advantage that no subsequent study or labor can give without a drawback, if neglected beyond the earlier periods of life. Who that mother was, or rather had been, no one but Hutter knew. She had now been dead two summers, and, as was stated by Hurry, she had been buried in the lake. Whether in indulgence of a prejudice, or from a reluctance to take the trouble to dig her grave, had frequently been a matter of discussion between the rude beings of that region. Judith had never visited the spot, but Hetty was present at the interment, and she often paddled a canoe about sunset or by the light of the moon, to the place, and gazed down into the limpid water in the hope of being able to catch a glimpse of the form that she had so tenderly loved from infancy to the sad hour of their parting. "'Must we reach the rock exactly at the moment the sun sets?' Judith demanded of the young man as they stood near each other, Deerslayer holding the steering oar and she working with a needle at some ornament of dress, 
that much exceeded her station in life, and was altogether a novelty in the woods? Will a few minutes sooner or later alter the matter? It will be very hazardous to remain long as near the shore as that rock. That's it, Judith. That's the very difficulty. The rock's within pint blank for a shotgun, and twill never do to hover about it too close and too long. When you have to deal with an injun, you must calculate and manage, for a red nature dearly likes circumvention. Now you see, Judith, that I do not steer towards the rock at all, but here to the eastward of it, whereby the savages will be tramping off in that direction, and get their legs a-wearied, and all for no advantage. You think, then, they see us and watch our movements, dear Slayer. I was in hopes they might have fallen back into the woods, and left us to ourselves for a few hours. That's altogether a woman's consate. There's no let-up in an injun's watchfulness, when he's on a war-path, and eyes are on us at this minute, though the lake preserves us. We must draw near the rock on a calculation, and endeavor to get the miscreants on a false scent. The Mingos have good noses, they tell me, but a white man's reason ought always to equalize their instinct. Judith now entered into a desultory discourse with Deerslayer, in which the girl betrayed her growing interest in the young man, an interest that his simplicity of mind and her decision of character, sustained as it was by the consciousness awakened by the consideration her personal charms so universally produced, rendered her less anxious to conceal than might otherwise have been the case. She was scarcely forward in her manner though there was sometimes a freedom in her glances that it required all the aid of her exceeding beauty to prevent from awakening suspicions unfavorable to her discretion, if not to her morals. With Deerslayer, however, these glances were rendered less obnoxious to so unpleasant a construction, for she seldom looked at him without discovering much of the sincerity and nature that accompany the purest emotions of woman. It was a little remarkable that, as his captivity lengthened, neither of the girls manifested any great concern for her father. But, as has been said already, their habits gave them confidence, and they looked forward to his liberation, by means of a ransom, with a confidence that might, in a great degree, account for their apparent indifference. Once before, Hutter had been in the hands of the Iroquois, and a few skins had readily effected his release. This event, however, unknown to the sisters, had occurred in a time of peace between England and France and when the savages were restrained, instead of being encouraged to commit their excesses, by the policy of the different colonial governments. While Judith was loquacious and caressing in her manner, Hetty remained thoughtful and silent. Once, indeed, she drew near to Deerslayer, and questioned him a little closely as to his intentions, as well as concerning the mode of effecting his purpose. But her wish to converse went no further. As soon as her simple queries were answered, and answered they all were in the fullest and kindest manner, she withdrew to her seat, and continued to work on a coarse garment that she was making for her father, sometimes humming a low melancholy air, and frequently sighing. In this manner the time passed away, and when the sun was beginning to glow behind the fringe of the pines that bounded the western hill, or about twenty minutes before it actually set, the ark was nearly as low as the point where Hutter and Hurry had been made prisoners. By shearing first to one side of the lake and then to the other, Deerslayer managed to create an uncertainty as to his object, and doubtless the savages who were unquestionably watching his movements were led to believe that his aim was to communicate with them, at or near this spot, and would hasten in that direction in order to be in readiness to profit by circumstances. This artifice was well managed, since the sweep of the bay, the curvature of the lake, and the low marshy land that intervened, would probably allow the ark to reach the rock before its pursuers, if really collected near this point, could have time to make the circuit that would be required to get there by land. With a view to aid this deception, Deerslayer stood as near the western shore as was at all prudent, and then causing Judith and Hetty to enter the house, or cabin, and crouching himself so as to conceal his person by the frame of the scow, he suddenly threw the head of the latter around, and began to make the best of his way towards the outlet. Favored by an increase in the wind, the progress of the ark was such as to promise the complete success of this plan, though the crab-like movement of the craft compelled the helmsman to keep its head looking in a direction very different from that in which it was actually moving. End of chapter 8 Recording by Bill Borst
Chapter Nine of the Deerslayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer, by James Fenimore Cooper, Chapter Nine. Yet art thou prodigal of smiles, smiles sweeter than thy frowns are stern. Earth sends from all her thousand isles a shout at thy return. The glory that comes down from thee bathes in deep joy the land and sea. Bryant, The Firmament, 11, lines 19 to 24. It may assist the reader in understanding the events we are about to record, if he has a rapidly sketched picture of the scene, placed before his eyes at a single view. It will be remembered that the lake was an irregularly shaped basin, of an outline that in the main was oval but with bays and points to relieve its formality and ornament its shores. The surface of this beautiful sheet of water was now glittering like a gem, in the last rays of the evening sun, and the setting of the whole, hills clothed in the richest forest verdure, was lighted up with a sort of radiant smile that is best described in the beautiful lines we have placed at the head of this chapter. As the banks, with few exceptions, rose abruptly from the water, even where the mountain did not immediately bound the view. There was a nearly unbroken fringe of leaves overhanging the placid lake, the trees starting out of the acclivities, inclining to the light, until in many instances they extended their long limbs and straight trunks some forty or fifty feet beyond the line of the perpendicular. In these cases we allude only to the giants of the forest, pines of a hundred or a hundred and fifty feet in height, for of the smaller growth very many inclined so far as to steep their lower branches in the water. In the position in which the ark had now got, the castle was concealed from view by the projection of a point, as indeed was the northern extremity of the lake itself. A respectable mountain, forest-clad, and rounded, like all the rest, limited the view in that direction, stretching immediately across the whole of the fair scene, with the exception of a deep bay that passed the western end lengthening the basin for more than a mile. The manner in which the water flowed out of the lake, beneath the leafy arches of the trees that lined the sides of the stream, has already been mentioned, and it has also been said that the rock, which was a favorite place of rendezvous throughout all that region, and where Deerslayer now expected to meet his friend, stood near this outlet, and at no great distance from the shore. It was a large isolated stone that rested on the bottom of the lake apparently left there when the waters tore away the earth from around it, enforcing for themselves a passage down the river, and which had obtained its shape from the action of the elements during the slow progress of centuries. The height of this rock could scarcely equal six feet, and, has been said, its shape was not unlike that which is usually given to beehives, or to a haycock. The latter, indeed, gives the best idea not only of its form, but of its dimensions. It stood, and still stands, for we are writing of real scenes, within fifty feet of the bank, and in water that was only two feet in depth, though there were seasons in which its rounded apex, if such a term can properly be used, was covered by the lake. Many of the trees stretched so far forward as almost to blend the rock with the shore, when seen from a little distance, and one tall pine in particular overhung it in a way to form a noble and appropriate canopy to a seat that had held many a forest chieftain, during the long succession of unknown ages, in which America, and all it contained, had existed apart, in mysterious solitude, a world by itself, equally without a familiar history, and without an origin that the annals of man can reach. When distant some two or three hundred feet from the shore, Deerslayer took in his sail. He dropped his grapnel as soon as he found the ark had drifted in a line that was directly to windward of the rock. The motion of the scow was then checked, when it was brought head to wind, by the action of the breeze. As soon as this was done, Deerslayer paid out line, and suffered the vessel to set down upon the rock, as fast as the light air could force it to leeward. Floating entirely on the surface, this was soon effected, and the young man checked the drift when he was told that the stern of the scow was within fifteen or eighteen feet of the desired spot. In executing this manoeuvre Deerslayer had proceeded promptly, 
for while he did not in the least doubt that he was both watched and followed by the foe, he believed he distracted their movements by the apparent uncertainty of his own, and he knew they could have no means of ascertaining that the rock was his aim, unless indeed one of their prisoners had betrayed him, a chance so improbable in itself as to give him no concern. Notwithstanding the celerity and decision of his movements, he did not, however, venture so near the shore without taking due precautions to effect a retreat, in the event of its becoming necessary. He held the line in his hand, and Judith was stationed at a loop on the side of the cabin next the shore, where she could watch the beach and the rock, and give timely notice of the approach of either friend or foe. Hetty was also placed on watch, but it was to keep the trees overhead in view, lest some enemy might ascend one, and, by completely commanding the interior of the scow, render the defence of the hut, or cabin, useless. The sun had disappeared from the lake and valley, when Deerslayer checked the ark, in the manner mentioned. Still it wanted a few minutes to the true sunset, and he knew Indian punctuality too well to anticipate any unmanly haste in his friend. The great question was, whether surrounded by enemies as he was known to be, he had escaped their toils. The occurrences of the last twenty-four hours must be a secret to him, and, like himself, Chingachgook was yet young on a path. It was true he came prepared to encounter the party that withheld his promised bride, but he had no means of ascertaining the extent of the danger he ran, or the precise positions occupied by either friends or foes. In a word, the trained sagacity and untiring caution of an Indian were all he had to rely on, amid the critical risks he unavoidably ran. "'Is the rock empty, Judith?' inquired Deerslayer, as soon as he had checked the drift of the ark, deeming it imprudent to venture unnecessarily near the shore. "'Is anything to be seen of the Delaware chief?' "'Nothing, Deerslayer. Neither rock, shore, trees, nor lake seems to have ever held a human form. Keep close, Judith, keep close, Hetty. A rifle has a prying eye, a nimble foot, and a desperate fatal tongue. Keep close, then, but keep up active looks, and be on the alert. "'Twould grieve me to the heart did any harm befall either of you. "'And you, dear slayer," exclaimed Judith, turning her handsome face from the loop to bestow a gracious and grateful look on the young man, "'do you keep close, and have a proper care that the savages do not catch a glimpse of you. A bullet might be as fatal to you as to one of us, and the blow that you felt would be felt by us all.' "'No fear of me, Judith. No fear of me, my good gal.' Do not look this away, although you look so pleasant and comely. But keep your eyes on the rock, and the shore, and the— Deerslayer was interrupted by a slight exclamation from the girl, who, in obedience to his hurried gestures, as much as in obedience to his words, had immediately bent her looks again, in the opposite direction. "'What is it? What is it, Judith?' he hastily demanded. "'Is anything to be seen?' "'There is a man on the rock, an Indian warrior, in his paint and armed. Where does he wear his hawk's feather?" eagerly added Deerslayer, relaxing his hold of the line in readiness to drift nearer to the place of rendezvous. Is it fast to the warlock, or does he carry it above the left ear? Tis as you say, above the left ear. He smiles, too, and mutters the word Mohican. "'God be praised! Tis the serpent at last!' exclaimed the young man, suffering the line to slip through his hands until hearing a light bound in the other end of the craft, he instantly checked the rope, and began to haul it in again, under the assurance that his object was effected. At that moment the door of the cabin was opened hastily, and a warrior, darting through the little room, stood at Deerslayer's side, simply uttering the exclamation, "Hug!" At the next instant Judith and Hetty shrieked and the air was filled with the yell of twenty savages who came leaping through the branches, down the bank, some actually falling headlong into the water in their haste. "'Pull, dear slayer!' cried Judith, hastily barring the door, in order to prevent an inroad by the passage through which the Delaware had just entered. "'Pull for life and death! The lake is full of savages, waiting after us!' The young men, for Chingachgook immediately came to his friend's assistance, 
needed no second bidding, but they applied themselves to their task in a way that showed how urgent they deemed the occasion. The great difficulty was in suddenly overcoming the inertia of so large a mass, for once in motion it was easy to cause the scow to skim the water with all the necessary speed. "'Pull, Deerslayer, for heaven's sake!' cried Judith, again at the loop. These wretches rush into the water like hounds following their prey. Ah! The scow moves! And now the water deepens to the armpits of the foremost. But they reach forward, and will seize the ark!" A slight scream, and then a joyous laugh followed from the girl, the first produced by a desperate effort of their pursuers, and the last by its failure. The scow, which had now got fairly in motion gliding ahead into deep water with a velocity that set the designs of their enemies at naught. As the two men were prevented by the position of the cabin from seeing what passed astern, they were compelled to inquire of the girls into the state of the chase. "'What now, Judith? What next? Do the Mingos still follow, or are we quit of them, for the present?' demanded Deerslayer, when he felt the rope yielding as if the scow was going fast ahead and heard the scream and laugh of the girl, almost in the same breath. "'They have vanished. One, the last, is just burying himself in the bushes of the bank. There, he has disappeared in the shadows of the trees. You have got your friend, and we are all safe.' The two men now made another great effort, pulled the ark up swiftly to the grapnel, tripped it, and when the scow had shot some distance and lost its way, they let the anchor drop again. Then, for the first time since their meeting, they ceased their efforts, as the floating house now lay several hundred feet from the shore, and offered a complete protection against bullets, there was no longer any danger or any motive for immediate exertion. The manner in which the two friends now recognized each other was highly characteristic. Chingachgook, a noble, tall, handsome, and athletic young Indian warrior, first examined his rifle with care, opening the pan to make sure that the priming was not wet, and assured of this important fact, he next cast furtive but observant glances around him, at the strange habitation, and at the two girls. Still he spoke not, and most of all did he avoid the betrayal of a womanish curiosity by asking questions. "'Judith and Hetty,' said Deerslayer, with an untaught natural courtesy, this is the Mohican chief of whom you have heard me speak, Chingachgook, as he is called, which signifies Big Sarpent, so named for his wisdom and prudence, and cunning, and my earliest and latest friend. I know it must be he by the hawk's feather over the left ear, most other warriors wearing him on the warlock. As Deerslayer ceased speaking, he laughed heartily, excited more perhaps by the delight of having got his friend safe at his side under circumstances so trying, than by any conceit that happened to cross his fancy, and exhibiting this outbreaking of feeling in a manner that was a little remarkable, since his merriment was not accompanied by any noise. Although Chingachgook both understood and spoke English, he was unwilling to communicate his thoughts in it, like most Indians, and when he had met Judith's cordial shake of the hand, and Hetty's milder salute, in the courteous manner that became a chief, he turned away apparently to await the moment when it might suit his friend to enter into an explanation of his future intentions, and to give a narrative of what had passed since their separation. The other understood his meaning, and discovered his own mode of reasoning in the matter by addressing the girls. "'This wind will soon die away altogether, now the sun is down,' he said, and there is no need for rowing again it. In half an hour or so it will either be a flat calm or the air will come off from the south shore, when we will begin our journey back again to the castle. In the meanwhile the Delaware and I will talk over matters, and get correct ideas of each other's notions concerning the course we ought to take." No one opposed this proposition, and the girls withdrew into the cabin to prepare the evening meal, while the two young men took their seats on the head of the scow and began to converse. The dialogue was in the language of the Delawares. As that dialect, however, is but little understood, even by the learned, we shall not only on this, but on all subsequent occasions, render such parts as it may be necessary to give closely into liberal English, preserving as far as possible the idiom and peculiarities of the respective speakers, by way of presenting the pictures in the most graphic forms to the minds of the readers. 
It is unnecessary to enter into the details first related by Deerslayer, who gave a brief narrative of the facts that are already familiar to those who have read our pages. In relating these events, however, it may be well to say that the speaker touched only on the outlines, more particularly abstaining from saying anything about his encounter with, and victory over, the Iroquois, as well as to his own exertions in behalf of the two deserted young women. When Deerslayer ended, the Delaware took up the narrative, in turn, speaking sententiously and with grave dignity. His account was both clear and short, nor was it embellished by any incidents that did not directly concern the history of his departure from the villages of his people, and his arrival in the valley of the Susquehanna. On reaching the latter, which was at a point only half a mile south of the outlet, he had soon struck a trail, which gave him notice of the probable vicinity of enemies. Being prepared for such an occurrence, the object of the expedition calling him directly into the neighborhood of the party of Iroquois that was known to be out, he considered the discovery as fortunate, rather than the reverse, and took the usual precautions to turn it to account. First following the river to its source, and ascertaining the position of the rock, he met another trail, and had actually been hovering for hours on the flanks of his enemies watching equally for an opportunity to meet his mistress, and to take a scalp, and it may be questioned which he most ardently desired. He kept near the lake, and occasionally he ventured to some spot where he could get a view of what was passing on its surface. The ark had been seen and watched, from the moment it hove in sight, though the young chief was necessarily ignorant that it was to be the instrument of his effecting the desired junction with his friend. The uncertainty of its movements, and the fact that it was unquestionably managed by white men, soon led him to conjecture the truth, however, and he held himself in readiness to get on board whenever a suitable occasion might offer. As the sun drew near the horizon, he repaired to the rock, where, on emerging from the forest, he was gratified in finding the ark lying, apparently, in readiness to receive him. The manner of his appearance, and of his entrance into the craft, is known. Although Chingachgook had been closely watching his enemies for hours, their sudden and close pursuit as he reached the scow was as much a matter of surprise to himself as it had been to his friend. He could only account for it by the fact of their being more numerous than he had at first supposed, and by their having out parties of the existence of which he was ignorant. Their regular and permanent encampment, if the word permanent can be applied to the residence of a party, that intended to remain out in all probability but a few weeks, was not far from the spot where Hutter and Hurry had fallen into their hands, and, as a matter of course, near a spring. "'Well, Sarpent,' asked Deerslayer, when the other had ended his brief but spirited narrative, speaking always in the Delaware tongue, which for the reader's convenience we only render into the peculiar vernacular of the speaker, "'Well, Sarpent, as you've been scouting around these Mingos, have you anything to tell us of their captives, the father of these young women, and of another who, I somewhat conclude, is the lovier of one of them? Chingachgook has seen them, an old man and a young warrior, the falling hemlock and the tall pine. You're not so much out, Delaware, you're not so much out. Old Hutter is decaying of a certainty, though many solid blocks might be hewn out of his trunk yet. And as for Hurry Harry, so far as height and strength and comeliness go, he may be called the pride of the human forest. Were the men bound, or in any manner suffering torture? I ask on account of the young women who, I dare to say, would be glad to know. It is not so, dear Slayer. The Mingos are too many to cage their game. Some watch, some sleep, some scout, some hunt. The pale faces are treated like brothers to-day. To-morrow they will lose their scalps. Yes, that's red nature, and must be submitted to. Judith and Hetty— Here's comforting tidings for you, the Delaware telling me that neither your father nor Hurry Harry is in suffering, but baiting the loss of liberty, as well off as we are ourselves. Of course they are kept in the camp, otherwise they do much as they please. I rejoice to hear this, dear Slayer, returned Judith, and now we are joined by your friend. I make no manner of question that we shall find an opportunity to ransom the prisoners. If there are any women in the camp, I have articles of dress that will catch their eyes, and, should the worst come to the worst, we can open the great chest, which I think will be found to hold things that may tempt the chiefs." "'Judith,' said the young man, 
looking up at her with a smile and an expression of earnest curiosity, that in spite of the growing obscurity did not escape the watchful looks of the girl. Can you find it in your heart to part with your own finery, to release prisoners, even though one be your own father, and the other is your sworn suitor and lover? The flush on the face of the girl arose in part from resentment, but more perhaps from a gentler and a novel feeling that, with the capricious waywardness of taste, had been rapidly rendering her more sensitive to the good opinion of the youth who questioned her than to that of any other person. Suppressing the angry sensation with instinctive quickness, she answered with a readiness and truth that caused her sister to draw near to listen, though the obtuse intellect of the latter was far from comprehending the workings of a heart as treacherous, as uncertain, and as impetuous in its feelings as that of the spoiled and flattered beauty. Deerslayer, answered Judith, after a moment's pause, I shall be honest with you. I confess that the time has been when what you call finery was to me the dearest thing on earth. But I begin to feel differently. Though Hurry Harry is not to me, nor ever can be, I would give all I own to set him free. If I would do this for blustering, bullying, talking Hurry, who has nothing but good looks to recommend him, you may judge what I would do for my own father. This sounds well and is according to woman's gifts. Ah's me! The same feelin's is to be found among the young women of the Delawares. I've known em, often and often, sacrifice their vanity to their hearts. Tis as it should be, tis as it should be, I suppose, in both colours. Woman was created for the feelin's, and is pretty much ruled by feelin'. Would the savages let father go, if Judith and I give them all our best things, demanded Hetty, in her innocent, mild manner? Their women might interfere, good Hetty. Yes, their women might interfere with such an end in view. But tell me, Sarpent, how is it as to squaws among the knaves? Have they many of their own women in the camp? The Delaware heard and understood all that passed, though with Indian gravity and finesse he had sat with averted face, seemingly inattentive to a discourse in which he had no direct concern. Thus appealed to, however, he answered his friend in his ordinary sententious manner. Six, he said, holding up all the fingers of one hand and the thumb of the other. Besides this, the last number denoted his betrothed, whom, with the poetry and truth of nature, he described by laying his hand on his own heart. Did you see her, chief? Did you get a glimpse of her pleasant countenance, or come close enough to her ear to sing in it the song she loves to hear? No, dear Slayer, the trees were too many, and leaves covered their boughs like clouds hiding the heavens in a storm. But—and the young warrior turned his dark face towards his friend, with a smile on it that illuminated its fierce-looking paint and naturally stern lineaments with a bright gleam of human feeling—Chingachgook heard the laugh of Watawa, and knew it from the laugh of the women of the Iroquois. It sounded in his ears like the chirp of the wren. Ay, trust a lovier's ear for that, and a Delaware's ear for all sounds that are ever heard in the woods. I know not why it is so, Judith, but when young men, and I dares to say it may be all the same with young women too, but when they get to have kind feelin's toward each other, it's wonderful how pleasant the laugh or the speech becomes to the other person. I've seen grim warriors listening to the chattering and the laughing of young gals, as if it was church music, such as is heard in the old Dutch church that stands in the great street of Albany, where I've been more than once with peltry and game. And you, dear slayer, said Judith quickly, and with more sensibility than marked her usually light and thoughtless manner, have you never felt how pleasant it is to listen to the laugh of the girl you love? Lord bless you, gal! Why, I've never lived enough among my own color to drop into them sort of feelin's. No, never. I dares to say they are natural and right, but to me there's no music so sweet as the sighing of the wind in the tree-tops, and the rippling of a stream from a full, sparkling, native fountain of pure forest water. Unless, indeed, he continued, dropping his head for an instant in a thoughtful manner, unless, indeed, it be the open mouth of a sartin hound when I'm on the track of a fat buck. As for unsartain dogs, I care little for their cries, seeing they are as likely to speak when the deer is not in sight as when it is." Judith walked slowly and pensively away. 
nor was there any of her ordinary calculating coquetry in the light tremulous sigh that unconsciously to herself arose to her lips. On the other hand, Hetty listened with guileless attention, though it struck her simple mind as singular that the young man should prefer the melody of the woods to the songs of girls, or even to the laugh of innocence and joy. Accustomed, however, to defer in most things to her sister, she soon followed Judith into the cabin, where she took a seat and remained pondering intensely over some occurrence, or resolution, or opinion, which was a secret to all but herself. Left alone, Deerslayer and his friend resumed their discourse. "'Has the young pale-face hunter been long on this lake?' demanded the Delaware, after courteously waiting for the other to speak first. "'Only since yesterday noon, Sarpent, though that has been long enough to see and do much. The gaze that the Indian fastened on his companion was so keen that it seemed to mock the gathering darkness of the night. As the other furtively returned his look, he saw the two black eyes glistening on him, like the balls of the panther, or those of the penned wolf. He understood the meaning of this glowing gaze, and answered evasively, as he fancied would best become the modesty of a white man's gifts. "'Tis as you suspect, Sarpent. Yes, tis somewhat that away. I have fell in with the enemy, and I suppose it may be said I fought them, too." An exclamation of delight and exultation escaped the Indian, and then, laying his hand eagerly on the arm of his friend, he asked if there were any scalps taken. That I will maintain in the face of all the Delaware tribe, old Tamanund, and your own father the great Uncas, as well as the rest, is again white gifts. My scalp is on my head, as you can see, Sarpent, and that was the only scalp that was in danger when one side was altogether Christian and white. Did no warrior fall? Deerslayer did not get his name by being slow of sight or clumsy with the rifle. In that particular, chief, your nearer reason and therefore nearer being right. I may say one Mingo fell." "'A chief!' demanded the other, with startling vehemence. "'Nay, that's more than I know, or can say. He was artful, and treacherous, and stout-hearted, and may well have gained popularity enough with his people to be named to that rank. The man fought well, though his eye wasn't quick enough for one who had had his schooling in your company, Delaware." "'My brother and friend struck the body?' That was uncalled for, seeing that the Mingo died in my arms. The truth may as well be said at once. He fought like a man of red gifts, and I fought like a man with gifts of my own color. God gave me the victory. I couldn't fly in the face of His providence by forgetting my birth and nature. White He made me, and white I shall live and die." Good! Deerslayer is a pale face, and has pale face hands. A Delaware will look for the scalp, and hang it on a pole, and sing a song in his honor, when we go back to our people. The glory belongs to the tribe. It must not be lost. This is easy talking, but twill not be as easy doing. The Mingo's body is in the hands of his friends, and no doubt is hid in some hole where Delaware cunning will never be able to get at the scalp. The young man then gave his friend a succinct but clear account of the event of the morning concealing nothing of any moment, and yet touching on everything modestly and with a careful attention to avoid the Indian habit of boasting. Chingachgook again expressed his satisfaction at the honor won by his friend, and then both arose, the hour having arrived when it became prudent to move the ark further from the land. It was now quite dark, the heavens having become clouded, and the stars hid. The north wind had ceased, as was usual with the setting of the sun and a light air arose from the south. This change favoring the design of Deerslayer, he lifted his grapnel, and the scow immediately and quite perceptibly began to drift more into the lake. The sail was set, when the motion of the craft increased to a rate not much less than two miles in the hour. As this superseded the necessity of rowing, an occupation that an Indian would not be likely to desire, Deerslayer, Chingachgook, and Judith seated themselves in the stern of the scow, where they first governed its movements by holding the oar. Here they discoursed on their future movements, and on the means that ought to be used in order to effect the liberation of their friends. In this dialogue Judith held a material part, the Delaware readily understanding all she said, 
while his own replies and remarks, both of which were few and pithy, were occasionally rendered into English by his friend. Judith rose greatly in the estimation of her companions, in the half-hour that followed. Prompt of resolution and firm of purpose, her suggestions and expedients partook of her spirit and sagacity, both of which were of a character to find favour with men of the frontier. The events that had occurred since their meeting, as well as her isolated and dependent situation, induced the girl to feel towards Deerslayer like the friend of a year instead of an acquaintance of a day. And so completely had she been won by his guileless truth of character, and of feeling, pure novelties in our sex, as respected her own experience, that his peculiarities excited her curiosity, and created a confidence that had never been awakened by any other man. Hitherto she had been compelled to stand on the defensive in her intercourse with men, with what success was best known to herself. But here had she been suddenly thrown into the society and under the protection of a youth, who evidently as little contemplated evil towards herself as if he had been her brother. The freshness of his integrity, the poetry and truth of his feelings, and even the quaintness of his forms of speech, all had their influence, and aided in awakening an interest that she found as pure as it was sudden and deep. Hurry's fine face and manly form had never compensated for his boisterous and vulgar tone, and her intercourse with the officers had prepared her to make comparisons under which even his great natural advantages suffered. But this very intercourse with the officers who occasionally came upon the lake to fish and hunt had an effect in producing her present sentiments towards the young stranger. With them, while her vanity had been gratified and her self-love strongly awakened, she had many causes deeply to regret the acquaintance, if not to mourn over it, in secret sorrow, for it was impossible for one of her quick intellect not to perceive how hollow was the association between superior and inferior and that she was regarded as the plaything of an idle hour, rather than as an equal and a friend, by even the best-intentioned and least designing of her scarlet-clad admirers. Deerslayer, on the other hand, had a window in his breast through which the light of his honesty was ever shining. And even his indifference to charms that so rarely failed to produce a sensation piqued the pride of the girl, and gave him an interest that another, seemingly more favoured by nature, might have failed to excite. In this manner half an hour passed, during which time the ark had been slowly stealing over the water, the darkness thickening around it, though it was easy to see that the gloom of the forest at the southern end of the lake was getting to be distant, while the mountains that lined the sides of the beautiful basin were overshadowing it, nearly from side to side. There was, indeed, a narrow stripe of water, in the centre of the lake, where the dim light that was still shed from the heavens fell upon its surface in a line extending north and south, and along this faint track a sort of inverted milky way, in which the obscurity was not quite as dense as in other places. The scow held her course, he who steered well knowing that it led in the direction he wished to go. The reader is not to suppose, however, that any difficulty could exist as to the course. This would have been determined by that of the air had it not been possible to distinguish the mountains, as well as by the dim opening in the south, which marked the position of the valley in that quarter, above the plain of tall trees, by a sort of lessened obscurity. The difference between the darkness of the forest and that of the night is seen only in the air. The peculiarities at length caught the attention of Judith and the deerslayer, and the conversation ceased to allow each to gaze at the solemn stillness and deep repose of nature. "'Tis a gloomy night,' observed the girl, after a pause of several minutes. "'I hope we may be able to find the castle. "'Little fear of our missing that, if we keep this path in the middle of the lake,' returned the young man. "'Nature has made us a road here, and, dim as it is, there'll be little difficulty following it. Do you hear nothing, dear Slayer? It seemed as if the water was stirring quite near us. Certainly something did move the water, uncommon-like. Must have been a fish. Them creatures prey upon each other like men and animals on the land. One has leaped into the air and fallen hard back into his own element. Tis of little use, Judith, for any to strive to get out of their elements, since it's nature to stay in em, and nature will have its way. Ha! That sounds like a paddle. 
used with more than common caution. At this moment the Delaware bent forward and pointed significantly into the boundary of gloom, as if some object had suddenly caught his eye. Both Deerslayer and Judith followed the direction of his gesture, and each got a view of a canoe at the same instant. The glimpse of this startling neighbor was dim, and to eyes less practiced it might have been uncertain, though to those in the ark the object was evidently a canoe with a single individual in it, the latter standing erect and paddling. How many lay concealed in its bottom, of course, could not be known. Flight, by means of oars from a bark canoe impelled by vigorous and skillful hands, was utterly impracticable, and each of the men seized his rifle in expectation of a conflict. "'I can easily bring down the paddler,' whispered Deerslayer. "'But we'll first hail him, and ask his errand.' Then, raising his voice, he continued in a solemn manner. "'Hold! If ye come nearer, I must fire, though contrary to my wishes, and then sartain death will follow. Stop paddling, and answer.' "'Fire, and slay a poor defenseless girl,' returned a soft, tremulous female voice, "'and God will never forgive you. Go your way, dear slayer, and let me go mine.' "'Hetty!' exclaimed the young man, and Judith, in a breath, and the former sprang instantly to the spot where he had left the canoe they had been towing. It was gone, and he understood the whole affair. As for the fugitive, frightened at the menace she ceased paddling, and remained dimly visible, resembling a spectral outline of a human form, standing on the water. At the next moment the sail was lowered to prevent the ark from passing the spot where the canoe lay. This last expedient, however, was not taken in time, for the momentum of so heavy a craft, and the impulsion of the air soon set her by, bringing Hetty directly to windward, though still visible as the change in the positions of the two boats now placed her in that species of Milky Way which has been mentioned. "'What can this mean, Judith?' demanded Deerslayer. "'Why has your sister taken the canoe and left us? You know she is feeble-minded, poor girl, and she has her own ideas of what ought to be done. She loves her father more than most children love their parents, and—then—' "'Then what, gal?' This is a trying moment, one in which truth must be spoken." Judith felt a generous and womanly regret at betraying her sister, and she hesitated ere she spoke again. But once more urged by Deerslayer, and conscious herself of all the risks the whole party was running by the indiscretion of Hetty, she could refrain no longer. "'Then I fear poor, weak-minded Hetty has not been altogether able to see all the vanity and rudeness and folly that lie hid behind the handsome face and fine form of Hurry Harry. She talks of him in her sleep, and sometimes betrays the inclination in her waking moments. "'You think, Judith, that your sister is now bent on some mad scheme, to serve her father and Hurry, which will in all likelihood give them reptiles, the Mingos, the mastership of a canoe? Such, I fear, will turn out to be the fact, dear Slayer. Poor Hetty has hardly sufficient cunning to outwit a savage. All this while the canoe with the form of Hetty erect in one end of it was dimly perceptible, though the greater drift of the ark rendered it, at each instant, less and less distinct. It was evident no time was to be lost, lest it should altogether disappear. The rifles were now laid aside as useless, the two men seizing the oars and sweeping the head of the scow round in the direction of the canoe. Judith, accustomed to the office, flew to the other end of the ark and placed herself at what might be called the helm. Hetty took the alarm at these preparations, which could not be made without noise, and started off like a bird that had been suddenly put up by the approach of unexpected danger. As Deerslayer and his companion rode with the energy of those who felt the necessity of straining every nerve, and Hetty's strength was impaired by a nervous desire to escape, the chase would have quickly terminated in the capture of the fugitive, had not the girl made several short and unlooked-for deviations in her course. These turnings gave her time, and they had also the effect of gradually bringing both canoe and ark within the deeper gloom, cast by the shadows from the hills. They also gradually increased the distance between the fugitive and her pursuers, until Judith called out to her companions to cease rowing, for she had completely lost sight of the canoe. When this mortifying announcement was made, 
Hetty was actually so near as to understand every syllable her sister uttered, though the latter had used the precaution of speaking as low as circumstances would allow her to do, and to make herself heard. Hetty stopped paddling at the same moment, and waited the result with an impatience that was breathless, equally from her late exertions and her desire to land. A dead silence immediately fell on the lake, during which the three in the ark were using their senses differently, in order to detect the position of the canoe. Judith bent forward to listen, in the hope of catching some sound that might betray the direction in which her sister was stealing away, while her two companions brought their eyes as near as possible to a level with the water, in order to detect any object that might be floating on its surface. All was vain, however, for neither sound nor sight rewarded their efforts. All this time Hetty, who had not the cunning to sink into the canoe, stood erect, a finger pressed on her lips, gazing in the direction in which the voices had last been heard, resembling a statue of profound and timid attention. Her ingenuity had barely sufficed to enable her to seize the canoe and to quit the ark, in the noiseless manner related, and then it appeared to be momentarily exhausted. Even the doublings of the canoe had been as much the consequence of an uncertain hand and of nervous agitation as of any craftiness or calculation. The pause continued several minutes, during which Deerslayer and the Delaware conferred together in the language of the latter. Then the oars dipped again, and the ark moved away, rowing with as little noise as possible. It steered westward, a little southerly, or in the direction of the encampment of the enemy. Having reached a point at no great distance from the shore, and where the obscurity was intense on account of the proximity of the land, it lay there near an hour in waiting for the expected approach of Hetty, who, it was thought, would make the best of her way to that spot as soon as she believed herself released from the danger of pursuit. No success rewarded this little blockade, however, neither appearance nor sound denoting the passage of the canoe. Disappointed at this failure, and conscious of the importance of getting possession of the fortress before it could be seized by the enemy, Deerslayer now took his way towards the castle with the apprehension that all his foresight in securing the canoes would be defeated by this unguarded and alarming movement on the part of the feeble-minded Hetty. End of chapter 9 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 10 of The Deerslayer this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter Ten. But who in this wild wood may credit give to either eye or ear? From rocky precipice or hollow cave, midst the confused sound of rustling leaves and creaking boughs and cries of nightly birds, Returning seeming answer. Joanna Behi, Rainer, a tragedy. Two, lines three through four, six through G. Fear, as much as calculation, had induced Hetty to cease paddling, when she found that her pursuers did not know in which direction to proceed. She remained stationary until the ark had pulled in near the encampment, as has been related in the preceding chapter when she resumed the paddle and with cautious strokes made the best of her way towards the western shore. In order to avoid her pursuers, however, who she rightly suspected would soon be rowing along that shore themselves, the head of the canoe was pointed so far north as to bring her to land on a point that thrust itself into the lake, at the distance of near a league from the outlet. Nor was this altogether the result of a desire to escape, for, Feeble-minded as she was, Hetty Hutter had a good deal of that instinctive caution which so often keeps those whom God has thus visited from harm. She was perfectly aware of the importance of keeping the canoes from falling into the hands of the Iroquois, and long familiarity with the lake had suggested one of the simplest expedients by which this great object could be rendered compatible with her own purpose. The point in question was the first projection that offered on that side of the lake, where a canoe, if set adrift with a southerly air, would float clear of the land, and where it would be no great violation of probabilities to suppose it might even hit the castle. 
the latter lying above it, almost in a direct line with the wind. Such, then, was Hetty's intention, and she landed on the extremity of the gravelly point, beneath an overhanging oak, with the express intention of shoving the canoe off from the shore, in order that it might drift up towards her father's insulated abode. She knew, too, from the logs that occasionally floated about the lake, that did it miss the castle and its appendages, the wind would be likely to change before the canoe could reach the northern extremity of the lake, and that Deerslayer might have an opportunity of regaining it in the morning, when no doubt he would be earnestly sweeping the surface of the water, and the whole of its wooded shores, with glass. In all this, too, Hetty was less governed by any chain of reasoning than by her habits, the latter often supplying the place of mind in human beings, as they perform the same for animals of the inferior classes. The girl was quite an hour finding her way to the point, the distance and the obscurity equally detaining her, but she was no sooner on the gravelly beach than she prepared to set the canoe adrift, in the manner mentioned. While in the act of pushing it from her, she heard low voices that seemed to come among the trees behind her. Startled at this unexpected danger, Hetty was on the point of springing into the canoe in order to seek safety in flight when she thought she recognized the tones of Judith's melodious voice. Bending forward so as to catch the sounds more directly, they evidently came from the water, and then she understood that the ark was approaching from the south, and so close in with the western shore, as necessarily to cause it to pass the point within twenty yards of the spot where she stood. Here, then, was all she could desire. The canoe was shoved off into the lake leaving its late occupant alone on the narrow strand. When this act of self-devotion was performed, Hetty did not retire. The foliage of the overhanging trees and bushes would have almost concealed her person had there been light, but in that obscurity it was utterly impossible to discover any object thus shaded at the distance of a few feet. Flight, too, was perfectly easy, as twenty steps would effectually bury her in the forest. She remained, therefore, watching with intense anxiety the result of her expedient, intending to call the attention of the others to the canoe with her voice, should they appear to pass without observing it. The ark approached under its sail, again Deerslayer standing in its bow, with Judith near him, and the Delaware at the helm. It would seem that in the bay below it had got too close to the shore, in the lingering hope of intercepting Hetty for, as it came nearer, the latter distinctly heard the directions that the young man forward gave to his companion aft, in order to clear the point. "'Lay her head more off the shore, Delaware,' said Deerslayer, for the third time, speaking in English that his fair companion might understand his words. "'Lay her head well off shore. We have got embayed here, and needs keep the mast clear of the trees. Judith, there's a canoe!' The last words were uttered with great earnestness and Deerslayer's hand was on his rifle ere they were fairly out of his mouth. But the truth flashed on the mind of the quick-witted girl, and she instantly told her companion that the boat must be that in which her sister had fled. "'Keep the scow straight, Delaware. Steer as straight as your bullet flies when sent again a buck. There. I have it.' The canoe was seized, and immediately secured again to the side of the ark. At the next moment the sail was lowered, and the motion of the ark arrested by means of the oars. "'Hetty!' called out Judith, concern, even affection, betraying itself in her tones. "'Are you within hearing, sister? For God's sake, answer, and let me hear the sound of your voice again. "'Hetty! Dear Hetty! I'm here, Judith, here on the shore, where it will be useless to follow me, as I will hide in the woods.' "'Oh, Hetty!' What is it you do? Remember, tis drawing near midnight, and that the woods are filled with savages and wild beasts. Neither will harm a poor half-witted girl, Judith. God is as much with me here as he would be in the ark or in the hut. I am going to help my father, and poor hurry Harry, who will be tortured and slain unless someone cares for them. We all care for them, and intend to-morrow to send them a flag of truce, to buy their ransom. Come back, then, sister. Trust to us, who have better heads than you, and who will do all we can for father. I know your head is better than mine, Judith, for mine is very weak, to be sure. But I must go to father and poor hurry. Do you and Deerslayer keep the castle, sister? Leave me in the hands of God. 
God is with us all, Hetty, in the castle or on the shore, father as well as ourselves, and it is sinful not to trust to his goodness. You can do nothing in the dark. We'll lose your way in the forest and perish for want of food. God will not let that happen to a poor child that goes to serve her father, sister. I must try and find the savages. Come back, for this night only. In the morning we will put you ashore, and leave you to do as you may think right. You say so, Judith, and you think so, but you would not. Your heart would soften, and you'd see tomahawks and scalping knives in the air. Besides, I've got a thing to tell the Indian chief that will answer all our wishes, and I'm afraid I may forget it if I don't tell it to him at once. You'll see that he will let father go as soon as he hears it. Poor Hetty! What can you say to a ferocious savage that will be likely to change his bloody purpose? That which will frighten him, and make him let father go, returned the simple-minded girl, positively. You'll see, sister, you'll see how soon it will bring him to, like a gentle child. Will you tell me, Hetty, what you intend to say? asked Deerslayer. I know the savages well, and can form some idea how far fair words will likely or not to work on their bloody natures. If it's not suited to the gifts of a redskin, twill be of no use, for reason goes by gifts as well as conduct. Well, then, answered Hetty, dropping her voice to a low confidential tone, for the stillness of the night and the nearness of the ark permitted her to do this and still to be heard. Well, then, dear slayer, as you seem a good and honest young man, I will tell you. I mean not to say a word to any of the savages until I get face to face with their head chief. Let them plague me with as many questions as they please. I'll answer none of them, unless it be to tell them to lead me to their wisest man. Then, dear slayer, I'll tell him that God will not forgive murder, and thefts, and that if father and hurry did go after the scalps of the Iroquois he must return good for evil for so the Bible commands, else he will go into everlasting punishment. When he hears this, and feels it to be true, as feel it he must, how long will it be before he sends father and hurry and me to the shore, opposite the castle, telling us all three to go our way in peace?" The last question was put in a triumphant manner, and then the simple-minded girl laughed at the impression she never doubted that her project had made on her auditors. Deerslayer was dumbfounded at this proof of guileless feebleness of mind, but Judith had suddenly bethought her of a means of counteracting this wild project, by acting on the very feelings that had given it birth. Without adverting to the closing question or the laugh, therefore, she hurriedly called to her sister by name, as one suddenly impressed with the call of what she had to say. But no answer was given to the call. By the snapping of twigs and the rustling of leaves, Hetty had evidently quitted the shore, and was already burying herself in the forest. To follow would have been fruitless, since the darkness, as well as the dense cover that the woods everywhere offered, would have rendered her capture next to impossible, and there was also the never-ceasing danger of falling into the hands of their enemies. After a short and melancholy discussion, therefore, the sail was again set and the ark pursued its course toward its habitual moorings, Deerslayer silently felicitating himself on the recovery of the canoe, and brooding over his plans for the morrow. The wind rose as the party quitted the point, and in less than an hour they reached the castle. Here all was found as it had been left, and the reverse of the ceremonies had to be taken in entering the building that had been used on quitting it. Judith occupied a solitary bed that night, bedewing the pillow with her tears, as she thought of the innocent and hitherto neglected creature who had been her companion from childhood, and bitter regrets came over her mind, from more causes than one, as the weary hours passed away, making it nearly morning before she lost her recollection in sleep. Deerslayer and the Delaware took their rest in the ark, where we shall leave them enjoying the deep sleep of the honest, the healthful, and fearless, to return to the girl we have last seen in the midst of the forest. When Hetty left the shore, she took her way unhesitatingly into the woods, with a nervous apprehension of being followed. Luckily, this course was the best she could have hit on to effect her own purpose, since it was the only one that led her from the point. 
The night was so intensely dark beneath the branches of the trees that her progress was very slow, and the direction she went altogether a matter of chance, after the first few yards. The formation of the ground, however, did not permit her to deviate far from the line in which she desired to proceed. On one hand it was soon bounded by the acclivity of the hill, while the lake on the other served as a guide. For two hours did this single-hearted and simple-minded girl toil through the mazes of the forest, sometimes finding herself on the brow of the bank that bounded the water, and at others struggling up an ascent that warned her to go no farther in that direction, since it necessarily ran at right angles to the course in which she wished to proceed. Her feet often slid from beneath her, and she got many falls, though none to do her injury. But by the end of the period mentioned she had become so weary as to want strength to go any farther. Rest was indispensable, and she set about preparing a bed with the readiness and coolness of one to whom the wilderness presented no unnecessary terrors. She knew that wild beasts roamed through all the adjacent forest, but animals that preyed on the human species were rare and of dangerous serpents there were literally none. These facts had been taught her by her father, and whatever her feeble mind received at all it received so confidingly as to leave her no uneasiness from any doubts or skepticism. To her the sublimity of the solitude in which she was placed was soothing, rather than appalling, and she gathered a bed of leaves with as much indifference to the circumstances that would have driven the thoughts of sleep entirely from the minds of most of her sex as if she had been preparing her place of nightly rest beneath the paternal roof. As soon as Hetty had collected a sufficient number of the dried leaves to protect her person from the damps of the ground, she kneeled beside the humble pile, clasped her raised hands in an attitude of deep devotion, and in a soft, low, but audible voice repeated the Lord's Prayer. This was followed by those simple and devout verses, so familiar to children, in which she recommended her soul to God should it be called away to another state of existence, ere the return of morning. This duty done, she lay down and disposed herself to sleep. The attire of the girl, though suited to the season, was sufficiently warm for all ordinary purposes. But the forest is ever cool, and the nights of that elevated region of country have always a freshness about them that renders clothing more necessary than is commonly the case in summers of a low latitude. This had been foreseen by Hetty, who had brought with her a coarse heavy mantle, which, when laid over her body, answered all the useful purposes of a blanket. Thus protected, she dropped asleep in a few minutes, as tranquilly as if watched over by the guardian care of that mother, who had so recently been taken from her forever, affording in this particular a most striking contrast between her own humble couch and the sleepless pillow of her sister. Hour passed after hour, in a tranquillity as undisturbed and a rest as sweet as if angels, expressly commissioned for that object, watched around the bed of Hetty Hutter. Not once did her soft eyes open until the gray of the dawn came struggling through the tops of the trees, falling on their lids, and united to the freshness of a summer's morning, given the usual summons to awake. Ordinarily Hetty was up ere the rays of the sun tipped the summits of the mountains, but on this occasion her fatigue had been so great, and her rest was so profound, that the customary warnings failed of their effect. The girl murmured in her sleep, threw an arm forward, smiled as gently as an infant in its cradle, but still slumbered. In making this unconscious gesture her hand fell on some object that was warm, and in the half-unconscious state in which she lay she connected the circumstance with her habits. At the next moment a rude attack was made on her side as if a rooting animal were thrusting its snout beneath, with a desire to force her position, and then, uttering the name of Judith, she awoke. As the startled girl arose to a sitting attitude she perceived that some dark object sprang from her, scattering the leaves and snapping the fallen twigs in its haste. Opening her eyes, and recovering from the first confusion and astonishment of her situation, Hetty perceived a cub of the common American brown bear balancing itself on its hinder legs, and still looking towards her as if doubtful whether it would be safe to trust itself near her person again. The first impulse of Hetty, who had been mistress of several of these cubs, was to run and seize the little creature as a prize, but a loud growl warned her of the danger of such a procedure. Recoiling a few steps the girl looked hurriedly round, and perceived the dam, watching her movements with fiery eyes at no great distance. 
a hollow tree that once had been the home of bees having recently fallen the mother with two more cubs was feasting on the dainty food that this accident had placed within her reach while the first kept a jealous eye on the situation of its truant and reckless young it would exceed all the means of human knowledge to presume to analyze the influences that govern the acts of the lower animals on this occasion the dam though proverbially fierce when its young is thought to be in danger manifested no intention to attack the girl it quitted the honey and advanced to a place within twenty feet of her where it raised itself on its hind legs and balanced its body in a sort of angry growling discontent but approached no nearer happily hetty did not fly on the contrary though not without terror she knelt with her face towards the animal and with clasped hands and uplifted eyes repeated the prayer of the previous night this act of devotion was not the result of alarm but it was a duty she never neglected to perform ere she slept and when the return of consciousness awoke her to the business of the day as the girl arose from her knees the bear dropped on its feet again and collecting its cubs around her permitted them to draw their natural sustenance hetty was delighted with this proof of tenderness in an animal that has but a very different reputation for the gentler feelings and as a cub would quit his mother to frisk and leap about in wantonness she felt a strong desire again to catch it up in her arms and play with it but admonished by the growl she had self-command sufficient not to put this dangerous project in execution and recollecting her errand among the hills she tore herself away from the group and proceeded on her course along the margin of the lake of which she now caught glimpses again through the trees to her surprise though not to her alarm the family of bears arose and followed her steps keeping a short distance behind her apparently watching every movement as if they had a near interest in all she did in this manner escorted by the dam and cubs the girl proceeded nearly a mile thrice the distance she had been able to achieve in the darkness during the same period of time she then reached a brook that had dug a channel for itself into the earth and went brawling into the lake between steep and high banks covered with trees here Hetty performed her ablutions. Then, drinking of the pure mountain water, she went her way, refreshed and lighter of heart, still attended by her singular companions. Her course now lay along a broad and nearly level terrace, which stretched from the top of the bank that bounded the water to a low acclivity that rose to a second and irregular platform above. This was at a part of the valley where the mountains ran obliquely, forming the commencement of a plain that spread between the hills southward of the sheet of water hetty knew by this circumstance that she was getting near to the encampment and had she not the bears would have given her warning of the vicinity of human beings snuffing the air the dam refused to follow any further though the girl looked back and invited her to come by childish signs and even by direct appeals made in her own sweet voice it was while making her way slowly through some bushes in this manner with averted face and eyes riveted on the immovable animals that the girl suddenly found her steps arrested by a human hand that was laid lightly on her shoulder where go said a soft female voice speaking hurriedly and in concern indian red man savage wicked warrior that away this unexpected salutation alarmed the girl no more than the presence of the fierce inhabitants of the woods. It took her a little by surprise, it is true, but she was in a measure prepared for some such meeting, and the creature who stopped her was as little likely to excite terror as any who ever appeared in the guise of an Indian. It was a girl, not much older than herself, whose smile was sunny as Judith's in her brightest moments, whose voice was melody itself and whose accents and manner had all the rebuked gentleness that characterizes the sex among a people who habitually treat their women as the attendants and servitors of the warriors beauty among the women of the aboriginal americans before they have become exposed to the hardships of wives and mothers is by no means uncommon in this particular the original owners of the country were not unlike their more civilized successors nature appearing to have bestowed that delicacy of mien and outline that forms so great a charm in the youthful female but of which they are so early deprived and that too as much by the habits of domestic life as from any other cause 
The girl who had so suddenly arrested the steps of Hetty was dressed in a calico mantle that effectually protected all the upper part of her person, while a short petticoat of blue cloth, edged with gold lace, that fell no lower than her knees, leggings of the same, and moccasins of deerskin, completed her attire. Her hair fell in long dark braids down her shoulders and back, and was parted above a low smooth forehead, in a way to soften the expression of eyes that were full of archness and natural feeling. Her face was oval, with delicate features, the teeth were even and white, while the mouth expressed a melancholy tenderness, as if it wore this peculiar meaning in intuitive perception of the fate of a being who was doomed from birth to endure a woman's sufferings, relieved by a woman's affections. Her voice, as has been already intimated, was soft as the sighing of the night air, a characteristic of the females of her race, but which was so conspicuous in herself as to have produced for her the name of Watawa, which rendered into English means histohist. In a word, this was the betrothed of Chingachgook, who, having succeeded in lulling their suspicions, was permitted to wander around the encampment of her captors. This indulgence was in accordance with the general policy of the red man, who well knew, moreover, that her trail could have been easily followed in the event of flight. It will also be remembered that the Iroquois, or Hurons, as would be better to call them, were entirely ignorant of the proximity of her lover, a fact, indeed, that she did not know herself. It is not easy to say which manifested the most self-possession at this unexpected meeting the pale-face or the red girl. But, though a little surprised, Watawa was the most willing to speak, and far the readier in foreseeing consequences, as well as in devising means to avert them. Her father, during her childhood, had been much employed as a warrior by the authorities of the colony, and dwelling for several years near the forts, she had caught a knowledge of the English tongue, which she spoke in the usual abbreviated manner of an Indian, but fluently and without any of the ordinary reluctance of her people. "'Where go?' repeated Watawa, returning the smile of Hetty in her own gentle winning manner. "'Wicked warrior that away, Good warrior far off!' "'What's your name?' asked Hetty, with the simplicity of a child. "'Watawa. I know Mingo. Good Delaware. Yankee's friend. Mingo cruel, and love scalp for blood. Delaware love him for honor. Come here, where no eyes." Watawa now led her companion towards the lake, descending the bank so as to place its overhanging trees and bushes between them and any probable observers. Nor did she stop until they were both seated, side by side, on a fallen log, one end of which actually lay buried in the water. "'Why you come for?' the young Indian eagerly inquired. "'Where you come for?' Hetty told her tale in her own simple and truth-loving manner. She explained the situation of her father, and stated her desire to serve him, and if possible to procure his release. "'Why your father come to Mingo camp in night?' asked the Indian girl, with a directness which, if not borrowed from the other, partook largely of its sincerity. "'He know it wartime. And he no boy, he no want beard, no want to be told Iroquois carry tomahawk and knife, and rifle. Why he come night-time, seize me by hair, and try to scalp Delaware girl?" "'You,' said Hetty, almost sickening with horror, "'did he seize you? Did he try to scalp you?' "'Why, no. Delaware scalp sell for much as Mingo scalp. Governor no tell difference. Wicked ting for pale-face to scalp. No his gifts, as the good deerslayer always tell me. "'And do you know the deerslayer?' said Hetty, coloring with delight and surprise, forgetting her regrets at the moment in the influence of this new feeling. "'I know him, too. He is now in the ark, with Judith and a Delaware who was called the Big Serpent. A bold and handsome warrior is this serpent, too.' Spite of the rich, deep color that nature had bestowed on the Indian beauty, the tell-tale blood deepened on her cheeks, until the blush gave new animation and intelligence to her jet-black eyes. Raising a finger in an attitude of warning, she dropped her voice, already so soft and sweet, nearly to a whisper, as she continued the discourse. "'Chingachgook! 
returned the Delaware girl, sighing out the harsh name in sound so softly guttural as to cause it to reach the ear in melody. His father, great chief of the Mahikani, next to old Tamanund, more as warrior, not so much gray hair and less at council fire. You know, serpent? He joined us last evening and was in the ark with me for two or three hours before I left it. I'm afraid, hissed. Hetty could not pronounce the Indian name of her new friend, but having heard Deerslayer give her this familiar appellation, she used it without any of the ceremony of civilized life. I'm afraid, hissed, he has come after scalps, as well as my poor father and hurry Harry. Why he shouldn't? Ha! Chingachgook, great warrior, very red scalp make his honor. Be sure he take him. Then, said Hetty earnestly, he will be as wicked as any other. God will not pardon a red man, what he will not pardon in a white man. No true, returned the Delaware girl, with a warmth that nearly amounted to passion. No true, I tell you. The Manitou smile and pleased when he see young warrior come back from the warpath, with two ten hundred scalp on a pole. Chingachgook father take scalp, grandfather take scalp, all old chief take scalp, and Chingachgook take as many scalp as he can carry himself. Then hissed, his sleep of nights must be terrible to think of. No one can be cruel and hope to be forgiven. No cruel, plenty forgiven, returned Watawa, stamping her little foot on the stony strand and shaking her head in a way to show how completely feminine feeling in one of its aspects, had gotten the better of feminine feeling in another. I tell you, serpent brave, he go home this time with four, yes, two scalp. And is that his errand here? Did he really come all this distance across mountain and valley, rivers and lakes, to torment his fellow creatures, and do so wicked a thing? This question at once appeased the growing ire of the half-offended Indian beauty. It completely got the better of the prejudices of education, and turned all her thoughts to a gentler and more feminine channel. At first she looked around her, suspiciously, as if distrusting eavesdroppers. Then she gazed wistfully into the face of her attentive companion, after which this exhibition of girlish coquetry and womanly feeling terminated by her covering her face with both her hands, and laughing in a strain that might well be termed the melody of the woods. Dread of discovery, however, soon put a stop to this naive exhibition of feeling, and removing her hands this creature of impulses gazed again wistfully into the face of her companion, as if inquiring how far she might trust a stranger with her secret. Although Hetty had no claims to her sister's extraordinary beauty, many thought her countenance the most winning of the two. It expressed all the undisguised sincerity of her character and it was totally free from any of the unpleasant physical accompaniments that so frequently attend mental imbecility. It is true that one accustomed to closer observations than common might have detected the proofs of her feebleness of intellect in the language of her sometimes vacant eyes, but they were signs that attracted sympathy by their total want of guile, rather than by any other feeling. The effect on Hist, to use the English and more familiar translation of the name, was favorable, and yielding to an impulse of tenderness, she threw her arms around Hetty, and embraced her with an outpouring emotion so natural that it was only equaled by its warmth. "'You good!' whispered the young Indian. "'You good! I know! It's so long since what do I have a friend, a sister, anybody to speak her heart to. You hissed friend! Don't I say truth? I never had a friend," answered Hetty, returning the warm embrace with unfeigned earnestness. I've a sister, but no friend. Judith loves me, and I love Judith, but that's natural, and as we are taught in the Bible. But I should like to have a friend. I'll be your friend, with all my heart, for I like your voice and your smile, and your way of thinking in everything, except about the scalps." No tink more of him, no say more of scalp, interrupted Hist, soothingly. You pale face, I red skin. We bring up different fashion. Deerslayer and Chingachgook, great friend, and know the same color. Hist and what your name, pretty pale face? I am called Hetty, though when they spell the name in the Bible, they always spell it Esther. 
What that make? No good, no harm. No need to spell name at all. Moravian try to make Watawa spell, but no won't let him. No good for Delaware girl to know too much, no more than warrior some time. That great shame. My name Watawa. That say hist in your tongue. You call him hist. I call him Hetty. These preliminaries settled to their mutual satisfaction, the two girls began to discourse of their several hopes and projects. Hetty made her new friend more fully acquainted with her intentions in behalf of her father, and, to one in the least addicted to prying into the affairs, Hist would have betrayed her own feelings and expectations in connection with the young warrior of her own tribe. Enough was revealed on both sides, however, to let each party get a tolerable insight into the views of the other, though enough still remained in mental reservation, to give rise to the following questions and answers, with which the interview in effect closed. As the quickest witted, Hist was the first with her interrogatories. Folding an arm about the waist of Hetty, she bent her head so as to look up playfully into the face of the other, and, laughing, as if her meaning were to be extracted from her looks, she spoke more plainly. Hetty got brother as well as father, she said. Why no talk of brother as well as father? I have no brother, Hist. I had one once, they say, but he is dead many a year, and lies buried in the lake by the side of my mother. No got brother? Got a young warrior? Love him almost as much as father, eh? Very handsome and brave-looking, fit to be chief, if he good as he seemed to be. It's wicked to love any man as well as I love my father, and so I strive not to do it, Hist, returned the conscientious Hetty who knew not how to conceal an emotion, by an approach to an untruth as venial as an evasion, though powerfully tempted by female shame to err. Though I sometimes think wickedness will get the better of me, if hurry comes so often to the lake. I must tell you the truth, dear Hist, because you ask me, but I should fall down and die in the woods if he knew it. Why he no ask you himself? Brave-looking? Why not bold-speaking? Young warrior ought to ask young girl. No make young girl speak first. Mingo girl's too shame for that." This was said indignantly, and with the generous warmth a young female of spirit would be apt to feel, at what she deemed an invasion of her sex's most valued privilege. It had little influence on the simple-minded, but also just-minded, Hetty, who, though inherently feminine in all her impulses, was much more alive to the workings of her own heart than to any of the usages with which convention has protected the sensitiveness of her sex. "'Ask me what?' the startled girl demanded, with a suddenness that proved how completely her fears had been aroused. "'Ask me if I like him as well as I do my own father? Oh, I hope he will never put such a question to me, for I should have to answer, and that would kill me.' "'No, no, no kill. Quite, almost.' returned the other, laughing in spite of herself. "'Make blush come. Make shame come, too. But he no stay great while. Then feel happier than ever. Young warrior must tell young girl he want to make wife, else never can live in his wigwam. Hurry don't want to marry me. Nobody will ever want to marry me, hist. How can you know? Perhaps everybody want to marry you, and by and by tongue say what heart feel. Why nobody want to marry you? I am not full-witted, they say. Father often tells me this, and so does Judith sometimes, when she is vexed. But I shouldn't so much mind them, as I did mother. She said so once, and then she cried as if her heart would break, and so I know I'm not full-witted." Hist gazed at the gentle, simple girl for quite a minute without speaking, and then the truth appeared to flash all at once on the mind of the young Indian maid. Pity, reverence, and tenderness seemed struggling together in her breast. And then, rising suddenly, she indicated a wish to her companion that she would accompany her to the camp, which was situated at no great distance. This unexpected change, from the precautions that Hist had previously manifested a desire to use, in order to prevent being seen, to an open exposure of the person of her friend, arose from the perfect conviction that no Indian would harm a being whom the Great Spirit had disarmed, by depriving it of its strongest defence, 
reason. In this respect, nearly all unsophisticated nations resemble each other, appearing to offer spontaneously, by a feeling creditable to human nature, that protection by their own forbearance, which has been withheld by the inscrutable wisdom of Providence. Watawa, indeed, knew that in many tribes the mentally imbecile and the mad were held in a species of religious reverence, receiving from these untutored inhabitants of the forest respect and honours, instead of the contumely and neglect that it is their fortune to meet with among the more pretending and sophisticated. Had he accompanied her new friend without apprehension or reluctance, it was her wish to reach the camp, and, sustained by her motives, she felt no more concern for the consequences than did her companion herself. Now the latter was apprised of the character of the protection that the pale-faced maiden carried with her. Still, as they proceeded slowly along a shore that was tangled with overhanging bushes, had he continued the discourse, assuming the office of interrogating which the other had instantly dropped, as soon as she ascertained the character of the mind to which her questions had been addressed. "'But you are not half-witted,' said Hetty, "'and there's no reason why the serpent should not marry you.' "'Hist prisoner! And Mingo got big ear! No speak of Chingachgook when they buy. Promise Hist that, good Hetty.' "'I know, I know,' returned Hetty, half-whispering, in her eagerness to let the other see she understood the necessity of caution. "'I know. Deerslayer and the serpent mean to get you away from the Iroquois, and you wish me not to tell the secret.' "'How you know?' said Hist, hastily, vexed at the moment that the other was not even more feeble-minded than was actually the case. "'How you know? Better not talk of any but fodder and hurry. Mingo understand dat. He no understand udder. Promise you no talk about what you no understand." "'But I do understand this, Hist, and so I must talk about it. Deerslayer as good as told father all about it, in my presence. And as nobody told me not to listen, I overheard it all, as I did hurry and father's discourse about the scalps. Very bad for pale faces to talk about scalps, and very bad for young woman to hear. Now you love Hist, I know, Hetty, and so among Injuns, when love hardest, never talk most. That's not the way among white people, who talk most about them they love best. I suppose it's because I'm only half-witted that I don't see the reason why it should be so different among red people. That would Deerslayer call gift. One gift to talk, tutter gift to hold tongue. Hold tongue your gift among Mingos. If Sarpent want to see Hist, so Hetty want to see Hurry. Good girl never tell secret of friend." Hetty understood this appeal, and she promised the Delaware girl not to make any allusion to the presence of Chingachgook, or to the motive of his visit to the lake. "'Maybe he get off Hurry and Fodder, as well as Hist, if let him have his way,' whispered Watawa to her companion, in a confiding, flattering way, just as they got near enough to the encampment to hear the voices of several of their own sex, who were apparently occupied in the usual toils of women of their class. "'Tink of dat, Hetty, and put two twenty-finger on mouth. No get friend free without serpent do it.' A better expedient could not have been adopted to secure the silence and discretion of Hetty than that which was now presented to her mind. As the liberation of her father and the young frontier man was the great object of her adventure, she felt the connection between it and the services of the Delaware, and with an innocent laugh she nodded her head, and in the same suppressed manner promised a due attention to the wishes of her friend. Thus assured, Hist tarried no longer, but immediately and openly led the way into the encampment of her captors. End of chapter 10 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 11 of The Deerslayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper Chapter 11 
the great king of kings hath in the table of his law commanded that thou shalt do no murder take heed for he holds vengeance in his hand to hurl upon their heads that break his law richard the third act one scene four lines one ninety five to one ninety seven and one ninety nine to two hundred that the party to which hist compulsorily belonged was not one that was regularly on the war-path was evident by the presence of females it was a small fragment of a tribe that had been hunting and fishing within the english limits where it was found by the commencement of hostilities and after passing the winter and spring by living on what was strictly the property of its enemies it chose to strike a hostile blow before it finally retired there was also deep indian sagacity in the manoeuvre which had led them so far into the territory of their foes when the runner arrived who announced the breaking out of hostilities between the english and french a struggle that was certain to carry with it all the tribes that dwelt within the influence of the respective belligerents this particular party of the iroquois were posted on the shores of the oneida a lake that lies some fifty miles nearer to their own frontier than that which is the scene of our tale to have fled in a direct line for the canadas would have exposed them to the dangers of a direct pursuit and the chiefs had determined to adopt the expedient of penetrating deeper into a region that had now become dangerous in the hope of being able to retire in the rear of their pursuers instead of having them on their trail the presence of the women had induced the attempt at this ruse the strength of these feebler members of the party being unequal to the effort of escaping from the pursuit of warriors when the reader remembers the vast extent of the american wilderness at that early day he will perceive that it was possible for even a tribe to remain months undiscovered in particular portions of it nor was the danger of encountering a foe the usual precautions being observed as great in the woods as it is on the high seas in a time of active warfare the encampment being temporary it offered to the eye no more than the rude protection of a bivouac relieved in some slight degree by the ingenious expedients which suggested themselves to the readiness of those who passed their lives amid similar scenes one fire that had been kindled against the roots of a living oak sufficed for the whole party the weather being too mild to require it for any purpose but cooking scattered around this centre of attraction were some fifteen or twenty low huts or perhaps kennels would be a better word into which their different owners crept at night and which were also intended to meet the exigencies of a storm these little huts were made of the branches of trees put together with some ingenuity and they were uniformly topped with bark that had been stripped from fallen trees of which every virgin forest possesses hundreds in all stages of decay of furniture they had next to none cooking utensils of the simplest sort were lying near the fire a few articles of clothing were to be seen in or around the huts rifles horns and pouches leaned against the trees or were suspended from the lower branches and the carcasses of two or three deer were stretched to view on the same natural shambles as the encampment was in the midst of a dense wood the eye could not take in its tout ensemble at a glance but hut after hut started out of the gloomy picture as one gazed about him in quest of objects there was no centre unless the fire might be so considered no open area where the possessors of this rude village might congregate but all was dark covert and cunning like its owners a few children strayed from hut to hut giving the spot a little of the air of domestic life and the suppressed laugh and low voices of the women occasionally broke in upon the deep stillness of the sombre forest as for the men they either ate slept or examined their arms they conversed but little and then usually apart or in groups withdrawn from the females whilst an air of untiring innate watchfulness and apprehension of danger seemed to be blended even with their slumbers as the two girls came near the encampment hetty uttered a slight exclamation on catching a view of the person of her father he was seated on the ground with his back to a tree and hurry stood near him indolently whittling a twig apparently they were as much at liberty as any others in or about the camp 
and one unaccustomed to Indian usages would have mistaken them for visitors, instead of supposing them to be captives. Watawa led her new friend quite near them, and then modestly withdrew, that her own presence might be no restraint on her feelings. But Hetty was not sufficiently familiar with caresses or outward demonstrations of fondness to indulge in any outbreaking of feeling. She merely approached and stood at her father's side without speaking, resembling a silent statue of filial affection. The old man expressed neither alarm nor surprise at her sudden appearance. In these particulars he had caught the stoicism of the Indians, well knowing that there was no more certain mode of securing their respect than by imitating their self-command. Nor did the savages themselves betray the least sign of surprise at this sudden appearance of a stranger among them. In a word, this arrival produced much less visible sensation, though occurring under circumstances so peculiar than would be seen in a village of higher pretensions to civilization, did an ordinary traveller drive up to the door of its principal inn. Still a few warriors collected, and it was evident by the manner in which they glanced at Hetty as they conversed together, that she was the subject of their discourse and probable that the reasons of her unlooked-for appearance were matters of discussion. This phlegm of manner is characteristic of the North American Indian, some say of his white successor also, but, in this case, much should be attributed to the peculiar situation in which the party was placed. The force in the ark, the presence of Chingachgook excepted, was well known, no tribe or body of troops was believed to be near, and vigilant eyes were posted round the entire lake watching day and night the slightest movement of those whom it would not be exaggerated now to term the besieged. Hutter was inwardly much moved by the conduct of Hetty, though he affected so much indifference of manner. He recollected her gentle appeal to him before he left the ark, and misfortune rendered that of weight which might have been forgotten amid the triumph of success. Then he knew the simple, single-hearted fidelity of his child, and understood why she had come and the total disregard of self that reigned in all her acts. "'This is not well, Hetty,' he said, deprecating the consequences to the girl herself more than any other evil. "'These are fierce Iroquois, and are as little apt to forget an injury as a favor. "'Tell me, father,' returned the girl, looking furtively about her, as if fearful of being overheard, "'did God let you do the cruel errand on which you came?' I want much to know this, that I may speak to the Indians plainly, if he did not." "'You should not have come hither, Hetty. These brutes will not understand your nature or your intentions." "'How was it, father? Neither you nor Hurry seems to have anything that looks like scalps.' "'If that will set your mind at peace, child, I can answer you, no. I had caught the young creature who came here with you but her screeches soon brought down upon me a troop of the wild-cats. That was too much for any single Christian to withstand. If that will do you any good, we are as innocent of having taken a scalp this time, as I make no doubt we shall also be innocent of receiving the bounty. Thank God for that, father. Now I can speak boldly to the Iroquois, and with an easy conscience. I hope Hurry, too, has not been able to harm any of the Indians. Why, as to that matter, Hetty? returned the individual in question. You've put it pretty much in the native character of the religious truth. Hurry has not been able, and that is the long and short of it. I've seen many squalls, old fellow, both on land and on the water, but never did I feel one as lively and as snappish as that which come down upon us night afore last, in the shape of an Indian hurrah boys. Why, Hetty, you're no great matter at a reason, or an idee that lies a little deeper than common but you're human and have some human notions. Now I'll just ask you to look at them circumstances. Here was old Tom, your father, and myself, bent on a legal operation, as is to be seen in the words of the law and the proclamation, thinking no harm, when we were set upon by critters that were more like a pack of hungry wolves than mortal savages even. And there they had us tethered like two sheep, in less time than it has taken me to tell you the story. "'You are free now, Hurry,' returned Hetty, glancing timidly at the fine unfettered limbs of the young giant. "'You have no cords, or withes, to pain your arms or legs now.' "'Not I, Hetty. Nature is nature, and freedom is nature, too. My limbs have a free look. 
but that's pretty much the amount of it, sin I can't use them in the way I should like. Even these trees have eyes, ay, and tongues, too, for was the old man here, or I, to start one single rod beyond our jail limits, Sarvis would be put on the bale afore we could gird up our loins for a race, and, like as not, four or five rifle bullets would be travelling arter us, carrying so many invitations to curb our impatience. There isn't a jail in the colony as tight as this we are now in, for I've tried the vartues of two or three on em, and I know the materials they are made of, as well as the men that made em, taken down being the next step in schoolin, to puttin' up in all such fabrications. Lest the reader should get an exaggerated opinion of Hurry's demerits from this boastful and indiscreet revelation, it may be well to say that his offences were confined to assaults and batteries, for several of which he had been imprisoned, when, as he has just said, he often escaped by demonstrating the flimsiness of the constructions in which he was confined, by opening for himself doors in spots where the architects had neglected to place them. But had he had no knowledge of jails, and little of the nature of crimes, beyond what her unadulterated and almost instinctive perceptions of right and wrong taught her, and this sally of the rude being who had spoken was lost upon her. She understood his general meaning, however, and answered in reference to that alone. "'It's so best, Hurry,' she said. "'It is best father and you should be quiet and peaceable, till I have spoken to the Iroquois, when all will be well and happy. I don't wish either of you to follow, but leave me to myself. As soon as all is settled, and you are at liberty to go back to the castle, I will come and let you know it.' Hetty spoke with so much simple earnestness, seemed so confident of success, and wore so high an air of moral feeling and truth, that both the listeners felt more disposed to attach an importance to her mediation than might otherwise have happened. When she manifested an intention to quit them, therefore, they offered no obstacle, though they saw she was about to join the group of chiefs who were consulting apart, seemingly on the manner and motive of her own sudden appearance. When Hist, for so we love best to call her, quitted her companion, she strayed near one or two of the elder warriors, who had shown her most kindness in her captivity, the principal man of whom had even offered to adopt her as his child if she would consent to become a Huron. In taking this direction the shrewd girl did so to invite inquiry. She was too well trained in the habits of her people to obtrude the opinions of one of her sex and years on men and warriors, but nature had furnished a tact and ingenuity that enabled her to attract the attention she desired, without wounding the pride of those to whom it was her duty to defer and respect. Even her affected indifference stimulated curiosity, and Hetty had hardly reached the side of her father before the Delaware girl was brought within the circle of the warriors, by a secret but significant gesture. Here she was questioned as to the person of her companion, and the motives that had brought her to the camp. This was all that Hist desired. She explained the manner in which she had detected the weakness of Hetty's reason, rather exaggerating than lessening the deficiency in her intellect, and then she related in general terms the object of the girl in venturing among her enemies. The effect was all that the speaker expected, her account investing the person and character of their visitor with a sacredness and respect that she well knew would prove her protection. As soon as her own purpose was attained, Hist withdrew to a distance where, with female consideration and a sisterly tenderness, she set about the preparation of a meal, to be offered to her new friend as soon as the latter might be at liberty to partake of it. While thus occupied, however, the ready girl in no degree relaxed her watchfulness, noting every change of countenance among the chiefs, every movement of Hetty's, and the smallest occurrence that could be likely to affect her own interests, or that of her new friend. As Hetty approached the chiefs, they opened their little circle, with an ease and deference of manner that would have done credit to men of more courtly origin. A fallen tree lay near, and the oldest of the warriors made a quiet sign for the girl to be seated on it, taking his place at her side with the gentleness of a father. The others arranged themselves around the two with grave dignity, and then the girl, who had sufficient observation to perceive that such a course was expected of her, began to reveal the object of her visit. The moment she opened her mouth to speak, however, the old chief gave a gentle sign for her to forbear, and said a few words to one of his juniors, 
and then waited in silent patience until the latter had summoned Hist to the party. This interruption proceeded from the chiefs having discovered that there existed a necessity for an interpreter, few of the Hurons present understanding the English language, and they but imperfectly. Watawa was not sorry to be called upon to be present at the interview, and least of all in the character in which she was now wanted. She was aware of the hazards she ran in attempting to deceive one or two of the party, but was none the less resolved to use every means that offered, and to practice every artifice that an Indian education could supply, to conceal the facts of the vicinity of her betrothed, and of the errand on which he had come. One unpractised in the expedients and opinions of savage life would not have suspected the readiness of invention, the wariness of action, the high resolution, the noble impulses, the deep self-devotion, and the feminine disregard of self when the affections were concerned, that lay concealed beneath the demure looks, the mild eyes, and the sunny smiles of this young Indian beauty. As she approached them, the grim old warriors regarded her with pleasure, for they had a secret pride in the hope of engrafting so rare a scion on the stock of their own nation, adoption being as regularly practiced and is distinctly recognized among the tribes of America, as it ever had been among those nations that submit to the sway of the civil law. As soon as Hist was seated by the side of Hetty, the old chief desired her to ask the fair young pale-face what had brought her among the Iroquois, and what they could do to serve her. "'Tell them, Hist, who I am, Thomas Hutter's youngest daughter. Thomas Hutter, the oldest of their two prisoners. He who owns the castle and the ark, and who has the best right to be thought the owner of these hills, and that lake, since he has dwelt so long, and trapped so long, and fished so long among them. They'll know whom you mean by Thomas Hutter, if you tell them that. And then tell them that I've come here to convince them they ought not to harm father and hurry. But let them go in peace, and to treat them as brethren, rather than as enemies. Now tell them all this plainly, Hist and fear nothing for yourself or me. God will protect us." Watawa did as the other desired, taking care to render the words of her friend as literally as possible into the Iroquois tongue, a language she used with a readiness almost equal to that with which she spoke her own. The chiefs heard this opening explanation with grave decorum, the two who had a little knowledge of English intimating their satisfaction with the interpreter by furtive but significant glances of the eyes. And now, Hist, continued Hetty, as soon as it was intimated to her that she might proceed, and now, Hist, I wish you to tell these red men, word for word, what I am about to say. Tell them first, that Father and Hurry came here with an intention to take as many scalps as they could, for the wicked governor and the province have offered money for scalps, whether of warriors or women, men or children, and the love of gold was too strong for their hearts to withstand it. Tell them this, dear Hist, just as you have heard it from me, word for word." Watawa hesitated about rendering this speech as literally as had been desired, but detecting the intelligence of those who understood English, and apprehending even a greater knowledge than they actually possessed, she found herself compelled to comply. Contrary to what a civilized man would have expected, the admission of the motives and of the errands of their prisoners produced no visible effect on either the countenances or the feelings of the listeners. They probably considered the act meritorious, and that which neither of them would have hesitated to perform in his own person, he would not be apt to censure in another. "'And now, Hist,' resumed Hetty, as soon as she perceived that her first speeches were understood by the chiefs, "'you can tell them more. They know that father and hurry did not succeed and therefore they can bear them no grudge for any harm that has been done. If they had slain their children and wives it would not alter the matter, and I am not certain that what I am about to tell them would not have more weight had there been mischief done. But ask them first, Hist, if they know there is a God who reigns over the whole earth, and is ruler and chief of all who live, let them be red or white or what color they may." Watawa looked a little surprised at this question for the idea of the Great Spirit is seldom long absent from the mind of an Indian girl. She put the question as literally as possible, however, and received a grave answer in the affirmative. "'This is right,' continued Hetty. 
and my duty will now be light. This great spirit, as you call our God, has caused a book to be written, that we call a Bible, and in this book have been set down all his commandments, and his holy will and pleasure, and the rules by which all men are to live, and directions how to govern the thoughts even, and the wishes, and the will. Here, this is one of these holy books, and you must tell the chiefs what I am about to read to them from its sacred pages." As Hetty concluded, she reverently unrolled a small English Bible from its envelope of coarse calico, treating the volume with the sort of external respect that a Romanist would be apt to show to a religious relic. As she slowly proceeded in her task, the grim warriors watched each movement with riveted eyes, and when they saw the little volume appear a slight expression of surprise escaped one or two of them. But Hetty held it out towards them in triumph, as if she expected the sight would produce a visible miracle, and then, without betraying either surprise or mortification at the stoicism of the Indian, she turned eagerly to her new friend in order to renew the discourse. "'This is the sacred volume, Hist,' she said, and these words, and lines, and verses, and chapters, all came from God." "'Why, great spirit, no send book to Injun, too?' demanded Hist, with the directness of a mind that was totally unsophisticated. "'Why?' answered Hetty, a little bewildered by a question so unexpected. "'Why? Ah! You know the Indians don't know how to read.' If Hist was not satisfied with this explanation, she did not deem the point of sufficient importance to be pressed. Simply bending her body, in a gentle admission of the truth of what she heard, she sat patiently awaiting the further arguments of the pale-face enthusiast. "'You can tell these chiefs that throughout this book men are ordered to forgive their enemies, to treat them as they would brethren, and never to injure their fellow-creatures, more especially on account of revenge or any evil passions. Do you think you can tell them this, so that they will understand it, Hist?" "'Tell him well enough. But he no very easy to understand.' Hist then conveyed the ideas of Hetty, in the best manner she could, to the attentive Indians, who heard her words with some such surprise as an American of our own times would be apt to betray at a suggestion that the great modern but vacillating ruler of things human, public opinion, might be wrong. One or two of their number, however, having met with missionaries, said a few words in explanation, and then the group gave all its attention to the communications that were to follow. Before Hetty resumed, she inquired earnestly of Hist if the chiefs had understood her, and receiving an evasive answer, was fain to be satisfied. "'I will now read to the warriors some of the verses that it is good for them to know,' continued the girl, whose manner grew more solemn and earnest as she proceeded and they will remember that they are the very words of the great spirit first then ye are commanded to love thy neighbor as thyself tell them that dear hist neighbor for injun no mean pale-face answered the delaware girl with more decision than she had hitherto thought it necessary to use neighbor mean iroquois for iroquois mohican for mohican pale-face for pale-face no need tell chief anything else you forget, Hist, these are the words of the Great Spirit, and the chiefs must obey them as well as others. Here is another commandment. Whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. What that mean? demanded Hist, with the quickness of lightning. Hetty explained that it was in order not to resent injuries, but rather to submit to receive fresh wrongs from the offender. And hear this too, Hist, she added. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. By this time Hetty had become excited. Her eye gleamed with the earnestness of her feelings, her cheeks flushed, and her voice, usually so low and modulated, became stronger and more impressive. With the Bible she had been early made familiar by her mother, she now turned from passage to passage with surprising rapidity, taking care to cull such verses as taught the sublime lessons of Christian charity and Christian forgiveness. To translate half she said, in her pious earnestness, Watawa would have found impracticable, had she made the effort. But wonder held her tongue-tied, equally with the chiefs, and the young, simple-minded enthusiast had fairly become exhausted with her own efforts, before the other opened her mouth again to utter a syllable. 
Then, indeed, the Delaware girl gave a brief translation of the substance of what had been both read and said, confining herself to one or two of the more striking of the verses, those that had struck her own imagination as the most paradoxical, and which certainly would have been the most applicable to the case, could the uninstructed minds of the listeners embrace the great moral truths they conveyed. It will be scarcely necessary to tell the reader the effect that such novel duties would be likely to produce among a group of Indian warriors, with whom it was a species of religious principle never to forget a benefit, or to forgive an injury. Fortunately, the previous explanations of Hist had prepared the minds of the Hurons for something extravagant, and most of that which to them seemed inconsistent and paradoxical was accounted for by the fact that the speaker possessed a mind that was constituted differently from those of most of the human race. Still, there were one or two old men who had heard similar doctrines from the missionaries, and these felt a desire to occupy an idle moment by pursuing a subject that they found so curious. "'This is the good book of the pale-faces,' observed one of these chiefs, taking the volume from the unresisting hands of Hetty who gazed anxiously at his face while he turned the leaves, as if she expected to witness some visible results from the circumstance. "'This is the law by which my white brethren professes to live?' Hist, to whom this question was addressed, if it might be considered as addressed to any one in particular, answered simply in the affirmative, adding that both the French of the Canadas and the Yengeese of the British provinces equally admitted its authority, and affected to revere its principles. "'Tell my young sister,' said the Huron, looking directly at Hist, "'that I will open my mouth and say a few words. "'The Iroquois chief go to speak. My pale-faced friend listen,' said Hist. "'I rejoice to hear it,' exclaimed Hetty. "'God has touched his heart, and he will now let father and hurry go.' "'This is the pale-face law,' resumed the chief. "'It tells him to do good to them that hurt him and when his brother asks him for his rifle to give him the powder-horn, too. Such is the pale-face law?" "'Not so, not so,' answered Hetty earnestly, when these words had been interpreted. "'There is not a word about rifles in the whole book, and powder and bullets give offence to the great spirit. Why, then, does the pale-face use them? If he is ordered to give double to him that asks only for one thing, why does he take double from the poor Indian who asked for no thing? He comes from beyond the rising sun, with this book in his hand, and he teaches the red man to read it. But why does he forget himself all it says? When the Indian gives, he is never satisfied. And now he offers gold for the scalps of our women and children, though he calls us beasts if we take the scalp of a warrior killed in open war. My name is Rivenoak. When Hetty had got this formidable question fairly presented to her mind in the translation, and Hist did her duty with more than usual readiness on this occasion, it scarcely need be said that she was sorely perplexed. Abler heads than that of this poor girl have frequently been puzzled by questions of a similar drift, and it is not surprising that with all her own earnestness and sincerity she did not know what answer to make. "'What shall I tell them, Hist?' she asked imploringly. I know that all I have read from the book is true, and yet it wouldn't seem so, would it, by the conduct of those to whom the book was given?" "'Give em pale-face reason,' returned Hist, ironically. "'That always good for one side, though be bad for t'other. "'No, no, Hist, there can't be two sides to truth. And yet it does seem strange. I'm certain I have read the verses right, and no one would be so wicked as to print the word of God wrong. That can never be, hissed. Well, to poor Injun girl, it seem everything can be to pale faces, returned the other coolly. One time a say white, and one time a say black. Why never can be? Hetty was more and more embarrassed, until overcome with the apprehension that she had failed in her object, and that the lives of her father and hurry would be the forfeit of some blunder of her own, she burst into tears. From that moment the manner of Hist lost all its irony and cool indifference, and she became the fond, caressing friend again. Throwing her arms around the afflicted girl, she attempted to soothe her sorrows by the scarcely ever failing remedy of female sympathy. "'Stop cry! No cry!' she said, wiping the tears from the face of Hetty, as she would have performed the same office for a child, 
and stopping to press her occasionally to her own warm bosom with the affection of a sister why you so trouble you no make he book if he be wrong and you no make he pale-face if he wicked they're wicked red man and wicked white man no color all good no color all wicked chiefs know that well enough Hetty soon recovered from this sudden burst of grief, and then her mind reverted to the purpose of her visit, with all its single-hearted earnestness. Perceiving that the grim-looking chiefs were still standing around her in grave attention, she hoped that another effort to convince them of the right might be successful. "'Listen, Hist,' she said, struggling to suppress her sobs, and to speak distinctly. "'Tell the chiefs that it matters not what the wicked do. Right is right.' The words of the Great Spirit are the words of the Great Spirit, and no one can go harmless for doing an evil act, because another has done it before him. Render good for evil, says this book, and that is the law for the red man as well as for the white man. Never hear such law among Delaware or among Iroquois, answered Hist soothingly. No good to tell chiefs any such laws as that. Tell them something they believe. Hist was about to proceed, notwithstanding, when a tap on the shoulder from the finger of the oldest chief caused her to look up. She then perceived that one of the warriors had left the group, and was already returning to it with hutter and hurry. Understanding that the two last were to become parties in the inquiry, she became mute, with the unhesitating obedience of an Indian woman. In a few seconds the prisoners stood face to face with the principal men of the captors. Daughter, said the senior chief to the young Delaware, ask this gray beard why he came into our camp. The question was put by Hist, in her own imperfect English, but in a way that was easy to be understood. Hutter was too stern and obdurate by nature to shrink from the consequences of any of his acts, and he was also too familiar with the opinions of the savages not to understand that nothing was to be gained by equivocation or an unmanly dread of their anger. Without hesitating, therefore, he avowed the purpose with which he had landed, merely justifying it by the fact that the government of the province had bid high for scalps. This frank avowal was received by the Iroquois with evident satisfaction, not so much, however, on account of the advantage it gave them in a moral point of view, as by its proving that they had captured a man worthy of occupying their thoughts and of becoming a subject of their revenge. Hurry, when interrogated, confessed the truth, though he would have been more disposed to concealment than his sterner companion, did the circumstances very well admit of its adoption. But he had tact enough to discover that equivocation would be useless at that moment, and he made a merit of necessity by imitating a frankness which, in the case of Hutter, was the offspring of habits of indifference acting on a disposition that was always ruthless, and reckless of personal consequences. As soon as the chiefs had received the answers to their questions, they walked away in silence, like men who deemed the matter disposed of, all Hetty's dogmas being thrown away on beings trained in violence from infancy to manhood. Hetty and Hist were now left alone with Hutter and Hurry, no visible restraint being placed on the movements of either, though all four, in fact, were vigilantly and unceasingly watched. As respects the men, care was had to prevent them from getting possession of any of the rifles that lay scattered about, their own included, and where all open manifestations of watchfulness ceased. But they, who were so experienced in Indian practices, knew too well how great was the distance between appearances and reality, to become the dupes of this seeming carelessness. Although both thought incessantly of the means of escape, and this without concert, each was aware of the uselessness of attempting any project of the sort that was not deeply laid, and promptly executed. They had been long enough in the encampment, and were sufficiently observant to have ascertained that Hist, also, was a sort of captive, and presuming on the circumstance, Hutter spoke in her presence more openly than he might otherwise have thought it prudent to do, inducing Hurry to be equally unguarded by his example. I'll not blame you, Hetty, for coming on this errand, which was well meant, if not very wisely planned, commenced the father, seating himself by the side of his daughter, and taking her hand. A sign of affection that this rude being was accustomed to manifest to this particular child. But preaching, and the Bible, 
are not the means to turn an Indian from his ways. Has Deerslayer sent any message, or has he any scheme by which he thinks to get us free? Ay, that's the substance of it, put in Hurry. If you can help us, gal, to half a mile of freedom, or even a good start of a short quarter, I'll answer for the rest. Perhaps the old man may want a little more. But for one of my height and years that will meet all objections." Hetty looked distressed, turning her eyes from one to the other, but she had no answer to give the question of the reckless hurry. "'Father,' she said, "'neither Deerslayer nor Judith knew of my coming until I had left the Ark. They are afraid the Iroquois will make a raft and try to get off to the hut, and think more of defending that than of coming to aid you." "'No, no, no,' said Hist hurriedly though in a low voice, and with her face bent towards the earth, in order to conceal from those whom she knew to be watching them the fact of her speaking at all. "'No, no, no! Deerslayer different man! He no tink of defending self, with friend in danger. Help one another, and all get to hut!' "'This sounds well, old Tom,' said Hurry, winking and laughing, though he too used the precaution to speak low. "'Give me a ready-witted squaw for a friend.' and though I'll not downright defy an Iroquois, I think I would defy the devil." "'No talk loud,' said Hist. "'Some Iroquois got Yankee's tongue, and all got Yankee's ear.'" "'Have we a friend in you, young woman?' inquired Hutter, with an increasing interest in the conference. "'If so, you may calculate on a solid reward, and nothing will be easier than to send you to your own tribe, if we can once fairly get you off with us to the castle. Give us the ark and the canoes and we can command the lake, spite of all the savages in the Canadas. Nothing but artillery could drive us out of the castle, if we can get back to it." "'Spose they come ashore to take scalp,' retorted Hist, with cool irony, at which the girl appeared to be more expert than is common for her sex. "'Ay, ay, that was a mistake. But there is little use in lamentations, and less still, young woman, in flings.' "'Father,' said Hetty, "'Judith thinks of breaking open the big chest in hopes of finding something in that which may buy your freedom of the savages." A dark look came over Hutter at the announcement of this fact, and he muttered his dissatisfaction in a way to render it intelligible enough. "'What for no break open chest?' put in Hist. "'Life sweeter than old chest! Scalp sweeter than old chest! If no tell darter to break him open, Watawa no help him to run away. Ye know not what ye ask. Ye are but silly girls, and the wisest way for ye both is to speak of what ye understand, and to speak of nothing else. I little like this cold neglect of the savages, Hurry. It's a proof that they think of something serious, and if we are to do anything we must do it soon. Can we count on this young woman, think you?" Listen, said Hist quickly, and with an earnestness that proved how much her feelings were concerned. Watawa no Iroquois, all over Delaware, got Delaware heart. Delaware feeling. She prisoner, too. One prisoner helped other prisoner. No good to talk more now. Darter stay with fodder. Watawa come and see friend. All look right. Then tell what he do." This was said in a low voice, but distinctly, and in a manner to make an impression. As soon as it was uttered the girl arose and left the group, walking composedly towards the hut she occupied as if she had no further interest in what might pass between the pale faces. End of chapter 11 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 12 of The Deerslayer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE DEERSLAYER by James Fenimore Cooper CHAPTER Twelve. She speaks much of her father, says she hears there's tricks in the world, and hems and beats her breast, spurns enviously at straws, speaks things in doubt, that carry but half sense. Her speech is nothing, yet the unshaped use of it doth move the hearers to collection. Hamlet, Act Four, Scene Five, Lines Four through Nine we left the occupants of the castle and the ark buried in sleep. Once or twice in the course of the night, it is true, Deerslayer or the Delaware, arose and looked out upon the tranquil lake. 
when, finding all safe, each returned to his pallet, and slept like a man who was not easily deprived of his natural rest. At the first signs of the dawn the former arose, however, and made his personal arrangements for the day, though his companion, whose nights had not been tranquil or without disturbances of late, continued on his blanket until the sun had fairly risen. Judith, too, was later than common that morning, for the earlier hours of the night had brought her little of either refreshment or sleep. But ere the sun had shown himself over the eastern hills, these two were up and afoot, even the tardy in that region seldom remaining on their pallets after the appearance of the great luminary. Chingachgook was in the act of arranging his forest toilet, when Deerslayer entered the cabin of the Ark and threw him a few coarse but light summer vestments that belonged to Hutter. "'Judith hath given me them for your use, chief,' said the latter, as he cast the jacket and trousers at the feet of the Indian, "'for it's again all prudence and caution to be seen in your war-dress and paint. Wash off all them fiery streaks from your cheeks. Put on these garments. And here is a hat, such as it is, that will give you an awful uncivilized sort of civilization, as the missionaries call it. Remember that Hist is at hand, and what we do for the maiden must be done while we are doing for others. I know it's again your gifts and your nature to wear clothes, unless they are cut and carried in a red man's fashion. But make a virtue of necessity and put these on at once, even if they do rise a little in your throat." Chingachgook, or the serpent, eyed the vestments with strong disgust, but he saw the usefulness of the disguise, if not its absolute necessity. Should the Iroquois discover a red man in or about the castle, it might, indeed, place them more on their guard, and give their suspicions a direction towards their female captive. Anything was better than a failure, as it regarded his betrothed, and after turning the different garments round and round, examining them with a species of grave irony, affecting to draw them on in a way that defeated itself, and otherwise manifesting the reluctance of a young savage to confine his limbs in the usual appliances of civilized life, the chief submitted to the directions of his companion, and finally stood forth, so far as the eye could detect, a red man in color alone. Little was to be apprehended from this last peculiarity, however, the distance from the shore and the want of glasses preventing any very close scrutiny, and Deerslayer himself, though of a brighter and fresher tint, had a countenance that was burnt by the sun to a hue scarcely less red than that of his Mohican companion. The awkwardness of the Delaware in his new attire caused his friend to smile more than once that day, but he carefully abstained from the use of any of those jokes which would have been bandied among white men on such an occasion. The habits of a chief, the dignity of a warrior on his first path, and the gravity of the circumstances in which they were placed, uniting to render so much levity out of season. The meeting at the morning meal of the three islanders, if we may use the term, was silent, grave, and thoughtful. Judith showed by her looks that she had passed an unquiet night, while the two men had the future before them, with its unseen and unknown events. A few words of courtesy passed between Deerslayer and the girl, in the course of the breakfast, but no allusion was made to their situation. At length Judith, whose heart was full, and whose novel feelings disposed her to entertain sentiments more gentle and tender than common, introduced the subject, and this in a way to show how much of her thoughts it had occupied, in the course of the last sleepless night. "'It would be dreadful, dear Slayer,' the girl abruptly exclaimed, "'should anything serious befall my father and Hetty. We cannot remain quietly here and leave them in the hands of the Iroquois, without bethinking us of some means of serving them. I'm ready, Judith, to sarve them, and all others who are in trouble, could the way to do it be pointed out. It's no trifling matter to fall into redskin hands, when men set out on an errand like that which took Hutter and Hurry ashore. That I know as well as another, and I wouldn't wish my worst enemy in such a strait, much less them with whom I've journeyed, and eat, and slept. Have you any scheme that you would like to have the Sarpent and me endeavor to carry out? I know of no other means to release the prisoners, than by bribing the Iroquois. They are not proof against presence, and we might offer enough, perhaps, to make them think it better to carry away what to them will be rich gifts, than to carry away poor prisoners. If, indeed, they should carry them away at all. This is well enough, Judith. Yes, it's well enough, if the enemy is to be bought. 
and we can find articles to make the purchase with. Your father has a convenient lodge, and it is most cunningly placed, though it doesn't seem overstocked with riches that will be likely to buy his ransom. There's the piece he calls Killdeer, might count for something, and I understand there's a keg of powder about, which might be a make-weight sartain. And yet two able-bodied men are not to be bought off for a trifle. Besides—' "'Besides what?' demanded Judith, impatiently, observing that the other hesitated to proceed, probably from a reluctance to distress her. "'Why, Judith, the Frenchers offer bounties as well as our own side, and the price of two scalps would purchase a keg of powder, and a rifle, though I'll not say one of the latter altogether as good as Kildeer, there, which your father vaunts as uncommon and unequalled, like, but fair powder, and a pretty certain rifle. Then the red men are not the expertest in firearms, and don't always know the difference atwixt that which is rail and that which is seeming." "'This is horrible,' muttered the girl, struck by the homely manner in which her companion was accustomed to state his facts. "'But you overlook my own clothes, dear Slayer, and they, I think, might go far with the women of the Iroquois.' "'No doubt they would. No doubt they would, Judith,' returned the other, looking at her keenly as if he would ascertain whether she were really capable of making such a sacrifice. But are you sartain, gal, you could find it in your heart to part with your own finery for such a purpose? Many is the man who has thought he was valiant, till danger stared him in the face. I've known them, too, that consented they were kind and ready to give away all they had to the poor, when they've been listening to other people's hard-heartedness, but whose fists have clenched as tight as the riven hickory when it came to downright offerings of their own. Besides, Judith, you're handsome, uncommon in that way, one might observe, and do no harm to the truth, and they that have beauty like to have that which will adorn it. Are you certain you could find it in your heart to part with your own finery?" The soothing allusion to the personal charms of the girl was well timed, to counteract the effect produced by the distrust that the young man expressed of Judith's devotion to her filial duties. Had another said as much as Deerslayer, the compliment would most probably have been overlooked in the indignation awakened by the doubts. But even the unpolished sincerity, that so often made this simple-minded hunter bear his thoughts, had a charm for the girl. And while she colored, and for an instant her eyes flashed fire, she could not find it in her heart to be really angry with one whose very soul seemed truth and manly kindness. Look her reproaches she did, but conquering the desire to retort, she succeeded in answering in a mild and friendly manner. "'You must keep all your favorable opinions for the Delaware girls, dear Slayer, if you seriously think thus of those of your own color,' she said, affecting to laugh. "'But try me. If you find that I regret either ribbon or feather, silk or muslin, then may you think what you please of my heart, and say what you think." "'That's justice. The rarest thing to find on earth is a truly just man. So says Tamenund, the wisest prophet of the Delawares, and so all must think that have occasion to see and talk and act among mankind. I love a just man, Sarpent. His eyes are never covered with darkness towards his enemies while they are all sunshine and brightness towards his friends. He uses the reason that God has given him, and he uses it with a feeling of his being ordered to look at, and to consider things as they are, and not as he wants them to be. It's easy enough to find men who call themselves just, but it's wonderful uncommon to find them that are the very thing, in fact. How often have I seen Indians, gal, who believed they were looking into a matter agreeable to the will of the Great Spirit? when in truth they were only striving to act up to their own will and pleasure, and this, half the time, with a temptation to go wrong that could no more be seen by themselves than the stream that runs in the next valley can be seen by us through yonder mountain, though any looker-on may have discovered it as plainly as we can discover the parch that are swimming around this hut." "'Very true, dear Slayer," rejoined Judith, losing every trace of displeasure in a bright smile. Very true, and I hope to see you act on this love of justice in all matters in which I am concerned. Above all, I hope you will judge for yourself, and not believe every evil story that a prating idler like Hurry Harry may have to tell that goes to touch the good name of any young woman. 
who may not happen to have the same opinion of his face and person that the blustering gallant has of himself. Hurry Harry's ideas do not pass for gospel with me, Judith. But even worse than he may have eyes and ears," returned the other gravely. "'Enough of this!' exclaimed Judith, with flashing eye and a flush that mounted to her temples, and more of my father and his ransom. "'Tis as you say, dear Slayer. The Indians will not be likely to give up their prisoners without a heavier bribe than my clothes can offer, and father's rifle and powder. There is the chest." "'Aye, there is the chest, as you say, Judith, and when the question gets to be between a secret and a scalp, I should think most men would prefer keeping the last. Did your father ever give you any downright commands concerning that chist? Never. He has always appeared to think its locks and its steel bands and its strength its best protection. "'Tis a rare chest, and altogether of curious build,' returned Deerslayer, rising and approaching the thing in question, on which he seated himself with a view to examine it with greater ease. Chingachgook. This is no wood that comes of any forest that you or I have ever trailed through. "'Tisn't the black walnut, and yet it's quite as comely, if not more so, did the smoke and the treatment give it fair play." The Delaware drew near, felt of the wood, examined its grain, endeavored to indent the surface with a nail, and passed his hand curiously over the steel bands, the heavy padlocks, and the other novel peculiarities of the massive box. No, nothing like this grows in these regions," resumed Deerslayer. I've seen all the oaks, both the maples, the elms, the basswoods, all the walnuts, the butternuts, and every tree that has a substance and color, wrought into some form or other, but never have I before seen such a wood as this. Judith, the chest itself would buy your father's freedom, or Iroquois curiosity isn't as strong as redskin curiosity, in general especially in the matter of woods. The purchase might be cheaper made, perhaps, dear Slayer. The chest is full, and it would be better to part with half than to part with the whole. Besides, father—I know not why, but father values that chest highly. He would seem to prize what it holds more than the chest itself, judging by the manner in which he treats the outside and secures the inside. Here are three locks, Judith. Is there no key?" I've never seen one, and yet key there must be, since Hetty told us she had often seen the chest opened. Keys no more lie in the air or float in the water than humans, gal. If there is a key, there must be a place in which it is kept. That is true, and it might not be difficult to find it did we dare to search. This is for you, Judith. It is altogether for you. The chist is yourn, or your father's. And Hutter is your father, not mine. Curiosity is a woman's, and not a man's failing. And there you have got all the reasons before you. If the chist has articles for ransom, it seems to me they would be wisely used in redeeming their owner's life, or even in saving his scalp. But that is a matter for your judgment, and not for ourn. When the lawful owner of a trap, or a buck, or a canoe isn't present, his next of kin becomes his representative by all the laws of the woods. We therefore leave you to say whether the chist shall or shall not be opened. I hope you do not believe I can hesitate when my father's life's in danger, dear Slayer. Why, it's pretty much putting a scolding again tears and mourning. It's not unreasonable to foretell that old Tom may find fault with what you've done, when he sees himself once more in his hut. Here but there's nothing unusual in men's falling out with what has been done for their own good. I dare to say that even the moon would seem a different thing from what it now does, could we look at it from the other side. Deerslayer, if we can find the key, I will authorize you to open the chest, and to take such things from it as you may think will buy father's ransom. First find the key, gal. We'll talk of the rest afterwards. Sarpent, You've eyes like a fly, and a judgment that's seldom out. Can you help us in calculating where Floating Tom would be apt to keep the key of a chist that he holds to be as private as this?" The Delaware had taken no part in the discourse until he was thus directly appealed to. When he quitted the chest, which had continued to attract his attention, 
and cast about him for the place in which a key would be likely to be concealed under such circumstances. As Judith and Deerslayer were not idle the while, the whole three were soon engaged in an anxious and spirited search. As it was certain that the desired key was not to be found in any of the common drawers or closets, of which there were several in the building, none looked there. But all turned their inquiries to those places that struck them as ingenious hiding-places, and more likely to be used for such a purpose. In this manner the outer room was thoroughly but fruitlessly examined, when they entered the sleeping apartment of Hutter. This part of the rude building was better furnished than the rest of the structure, containing several articles that had been especially devoted to the service of the deceased wife of its owner. But as Judith had all the rest of the keys, it was soon rummaged without bringing to light the particular key desired. They now entered the bedroom of the daughters. Chingachgook was immediately struck with the contrast between the articles and the arrangement of that side of the room that might be called Judith's, and that which more properly belonged to Hetty. A slight exclamation escaped him, and pointing in each direction, he alluded to the fact in a low voice, speaking to his friend in the Delaware tongue. "'Tis as you think, Sarpent," answered Deerslayer, whose remarks we always translate into English, preserving as much as possible of the peculiar phraseology and manner of the man. "'Tis just so, as any one may see, and tis all founded in nature. One sister loves finery, some say overmuch while t'other is as meek and lowly as God ever created goodness and truth. Yet, after all, I dare say that Judith has her virtues, and Hetty has her failings. "'And the feeble mind has seen the chist opened?' inquired Chingachgook, with curiosity in his glance. "'Sartin. That much I've heard from her own lips. And for that matter, so have you. It seems her father doesn't misgive her discretion, though he does that of his eldest darter. Then the key is hid only from the wild rose, for so Chingachgook had begun gallantly to term Judith in his private discourse with his friend. That's it. That's just it. One he trusts, and the other he doesn't. There's red and white in that sarpent, all tribes and nations agreeing in trusting some, and refusing to trust other some. It depends on character and judgment. Where could a key be put so little likely to be found by the wild rose as among coarse clothes? Deerslayer started, and turning to his friend with admiration expressed in every lineament of his face, he fairly laughed, in his silent but hearty manner, at the ingenuity and readiness of the conjecture. "'Your name's well bestowed, Sarpent. Yes, tis well bestowed. Sure enough. Where would a lover of finery be so little likely to search, as among garments as coarse and unseemly, as these of poor Hetty's. I dares to say Judith's delicate fingers haven't touched a bit of cloth as rough and uncomely as that petticoat now since she first made acquaintance with the officers. Yet who knows? The key may be as likely to be on the same peg as in any other place. Take down the garment, Delaware, and let us see if you are really a prophet." Chingachgook did as desired, but no key was found. A coarse pocket, apparently empty, hung on the adjoining peg, and this was next examined. By this time the attention of Judith was called in that direction, and she spoke hurriedly and like one who wished to save unnecessary trouble. "'Those are only the clothes of poor Hetty, dear simple girl,' she said. "'Nothing we seek would be likely to be there.' The words were hardly out of the handsome mouth of the speaker, when Chingachgook drew the desired key from the pocket. Judith was too quick of apprehension not to understand the reason a hiding-place so simple and exposed had been used. The blood rushed to her face, as much with resentment, perhaps, as with shame, and she bit her lip, though she continued silent. Deerslayer and his friend now discovered the delicacy of men of native refinement, neither smiling nor even by a glance betraying how completely he understood the motives and ingenuity of this clever artifice. The former, who had taken the key from the Indian, led the way into the adjoining room, and applying it to a lock ascertained that the right instrument had actually been found. There were three padlocks, each of which, however, was easily opened by this single key. Deerslayer removed them all, loosened the hasps, 
raised the lid a little to make certain it was loose, and then he drew back from the chest several feet, signing to his friend to follow. "'This is a family chist, Judith,' he said, "'and tis like to hold family secrets. The Sarpent and I will go into the ark, and look to the canoes, and paddles, and oars, while you can examine it by yourself, and find out whether anything that will be a make-weight and a ransom is, or is not, among the articles. When you've got through, give us a call, and we'll all sit in council together, touching the valley of the articles." "'Stop, Deerslayer!' exclaimed the girl, as he was about to withdraw. "'Not a single thing will I touch. I will not even raise the lid, unless you are present. Father and Hetty have seen fit to keep the inside of this chest a secret from me, and I am much too proud to pry into their hidden treasures, unless it were for their own good. But on no account will I open the chest alone. Stay with me, then. I want witnesses of what I do." "'I rather think, Sarpent, that the gal is right. Confidence and reliance beget security, but suspicion is like to make us all wary. Judith has a right to ask us to be present, and should the chist hold any of Master Hutter's secrets, they will fall into the keeping of two as close-mouthed young men as are to be found. We will stay with you, Judith. But first let us take a look at the lake and the shore, for this chist will not be emptied in a minute." The two men now went out on the platform, and Deerslayer swept the shore with the glass, while the Indian gravely turned his eye on the water and the woods, in quest of any sign that might betray the machinations of their enemies. Nothing was visible, and assured of their temporary security, the three collected around the chest again, with the avowed object of opening it. Judith had held this chest and its unknown contents in a species of reverence as long as she could remember. Neither her father nor her mother ever mentioned it in her presence, and there appeared to be a silent convention that, in naming the different objects that occasionally stood near it, or even lay on its lid, care should be had to avoid any allusion to the chest itself. Habit had rendered this so easy, and so much a matter of course, that it was only quite recently the girl had began even to muse on the singularity of the circumstance. But there had never been sufficient intimacy between Hutter and his eldest daughter to invite confidence. At times he was kind, but in general, with her more especially, he was stern and morose. Least of all had his authority been exercised in a way to embolden his child to venture on the liberty she was about to take, without many misgivings of the consequences, although the liberty proceeded from a desire to serve himself. Then Judith was not altogether free from a little superstition on the subject of this chest, which had stood a sort of tabooed relic before her eyes from childhood to the present hour. Nevertheless, the time had come when it would seem that this mystery was to be explained, and that, under circumstances, too, which left her very little choice in the matter. Finding that both her companions were watching her movements, in grave silence, Judith placed a hand on the lid, and endeavoured to raise it. Her strength, however, was insufficient, and it appeared to the girl, who was fully aware that all the fastenings were removed, that she was resisted in an unhallowed attempt by some supernatural power. "'I cannot raise the lid, dear Slayer,' she said. "'Had we not better give up the attempt, and find some other means of releasing the prisoners?' "'Not so, Judith. Not so, gal. No means are as certain and easy as a good bribe," answered the other. As for the lid, tis held by nothing but its own weight, which is prodigious for so small a piece of wood, loaded with iron as it is. As Deerslayer spoke, he applied his own strength to the effort, and succeeded in raising the lid against the timbers of the house, where he took care to secure it by a sufficient prop. Judith fairly trembled as she cast her first glance at the interior, and she felt a temporary relief in discovering that a piece of canvas, that was carefully tucked in around the edges, effectually concealed all beneath it. The chest was apparently well stored, however, the canvas lying within an inch of the lid. "'Here's a full cargo,' said Deerslayer, eyeing the arrangement, and we had needs go to work leisurely and at our ease. Sarpent, bring some stools, while I spread this blanket on the floor, and then we'll begin work orderly and in comfort.' The Delaware complied. Deerslayer civilly placed a stool for Judith, took one himself, and commenced the removal of the canvas covering. This was done deliberately, 
and in as cautious a manner as if it were believed that the fabrics of a delicate construction lay hidden beneath. When the canvas was removed, the first articles that came in view were some of the habiliments of the male sex. They were of fine materials, and according to the fashions of the age, were gay in colors and rich in ornaments. One coat in particular was of scarlet, and had buttonholes worked in gold thread. Still it was not military, but was part of the attire of a civilian of condition, at a period when social rank was rigidly respected in dress. Chingachgook could not refrain from an exclamation of pleasure as soon as Deerslayer opened this coat and held it up to view, for, notwithstanding all his trained self-command, the splendor of the vestment was too much for the philosophy of an Indian. Deerslayer turned quickly, and he regarded his friend with momentary displeasure as this burst of weakness escaped him, and then he soliloquized, as was his practice whenever any strong feeling suddenly got the ascendancy. "'Tis his gift, yes. Tis the gift of a redskin to love finery, and he is not to be blamed. This is an extraordinary garment, too, and extraordinary things get up extraordinary feelings. I think this will do, Judith for the Indian heart is hardly to be found in all America that can withstand colors like these, and glitter like that. If this coat was ever made for your father, you've come honestly by the taste for finery you have." "'That coat was never made for a father,' answered the girl quickly. "'It is much too long, while father is short and square.' "'Cloth was plenty if it was, and glitter cheap,' answered Deerslayer, with his silent joyous laugh. Sarpent, this garment was made for a man of your size, and I should like to see it on your shoulders." Chingachgook, nothing loath, submitted to the trial, throwing aside the coarse and threadbare jacket of Hutter, to deck his person in a coat that was originally intended for a gentleman. The transformation was ludicrous, but as men are seldom struck with incongruities in their own appearance any more than in their own conduct. The Delaware studied this change in a common glass, by which Hutter was in the habit of shaving, with grave interest. At that moment he thought of Hist, and we owe it to truth to say, though it may militate a little against the stern character of a warrior to avow it, that he wished he could be seen by her in his present improved aspect. "'Off with it, Sarpent, off with it,' resumed the inflexible deerslayer. "'Such garments as little become you as they would become me. Your gifts are for paint, and hawk's feathers, and blankets, and wampum, and mine are for doublets of skins, tough leggings, and serviceable moccasins. I say moccasins, Judith, for though white, living as I do in the woods, it's necessary to take some of the practices of the woods, for comfort, sake, and cheapness. I see no reason, dear Slayer, why one man may not wear a scarlet coat as well as another, returned the girl. I wish I could see you in this handsome garment see me in a coat fit for a lord? Well, Judith, if you wait till that day, you'll wait until you see me beyond reason and memory. No, no, gal. My gifts are my gifts, and I'll live and die in em, though I never bring down another deer or spear another salmon. What have I done that you should wish to see me in such a flaunting coat, Judith? Because I think, dear Slayer, that the false-tongued and false-hearted young gallants of the garrisons ought not alone appear in fine feathers, but that truth and honesty have their claims to be honored and exalted. And what exaltification, the reader will have remarked, that Deerslayer had not very critically studied his dictionary. And what exaltification would it be to me, Judith, to be bedizened and bescarleted like a Mingo chief that has just got his presence up from Quebec? No, no, I'm well as I am, and if not I can be no better. Lay the coat down on the blanket, Sarpent, and let us look farther into the chist." The tempting garment, one surely that was never intended for Hutter, was laid aside, and the examination proceeded. The male attire, all of which corresponded with the coat in quality, was soon exhausted, and then succeeded female. A beautiful dress of brocade, a little the worse from negligent treatment, followed, and this time open exclamations of delight escaped the lips of Judith. Much as the girl had been addicted to dress, and favorable as had been her opportunities of seeing some little pretension in that way among the wives of the different commandants, and other ladies of the forts, 
Never before had she beheld a tissue or tints to equal those that were now so unexpectedly placed before her eyes. Her rapture was almost childish, nor would she allow the inquiry to proceed, until she had attired her person in a robe so unsuited to her habits and her abode. With this end she withdrew into her own room, where with hands practised in such offices she soon got rid of her own neat gown of linen, and stood forth in the gay tints of the brocade. The dress happened to fit the fine full person of Judith, and certainly it had never adorned a being better qualified by natural gifts to do credit to its really rich hues and fine texture. When she returned, both Deerslayer and Chingachgook, who had passed the brief time of her absence in taking a second look at the male garments, arose in surprise, each permitting exclamations of wonder and pleasure to escape him, in a way so unequivocal as to add new lustre to the eyes of Judith, by flushing her cheeks with a glow of triumph. Affecting, however, not to notice the impression she had made, the girl seated herself with the stateliness of a queen, desiring that the chest might be looked into further. "'I don't know a better way to treat with the Mingos, gal,' cried Deerslayer, "'than to send you ashore as you be, and to tell em that a queen has arrived among em. They'll give up old Hutter, and Hurry, and Hetty, too, at such a spectacle.' "'I thought your tongue too honest to flatter, Deerslayer,' returned the girl, gratified at this admiration more than she would have cared to own. One of the chief reasons of my respect for you was your love for truth. And tis truth, and solemn truth, Judith, and nothing else. Never did eyes of mine gaze on as glorious a looking creature as you be yourself, at this very moment. I've seen beauties in my time, too, both white and red, and them that was renowned and talked of far and near, but never have I beheld one that could hold any comparison with what you are at this blessed instant, Judith. Never. The glance of delight which the girl bestowed on the frank-speaking hunter in no degree lessened the effect of her charms, and as the humid eyes blended with it a look of sensibility, perhaps Judith never appeared more truly lovely than at what the young man had called that blessed instant. He shook his head, held it suspended a moment over the open chest, like one in doubt and then proceeded with the examination. Several of the minor articles of female dress came next, all of a quality to correspond with the gown. These were laid at Judith's feet, in silence, as if she had a natural claim to their possession. One or two, such as gloves and lace, the girl caught up, and appended to her already rich attire in affected playfulness, but with the real design of decorating her person as far as circumstances would allow. When these two remarkable suits, male and female, they might be termed, were removed, another canvas covering separated the remainder of the articles from the part of the chest which they had occupied. As soon as Deerslayer perceived this arrangement, he paused, doubtful of the propriety of proceeding any further. "'Every man has his secrets, I suppose,' he said, "'and all men have a right to their enjoyment. We've got low enough in this chist, in my judgment, to answer our wants, and it seems to me we should do well by going no farther, and by letting Master Hutter have to himself, and his own feelings, all that's beneath this cover. "'Do you mean, dear Slayer, to offer these clothes to the Iroquois as ransom?' demanded Judith quickly. "'Sartin. What are we prying into another man's chist for, but to serve its owner in the best way we can?' This coat alone would be very apt to gain over the head chief of the reptiles, and if his wife or darter should happen to be out with him, that their gown would soften the heart of any woman that is to be found between Albany and Montreal. I do not see that we want a larger stock in trade than them two articles. But of what use could a dress like this be to any Indian woman? She could not wear it among the branches of the trees. The dirt and smoke of the wigwam would soon soil it and how would a pair of red arms appear, thrust through these short laced sleeves? All very true, gal, and you might go on and say it is altogether out of time and place and season, in this region at all. What is it to us how the finery is treated, so long as it answers our wishes? I do not see that your father can make any use of such clothes, and it's lucky he has things that are of no valley to himself, that will bear a high price with others. We can make no better trade for him than to offer these duds for his liberty. We'll throw in the light frivolities, and get hurry off in the bargain. Then you think, Deerslayer, that Thomas Hutter 
has no one in his family, no child, no daughter to whom this dress may be thought becoming, and whom you could wish to see in it once in a while, even though it should be at long intervals, and only in playfulness? I understand you, Judith, yes, I now understand your meaning, and I think I can say your wishes, that you are as glorious in that dress as the sun when it rises or sets in a soft October day, I'm ready to allow, and that you greatly become it is a good deal more certain than that it becomes you. There's gifts in clothes, as well as in other things. Now I do not think that a warrior on his first path ought to lay on the same awful paints as a chief that has had his virtue tried, and knows from experience he will not disgrace his pretensions. So it is with all of us, red or white. You are Thomas Hutter's darter, and that gown was made for the child of some governor or a lady of high station, and it was intended to be worn among fine furniture and in rich company. In my eyes, Judith, a modest maiden never looks more becoming than when becomingly clad, and nothing is suitable that is out of character. Besides, gal, if there's a creature in the colony that can afford to do without finery, and to trust to her own good looks and sweet countenance, it's yourself." "'I'll take off the rubbish this instant, dear slayer,' cried the girl, springing up to leave the room, and never do I wish to see it on any human being again. "'So it is with them all, Sarpent,' said the other, turning to his friend and laughing, as soon as the beauty had disappeared. They like finery, but they like their native charms most of all. I'm glad the gal has consented to lay aside her fur below's souse ever, for it's again reason for one of her class to wear em. And then she is handsome enough, as I call it, to go alone. Hist would show uncommon likely, too, in such a gowned Delaware. Watawa is a red-skinned girl, dear slayer, returned the Indian, like the young of the pigeon. She is to be known by her own feathers. I should pass by without knowing her were she dressed in such a skin. It's wisest always to be so clad that our friends need not ask us our names. The wild rose is very pleasant, but she is no sweeter for so many colors. That's it. That's nature, and the true foundation for love and protection. When a man stoops to pick a wild strawberry, he does not expect to find a melon, and when he wishes to gather a melon, he's disappointed if it proves to be a squash, though squashes be often brighter to the eye than melons. That's it. And it means stick to your gifts, and your gifts will stick to you." The two men had now a little discussion together, touching the propriety of penetrating any farther into the chest of Hutter. When Judith reappeared, divested of her robes, and in her own simple linen frock again. "'Thank you, Judith,' said Deerslayer, taking her kindly by the hand, for I know it went a little again the natural cravings of woman to lay aside so much finery, as it might be in a lump. But you're more pleasing to the eye as you stand, you be, than if you had a crown on your head, and jewels dangling from your hair. The question now is whether to lift this covering to see what will be really the best bargain we can make for Master Hutter for we must do as we think he would be willing to do, did he stand here in our places." Judith looked very happy. Accustomed as she was to adulation, the homely homage of Deerslayer had given her more true satisfaction than she had ever yet received from the tongue of man. It was not the terms in which this admiration had been expressed, for they were simple enough, that produced so strong an impression, nor yet their novelty, or their warmth of manner nor any of those peculiarities that usually give value to praise, but the unflinching truth of the speaker, that carried his words so directly to the heart of the listener. This is one of the great advantages of plain dealing and frankness. The habitual and wily flatterer may succeed until his practices recoil on himself, and like other sweets his aliment cloys its excess. But he who deals honestly, though he often necessarily offends, possesses a power of praising that no quality but sincerity can bestow, since his words go directly to the heart, finding their support in the understanding. Thus it was with Deerslayer and Judith. So soon and so deeply did this simple hunter impress those who knew him with a conviction of his unending honesty, that all he uttered in commendation was as certain to please, as all he uttered in the way of rebuke was as certain to rankle and excite enmity where his character had not awakened a respect and affection, that in another sense rendered it painful. 
In after life, when the career of this untutored being brought him in contact with officers of rank and others entrusted with the care of the interests of the State, this same influence was exerted on a wider field, even generals listening to his commendations with a glow of pleasure, that it was not always in the power of their official superiors to awaken. Perhaps Judith was the first individual of his own color who fairly submitted to this natural consequence of truth and fair dealing on the part of Deerslayer. She had actually pined for his praise, and she had now received it, and that in the form which was most agreeable to her weaknesses and habits of thought. The result will appear in the course of the narrative. "'If we knew all that chest holds, dear Slayer,' returned the girl, when she had a little recovered from the immediate effect produced by his commendations of her personal appearance, we could better determine on the course we ought to take. That's not unreasonable, gal, though it's more a pale face than a redskin gift to be prying into other people's secrets. Curiosity is natural, and it is expected that all human beings should have human failings. Whenever I've been at the garrisons, I've found that most in and about them had a longing to learn their neighbors' secrets. Yes, and sometimes to fancy them when they couldn't find them out. That's the difference between an Indian gentleman and a white gentleman. The sarpent here would turn his head aside if he found himself unknowingly looking into another chief's wigwam, whereas in the settlements, while all pretend to be great people, most prove they've got betters by the manner in which they talk of their concerns. I'll be bound, Judith, you wouldn't get the sarpent there to confess there was another in the tribe so much greater than himself as to become the subject of his ideas and to imply his tongue in conversations about his movements and ways and food and all the other little matters that occupy a man when he's not implied in his greater duties. He who does this is but little better than a blackguard in the grain, and them that encourages him is pretty much of the same kidney. Let them wear coats as fine as they may, or of what dye they please. But this is not another man's wigwam. It belongs to my father. These are his things and they are wanted in his service. That's true, gal, that's true, and it carries weight with it. Well, when all is before us, we may indeed best judge which to offer for the ransom and which to withhold." Judith was not altogether as disinterested in her feelings as she affected to be. She remembered that the curiosity of Hetty had been indulged in connection with this chest, while her own had been disregarded and she was not sorry to possess an opportunity of being placed on a level with her less gifted sister in this one particular, it appearing to be admitted all round that the inquiry into the contents of the chest ought to be renewed. Deerslayer proceeded to remove the second covering of canvas. The articles that lay uppermost, when the curtain was again raised on the secrets of the chest, were a pair of pistols, curiously inlaid with silver. Their value would have been considerable in one of the towns though as weapons in the woods they were a species of arms seldom employed. Never, indeed, unless it might be by some officer from Europe, who visited the colonies, as many were then wont to do, so much impressed with the superiority of the usages of London as to fancy they were not to be laid aside on the frontiers of America. What occurred on the discovery of these weapons will appear in the succeeding chapter. End of chapter 12 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter Thirteen of the Deerslayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter Thirteen An oaken, broken elbow chair. A caudle cup without an ear. A battered, shattered ash bedstead. A box of deal without a lid. A pair of tongs but out of joint, a back-sword poker without point, a dish which might good meat afford once, an ovid, and an old concordance. Thomas Sheridan, a true and faithful inventory of the goods belonging to Dr. Swift. 11. Lines 1 through 6 and 13 through 14. No sooner did Deerslayer raise the pistols than he turned to the Delaware and held them up for his admiration. "'Child gun!' 
said the serpent, smiling, while he handled one of the instruments as if it had been a toy. "'Not it, serpent, not it. It was made for a man, and would satisfy a giant, if rightly used. But stop. White men are remarkable for their carelessness in putting away firearms, in chists and corners. Let me look if care has been given to these.' As Deerslayer spoke, he took the weapon from the hand of his friend, and opened the pan. The last was filled with priming, caked like a bit of cinder, by time, moisture, and compression. An application of the ramrod showed that both the pistols were charged, although Judith could testify that they had probably lain for years in the chest. It is not easy to portray the surprise of the Indian at this discovery, for he was in the practice of renewing his priming daily and of looking to the contents of his piece at other short intervals. "'This is white neglect,' said Deerslayer, shaking his head, "'and scarce a season goes by that some one in the settlements doesn't suffer from it. It's extraordinary, too, Judith, yes, it's downright extraordinary, that the owner shall fire his piece at a deer or some other game, or perhaps at an enemy, and twice out of three times he'll miss. But let him catch an accident with one of these forgotten charges and he makes it certain death to a child, or a brother, or a friend. Well, we shall do a good turn to the owner, if we fire these pistols for him, and as they're novelties to you and me, Sarpent, we'll try our hands at a mark. Freshen that priming, and I'll do the same with this, and then we'll see who is the best man with a pistol. As for the rifle, that's long been settled atween us." Deerslayer laughed heartily at his own conceit and in a minute or two they were both standing on the platform, selecting some object in the ark for their target. Judith was led by curiosity to their side. "'Stand back, gal, stand a little back. These weapons have been long loaded,' said Deerslayer, and some accident may happen in the discharge. "'Then you shall not fire them. Give them both to the Delaware, or it would be better to unload them without firing.' That's again usage, and some people say again manhood, though I hold to no such silly doctrine. We must fire em, Judith, yes, we must fire em, though I foresee that neither will have any great reason to boast of his skill. Judith, in the main, was a girl of great personal spirit, and her habits prevented her from feeling any of the terror that is apt to come over her sex at the report of firearms. She had discharged many a rifle and had even been known to kill a deer under circumstances that were favourable to the effort. She submitted, therefore, falling a little back by the side of Deerslayer, giving the Indian the front of the platform to himself. Chingachgook raised the weapon several times, endeavoured to steady it by using both hands, changed his attitude from one that was awkward to another still more so, and finally drew the trigger, with a sort of desperate indifference, without having, in reality, secured any aim at all. The consequence was, that instead of hitting the knot which had been selected for the mark, he missed the arc altogether, the bullet skipping along the water like a stone that was thrown by hand. "'Well done, Serpent, well done!' cried Deerslayer, laughing, with his noiseless glee. "'You've hit the lake, and that's an exploit for some men. I knowed it, and as much as said it here to Judith.' for your short weapons don't belong to redskin gifts. You've hit the lake, and that's better than only hitting the air. Now stand back, and let us see what white gifts can do with a white weapon. A pistol isn't a rifle, but color is color." The aim of Deerslayer was both quick and steady, and the report followed almost as soon as the weapon rose. Still the pistol hung fire, as it is termed and fragments of it flew in a dozen directions, some falling on the roof of the castle, others in the ark, and one in the water. Judith screamed, and when the two men turned anxiously towards the girl, she was as pale as death, trembling in every limb. "'She's wounded, yes, the poor gal's wounded, Sarpent, though one couldn't foresee it, standing where she did. We'll lead her into a seat, and we must do the best for her that our knowledge and skill can afford. Judith allowed herself to be supported to a seat, swallowed a mouthful of the water that the Delaware offered her in a gourd, and, after a violent fit of trembling that seemed ready to shake her fine frame to dissolution, she burst into tears. "'The pain must be borne, poor Judith. Yes, it must be borne,' said Deerslayer soothingly. 
though I am far from wishing you not to weep, for weeping often lightens gallish feelings. Where can she be hurt, Sarpent? I see no signs of blood, nor any rent of skin or garments. I am uninjured, dear slayer, stammered the girl through her tears. It's fright, nothing more. I do assure you, and God be praised, no one, I find, has been harmed by the accident. This is extraordinary, exclaimed the unsuspecting and simple-minded hunter. I thought, Judith, you'd been above settlement weaknesses, and that you was a gal not to be frightened by the sound of a bursting weapon. No, I didn't think you so skeery. Hetty might well have been startled, but you've too much judgment and reason to be frightened when the danger's all over. They're pleasant to the eye, chief, and changeful, but very uncertain in their feelings. Shame kept Judith silent. There had been no acting in her agitation but all had fairly proceeded from sudden and uncontrollable alarm, an alarm that she found almost as inexplicable to herself as it proved to be to her companions. Wiping away the traces of tears, however, she smiled again, and was soon able to join in the laugh at her own folly. "'And you, dear Slayer,' she at length succeeded in saying, "'are you indeed altogether unhurt? It seems almost miraculous that a pistol should have burst in your hand.' and you escape without the loss of a limb, if not of life. Such wonders aren't uncommon at all among worn-out arms. The first rifle they gave me played the same trick, and yet I lived through it, though not as unharmless as I've got out of this affair. Thomas Hutter is master of one pistol less than he was this morning, but as it happened in trying to sarve him, there's no ground of complaint. Now, draw near, and let us look farther into the inside of the chist. Judith by this time had so far gotten the better of her agitation as to resume her seat, and the examination went on. The next article that offered was enveloped in cloth, and on opening it it proved to be one of the mathematical instruments that were then in use among seamen, possessing the usual ornaments and fastenings in brass. Deerslayer and Chingachgook expressed their admiration and surprise at the appearance of the unknown instrument, which was bright and glistening having apparently been well cared for. "'This goes beyond the surveyors, Judith,' Deerslayer exclaimed, after turning the instrument several times in his hands. "'I've seen all their tools often, and wicked and heartless enough are they, for they never come into the forest but to lead the way to waste and destruction. But none of them have as designing a look as this. I fear me, after all, that Thomas Hutter has journeyed into the wilderness with no fair intentions towards its happiness.' Did you ever see any of the cravings of a surveyor about your father, gal?" "'He is no surveyor, dear Slayer. Nor does he know the use of that instrument, though he seems to own it. Do you suppose that Thomas Hutter ever wore that coat? It is as much too large for him as this instrument is beyond his learning." "'That's it. That must be it, Sarpent. And the old fellow, by some unknown means, has fallen heir to another man's goods. They say he has been a mariner, and no doubt this chist and all it holds. Ha! What have we here? This far out does the brass and black wood of the tool." Deerslayer had opened a small bag, from which he was taking, one by one, the pieces of a set of chessmen. They were of ivory, much larger than common, and exquisitely wrought. Each piece represented the character or thing after which it is named, the knights being mounted the castle stood on elephants, and even the pawns possessed the heads and busts of men. The set was not complete, and a few fractures betrayed bad usage, but all that was left had been carefully put away and preserved. Even Judith expressed wonder, as these novel objects were placed before her eyes, and Chingachgook fairly forgot his Indian dignity in admiration and delight. The latter took up each piece, and examined it with never-tiring satisfaction, pointing out to the girl the more ingenious and striking portions of the workmanship. But the elephants gave him the greatest pleasure. The hus that he uttered, as he passed his fingers over their trunks, and ears, and tails, were very distinct. Nor did he fail to note the pawns, which were armed as archers. This exhibition lasted several minutes, during which time Judith and the Indian had all the rapture to themselves. Deerslayer sat silent, thoughtful, and even gloomy, 
though his eyes followed each movement of the two principal actors, noting every new peculiarity about the pieces as they were held up to view. Not an exclamation of pleasure, nor a word of condemnation passed his lips. At length his companions observed his silence, and then, for the first time since the chessmen had been discovered, did he speak. "'Judith,' he asked earnestly, but with a concern that amounted almost to tenderness of manner, did your parents ever talk to you of religion?" The girl colored, and the flashes of crimson that passed over her beautiful countenance were like the wayward tints of a Neapolitan sky in November. Deerslayer had given her so strong a taste for truth, however, that she did not waver in her answer, replying simply and with sincerity. "'My mother did often,' she said. "'My father never.' I thought it made my mother sorrowful to speak of our prayers and duties. But my father has never opened his mouth on such matters, before or since her death. That I can believe, that I can believe. He has no God, no such God as it becomes a man of white skin to worship, or even a red skin. Them things are idols." Judith started, and for a moment she seemed seriously hurt. Then she reflected, and in the end she laughed. And you think, Deerslayer, that these ivory toys are my father's gods? I have heard of idols, and know what they are." "'Them are idols,' repeated the other positively. "'Why should your father keep em, if he doesn't worship em? Would he keep his gods in a bag, and locked up in a chest? No, no, Deerslayer, my poor father carries his god with him, wherever he goes, and that is in his own cravings. These things may really be idols, I think they are myself, from what I have heard and read of idolatry, but they have come from some distant country, and like all the other articles, have fallen into Thomas Hutter's hands when he was a sailor. I'm glad of it. I am downright glad to hear it, Judith, for I do not think I could have mustered the resolution to strive to help a white idolater out of his difficulties. The old man is of my color and nation, and I wish to serve him but as one who denied all his gifts in the way of religion, it would have come hard to do so. That animal seems to give you great satisfaction, Sarpent, though it's an idolatrous beast at the best." "'It is an elephant,' interrupted Judith. I've often seen pictures of such animals at the garrisons, and Mother had a book in which there was a printed account of the creature. Father burnt that with all the other books, for he said Mother loved reading too well. This was not long before Mother died, and I have sometimes thought that the loss hastened her end. This was said equally without levity and without any very deep feeling. It was said without levity, for Judith was saddened by her recollections, and yet she had been too much accustomed to live for self, and for the indulgence of her own vanities, to feel her mother's wrongs very keenly. It required extraordinary circumstances to awaken a proper sense of her situation, and to stimulate the better feelings of this beautiful but misguided girl, and those circumstances had not yet occurred in her brief existence. "'Elephant or no elephant, tis an idol,' returned the hunter, and not fit to remain in Christian keeping." "'Good for Iroquois,' said Chingachgook, parting with one of the castles with reluctance as his friend took it from him to replace it in the bag. Elephant by whole tribe, by Delaware almost. Ay, that it would, as any one who comprehends redskin nature must know, answered Deerslayer. But the man that passes false money, Sarpent, is as bad as he who makes it. Did you ever know a just Injun that wouldn't scorn to sell a coon skin for the true marten, or to pass off a mink for a beaver? I know that a few of these idols, perhaps one of them elephants, would go far towards buying Thomas Hutter's liberty but it goes again conscience to pass such counterfeit money. Perhaps no Injun tribe, hereaway, is downright idolaters, but there's some that come so near it that white gifts ought to be particular about encouraging them in their mistake. If idolatry is a gift, dear slayer, and gifts are what you seem to think them, idolatry in such people can hardly be a sin," said Judith, with more smartness than discrimination. God grants no such gifts to any of his creatures, Judith," returned the hunter seriously. He must be adored under some name or other, and not creatures of brass or ivory. 
It matters not whether the Father of all is called God, or Manitou, Deity, or Great Spirit. He is none the less our common Maker and Master, nor does it count for much whether the souls of the just go to Paradise or happy hunting-grounds, since he may send each his own way, as suits his own pleasure and wisdom. But it curdles my blood, when I find human mortals so bound up in darkness and consate, as to fashion the earth or wood or bones, things made by their own hands, into motionless senseless effigies, and then fall down afore them, and worship them as a deity. After all, dear slayer, these pieces of ivory may not be idols at all. I remember now to have seen one of the officers at the garrison with a set of fox and geese made in some such a design as these. And here is something hard, wrapped in cloth, that may belong to your idols." Deerslayer took the bundle the girl gave him, and unrolling it, he found the board within. Like the pieces it was large, rich, and inlaid with ebony and ivory. Putting the whole in conjunction, the hunter, though not without many misgivings, slowly came over to Judith's opinion, and finally admitted that the fancied idols must be merely the curiously carved men of some unknown game. Judith had the tact to use her victory with great moderation, nor did she once, even in the most indirect manner, allude to the ludicrous mistake of her companion. This discovery of the uses of the extraordinary-looking little images settled the affair of the proposed ransom. It was agreed generally, and all understood the weaknesses and tastes of Indians, that nothing could be more likely to tempt the cupidity of the Iroquois than the elephants, in particular. Luckily, the whole of the castles were among the pieces, and these four tower-bearing animals it was finally determined should be the ransom offered. The remainder of the men, and indeed all the rest of the articles in the chest, were to be kept out of view, and to be resorted to only as a last appeal. As soon as these preliminaries were settled, everything but those intended for the bribe was carefully replaced in the chest. All the covers were tucked in, as they had been found, and it was quite possible, could Hutter have been put in possession of the castle again, that he might have passed the remainder of his days in it, without even suspecting the invasion that had been made on the privacy of the chest. The rent pistol would have been the most likely to reveal the secret, but this was placed by the side of its fellow, and all were pressed down as before, some half a dozen packages in the bottom of the chest not having been opened at all. When this was done the lid was lowered, the padlocks replaced, and the key turned. The latter was then replaced in the pocket from which it had been taken. More than an hour was consumed in settling the course proper to be pursued, and in returning everything to its place. The pauses to converse were frequent, and Judith, who experienced a lively pleasure in the open, undisguised admiration with which Deerslayer's honest eyes gazed at her handsome face, found the means to prolong the interview with a dexterity that seems to be innate in female coquetry. Deerslayer, indeed, appeared to be the first who was conscious of the time that had been thus wasted, and to call the attention of his companion to the necessity of doing something towards putting the plan of ransoming into execution. Chingachgook had remained in Hutter's bedroom, where the elephants were laid, to feast his eyes with the images of animals so wonderful and so novel. Perhaps an instinct told him that his presence would not be as acceptable to his companions as this holding himself aloof, for Judith had not much reserve in the manifestations of her preferences, and the Delaware had not got so far as one betrothed without acquiring some knowledge of the symptoms of the master passion. "'Well, Judith,' said Deerslayer, rising after the interview had lasted much longer than even he himself suspected, "'Tis pleasant conversing with you and settling all these matters, but duty calls us another way. All this time, hurry and your father, not to say Hetty, the word was cut short in the speaker's mouth, for at that critical moment a light step was heard on the platform, or courtyard, a human figure darkened the doorway, and the person last mentioned stood before him. The low exclamation that escaped Deerslayer and the slight scream of Judith were hardly uttered when an Indian youth between the ages of fifteen and seventeen stood beside her. These two entrances had been made with moccasined feet, and consequently almost without noise, but unexpected and stealthy as they were, 
they had not the effect to disturb Deerslayer's self-possession. His first measure was to speak rapidly in Delaware to his friend, cautioning him to keep out of sight, while he stood on his guard. The second was to step to the door to ascertain the extent of the danger. No one else, however, had come, and a simple contrivance in the shape of a raft that lay floating at the side of the ark at once explained the means that had been used in bringing Hetty off. Two dead and dry, and consequently buoyant, logs of pine were bound together with pins and withes, and a little platform of riven chestnut had been rudely placed on their surfaces. Here had he had been seated, on a billet of wood, while the young Iroquois had rowed the primitive and slow-moving, but perfectly safe craft from the shore. As soon as Deerslayer had taken a close survey of this raft, and satisfied himself nothing else was near, he shook his head and muttered in his soliloquizing way, this comes of prying into another man's chist. Had we been watchful and keen-eyed, such a surprise could never have happened, and getting this much from a boy teaches us what we may expect when the old warriors set themselves fairly about their circumventions. It opens the way, howsoever, to a treaty for the ransom, and I will hear what Hetty has to say. Judith, as soon as her surprise and alarm had a little abated, discovered a proper share of affectionate joy at the return of her sister. She folded her to her bosom, and kissed her, as had been her wont in the days of their childhood and innocence. Hetty herself was less affected, for to her there was no surprise, and her nerves were sustained by the purity and holiness of her purpose. At her sister's request she took a seat, and entered into an account of her adventures since they had parted. Her tale commenced just as Deerslayer returned, and he also became an attentive listener. While the young Iroquois stood near the door, seemingly as indifferent to what was passing as one of its posts. The narrative of the girl was sufficiently clear until she reached the time where we left her in the camp, after the interview with the chiefs, and at the moment when Hist quitted her, in the abrupt manner already related. The sequel of the story may be told in her own language. When I read the texts to the chiefs, Judith, you could not have seen that they made any changes on their minds," she said. But if seed is planted, it will grow. God planted the seeds of all these trees. Ay, that he did, that he did, muttered Deerslayer, and a goodly harvest has followed. God planted the seeds of all these trees, continued Hetty, after a moment's pause, and you see to what a height and shade they have grown. So it is with the Bible. You may read a verse this year and forget it and it will come back to you a year hence, when you least expect to remember it. And did you find anything of this among the savages, poor Hetty? Yes, Judith, and sooner and more fully than I had even hoped. I did not stay long with father and hurry, but went to get my breakfast with Hist. As soon as we had done, the chiefs came to us, and then we found the fruits of the seed that had been planted. They said what I had read from the good book was right. It must be right. It sounded right, like a sweet bird singing in their ears, and they told me to come back and say as much to the great warrior who had slain one of their braves, and to tell it to you, and to say how happy they should be to come to church here, in the castle, or to come out in the sun and hear me read more of the sacred volume, and to tell you that they wish you would lend them some canoes, that they can bring father and hurry and their women to the castle that we might all sit on the platform there and listen to the singing of the pale-faced Manitou. There, Judith, did you ever know of anything that so plainly shows the power of the Bible as that? If it were true, twould be a miracle indeed, Hetty. But all this is no more than Indian cunning and Indian treachery, striving to get the better of us by management, when they find it is not to be done by force. Do you doubt the Bible, sister? that you judge the savages so harshly? I do not doubt the Bible, poor Hetty, but I much doubt an Indian and an Iroquois. What do you say to this visit, dear Slayer? First let me talk a little with Hetty, returned the party appealed to. Was the raft made atter you had got your breakfast, gal, and did you walk from the camp to the shore opposite to us here? Oh, no, dear Slayer, the raft was ready-made and in the water. Could that have been by a miracle, Judith? Yes, yes, an Indian miracle, rejoined the hunter. They're expert enough in them sort of miracles, 
and you found the raft ready-made to your hands, and in the water, and in waiting like for its cargo? It was all as you say. The raft was near the camp, and the Indians put me on it, and had ropes of bark, and they dragged me to the place opposite to the castle, and then they told that young man to row me off, here. And the woods are full of the vagabonds waiting to know what is to be the upshot of the miracle. We comprehend this affair now, Judith. But I'll first get rid of this young Canada bloodsucker, and then we'll settle our own course. Do you and Hetty leave us together, first bringing me the elephants, which the sarpent is admiring, for twill never do to let this loping deer be alone a minute, or he'll borrow a canoe without asking. Judith did as desired, first bringing the pieces, and retiring with her sister into their own room. Deerslayer had acquired some knowledge of most of the Indian dialects of that region, and he knew enough of the Iroquois to hold a dialogue in the language. Beckoning to the lad, therefore, he caused him to take a seat on the chest, when he placed two of the castles suddenly before him. Up to that moment this youthful savage had not expressed a single intelligible emotion, or fancy. There were many things in and about the place that were novelties to him, but he had maintained his self-command with philosophical composure. It is true, Deerslayer had detected his dark eyes scanning the defences and the arms, but the scrutiny had been made with such an air of innocence, in such a gaping, indolent, boyish manner, that no one but a man who had himself been taught in a similar school would have even suspected his object. The instant, however, the eyes of the savage fell upon the wrought ivory, and the images of the wonderful unknown beasts, surprise and admiration got the mastery of him. The manner in which the natives of the South Sea Islands first beheld the toys of civilized life has been often described, but the reader is not to confound it with the manner of an American Indian, under similar circumstances. In this particular case, the young Iroquois, or Huron, permitted an exclamation of rapture to escape him, and then he checked himself like one who had been guilty of an indecorum. After this his eyes ceased to wander, but became riveted on the elephants, one of which, after a short hesitation, he even presumed to handle. Deerslayer did not interrupt him for quite ten minutes, knowing that the lad was taking such note of the curiosities as would enable him to give the most minute and accurate description of their appearance to his seniors on his return. When he thought sufficient time had been allowed to produce the desired effect, the hunter laid a finger on the naked knee of the youth, and drew his attention to himself. "'Listen,' he said, "'I want to talk with my young friend from the Canadas. Let him forget that wonder for a minute.' "'Where t'other pale brother?' demanded the boy, looking up and letting the idea that had been most prominent in his mind, previously to the introduction of the chessmen, escape him involuntarily. "'He sleeps, or if he isn't fairly asleep, he is in the room where the men do sleep,' returned Deerslayer. "'How did my young friend know there was another?' "'See him from the shore. Iroquois have got long eyes. See beyond the clouds.' See the bottom of the great spring. Well, the Iroquois are welcome. Two pale faces are prisoners in the camp of your father's boy. The lad nodded, treating the circumstance with great apparent indifference, though a moment after he laughed as if exulting in the superior address of his own tribe. Can you tell me, boy, what your chiefs intend to do with these captives? Or haven't they yet made up their minds? The lad looked a moment at the hunter with a little surprise. Then he coolly put the end of his forefinger on his own head, just above the left ear, and passed it round his crown with an accuracy and readiness that showed how well he had been drilled in the peculiar art of his race. "'When?' demanded Deerslayer, whose gorge rose at this cool demonstration of indifference to human life. "'And why not take them to your wigwams?' "'Road too long, and full of pale-faces.' Wigwam full, and scalps sell high. Small scalp, much gold. Well, that explains it. Yes, that does explain it. There's no need of being any plainer. Now you know, lad, that the oldest of your prisoners is the father of these two young women, and the other is the suitor of one of them. The gals naturally wish to save the scalps of such friends, and they will give them two ivory creatures as ransom, one for each scalp. Go back and tell this to your chiefs 
and bring me the answer before the sun sets." The boy entered zealously into this project, and with a sincerity that left no doubt of his executing his commission with intelligence and promptitude. For a moment he forgot his love of honor, and all his clannish hostility to the British and their Indians, in his wish to have such a treasure in his tribe, and Deerslayer was satisfied with the impression he had made. It is true the lad proposed to carry one of the elephants with him as a specimen of the other, but to this his brother negotiator was too sagacious to consent, well knowing that it might never reach its destination if confided to such hands. This little difficulty was soon arranged, and the boy prepared to depart. As he stood on the platform, ready to step aboard of the raft, he hesitated, and turned short with a proposal to borrow a canoe as the means most likely to shorten the negotiations. Deerslayer quietly refused the request, and after lingering a little longer the boy rowed slowly away from the castle, taking the direction of a thicket on the shore that lay less than half a mile distant. Deerslayer seated himself on a stool, and watched the progress of the ambassador sometimes closely scanning the whole line of shore, as far as eye could reach, and then placing an elbow on a knee, he remained a long time with his chin resting on the hand. During the interview between Deerslayer and the lad a different scene took place in the adjoining room. Hetty had inquired for the Delaware, and being told why and where he remained concealed, she joined him. The reception which Chingachgook gave his visitor was respectful and gentle. He understood her character, and no doubt his disposition to be kind to such a being was increased by the hope of learning some tidings of his betrothed. As soon as the girl entered she took a seat, and invited the Indian to place himself near her. Then she continued silent, as if she thought it decorous for him to question her, before she consented to speak on the subject she had in her mind. But. As Chingachgook did not understand this feeling, he remained respectfully attentive to anything she might be pleased to tell him. "'You are Chingachgook, the great serpent of the Delawares, aren't you?' the girl at length commenced, in her own simple way, losing her self-command in the desire to proceed, but anxious first to make sure of the individual. "'Chingachgook,' returned the Delaware, with grave dignity, "'that say great serpent, in Deerslayer tongue.' Well, that is my tongue. Deerslayer and father and Judith and I, and poor Hurry Harry. Do you know Henry March, great serpent? I know you don't, however, or he would have spoken of you too. Did any tongue name Chingachgook, drooping Lily, for so the chief had named poor Hetty? Was his name sung by a little bird among Iroquois? Hetty did not answer at first but with that indescribable feeling that awakens sympathy and intelligence among the youthful and unpractised of her sex, she hung her head, and the blood suffused her cheek ere she found her tongue. It would have exceeded her stock of intelligence to explain this embarrassment. But, though poor Hetty could not reason, on every emergency, she could always feel. The color slowly receded from her cheeks, and the girl looked up archly at the Indian, smiling with the innocence of a child, mingled with the interest of a woman. "'My sister, the drooping lily, hear such bird,' Chingachgook added, and this with a gentleness of tone and manner that would have astonished those who sometimes heard the discordant cries that often came from the same throat. These transitions from the harsh and guttural to the soft and melodious not being infrequent in ordinary Indian dialogues. My sister's ears were open. Has she lost her tongue? You are Chingachgook. You must be, for there is no other red man here. And she thought Chingachgook would come. Chingachgook, pronouncing the name slowly and dwelling on each syllable, Great Sarpent, Yengi's tongue. It is singular there should be any question concerning the origin of the well-known sobriquet of Yankees. Nearly all the old writers who speak of the Indians first known to the colonists make them pronounce the word English as Yengeese. Even at this day it is a provincialism of New England to say English instead of English, and there is a close conformity of sound between English and Yengeese, more especially if the latter word, as was probably the case, be pronounced short. 
The transition from Yengeese, thus pronounced, to Yankees is quite easy. If the former is pronounced Yangus, it is almost identical with Yankees, and Indian words have seldom been spelt as they are pronounced. Thus the scene of this tale is spelt Atsigo, and is properly pronounced Atsego. The liquids of the Indians would easily convert N into Yen. Chingachgook, repeated Hetty, in the same deliberate manner. Yes, so Hist called it, and you must be the chief. Watawa, added the Delaware. Watawa, or Histohist. I think Hist prettier than Wa, and so I call her Hist. Wa very sweet in Delaware ears. You make it sound differently from me, but never mind. I did hear the bird you speak of sing, great serpent. Will my sister say words of song? What she sing most? How she look? Often she laugh? She sang Chingachgook oftener than anything else, and she laughed heartily, when I told how the Iroquois waded into the water after us and couldn't catch us. I hope these logs haven't ears, serpent. No fear logs. Fear sister next room. No fear Iroquois. Deerslayer stuff his eyes and ears with strange beast. I understand you, serpent, and I understood Hist. Sometimes I think I'm not half as feeble-minded as they say I am. Now, do you look up at the roof, and I'll tell you all. But you frighten me. You look so eager when I speak of Hist." The Indian controlled his looks, and affected to comply with the simple request of the girl. Hist told me to say, in a very low voice, that you mustn't trust the Iroquois in anything. They are more artful than any Indians she knows. Then she says that there is a large bright star that comes over the hill about an hour after dark. Hist had pointed out the planet Jupiter without knowing it. And just as that star comes in sight, she will be on the point where I landed last night, and that you must come for her in a canoe. Good. Chingachgook understand well enough now but he understand better if my sisters sing him again." Hetty repeated her words, more fully explaining what Star was meant, and mentioning the part of the point where he was to venture ashore. She now proceeded, in her own unsophisticated way, to relate her intercourse with the Indian maid, and to repeat several of her expressions and opinions that gave great delight to the heart of her betrothed. She particularly renewed her injunctions to be on their guard against treachery a warning that was scarcely needed, however, as addressed to men as wary as those to whom it was sent. She also explained with sufficient clearness, for on all such subjects the mind of the girl seldom failed her, the present state of the enemy, and the movements they had made since morning. Hist had been on the raft with her until it quitted the shore, and was now somewhere in the woods, opposite to the castle, and did not intend to return to the camp until night approached when she hoped to be able to slip away from her companions, as they followed the shore on their way home, and conceal herself on the point. No one appeared to suspect the presence of Chingachgook, though it was necessarily known that an Indian had entered the Ark the previous night, and it was suspected that he had since appeared in, and about the castle, in the dress of a pale-face. Still some little doubt existed on the latter point for as this was the season when white men might be expected to arrive, there was some fear that the garrison of the castle was increasing by these ordinary means. All this had Hist communicated to Hetty, while the Indians were dragging them along shore, the distance, which exceeded six miles, affording abundance of time. Hist don't know herself whether they suspect her or not, or whether they suspect you, but she hopes neither is the case. And now, Serpent, since I have told you so much from your betrothed," continued Hetty, unconsciously taking one of the Indian's hands, and playing with the fingers, as a child is often seen to play with those of a parent, you must let me tell you something from myself. When you marry Hist, you must be kind to her, and smile on her, as you do now on me, and not look cross as some of the chiefs do at their squaws. Will you promise this? Always good to wa too tender to twist hard, else she break. Yes, and smile, too. You don't know how much a girl craves smiles from them she loves. Father scarce smiled on me once, 
while I was with him. And Hurry, yes, Hurry talked loud and laughed, but I don't think he smiled once either. You know the difference between a smile and a laugh? Laugh best. Hear Wa laugh, think birds sing. I know that. Her laugh is pleasant. But you must smile, and then, serpent, you mustn't make her carry burthens and hoe corn, as so many Indians do, but treat her more as the pale-faces treat their wives. Watawa no pale-face. Got red skin, red heart, red feelin's. All red. No pale-face. Must carry papoose. Every woman is willing to carry her child, said Hetty, smiling. And there is no harm in that. But you must love Hist, and be gentle, and good to her, for she is gentle and good herself. Chingachgook gravely bowed, and then he seemed to think this part of the subject might be dismissed. Before there was time for Hetty to resume her communications, the voice of Deerslayer was heard calling on his friend in the outer room. At this summons the serpent rose to obey, and Hetty joined her sister. End of chapter 13 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter Fourteen of the Deer Slayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deer Slayer by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter Fourteen. A stranger animal cries one sure never lived beneath the sun. A lizard's body lean and long, a fish's head, a serpent's tongue, its foot with triple claw disjoined and what a length of tail behind james merrick the chameleon eleven lines twenty one through twenty six the first act of the delaware on rejoining his friend was to proceed gravely to disencumber himself of his civilized attire and to stand forth an indian warrior again the protest of deerslayer was met by his communicating the fact that the presence of an indian in the hut was known to the iroquois and that maintaining the disguise would be more likely to direct suspicions to his real object than if he came out openly as a member of a hostile tribe. When the latter understood the truth, and was told that he had been deceived in supposing the chief had succeeded in entering the ark undiscovered, he cheerfully consented to the change, since further attempt at concealment was useless. A gentler feeling than the one avowed, however, lay at the bottom of the Indian's desire to appear as a son of the forest. He had been told that Hist was on the opposite shore, and nature so far triumphed over all distinctions of habit and tribes and people as to reduce this young savage warrior to the level of a feeling which would have been found in the most refined inhabitant of a town, under similar circumstances. There was a mild satisfaction in believing that she he loved could see him, and as he walked out on the platform in his scanty native attire, an Apollo of the wilderness, a hundred of the tender fancies that fleet through lovers' brains beset his imagination, and softened his heart. All this was lost on Deerslayer, who was no great adept in the mysteries of Cupid, but whose mind was far more occupied with the concerns that forced themselves on his attention than with any of the truant fancies of love. He soon recalled his companion, therefore, to a sense of their actual condition, by summoning him to a sort of council of war, in which they were to settle their future course. In the dialogue that followed, the parties mutually made each other acquainted with what had passed in their several interviews. Chingachgook was told the history of the treaty about the ransom, and Deerslayer heard the whole of Hetty's communications. The latter listened with generous interest to his friend's hopes and promised cheerfully all the assistance he could lend. "'Tis our main arrand, Sarpent, as you know, this battling for the castle and old Hutter's darters coming in as a sort of accident. Yes, yes. I'll be active in helping little Hist, who's not only one of the best and handsomest maidens of the tribe, but the very best and handsomest. I've always encouraged you, chief, in that liking and it's proper, too, that a great and ancient race like yourn shouldn't come to an end. If a woman of red skin and red gifts could get to be near enough to me to wish her for a wife, I'd search for just such another. But that can never be. No, that can never be. I'm glad Hetty has met with Hist, however, for though the first is a little short of wit and understanding, 
the last has enough for both. Yes, Sarpent, laughing heartily, put him together, and two smarter gals isn't to be found in all your colony. I will go to the Iroquois camp, returned the Delaware gravely. No one knows Chingachgook but Wa, and a treaty for lives and scalps should be made by a chief. Give me the strange beasts, and let me take a canoe. Deerslayer dropped his head and played with the end of a fish-pole in the water, as he sat dangling his legs over the edge of the platform, like a man who was lost in thought by the sudden occurrence of a novel idea. Instead of directly answering the proposal of his friend, he began to soliloquize, a circumstance, however, that in no manner rendered his words more true, as he was remarkable for saying what he thought, whether the remarks were addressed to himself or to any one else. "'Yes, yes,' he said. This must be what they call love. I've heard say that it sometimes upsets reason altogether, leaving a young man as helpless as to calculation and caution as a brute beast. To think that the serpent should be so lost to reason, and cunning, and wisdom! We must certainly manage to get Hist off, and have him married as soon as we get back to the tribe. Or this war will be of no more use to the chief than a hunt a little uncommon extraordinary. Yes, yes. He'll never be the man he was till this matter is off his mind, and he comes to his senses like all the rest of mankind. Sarpent, you can't be in earnest, and therefore I shall say but little to your offer. But you're a chief, and will soon be sent out on the war-path at head of the parties. And I'll just ask you if you'd think of putting your forces into the enemy's hands, afore the battle is fought. Wah! ejaculated the Indian. Ay, wa, I know well enough it's wa, and altogether wa, really, Sarpent, I'm concerned and mortified about you. I never heard so weak an ID come from a chief, and he too, one that's already got a name for being wise, young and inexperienced as he is. Canoe you shan't have, so long as the vice of friendship and warning can count for anything. My pale-faced friend is right. A cloud came over the face of Chingachgook and weakness got into his mind, while his eyes were dim. My brother has a good memory for good deeds, and a weak memory for bad. He will forget. Yes, that's easy enough. Say no more about it, chief. But if another of them clouds blow near you, do your endeavors to get out of its way. Clouds are bad enough in the weather, but when they come to the reason it gets to be serious. Now, sit down by me here, and let us calculate our movements a little for we shall soon either have a truce and a peace, or we shall come to an active and bloody war. You see the vagabonds can make logs serve their turn, as well as the best raftsmen on the rivers, and it would be no great exploit for them to invade us in a body. I've been thinking of the wisdom of putting all old Tom's stores into the ark, of barring and locking up the castle, and of taking to the ark altogether. That is movable, and by keeping the sail up and shifting places we might worry through a great many nights, without them Canada wolves finding a way into our sheepfold. Chingachgook listened to this plan with approbation. Did the negotiation fail, there was now little hope that the night would pass without an assault, and the enemy had sagacity enough to understand that in carrying the castle they would probably become masters of all it contained, the offered ransom included and still retain the advantages they had hitherto gained. Some precaution of the sort appeared to be absolutely necessary, for now the numbers of the Iroquois were known, a night attack could scarcely be successfully met. It would be impossible to prevent the enemy from getting possession of the canoes and the ark, and the latter itself would be a hold in which the assailants would be as effectually protected against bullets as were those in the building. For a few minutes, both the men thought of sinking the ark in the shallow water, of bringing the canoes into the house, and of depending altogether on the castle for protection. But reflection satisfied them that, in the end, this expedient would fail. It was so easy to collect logs on the shore, and to construct a raft of almost any size, that it was certain the Iroquois, now they had turned their attention to such means, would resort to them seriously, so long as there was the certainty of success by perseverance. After deliberating maturely, and placing all the considerations fairly before them, 
the two young beginners in the art of forest warfare settled down into the opinion that the ark offered the only available means of security. This decision was no sooner come to than it was communicated to Judith. The girl had no serious objection to make, and all four set about the measures necessary to carrying the plan into execution. The reader will readily understand that Floating Tom's worldly goods were of no great amount. A couple of beds, some wearing apparel, the arms and ammunition, a few cooking utensils, with the mysterious and but half-examined chest formed the principal items. These were all soon removed, the ark having been hauled on the eastern side of the building, so that the transfer could be made without being seen from the shore. It was thought unnecessary to disturb the heavier and coarser articles of furniture, as they were not required in the ark, and were of but little value in themselves. As great caution was necessary in removing the different objects, most of which were passed out of a window with a view to conceal what was going on, it required two or three hours before all could be effected. By the expiration of that time the raft made its appearance, moving from the shore. Deerslayer immediately had recourse to the glass, by the aid of which he perceived that two warriors were on it, though they appeared to be unarmed. The progress of the raft was slow a circumstance that formed one of the great advantages that would be possessed by the scow, in any future collision between them, the movements of the latter being comparatively swift and light. As there was time to make the dispositions for the reception of the two dangerous visitors, everything was prepared for them, long before they had got near enough to be hailed. The serpent and the girls retired into the building, where the former stood near the door, well provided with rifles, while Judith watched the proceedings without, through a loop. As for Deerslayer, he had brought a stool to the edge of the platform, at the point towards which the raft was advancing, and taken his seat with his rifle leaning carelessly between his legs. As the raft drew nearer, every means possessed by the party in the castle was resorted to, in order to ascertain if their visitors had any firearms. Neither Deerslayer nor Chingachgook could discover any, but Judith, unwilling to trust to simple eyesight, thrust the glass through the loop, and directed it towards the hemlock boughs that lay between the two logs of the raft, forming a sort of flooring, as well as a seat for the use of the rowers. When the heavy moving craft was within fifty feet of him, Deerslayer hailed the Hurons, directing them to cease rowing, it not being his intention to permit them to land. Compliance, of course, was necessary and the two grim-looking warriors instantly quitted their seats, though the raft continued slowly to approach, until it had driven in much nearer to the platform. "'Are ye chiefs?' demanded Deerslayer with dignity. "'Are ye chiefs? Or have the Mingos sent me warriors without names on such an errand? If so, the sooner you go back, the sooner them will be likely to come that a warrior can talk with.' Huh! <laughs> exclaimed the elder of the two on the raft, rolling his glowing eyes over the different objects that were visible in and about the castle, with a keenness that showed how little escaped him. "'My brother is very proud, but Rivenoak—we use the literal translation of the term, writing as we do in English—is a name to make a Delaware turn pale. "'That's true, or it's a lie, Rivenoak, as it may be. But I am not likely to turn pale, seeing that I was born pale. What's your errand, and why do you come among the light bark canoes on logs that are not even dug out? The Iroquois are not ducks to walk on water. Let the pale faces give them a canoe, and they'll come in a canoe. That's more rational than likely to come to pass. We have but four canoes, and being four persons, that's only one for each of us. We thank you for the offer, howsoever, though we ask leave not to accept it. You are welcome, Iroquois on your logs. Thanks. My young pale-face warrior, he has got a name. How do the chiefs call him?" Deerslayer hesitated a moment, and a gleam of pride and human weakness came over him. He smiled, muttered between his teeth, and then looking up proudly he said, Mingo, like all who are young and active, I have been known by different names at different times. One of your warriors, whose spirit started for the happy grounds of your people, as lately as yesterday morning, thought I deserved to be known by the name of Hawkeye, and this because my sight happened to be quicker than his own, when it got to be life or death atween us." 
Chingachgook, who was attentively listening to all that passed, heard and understood this proof of passing weakness in his friend, and on a future occasion he questioned him more closely concerning the transaction on the point, where Deerslayer had first taken human life. When he had got the whole truth, he did not fail to communicate it to the tribe, from which time the young hunter was universally known among the Delawares by an appellation so honorably earned. As this, however, was a period posterior to all the incidents of this tale, we shall continue to call the young hunter by the name under which he has been first introduced to the reader. Nor was the Iroquois less struck with the vaunt of the white man. He knew of the death of his comrade, and had no difficulty in understanding the allusion, the intercourse between the conqueror and his victim on that occasion having been seen by several savages on the shore of the lake who had been stationed at different points just within the margin of bushes to watch the drifting canoes, and who had not time to reach the scene of action ere the victor had retired. The effect on this rude being of the forest was an exclamation of surprise. Then such a smile of courtesy and wave of the hand succeeded as would have done credit to Asiatic diplomacy. The two Iroquois spoke to each other in low tones and both drew near the end of the raft that was closest to the platform. "'My brother, Hawkeye, has sent a message to the Hurons,' resumed Rivenoak, "'and it has made their hearts very glad. They hear he has images of beasts with two tails. Will he show them to his friends?' "'Enemies would be truer,' returned Deerslayer, "'but sound is in sense, and does little harm. Here is one of the images. I toss it to you under the faith of treaties. If it's not returned, the rifle will settle the pint atween us." The Iroquois seemed to acquiesce in the conditions, and Deerslayer arose and prepared to toss one of the elephants to the raft, both parties using all the precaution that was necessary to prevent its loss. As practice renders men expert in such things, the little piece of ivory was soon successfully transferred from one hand to the other, and then followed another scene on the raft in which astonishment and delight got the mastery of Indian stoicism. These two grim old warriors manifested even more feeling, as they examined the curiously wrought chessman, than had been betrayed by the boy, for in the case of the latter recent schooling had interposed its influence, while the men, like all who are sustained by well-established characters, were not ashamed to let some of their emotions be discovered. For a few minutes, they apparently lost the consciousness of their situation, in the intense scrutiny they bestowed on a material so fine, work so highly wrought, and an animal so extraordinary. The lip of the moose is perhaps the nearest approach to the trunk of the elephant that is to be found in the American forest, but this resemblance was far from being sufficiently striking to bring the new creature within the range of their habits and ideas. And the more they studied the image, the greater was their astonishment nor did these children of the forest mistake the structure on the back of the elephant for a part of the animal. They were familiar with horses and oxen, and had seen towers in the Canadas, and found nothing surprising in creatures of burthen. Still, by a very natural association they supposed the carving meant to represent that the animal they saw was of a strength sufficient to carry a fort on its back, a circumstance that in no degree lessened their wonder. "'Has my pale-faced brother any more such beasts?' at last the senior of the Iroquois asked, in a sort of petitioning manner. "'There's more where them came from, Mingo,' was the answer. "'One is enough, however, to buy off fifty scalps. "'One of my prisoners is a great warrior, tall as a pine, strong as the moose, active as a deer, fierce as the panther. Some day he'll be a great chief, and lead the army of King George.' "'Tut, tut, Mingo!' Hurry Harry is hurry Harry, and you'll never make more than a corporal of him if you do that. He's tall enough of a sartainty, but that's of no use, as he only hits his head agin the branches as he goes through the forest. He's strong, too, but a strong body isn't a strong head, and the king's generals are not chosen for their sinews. He's swift, if you will, but a rifle bullet is swifter. And as for fierceness, it's no great recommend to a soldier. They that think they feel the stoutest often given out at the pinch. No, no, you'll never make Hurry's scalp pass for more than a good head of curly hair, and a rattle-pate beneath it. 
My old prisoner very wise, king of the lake, great warrior, wise counsellor. Well, there's them that might gainsay all this, too, Mingo. A very wise man wouldn't be apt to be taken in so foolish a manner as befell Master Hutter, and if he gives good counsel, he must have listened to very bad in that affair. There's only one king of this lake, and he's a long way off, and isn't likely ever to see it. Floating Tom is some such king of this region, as the wolf that prowls through the woods is king of the forest. A beast with two tails is well worth two such scalps. But my brother has another beast? He will give two, holding up as many fingers, for old father? Floating Tom is no father of mine, but he'll fare none the worse for that. As for giving two beasts for his scalp, and each beast with two tails, it is quite beyond reason. Think yourself well off, Mingo, if you make a much worse trade." By this time the self-command of Rivenoak had got the better of his wonder, and he began to fall back on his usual habits of cunning, in order to drive the best bargain he could. It would be useless to relate more than the substance of the desultory dialogue that followed, in which the Indian manifested no little management in endeavouring to recover the ground lost under the influence of surprise. He even affected to doubt whether any original for the image of the beast existed, and asserted that the oldest Indian had never heard a tradition of any such animal. Little did either of them imagine at the time that, long ere a century elapsed, the progress of civilization would bring even much more extraordinary and rare animals into that region, as curiosities to be gazed at by the curious, and that the particular beast about which the disputants contended would be seen laving its sides and swimming in the very sheet of water on which they had met. The Atsigo is a favorite place for the caravan keepers to let their elephants bathe. The writer has seen two at a time, since the publication of this book, swimming about in company. As is not uncommon on such occasions, one of the parties got a little warm in the course of the discussion, for Deerslayer met all the arguments and prevarication of his subtle opponent with his own cool directness of manner, and unmoved love of truth. What an elephant was he knew little better than the savage, but he perfectly understood that the carved pieces of ivory must have some such value in the eyes of an Iroquois as a bag of gold or a package of beaver skins would in those of a trader. Under the circumstances, therefore, he felt it to be prudent not to concede too much at first, since there existed a nearly unconquerable obstacle to making the transfers, even after the contracting parties had actually agreed upon the terms. Keeping this difficulty in view, he held the extra chessmen in reserve, as a means of smoothing any difficulty in the moment of need. At length the savage pretended that further negotiation was useless, since he could not be so unjust to his tribe as to part with the honor and emoluments of two excellent full-grown male scalps, for a consideration so trifling as a toy like that he had seen, and he prepared to take his departure. Both parties now felt as men are wont to feel, when a bargain that each is anxious to conclude is on the eve of being broken off, in consequence of too much pertinacity in the way of management. The effect of the disappointment was very different, however, on the respective individuals. Deerslayer was mortified and filled with regret, for he not only felt for the prisoners, but he also felt deeply for the two girls. The conclusion of the treaty, therefore, left him melancholy and full of regret. With the savage his defeat produced the desire of revenge. In a moment of excitement he had loudly announced his intention to say no more and he felt equally enraged with himself and with his cool opponent that he had permitted a pale-face to manifest more indifference and self-command than an Indian chief. When he began to urge his raft away from the platform, his countenance lowered and his eye glowed, even while he affected a smile of amity and a gesture of courtesy at party. It took some little time to overcome the inertia of the logs, and while this was being done by the silent Indian, Rivenoak stalked over the hemlock boughs that lay between the logs in sullen ferocity, eyeing keenly the while the hut, the platform, and the person of his late disputant. Once he spoke in low, quick tones to his companion, and he stirred the boughs with his feet like an animal that is restive. At that moment the watchfulness of Deerslayer had a little abated, for he sat musing on the means of renewing the negotiation without giving too much advantage to the other side. 
It was perhaps fortunate for him that the keen and bright eyes of Judith were as vigilant as ever. At the instant when the young man was least on his guard, and his enemy was the most on the alert, she called out in a warning voice to the former, most opportunely giving the alarm. "'Be on your guard, dear slayer," the girl cried. "'I see rifles with the glass beneath the hemlock brush, and the Iroquois is loosening them with his feet.' It would seem that the enemy had carried their artifices so far as to employ an agent who understood English. The previous dialogue had taken place in his own language, but it was evident by the sudden manner in which his feet ceased their treacherous occupation, and in which the countenance of Rivenoak changed from sullen ferocity to a smile of courtesy, that the call of the girl was understood. Signing to his companion to cease his efforts to set the logs in motion, he advanced to the end of the raft, which was nearest to the platform, and spoke. "'Why should Rivenoak and his brother leave any cloud between them?' he said. "'They are both wise, both brave, and both generous. They ought to part friends. One beast shall be the price of one prisoner.' "'And Mingo,' answered the other, delighted to renew the negotiations on almost any terms, and determined to clinch the bargain, if possible, by a little extra liberality. You'll see that a pale-face knows how to pay a full price, when he trades with an open heart and an open hand. Keep the beast that you had forgotten to give back to me, as you was about to start, and which I forgot to ask for on account of concern at parting in anger. Show it to your chiefs. When you bring us our friends, two more shall be added to it, and— hesitating a moment in distrust of the expediency of so great a concession, then deciding in its favor. And, if we see them before the sun sets, we may find a fourth to make up an even number." This settled the matter. Every gleam of discontent vanished from the dark countenance of the Iroquois, and he smiled as graciously, if not as sweetly, as Judith Hutter herself. The piece already in his possession was again examined and an ejaculation of pleasure showed how much he was pleased with this unexpected termination of the affair. In point of fact, both he and Deerslayer had momentarily forgotten what had become the subject of their discussion, in the warmth of their feelings. But such had not been the case with Rivenoak's companion. This man retained the peace, and had fully made up his mind, were it claimed under such circumstances as to render its return necessary, to drop it in the lake, trusting to his being able to find it again at some future day. This desperate expedient, however, was no longer necessary, and after repeating the terms of agreement, and professing to understand them, the two Indians finally took their departure, moving slowly towards the shore. "'Can any faith be put in such wretches?' asked Judith, when she and Hetty had come out on the platform and were standing at the side of Deerslayer watching the dull movement of the logs. Will they not rather keep the toy they have, and send us off some bloody proofs of their getting the better of us in cunning, by way of boasting? I've heard of acts as bad as this." "'No doubt, Judith, no manner of doubt. If it wasn't for Indian nature. But I'm no judge of a redskin, if that two-tailed beast doesn't set the whole tribe in some such stir as a stick raises in a beehive. Now, there's the serpent a man with nerves like flint, and no more curiosity in everyday concerns than his befitting prudence. Why, he was so overcome with the sight of the creature, carved as it is in bone, that I felt ashamed for him. That's just their gifts, howsoever, and one can't quarrel with a man for his gifts, when they are lawful. Chingachgook will soon get over his weakness, and remember that he's a chief, and that he comes of a great stock, and has a renowned name to support and uphold. But as for yonder scamps, there'll be no peace among em, till they think they've got possession of everything of the nature of that bit of carved bone that's to be found among Thomas Hutter's stores. They only know of the elephants, and can have no hopes about the other things. That's true, Judith. Still, covetousness is a craving feelin'. They'll say, if the pale-faces have these curious beasts with two tails, who knows but they've got some with three or for that matter with four. That's what the schoolmasters call natural arithmetic, and twill be certain to beset the feelings of savages. They'll never be easy till the truth is known." "'Do you think, dear Slayer, inquired Hetty, in her simple and innocent manner, that the Iroquois won't let father and hurry go? I read to them several of the very best verses in the whole Bible, 
and you see what they have done already. The hunter, as he always did, listened kindly and even affectionately to Hetty's remarks. Then he mused a moment in silence. There was something like a flush on his cheek as he answered after quite a minute had passed. I don't know whether a white man ought to be ashamed or not to own he can't read. But such is my case, Judith. You are skillful, I find, in all such matters, while I have only studied the hand of God as it is seen in the hills and the valleys, the mountain-tops, the streams, the forests, and the springs. Much learning may be got in this way, as well as out of books, and yet I sometimes think it is a white man's gift to read. When I hear from the mouths of the Moravians the words of which Hetty speaks, they raise a longing in my mind, and I then think I will know how to read them myself. But the game in summer, and the traditions, and lessons in war, and other matters, have always kept me behindhand. "'Shall I teach you, Deerslayer?' asked Hetty, earnestly. "'I'm weak-minded, they say, but I can read as well as Judith. It might save your life to know how to read the Bible to the savages, and it will certainly save your soul, for Mother told me that, again and again. Thank ye, Hetty. Yes, thank ye, with all my heart. These are like to be too stirring times for much idleness. But after it's peace, and I come to see you again on this lake, then I'll give myself up to it, as if twas pleasure and profit in a single business. Perhaps I ought to be ashamed, Judith, that tis so. But truth is truth. As for these Iroquois, tisn't very likely they'll forget a beast with two tails, on account of a verse or two from the Bible. I rather expect they'll give up the prisoners, and trust to some circumvenion or other to get em back again with us and all in the castle and the ark in the bargain. Howsever, we must humour the vagabonds, first to get your father and hurry out of their hands, and next to keep the peace atween us, until such time as the serpent there can make out to get off his betrothed wife. If there's any sudden outbreakin' of anger and ferocity, the Indians will send off all their women and children to the camp at once, whereas by keepin' em calm and trustful we may manage to meet Hist at the spot she has mentioned. Rather than have the bargain fall through, now, I'd throw in half a dozen of them effigy bow and arrow men, such as we've in plenty in the chist. Judith cheerfully assented, for she would have resigned even the flowered brocade rather than not redeem her father and please Deerslayer. The prospects of success were now so encouraging as to raise the spirits of all in the castle, though a due watchfulness of the movements of the enemy was maintained. Hour passed after hour, notwithstanding, and the sun had once more begun to fall towards the summits of the western hills, and yet no signs were seen of the return of the raft. By dint of sweeping the shore with the glass, Deerslayer at length discovered a place in the dense and dark woods where, he entertained no doubt, the Iroquois were assembled in considerable numbers. It was near the thicket whence the craft had issued, and a little rill that trickled into the lake announced the vicinity of a spring. Here, then, the savages were probably holding their consultation, and the decision was to be made that went to settle the question of life or death for the prisoners. There was one ground for hope in spite of the delay, however, that Deerslayer did not fail to place before his anxious companions. It was far more probable that the Indians had left their prisoners in the camp than that they had encumbered themselves by causing them to follow through the woods a party that was out on a merely temporary excursion. If such was the fact, it required considerable time to send a messenger the necessary distance, and to bring the two white men to the spot where they were to embark. Encouraged by these reflections, a new stock of patience was gathered, and the declension of the sun was viewed with less alarm. The result justified Deerslayer's conjecture. Not long before the sun had finally disappeared, the two logs were seen coming out of the thicket again, and as it drew near, Judith announced that her father and Hurry, both of them pinioned, lay on the bushes in the center. As before, the two Indians were rowing. The latter seemed to be conscious that the lateness of the hour demanded unusual exertions, and contrary to the habits of their people, who are ever averse to toil, they labored hard at the rude substitutes for oars. In consequence of this diligence, the raft occupied its old station in about half the time that had been taken in the previous visits. Even after the conditions were so well understood, and matters had proceeded so far, the actual transfer of the prisoners 
was not a duty to be executed without difficulty. The Iroquois were compelled to place great reliance on the good faith of their foes, though it was reluctantly given, and was yielded to necessity rather than to confidence. As soon as Hutter and Hurry should be released, the party in the castle numbered two to one, as opposed to those on the raft, and escape by flight was out of the question as the former had three bark canoes, to say nothing of the defences of the house and the ark. All this was understood by both parties, and it is probable the arrangement never could have been completed, had not the honest countenance and manner of Deerslayer wrought their usual effect on Rivenoak. "'My brother knows I put faith in him,' said the latter, as he advanced with Hutter, whose legs had been released to enable the old man to ascend to the platform. "'One scalp, one more beast.' "'Stop, Mingo,' interrupted the hunter. "'Keep your prisoner a moment. I have to go and seek the means of payment.' This excuse, however, though true in part, was principally a fetch. Deerslayer left the platform, and entering the house, he directed Judith to collect all the arms and to conceal them in her own room. He then spoke earnestly to the Delaware, who stood on guard as before, near the entrance of the building, put the three remaining castles in his pocket, and returned. "'You are welcome back to your old abode, Master Hutter,' said Deerslayer, as he helped the other up on the platform, slyly passing into the hand of Rivenoak at the same time another of the castles. "'You'll find your darters right glad to see you, and here's Hetty come herself to say as much in her own behalf.' Here the hunter stopped speaking and broke out into a hearty fit of his silent and peculiar laughter. Hurry's legs were just released, and he had been placed on his feet. So tightly had the ligatures been drawn, that the use of his limbs was not immediately recovered, and the young giant presented, in good sooth, a very helpless and a somewhat ludicrous picture. It was this unusual spectacle, particularly the bewildered countenance, that excited the merriment of Deerslayer. "'You look like a girdled pine in a clearin', hurry, Harry, that is rocking in a gale,' said Deerslayer, checking his unseasonable mirth more from delicacy to the others than from any respect to the liberated captive. I'm glad, howsoever, to see that you haven't had your hair dressed by any of the Iroquois barbers in your late visit to their camp. Harky, dear Slayer, returned the other a little fiercely, it will be prudent for you to deal less in mirth and more in friendship on this occasion. Act like a Christian for once, and not like a laughing gal in a country school when the master's back is turned. And just tell me whether there's any feet or not at the end of these legs of mine. I think I can see them, but as for feelin', they might as well be down on the banks of the Mohawk as be where they seem to be. You've come off whole, hurry, and that's not a little, answered the other, secretly passing to the Indian the remainder of the stipulated ransom, and making an earnest sign at the same moment for him to commence his retreat. You've come off whole, feet and all and are only a little numb from a tight fit of the withes. Nature'll soon set the blood in motion, and then you may begin to dance to celebrate what I call a most wonderful and unexpected deliverance from a den of wolves." Deerslayer released the arms of his friends as each landed, and the two were now stamping and limping about on the platform, growling and uttering denunciations as they endeavored to help the returning circulation. They had been tethered too long, however, to regain the use of their limbs in a moment, and the Indians being quite as diligent on their return as on their advance, the raft was fully a hundred yards from the castle when Hurry, turning accidentally in that direction, discovered how fast it was getting beyond the reach of his vengeance. By this time he could move with tolerable facility, though still numb and awkward. Without considering his own situation, however, he seized the rifle that leaned against the shoulder of Deerslayer and attempted to cock and present it. The young hunter was too quick for him. Seizing the piece, he wrenched it from the hands of the giant, not, however, until it had gone off in the struggle, when pointed directly upward. It is probable that Deerslayer could have prevailed in such a contest on account of the condition of Hurry's limbs, but the instant the gun went off, the latter yielded and stumped towards the house, raising his legs at each step quite a foot from the ground from an uncertainty of the actual position of his feet. But he had been anticipated by Judith. The whole stock of Hutter's arms, which had been left in the building as a resource in the event of a sudden outbreaking of hostilities, had been removed, and were already secreted, agreeably to Deerslayer's directions. 
In consequence of this precaution, no means offered by which March could put his designs in execution. Hurry seated himself, and like Hutter, for half an hour he was too much occupied in endeavouring to restore the circulation, and in regaining the use of his limbs, to indulge in any other reflections. By the end of this time the raft had disappeared, and night was beginning to throw her shadows once more over the whole sylvan scene. Before darkness had completely set in, and while the girls were preparing the evening meal, Deerslayer related to Hutter an outline of events that had taken place, and gave him a history of the means he had adopted for the security of his children and property. End of chapter 14 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 15 of the Deerslayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter 15 As long as Edwarda rules this lande, nequiet you wille ye know. Your sonus and husbandus shall be slain. Am brooks with bloda shall floa. You leave your a god and lawful a king when in adversity. Lick a ma and toa the trua causa steek and for the trua causa dia. Chatterton. The calm of evening was again in singular contrast, while its gathering gloom was in singular unison with the passions of men. The sun was set, and the rays of the retiring luminary had ceased to gild the edges of the few clouds that had sufficient openings to admit the passage of its fading light. The canopy overhead was heavy and dense, promising another night of darkness, but the surface of the lake was scarcely disturbed by a ripple. There was a little air, though it scarce deserved to be termed wind. Still, being damp and heavy, it had a certain force. The party in the castle were as gloomy and silent as the scene. The two ransomed prisoners felt humbled and discoloured, but their humility partook of the rancour of revenge. They were far more disposed to remember the indignity with which they had been treated during the last few hours of their captivity than to feel grateful for the previous indulgence. Then that keen-sighted monitor, conscience, by reminding them of the retributive justice of all they had endured, goaded them rather to turn the tables on their enemies than to accuse themselves. As for the others, they were thoughtful, equally from regret and joy. Deerslayer and Judith felt most of the former sensation, though from very different causes, while Hetty, for the moment, was perfectly happy. The Delaware had also lively pictures of felicity in the prospect of so soon regaining his betrothed. Under such circumstances, and in this mood, all were taking the evening meal. "'Old Tom!' cried Hurry, bursting into a fit of boisterous laughter. "'You looked amazingly like a tethered bear as you was stretched on them hemlock boughs, and I only wonder you didn't growl more. Well, it's over, and Siths and lamentations won't mend the matter. There's the blackguard Rivenoak, he that brought us off has an uncommon scalp, and I'd give as much for it myself as the colony. Yes, I feel as rich as the governor in these matters now, and will lay down with them doubloon for doubloon. Judith, darling, did you mourn for me much, when I was in the hands of the Philipsteins? The last were a family of German descent on the Mohawk, to whom Hurry had a great antipathy, and whom he had confounded with the enemies of Judea. "'Our tears have raised the lake, Hurry March, as you might have seen by the shore,' returned Judith, with a feigned levity that she was far from feeling. "'That Hetty and I should have grieved for father was to be expected, but we fairly rained tears for you.' "'We were sorry for poor Hurry, as well as for father, Judith,' put in her innocent and unconscious sister. "'True, girl, true. But we feel sorrow for everybody that's in trouble, you know.' returned the other, in a quick, admonitory manner, and a low tone. Nevertheless, we are glad to see you, Master March, and out of the hands of the Philipsteins, too. Yes, they're a bad set, and so is the other brood of em down on the river. It's a wonderment to me how you got us off, dear Slayer. 
and I forgive you the interference that prevented my doing justice on that vagabond for this small service. Let us into the secret, that we may do you the same turn at need. Was it by lying, or by coaxing? By neither, hurry, but by buying. We paid a ransom for you both, and that too at a price so high you would well be on your guard again another captivement, lest our stock of goods shouldn't hold out. A ransom! Old Tom has paid the fiddler, then, for nothing of mine would have bought off the hair, much less the skin. I didn't think men as keen-set as them vagabonds would let a fellow up so easy, when they had him fairly at a close hug, and floored. But money is money, and somehow it's unnatural hard to withstand. Indian or white man, tis pretty much the same. It must be owned, Judith, there's a considerable of human nature in mankind generally, arter all. Hutter now rose, and signing to Deerslayer, as he led him to an inner room, where, in answer to his questions, he first learned the price that had been paid for his release. The old man expressed neither resentment nor surprise at the inroad that had been made on his chest, though he did manifest some curiosity to know how far the investigations of its contents had been carried. He also inquired where the key had been found. The habitual frankness of Deerslayer prevented any prevarication and the conference soon terminated by the return of the two to the outer room, or that which served for the double purpose of parlour and kitchen. "'I wonder if it's peace or war between us and the savages,' exclaimed Hurry, just as Deerslayer, who had paused for a single instant, listened attentively, and was passing through the outer door without stopping. "'This given up captives has a friendly look, and when men have traded together on a fair and honourable footing they ought to part friends for that occasion at least. Come back, dear Slayer, and let us have your judgment, for I'm beginning to think more of you since your late behavior than I used to do. There's an answer to your question, Hurry, since you're in such haste to come again to blows." As dear Slayer spoke, he threw on the table on which the other was reclining with one elbow a sort of miniature faggot, composed of a dozen sticks, bound tightly together with a deerskin thong. March seized it eagerly and holding it close to a blazing knot of pine that lay on the hearth, and which gave out all the light there was in the room, ascertained that the ends of the several sticks had been dipped in blood. "'If this isn't plain English,' said the reckless frontier man, "'it's plain Indian. Here's what they call a declaration of war down at York, Judith. How did you come by this defiance, dear Slayer?' "'Fairly enough. It lay not a minute since in what you call Floatin' Tom's dooryard. How came it there?' It never fell from the clouds, Judith, as little toads sometimes do, and then it don't rain. You must prove where it come from, Deerslayer, or we shall suspect some design to scare them that would have lost their wits long ago, if fear could drive them away." Deerslayer had approached a window, and cast a glance out of it on the dark aspect of the lake. As if satisfied with what he beheld, he drew near Hurry, and took the bundle of sticks into his own hand, examining it attentively. "'Yes, this is an Indian declaration of war, sure enough,' he said, "'and it's a proof how little you're suited to be on the path it has travelled, Harry March, that it has got here, and you never the wiser as to the means. The savages may have left the scalp on your head, but they must have taken off the ears, else you'd have heard the stirring of the water made by the lad as he come off again on his two logs.' His errand was to throw these sticks at our door, as much as to say, We've struck the war-post since the trade, and the next thing will be to strike you. The prowling wolves! But hand me that rifle, Judith, and I'll send an answer back to the vagabonds through their messenger." "'Not while I stand by, Master March,' coolly put in Deerslayer, motioning for the other to forbear. Faith is faith, whether given to a redskin or to a Christian. The lad lighted a knot, and came off fairly under its blaze to give us this warning. And no man here should harm him, while implied on such an errand. There's no use in words, for the boy is too cunning to leave the knot burning, now his business is done, and the night is already too dark for a rifle to have any certainty. "'That may be true enough as to a gun, but there's virtue still in a canoe,' answered Hurry, passing towards the door with enormous strides, carrying a rifle in his hands. "'The being doesn't live that shall stop me from following and bringing back that reptile's scalp. The more on em that you crush in the egg the fewer they'll be to dart at you in the woods." Judith trembled like the aspen. 
she scarce knew why herself, though there was the prospect of a scene of violence. For if Hurry was fierce and overbearing in the consciousness of his vast strength, Deerslayer had about him the calm determination that promises greater perseverance, and a resolution more likely to effect its object. It was the stern resolute eye of the latter, rather than the noisy vehemence of the first, that excited her apprehensions. Hurry soon reached the spot where the canoe was fastened, but not before Deerslayer had spoken in a quick, earnest voice to the serpent, in Delaware. The latter had been the first, in truth, to hear the sounds of the oars, and he had gone upon the platform in jealous watchfulness. The light satisfied him that a message was coming, and when the boy cast his bundle of sticks at his feet it neither moved his anger nor induced surprise. He merely stood at watch, rifle in hand, to make certain that no treachery lay behind the defiance. As Deerslayer now called to him, he stepped into the canoe, and quick as thought removed the paddles. Hurry was furious when he found that he was deprived of the means of proceeding. He first approached the Indian with loud menaces and even Deerslayer stood aghast at the probable consequences. March shook his sledge-hammer fists, and flourished his arms as he drew near the Indian, and all expected he would attempt to fell the Delaware to the earth. One of them, at least, was well aware that such an experiment would be followed by immediate bloodshed. But even Hurry was awed by the stern composure of the chief, and he, too, knew that such a man was not to be outraged with impunity. He therefore turned to vent his rage on Deerslayer, where he foresaw no consequences so terrible. What might have been the result of this second demonstration, if completed, is unknown, since it was never made. "'Hurry,' said a gentle soothing voice at his elbow, "'it's wicked to be so angry, and God will not overlook it. The Iroquois treated you well, and they didn't take your scalp, though you and father wanted to take theirs.' The influence of mildness on passion is well known. Hetty, too, had earned a sort of consideration, that had never before been enjoyed by her, through the self-devotion and decision of her recent conduct. Perhaps her established mental imbecility, by removing all distrust of a wish to control, aided her influence. Let the cause be as questionable as it might, the effect was sufficiently certain. Instead of throttling his old fellow-traveller, Hurry turned to the girl and poured out a portion of his discontent, if none of his anger, in her attentive ears. "'Tis too bad, Hetty,' he exclaimed, "'as bad as a county jail or a lack of beaver to get a creature into your very trap, then to see it get off. As much as six first-quality skins in valley has paddled off on them clumsy logs, when twenty strokes of a well-turned paddle would overtake em. I say in valley, for as to the boy in the way of nature, he is only a boy, and is worth neither more nor less than one. Deerslayer, you've been untrue to your friends, in letting such a chance slip through my fingers as well as your own." The answer was given quietly, but with a voice as steady as a fearless nature and the consciousness of rectitude could make it. "'I should have been untrue to the right had I done otherwise,' returned the Deerslayer steadily and neither you nor any other man has the authority to demand that much of me. The lad came on a lawful business, and the meanest redskin that roams the woods would be ashamed of not respecting his errand. But he's now far beyond your reach, Master March, and there's little use in talking, like a couple of women, of what can no longer be helped." So saying, Deerslayer turned away, like one resolved to waste no more words on the subject, while Hutter pulled Harry by the sleeve and led him into the ark. There they sat long in private conference. In the meantime the Indian and his friend had their secret consultation, for though it wanted some three or four hours to the rising of the star, the former could not abstain from canvassing his scheme, and from opening his heart to the other. Judith, too, yielded to her softer feelings, and listened to the whole of Hetty's artless narrative of what occurred after she landed. The woods had few terrors for either of these girls, educated as they had been and accustomed as they were to look out daily at their rich expanse or to wander beneath their dark shades. But the elder sister felt that she would have hesitated about thus venturing alone into an Iroquois camp. Concerning Hist, Hetty was not very communicative. She spoke of her kindness and gentleness, and of the meeting in the forest. But the secret of Chingachgook was guarded with a shrewdness and fidelity that many a sharper-witted girl might have failed to display. At length, 
the several conferences were broken up by the reappearance of Hutter on the platform. Here he assembled the whole party, and communicated as much of his intentions as he deemed expedient. Of the arrangement made by Deerslayer, to abandon the castle during the night and to take refuge in the ark, he entirely approved. It struck him as it had the others, as the only effectual means of escaping destruction. Now that the savages had turned their attention to the construction of rafts, no doubt could exist of their at least making an attempt to carry the building, and the message of the bloody sticks sufficiently showed their confidence in their own success. In short, the old man viewed the night as critical, and he called on all to get ready as soon as possible, in order to abandon the dwellings, temporarily at least, if not for ever. These communications made, everything proceeded promptly and with intelligence. The castle was secured in the manner already described, the canoes were withdrawn from the dock and fastened to the ark by the side of the other, the few necessaries that had been left in the house were transferred to the cabin, the fire was extinguished, and all embarked. The vicinity of the hills, with their drapery of pines, had the effect to render nights that were obscure darker than common on the lake. As usual, however, a belt of comparative light was etched through the centre of the sheet, while it was within the shadows of the mountains that the gloom rested most heavily on the water. The island or castle stood in this belt of comparative light, but still the night was so dark as to cover the aperture of the ark. At the distance of an observer on the shore her movements could not be seen at all, more particularly as a background of dark hillside filled up the perspective of every view that was taken diagonally or directly across the water. The prevailing wind on the lakes of that region is west, but owing to the avenues performed by the mountains it is frequently impossible to tell the true direction of the currents, as they often vary within very short distances and brief differences of time. This is truer in light of fluctuating puffs of air than in steady breezes, though the squalls of even the latter are familiarly known to be uncertain and baffling in all mountainous regions and narrow waters. On the present occasion, Hutter himself, as he shoved the ark from her berth at the side of the platform, was at a loss to pronounce which way the wind blew. In common, this difficulty was solved by the clouds, which floating high above the hilltops, as a matter of course, obeyed the currents. But now the whole vault of heaven seemed a massive gloomy wall. Not an opening of any sort was visible, and Chingachgook was already trembling lest the non-appearance of the star might prevent his betrothed from being punctual to her appointment. Under these circumstances Hutter hoisted his sail seemingly with the sole intention of getting away from the castle, as it might be dangerous to remain much longer in its vicinity. The air soon filled the cloth, and when the scow was got under command, and the sail was properly trimmed, it was found that the direction was southerly, inclining towards the eastern shore. No better course offering for the purposes of the party, the singular craft was suffered to skim the surface of the water in this direction for more than an hour, when a change in the currents of the air drove them over towards the camp. Deerslayer watched all the movements of Hutter and Harry with jealous attention. At first he did not know whether to ascribe the course they held to accident or to design, but he now began to suspect the latter. Familiar as Hutter was with the lake, it was easy to deceive one who had little practice on the water, and let his intentions be what they might, it was evident, ere two hours had elapsed, that the ark had got sufficient space to be within a hundred rods of the shore, directly abreast of the known position of the camp. For a considerable time previously to reaching this point, Hurry, who had some knowledge of the Algonquin language, had been in close conference with the Indian, and the result was now announced by the latter to Deerslayer who had been a cold, not to say distrusted, looker-on of all that passed. My old father, and my young brother, the Big Pine, for so the Delaware had named March, want to see Huron scalps at their belts, said Chingachgook to his friend. There is room for some on the girdle of the serpent, and his people will look for them when he goes back to his village. Their eyes must not be left long in a fog, but they must see what they look for. I know that my brother has a white hand. He will not strike even the dead. He will wait for us. When we come back he will not hide his face from shame for his friend. The great serpent of the Mohicans must be worthy to go on the war-path with Hawkeye." "'Aye, aye, serpent! I see how it is. 
that name's to stick, and in time I shall get to be known by it instead of Deerslayer. Well, if such honours will come, the humblest of us all must be willing to abide by em. As for your looking for scalps, it belongs to your gifts, and I see no harm in it. Be merciful, Sarpent, howsoever, be merciful, I beseech you. It surely can do no harm to a redskin's honour to show a little mercy. As for the old man, the father of two young women, who might ripen better feelings in his heart, and Harry March here, who, pine as he is, might better bear the fruit of a more Christianized tree, as for them too, I leave them in the hands of the white man's God. Wasn't it for the bloody sticks, no man should go again the Mingos this night, seeing that it would dishonor our faith and characters. But them that crave blood can't complain if blood is shed at their call. Still, Sarpent, you can be merciful. Don't begin your career with the wails of women and the cries of children. Bear yourself so that Hist will smile, and not weep, when she meets you. Go, then, and the Manitou preserve you. My brother will stay here with the scow. Wah will soon be standing on the shore waiting, and Chingachgook must hasten." The Indian then joined his two co-adventurers, and first lowering the sail, they all three entered the canoe, and left the side of the ark. Neither Hutter nor March spoke to Deerslayer concerning their object, or the probable length of their absence. All this had been confided to the Indian, who had acquitted himself of the trust with characteristic brevity. As soon as the canoe was out of sight, and that occurred ere the paddles had given a dozen strokes, Deerslayer made the best dispositions he could to keep the ark as nearly stationary as possible, and then he sat down in the end of the scow to chew the cut of his own bitter reflections. It was not long, however, before he was joined by Judith, who sought every occasion to be near him, managing her attack on his affections with the address that was suggested by native coquetry, aided by no little practice, but which received much of its most dangerous power from the touch of feeling that threw around her manner, voice, accents, thoughts, and acts, the indescribable witchery of natural tenderness. Leaving the young hunter exposed to these dangerous assailants, it has become our more immediate business to follow the party in the canoe to the shore. The controlling influence that led Hutter and Hurry to repeat their experiment against the camp was precisely that which had induced the first attempt, a little heightened, perhaps, by the desire of revenge. But neither of these two rude beings, so ruthless in all things that touched the rights and interests of the red man, though possessing veins of human feeling on other matters, was much actuated by any other desire than a heartless longing for profit. Hurry had felt angered at his sufferings when first liberated, it is true, but that emotion soon disappeared in the habitual love of gold, which he sought with the reckless avidity of a needy spendthrift, rather than with the ceaseless longings of a miser. In short, the motive that urged them both so soon to go against the Hurons, was an habitual contempt of their enemy, acting on the unceasing cupidity of prodigality. The additional chances of success, however, had their place in the formation of the second enterprise. It was known that a large portion of the warriors, perhaps all, were encamped for the night abreast of the castle, and it was hoped that the scalps of helpless victims would be the consequence. To confess the truth, Hutter in particular, he who had just left two daughters behind him, expected to find few besides women and children in the camp. The fact had been but slightly alluded to in his communications with Hurry, and with Chingachgook it had been kept entirely out of view. If the Indian thought of it at all, it was known only to himself. Hutter steered the canoe. Hurry had manfully taken his post in the bows, and Chingachgook stood in the centre. We say stood for all three were so skilled in the management of that species of frail bark as to be able to keep erect positions in the midst of the darkness. The approach to the shore was made with great caution, and the landing effected in safety. The three now prepared their arms, and began their tiger-like approach upon the camp. The Indian was on the lead, his two companions treading in his footsteps with a stealthy cautiousness of manner that rendered their progress almost literally noiseless. Occasionally a dried twig snapped under the heavy weight of the gigantic hurry, or the blundering clumsiness of the old man. But, had the Indian walked on air, his step could not have seemed lighter. The great object was first to discover the position of the fire, which was known to be the centre of the whole encampment. At length the keen eye of Chingachgook 
caught a glimpse of this important guide. It was glimmering at a distance among the trunks of trees. There was no blaze, but merely a single smouldering brand, as suited the hour, the savages usually retiring and rising with the revolutions of the sun. As soon as a view was obtained of this beacon, the progress of the adventurers became swifter and more certain. In a few minutes they got to the edge of the circle of little huts. Here they stopped to survey their ground, and to concert their movements. The darkness was so deep as to render it difficult to distinguish anything but the glowing brand, the trunks of the nearest trees, and the endless canopy of leaves that veiled the clouded heaven. It was ascertained, however, that a hut was quite near and Chingachgook attempted to reconnoitre its interior. The manner in which the Indian approached the place that was supposed to contain enemies resembled the wily advances of the cat on the bird. As he drew near, he stooped mis mistake. As he drew near, he stooped to his hands and knees, for the entrance was so low as to require this attitude, even as a convenience. Before thrusting his head inside, however, he listened long to catch the breathing of sleepers. No sound was audible and this human serpent thrust his head in at the door, or opening, as another serpent would have peered in on the nest. Nothing rewarded the hazardous experiment, for, after feeling cautiously with a hand, the place was found to be empty. The Delaware proceeded in the same guarded manner to one or two more of the huts, finding all in the same situation. He then returned to his companions, and informed them that the Hurons had deserted their camp. A little further inquiry corroborated this fact, and it only remained to return to the canoe. The different manner in which the adventurers bore the disappointment is worthy of a passing remark. The chief, who had landed solely with the hope of acquiring renown, stood stationary, leaning against a tree, waiting the pleasure of his companions. He was mortified, and a little surprised, it is true, but he bore all with dignity, falling back for support on the sweeter expectations that still lay in reserve for that evening. It was true, he could not now hope to meet his mistress with the proofs of his daring and skill on his person, but he might still hope to meet her, and the warrior, who was zealous in the search, might always hope to be honored. On the other hand, Hutter and Hurry, who had been chiefly instigated by the basest of all human motives, the thirst of gain, could scarce control their feelings. They went prowling among the huts as if they expected to find some forgotten child or careless sleeper and again and again did they vent their spite on the insensible huts, several of which were actually torn to pieces, and scattered about the place. Nay, they even quarrelled with each other, and fierce reproaches passed between them. It is possible some serious consequences might have occurred, had not the Delaware interfered to remind them of the danger of being so unguarded, and of the necessity of returning to the Ark. This checked the dispute and in a few minutes they were paddling sullenly back to the spot where they hoped to find that vessel. It has been said that Judith took her place at the side of Deerslayer soon after the adventurers departed. For a short time the girl was silent, and the hunter was ignorant which of the sisters had approached him, but he soon recognized the rich, full-spirited voice of the elder, as her feelings escaped in words. "'This is a terrible life for women, Deerslayer,' she exclaimed. "'Would to heaven I could see an end of it!' The life is well enough, Judith, was the answer, being pretty much as it is used or abused. What would you wish to see in its place? I should be a thousand times happier to live nearer to civilized beings, where there are farms and churches and houses built as it might be by Christian hands, and where my sleep at night would be sweet and tranquil. A dwelling near one of the forts would be far better than this dreary place where we live. Nay, Judith. I can't agree too lightly in the truth of all this. If forts are good to keep off enemies, they sometimes hold enemies of their own. I don't think twould be for your good, or the good of Hetty, to live near one. And if I must say what I think, I'm afeard you are a little too near as it is." Deerslayer went on in his own steady, earnest manner, for the darkness concealed the tints that colored the cheeks of the girl almost to the brightness of crimson while her own great efforts suppressed the sounds of the breathing that nearly choked her. As for farms, they have their uses, and there's them that like to pass their lives on em. But what comfort can a man look for in a clearin' that he can't find in double quantities in the forest? If air 
and room and light are a little craved, the windrows and the streams will furnish him. Or here are the lakes for such as have bigger longings in that way. But where are you to find your shades, and laughing springs, and leaping brooks, and venerable trees, a thousand years old, in a clearin? You don't find them, but you find their disabled trunks, marking the earth like headstones in a graveyard. It seems to me that the people who live in such places must be always thinking of their own inns, and of universal decay, and that, too, not of the decay that is brought about by time and nature, but the decay that follows waste and violence. Then as to churches, they're good, I suppose, else wouldn't good men uphold them. But they are not altogether necessary. They call them the temples of the Lord. But, Judith, the whole earth is a temple of the Lord to such as have the right mind. Neither forts nor churches make people happier of themselves. Moreover, all is contradiction in the settlements, while all is concord in the woods. Forts and churches almost always go together, and yet they're downright contradictions, churches being for peace and forts for war. No, no. Give me the strong places of the wilderness, which is the trees and the churches, too, which are arbors raised by the hand of nature. Woman is not made for scenes like these, dear slayer, scenes of which we shall have no end, as long as this war lasts. If you mean women of white color, I rather think you're not far from the truth, gal. But as for the females of the red men, such visitations are quite in character. Nothing would make Hist, now, the bargained wife of yonder Delaware, happier than to know that he is at this moment prowling around his natural enemies, striving after a scalp. Surely, surely, dear slayer, she cannot be a woman, and not feel concern when she thinks the man she loves is in danger. She doesn't think of the danger, Judith, but of the honor. And when the heart is desperately set on such feelings, why, there is little room to crowd in fear. Hist is a kind, gentle, laughing, pleasant creature. But she loves honor, as well as any Delaware gal I ever knowed. She's to meet the sarpent an hour hence on the pint where Hetty landed, and no doubt she has her anxiety about it, like any other woman. But she'd be all the happier did she know that her lover was at this moment waylaying a mingo for his scalp. If you really believe this, dear slayer, no wonder you lay so much stress on gifts. Certain am I that no white girl could feel anything but misery while she believed her betrothed in danger of his life nor do I suppose even you, unmoved and calm as you ever seem to be, could be at peace if you believed your hist in danger. That's a different matter. Tis altogether a different matter, Judith. Woman is too weak and gentle to be intended to run such risks. And man must feel for her. Yes, I rather think that's as much red nature as it's white. But I have no hist, nor am I like to have, for I hold it wrong to mix colors, any way except in friendship, and services. In that you are and feel as a white man should. As for Hurry Harry, I do think it would be all the same to him whether his wife were a squaw or a governor's daughter, provided she was a little comely, and could help to keep his craving stomach full. You do march in justice, Judith. Yes, you do. The poor fellow dotes on you, and when a man has really set his heart on such a creature, it isn't a mingo or even a Delaware gal that'll be likely to unsettle his mind. You may laugh at such men as Hurry and I, for we're rough and unteached in the ways of books and other knowledge, but we've our good pints as well as our bad ones. An honest heart is not to be despised, gal, even though it be not versed in all the niceties that please the female fancy. You, dear slayer, and do you, can you, for an instant, suppose I place you by the side of Harry March? No. No, I am not so far gone in dullness as that. No one, man or woman, could think of naming your honest heart, manly nature, and simple truth, with the boisterous selfishness, greedy, avarice, and overbearing ferocity of Harry March. The very best that can be said of him is to be found in his name of Hurry Scurry, which, if it means no great harm, means no great good. Even my father, following his feelings with the other, as he is doing at this moment, well knows the difference between you. This I know, for he said as much to me in plain language. Judith was a girl of quick sensibilities and of impetuous feelings, and, being under few of the restraints 
that curtail the manifestations of maiden emotions among those who are educated in the habits of civilized life. She sometimes betrayed the latter with a feeling that was so purely natural as to place it as far above the wiles of coquetry as it was superior to its heartlessness. She had now even taken one of the hard hands of the hunter and pressed it between both her own, with a warmth and earnestness that proved how sincere was her language. It was perhaps fortunate that she was checked by the very excess of her feelings, since the same power might have urged her on to avow all that her father had said, the old man not having been satisfied with making a comparison favorable to Deerslayer, as between the hunter and Hurry, but having actually, in his blunt rough way, briefly advised his daughter to cast off the latter entirely, and to think of the former as a husband. Judith would not willingly have said this to any other man but there was so much confidence awakened by the guileless simplicity of Deerslayer, that one of her nature found it a constant temptation to overstep the bounds of habit. She went no further, however, immediately relinquishing the hand, and falling back on a reserve that was more suited to her sex, and indeed to her natural modesty. "'Thank ye, Judith, thank ye with all my heart,' returned the hunter, whose humility prevented him from placing any flattering interpretation on either the conduct or the language of the girl. Thank ye as much as if it was all true. Harry's sightly, yes, he's as sightly as the tallest pine of the mountains, and the sarpent has named him accordingly. However, some fancy good looks, and some fancy good conduct only. Hurry has one advantage, and it depends on himself whether he'll have t'other, or— Hark! That's your father's voice, gal, and he speaks like a man who's riled at something. "'God save us from any more of these horrible scenes!' exclaimed Judith, bending her face to her knees and endeavouring to exclude the discordant sounds by applying her hands to her ears. "'I sometimes wish I had no father.' This was bitterly said, and the repinings which extorted the words were bitterly felt. It is impossible to say what might next have escaped her had not a gentle, low voice spoken at her elbow. "'Judith!' I ought to have read a chapter to Father and Hurry," said the innocent but terrified speaker, and that would have kept them from going again on such an errand. Do you call to them, dear Slayer, and tell them I want them, and that it will be good for them both if they'll return and hearken to my words. Ah's me! Poor Hetty, you little know the cravens for gold and revenge, if you believe they are so easily turned aside from their longings. But this is an uncommon business in more ways than one, Judith. I hear your father and hurry growling like bears, and yet no noise comes from the mouth of the young chief. There's an end of secrecy, and yet his whoop, which ought to ring in the mountains according to rule in such circumstances, is silent. Justice may have alighted on him, and his death have saved the lives of the innocent. Not it, not it. The serpent is not the one to suffer if that's to be the law. Certainly there has been no onset, and tis most likely that the camp's deserted, and the men are coming back disappointed. That accounts for the growls of hurry and the silence of the serpent. Just at this instant a fall of a paddle was heard in the canoe. For vexation made March reckless, Deerslayer felt convinced that his conjecture was true. The sail being down, the ark had not drifted far, and ere many minutes he heard Chingachgook in a low, quiet tone, directing Hutter how to steer in order to reach it. In less time than it takes to tell the fact, the canoe touched the scow, and the adventurers entered the latter. Neither Hutter nor Hurry spoke of what had occurred, but the Delaware, in passing his friend, merely uttered the words, "'Fires out!' which, if not literally true, sufficiently explained the truth to his listener. It was now a question as to the course to be steered. A short surly conference was held when Hutter decided that the wisest way would be to keep in motion as the means most likely to defeat any attempt at a surprise, announcing his own and March's intention to requite themselves for the loss of sleep during their captivity by lying down. As the air still baffled and continued light, it was finally determined to sail before it, let it come in what direction it might, so long as it did not blow the ark upon the strand. This point settled, the released prisoners helped to hoist the sail, and they threw themselves upon two of the pallets, leaving Deerslayer and his friend to look after the movements of the craft. 
as neither of the latter was disposed to sleep, on account of the appointment with Hist, this arrangement was acceptable to all parties. That Judith and Hetty remained up also, in no manner impaired the agreeable features of this change. For some time the scow rather drifted than sailed along the western shore, following a light southerly current of the air. The progress was slow, not exceeding a couple of miles in the hour, but the two men perceived that it was not only carrying them towards the point they desired to reach, but at a rate that was quite as fast as the hour yet rendered necessary. But little more was to be said the while, even by the girls, and that little had more reference to the rescue of Hist than to any other subject. The Indian was calm to the eye, but as minute after minute passed his feelings became more and more excited, until they reached a state that might have satisfied the demands of even the most exacting mistress. Deerslayer kept the craft as much in the bays as was prudent, for the double purpose of sailing within the shadows of the woods, and of detecting any signs of an encampment they might pass on the shore. In this manner they doubled one low point, and were already in the bay that was terminated north by the goal at which they aimed. The latter was still a quarter of a mile distant, when Chingachgook came silently to the side of his friend, and pointed to a place directly ahead. A small fire was glimmering just within the verge of the bushes that lined the shore on the southern side of the point, leaving no doubt that the Indians had suddenly removed their camp to the very place, or at least the very projection of land, where Hist had given them the rendezvous. End of chapter 15 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter Sixteen of the Deerslayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. Chapter Sixteen I hear thee babbling to the vale of sunshine and of flowers, but unto me thou bringst a tale of visionary hours. Wordsworth. One discovery mentioned at the close of the preceding chapter was of great moment in the eyes of Deerslayer and his friend. In the first place there was the danger, almost the certainty, that Hutter and Hurry would make a fresh attempt on this camp, should they awake and ascertain its position. Then there was the increased risk of landing to bring off Hist, and there were the general uncertainty and additional hazards that must follow from the circumstance that their enemies had begun to change their positions. As the Delaware was aware that the hour was near when he ought to repair to the rendezvous, he no longer thought of trophies torn from his foes, and one of the first things arranged between him and his associate was to permit the two others to sleep on, lest they should disturb the execution of their plans by substituting some of their own. The ark moved slowly, and it would have taken fully a quarter of an hour to reach the point, at the rate at which they were going thus affording time for a little forethought. The Indians, in the wish to conceal their fire from those who were thought to be still in the castle, had placed it so near the southern side of the point as to render it extremely difficult to shut it in by the bushes, though Deerslayer varied the direction of the scow both to the right and to the left, in the hope of being able to effect that object. "'There's one advantage, Judith, in finding that fire so near the water,' he said while executing these little manoeuvres, since it shows the Mingos believe we are in the hut, and our coming on em from this quarter will be an unlooked-for event. But it's lucky Harry March and your father are asleep, else we should have em prowling after scalps again. Ha! There! The bushes are beginning to shut in the fire, and now it can't be seen at all. Deerslayer waited a little to make sure that he had at last gained the desired position, when he gave the signal agreed on, and Chingachgook let go the grapnel and lowered the sail. The situation in which the ark now lay had its advantages and its disadvantages. The fire had been hid by shearing towards the shore, and the latter was nearer, perhaps, than was desirable. Still, the water was known to be very deep farther off in the lake, and anchoring in deep water, under the circumstances in which the party was placed, was to be avoided, if possible. It was also believed no raft could be within miles, and though the trees in the darkness appeared almost to overhang the scow, it would not be easy to get off to her without using a boat. 
The intense darkness that prevailed so close in with the forest, too, served as an effectual screen, and so long as care was had not to make a noise, there was little or no danger of being detected. All these things Deerslayer pointed out to Judith, instructing her as to the course she was to follow in the event of an alarm, for it was thought to the last degree inexpedient to arouse the sleepers, unless it might be in the greatest emergency. And now, Judith, we understand one another. It is time the Sarpent and I had taken to the canoe," the hunter concluded. The star has not risen yet, it's true. But it soon must, though none of us are likely to be any the wiser for it to-night, on account of the clouds. Howsever, Hist has a ready mind, and she's one of them that doesn't always need to have a thing afore her to see it. I'll warrant you she'll not be either two minutes or two feet out of the way unless them jealous vagabonds, the Mingos, have taken the alarm, and put her as a stool-pigeon to catch us, or have hid her away, in order to prepare her mind for a Huron instead of a Mohican husband." "'Deerslayer,' interrupted the girl earnestly, "'this is a most dangerous service. Why do you go on it at all?' "'Anan. Why, you know, gal, we go to bring off Hist. The Sarpent's betrothed, the maid he means to marry as soon as we get back to the tribe. That is all right for the Indian. But you do not mean to marry Hist. You are not betrothed. And why should two risk their lives and liberties to do that which one can just as well perform?" Ah! Now I understand you, Judith. Yes, now I begin to take the I.D. You think as Hist is the Sarpent's betrothed, as they call it, and not mine, it's altogether his affair and as one man can paddle a canoe he ought to be left to go after his gal alone. But you forget this is our arnd here on the lake, and it would not tell well to forget an arnd just as the pinch came. Then, if love does count for so much with some people, particularly with young women, friendship counts for something, too, with other some. I dares to say, the Delaware can paddle a canoe by himself, and can bring off Hist by himself, and perhaps he would like that quite as well as to have me with him. But he couldn't circumvent circumventions, or stir up an ambushment, or fight with the savages, and get his sweetheart at the same time, as well by himself as if he had a friend with him to depend on, even if that friend is no better than myself. No, no, Judith, you wouldn't desert one that counted on you at such a moment, and you can't in reason expect me to do it. I fear—I believe you are right, dear Slayer and yet I wish you were not to go. Promise me one thing at least, and that is, not to trust yourself among the savages, or to do anything more than to save the girl. That will be enough for once, and with that you ought to be satisfied." "'Lord bless you, gal. One would think it's Hetty that's talking, and not the quick-witted and wonderful Judith Hutter. But fright makes the wise silly, and the strong weak. Yes, I've seen proofs of that, time and again. Well. It's kind and soft-hearted of you, Judith, to feel this concern for a fellow-creature, and I shall always say that you are kind and of true feelings. Let them that envy your good looks tell as many idle stories of you as they may." "'Dear Slayer,' hastily said the girl, interrupting him, though nearly choked by her own emotions, "'do you believe all you hear about a poor motherless girl? Is the foul tongue of Hurry Harry to blast my life?' "'Not it, Judith, not it. I've told Hurry it wasn't manful to backbite them he couldn't win by fair means, and that even an Indian is always tender touching a young woman's good name." "'If I had a brother, he wouldn't dare to do it,' exclaimed Judith, with eyes flashing fire. "'But finding me without any protector but an old man, whose ears are getting to be as dull as his feelings, he has his way as he pleases.' "'Not exactly that, Judith, no, not exactly that, neither. No man, brother or stranger, would stand by and see as fair a gal as yourself hunted down, without saying a word in her behalf. Hurry's in earnest in wanting to make you his wife, and the little he does let out again you comes more from jealousy, like, than from anything else. Smile on him when he awakes, and squeeze his hand only half as hard as you squeezed mine a bit ago, and my life on it, the poor fellow will forget everything but your comeliness. Hot words don't always come from the heart, but oftener from the stomach than anywhere else. Try him, Judith, when he awakes, and see the virtue of a smile." 
Deerslayer laughed, in his own manner, as he concluded, and then he intimated to the patient-looking but really impatient Chingachgook his readiness to proceed. As the young man entered the canoe, the girl stood immovable as stone, lost in the musings that the language and manner of the other were likely to produce. The simplicity of the hunter had completely put her at fault, for, in her narrow sphere, Judith was an expert manager of the other sex, though in the present instance she was far more actuated by impulses, in all she had said and done, than by calculation. We shall not deny that some of Judith's reflections were bitter, though the sequel of the tale must be referred to in order to explain how merited, or how keen, were her sufferings. Chingachgook and his pale-faced friend set forth on their hazardous and delicate enterprise, with a coolness and method that would have done credit to men who were on their twentieth instead of being on their first warpath, as suited his relation to the pretty fugitive in whose service they were engaged. The Indian took his place in the head of the canoe while Deerslayer guided its movements in the stern by this arrangement, the former would be the first to land and of course the first to meet his mistress. The latter had taken his post without comment, but in secret influenced by the reflection that one who had so much at stake as the Indian might not possibly guide the canoe with the same steadiness and intelligence as another who had more command of his feelings. From the instant they left the side of the ark, the movements of the two adventurers were like the maneuvers of highly drilled soldiers, who for the first time were called on to meet the enemy in the field. As yet, Chingachgook had never fired a shot in anger, and the debut of his companion in warfare is known to the reader. It is true, the Indian had been hanging about his enemy's camp for a few hours on his first arrival, and he had even once entered it, as related in the last chapter. But no consequences had followed either experiment. Now it was certain that an important result was to be effected, or a mortifying failure was to ensue. The rescue or the continued captivity of Hist depended on the enterprise. In a word, it was virtually the maiden expedition of these two ambitious young forest soldiers, and while one of them set forth impelled by sentiments that usually carry men so far, both had all their feelings of pride and manhood enlisted in their success. Instead of steering in a direct line to the point, then distant from the ark less than a quarter of a mile, Deerslayer laid the head of his canoe diagonally towards the centre of the lake, with the view to obtain a position from which he might approach the shore, having his enemies in his front only. The spot where Hetty had landed, and where Hist had promised to meet them, moreover, was on the upper side of the projection rather than on the lower, and to reach it would have required the two adventurers to double nearly the whole point, close in with the shore, had not this preliminary step been taken. So well was the necessity for this measure understood that Chingachgook quietly paddled on, although it was adopted without consulting him, and apparently was taking him in a direction nearly opposite to that one might think he most wished to go. A few minutes sufficed, however, to carry the canoe the necessary distance, when both the young men ceased paddling, as it were, by instinctive consent, and the boat became stationary. The darkness increased rather than diminished, but it was still possible from the place where the adventurers lay to distinguish the outlines of the mountains. In vain did the Delaware turn his head eastward to catch a glimpse of the promised star, for notwithstanding the clouds broke a little near the horizon in that quarter of the heavens, the curtain continued so far drawn as effectually to conceal all behind it. In front, as was known by the formation of land above and behind it, lay the point at the distance of about a thousand feet. No signs of the castle could be seen, nor could any movement in that quarter of the lake reach the air. The latter circumstance might have been equally owing to the distance, which was several miles, or to the fact that nothing was in motion. As for the ark, though scarcely farther from the canoe than the point, it lay so completely buried in the shadows of the shore that it would not have been visible even had there been many degrees more of light than actually existed. The adventurers now held a conference in low voices, consulting together as to the probable time. Deerslayer thought it wanted yet some minutes to the rising of the star, while the impatience of the chief caused him to fancy the night further advanced, and to believe that his betrothed was already waiting his appearance on the shore. 
As might have been expected, the opinion of the latter prevailed, and his friend disposed himself to steer for the place of rendezvous. The utmost skill and precaution now became necessary in the management of the canoe. The paddles were lifted and returned to the water in a noiseless manner, and when within a hundred yards of the beach Chingachgook took in his, altogether laying his hand on his rifle in its stead. As they got still more within the belt of darkness that girded the woods, it was seen that they were steering too far north, and the course was altered accordingly. The canoe now seemed to move by instinct, so cautious and deliberate were all its motions. Still it continued to advance, until its bows grated on the gravel of the beach, at the precise spot where Hetty had landed, and whence her voice had issued the previous night as the ark was passing. There was, as usual, a narrow strand, but bushes fringed the woods, and in most places overhung the water. Chingachgook stepped upon the beach, and cautiously examined it for some distance on each side of the canoe. In order to do this he was often obliged to wade to his knees in the lake, but no hist rewarded his search. When he returned he found his friend also on the shore. They next conferred in whispers, the Indian apprehending that they must have mistaken the place of rendezvous. But Deerslayer thought it was probable they had mistaken the hour. While he was yet speaking he grasped the arm of the Delaware, caused him to turn his head in the direction of the lake, and pointed towards the summits of the eastern mountains. The clouds had broken a little, apparently behind rather than above the hills, and the evening star was glittering among the branches of a pine. This was every way a flattering omen, and the young men leaned on their rifles listening intently for the sound of approaching footsteps. Voices they often heard, and mingled with them were the suppressed cries of children and the low but sweet laugh of Indian women. As the Native Americans are habitually cautious and seldom break out in loud conversation, the adventurers knew by these facts that they must be very near the encampment. It was easy to perceive that there was a fire within the woods, by the manner in which some of the upper branches of the trees were illuminated, but it was not possible, where they stood, to ascertain exactly how near it was to themselves. Once or twice it seemed as if stragglers from around the fire were approaching the place of rendezvous, but these sounds were either altogether illusion, or those who had drawn near returned again without coming to the shore. A quarter of an hour was passed in this state of intense expectation and anxiety, when Deerslayer proposed that they should circle the point in the canoe, and by getting a position close in, where the camp could be seen, reconnoitre the Indians, and thus enable themselves to form some plausible conjectures for the non-appearance of Hist. The Delaware, however, resolutely refused to quit the spot, reasonably enough offering as a reason the disappointment of the girl, should she arrive in his absence. Deerslayer felt for his friend's concern, and offered to make the circuit of the point by himself, leaving the latter concealed in the bushes to await the occurrence of any fortunate event that might favor his views. With this understanding, then, the parties separated. As soon as Deerslayer was at his post again in the stern of the canoe, he left the shore with the same precautions, and in the same noiseless manner as he had approached it. On this occasion he did not go far from the land, the bushes affording a sufficient cover by keeping as close in as possible. Indeed, it would not have been easy to devise any means more favorable to reconnoitering round an Indian camp than those afforded by the actual state of things. The formation of the point permitted the place to be circled on three of its sides, and the progress of the boat was so noiseless as to remove any apprehensions from an alarm through sound the most practiced and guarded foot might stir a bunch of leaves or snap a dried stick in the dark, but a bark canoe could be made to float over the surface of smooth water, almost with the instinctive readiness, and certainly with the noiseless movements of an aquatic bird. Deerslayer had got nearly in a line between the camp and the ark before he caught a glimpse of the fire. This came upon him suddenly, and a little unexpectedly, at first causing an alarm, lest he had incautiously ventured within the circle of light it cast. But perceiving at a second glance that he was certainly safe from detection, so long as the Indians kept near the centre of the illumination, he brought the canoe to a state of rest in the most favourable position he could find, and commenced his observations. We have written much, but in vain, concerning this extraordinary being, if the reader requires now to be told, that, untutored as he was in the learning of the world, and simple as he ever showed himself to be in all matters touching the subtleties of conventional taste, 
He was a man of strong, native, poetical feeling. He loved the woods for their freshness, their sublime solitudes, their vastness, and the impress that they everywhere bore of the divine hand of their Creator. He seldom moved through them without pausing to dwell on some peculiar beauty that gave him pleasure, though seldom attempting to investigate the causes, and never did a day pass without his communing in spirit, and this, too, without the aid of forms or language, with the infinite source of all he saw, felt, and beheld. Thus constituted, in a moral sense, and of a steadiness that no danger could appall, or any crisis disturb, it is not surprising that the hunter felt a pleasure at looking on the scene he now beheld, that momentarily caused him to forget the object of his visit. This will more fully appear when we describe it. The canoe lay in front of a natural vista, not only through the bushes that lined the shore, but of the trees also that afforded a clear view of the camp. It was by means of this same opening that the light had been first seen from the ark. In consequence of their recent change of ground, the Indians had not yet retired to their huts, but had been delayed by their preparations, which included lodging as well as food. A large fire had been made, as much to answer the purpose of torches as for the use of their simple cookery, and at this precise moment it was blazing high and bright, having recently received a large supply of dried brush. The effect was to illuminate the arches of the forest, and to render the whole area occupied by the camp as light as if hundreds of tapers were burning. Most of the toil had ceased, and even the hungriest child had satisfied its appetite. In a word, the time was that moment of relaxation and general indolence which is apt to succeed a hearty meal, and when the labors of the day have ended. The hunters and the fishermen have been totally successful, and food, that one great requisite of savage life, being abundant, every other care appeared to have subsided in the sense of enjoyment dependent on this all-important fact. Deerslayer saw at a glance that many of the warriors were absent. His acquaintance Rivenoak, however, was present being seated in the foreground of a picture that Salvatore Rosa would have delighted to draw, his swarthy features illuminated as much by pleasure as by the torch-like flame, while he showed another of the tribe one of the elephants that had caused so much sensation among his people. A boy was looking over his shoulder, in dull curiosity, completing the group. More in the background, eight or ten warriors lay half recumbent on the ground, or sat with their backs reclining against trees so many types of indolent repose. Their arms were near them all, sometimes leaning against the same trees as themselves, or were lying across their bodies in careless preparation. But the group that most attracted the attention of Deerslayer was that composed of the women and children. All the females appeared to be collected together, and almost as a matter of course their young were near them. The former laughed and chatted in their rebuked and quiet manner though one who knew the habits of the people might have detected that everything was not going on in its usual train. Most of the young women seemed to be light-hearted enough, but one old hag was seated apart with a watchful, soured aspect, which the hunter at once knew betokened that some duty of an unpleasant character had been assigned her by the chiefs. What that duty was he had no means of knowing, but he felt satisfied it must be in some measure connected with her own sex the aged among the women generally being chosen for such offices and no other. As a matter of course, Deerslayer looked eagerly and anxiously for the form of Hist. She was nowhere visible, though the light penetrated to considerable distances in all directions around the fire. Once or twice he started, as he thought he recognized her laugh, but his ears were deceived by the soft melody that is so common to the Indian female voice. At length, the old woman spoke loud and angrily, and then he caught a glimpse of one or two dark figures in the background of trees, which turned as if obedient to the rebuke, and walked more within the circle of the light. A young warrior's form first came fairly into view, then followed by two youthful females, one of whom proved to be the Delaware girl. Deerslayer now comprehended it all. Hist was watched, possibly by her young companion, certainly by the old woman. The youth was probably some suitor of either her or her companion, but even his discretion was distrusted under the influence of his admiration. The known vicinity of those who might be supposed to be her friends, and the arrival of a strange red man on the lake, had induced more than the usual care, 
and the girl had not been able to slip away from those who watched her, in order to keep her appointment. Deerslayer traced her uneasiness by her attempting once or twice to look up through the branches of the trees, as if endeavouring to get glimpses of the star she had herself named as the sign for meeting. All was vain, however, and after strolling about the camp a little longer, in affected indifference, the two girls quitted their male escort, and took seats among their own sex. As soon as this was done, the old sentinel changed her place to one more agreeable to herself a certain proof that she had hitherto been exclusively on watch. Deerslayer now felt greatly at a loss how to proceed. He well knew that Chingachgook could never be persuaded to return to the Ark without making some desperate effort for the recovery of his mistress, and his own generous feelings well disposed him to aid in such an undertaking. He thought he saw the signs of an intention among the females to retire for the night, and should he remain, and the fire continue to give out its light, he might discover the particular hut or arbor under which Hist reposed, a circumstance that would be of infinite use in their future proceedings. Should he remain, however, much longer where he was, there was great danger that the impatience of his friend would drive him into some act of imprudence. At each instant, indeed, he expected to see the swarthy form of the Delaware appearing in the background, like the tiger prowling around the fold. Taking all things into consideration, therefore, he came to the conclusion that it would be better to rejoin his friend, and endeavour to temper his impetuosity by some of his own coolness and discretion. It required but a minute or two to put this plan in execution, the canoe returning to the strand some ten or fifteen minutes after it had left it. Contrary to his expectations, perhaps, Deerslayer found the Indian at his post, from which he had not stirred, fearful that his betrothed might arrive during his absence. A conference followed, in which Chingachgook was made acquainted with the state of things in the camp. When Hist named the point as the place of meeting, it was with the expectation of making her escape from the old position, and of repairing to a spot that she expected to find without any occupants. But the sudden change of localities had disconcerted all her plans. A much greater degree of vigilance than had been previously required was now necessary, and the circumstance that an aged woman was on watch also denoted some special grounds of alarm. All these considerations, and many more that will readily suggest themselves to the reader, were briefly discussed before the young men came to any decision. The occasion, however, being one that required acts instead of words, the course to be pursued was soon chosen. Disposing of the canoe in such a manner that Hist must see it, should she come to the place of meeting previously to their return, the young men looked to their arms and prepared to enter the wood. The whole projection into the lake contained about two acres of land, and the part that formed the point and on which the camp was placed did not compose a surface of more than half that size. It was principally covered with oaks, which, as is usual in the American forests, grew to a great height without throwing out a branch, and then arched in a dense and rich foliage. Beneath, except the fringe of thick bushes along the shore, there was very little underbrush though in consequence of their shape the trees were closer together than is common in regions where the axe has been freely used, resembling tall, straight, rustic columns, upholding the usual canopy of leaves. The surface of the land was tolerably even, but it had a small rise near its centre which divided it into a northern and southern half. On the latter the Hurons had built their fire, profiting by the formation to conceal it from their enemies, who— it will be remembered, were supposed to be in the castle, which bore northerly. A brook also came brawling down the sides of the adjacent hills, and found its way into the lake on the southern side of the point. It had cut for itself a deep passage through some of the higher portions of the ground, and in later days, when this spot has become subjected to the uses of civilization by its windings and shaded banks, it has become no mean accessory in contributing to the beauty of the place. This brook lay west of the encampment, and its waters found their way into the great reservoir of that region on the same side, and quite near to the spot chosen for the fire. All these peculiarities, so far as circumstances allowed, had been noted by Deerslayer, and explained to his friend. The reader will understand that the little rise in the ground that lay behind the Indian encampment greatly favoured the secret advance of the two adventurers. 
It prevented the light of the fire diffusing itself on the ground directly in the rear, although the land fell away towards the water, so as to leave what might be termed the left or eastern flank of the position unprotected by this covering. We have said unprotected, though that is not properly the word, since the knoll behind the huts and the fire offered a cover for those who were now stealthily approaching, rather than any protection to the Indians. Deerslayer did not break through the fringe of bushes immediately abreast of the canoe, which might have brought him too suddenly within the influence of the light, since the hillock did not extend to the water. But he followed the beach northerly until he got nearly on the opposite side of the tongue of land which brought him under the shelter of the low acclivity, and consequently more in the shadow. As soon as the friends emerged from the bushes they stopped to reconnoitre. The fire was still blazing behind the little ridge, casting its light upward into the tops of the trees, producing an effect that was more pleasing than advantageous. Still the glare had its uses, for while the background was in obscurity the foreground was in strong light exposing the savages and concealing their foes. Profiting by the latter circumstance, the young men advanced cautiously towards the ridge, Deerslayer in front, for he insisted on this arrangement, lest the Delaware should be led by his feelings into some indiscretion. It required but a moment to reach the foot of the little ascent, and then commenced the most critical part of the enterprise. Moving with exceeding caution, and trailing his rifle, both to keep its barrel out of view and in readiness for service, the hunter put foot before foot, until he got sufficiently high to overlook the summit, his own head being alone brought into the light. Chingachgook was at his side, and both paused to take another close examination of the camp. In order, however, to protect themselves against any straggler in the rear, they placed their bodies against the trunk of an oak, standing on the side next the fire. The view that Deerslayer now obtained of the camp was exactly the reverse of that he had perceived from the water. The dim figures which he had formerly discovered must have been on the summit of the ridge, a few feet in advance of the spot where he was now posted, and around it were seated on logs thirteen warriors, which accounted for all whom he had seen from the canoe. They were conversing with much earnestness among themselves, the image of the elephant passing from hand to hand. The first burst of savage wonder had abated, and the question now under discussion was the probable existence, the history, and the habits of so extraordinary an animal. We have not leisure to record the opinions of these rude men on a subject so consonant to their lives and experience. But little is hazarded in saying that they were quite as plausible and far more ingenious than half the conjectures that precede the demonstrations of science. However much they may have been at fault as to their conclusions and inferences, it is certain that they discussed the questions with a zealous and most undivided attention. For the time being all else was forgotten and our adventurers could not have approached at a more fortunate instant. The females were collected near each other, much as Deerslayer had last seen them, nearly in a line between the place where he now stood and the fire. The distance from the oak against which the young men leaned and the warriors was about thirty yards. The women may have been half that number of yards nigher. The latter, indeed, were so near as to make the utmost circumspection as to motion and noise indispensable. Although they conversed in their low, soft voices, it was possible, in the profound stillness of the woods, even to catch passages of the discourse, and the light-hearted laugh that escaped the girls might occasionally have reached the canoe. Deerslayer felt that the tremolo that passed through the frame of his friend when the latter first caught the sweet sounds that issued from the plump, pretty lips of Hist. He even laid a hand on the shoulder of the Indian as a sort of admonition to command himself. As the conversation grew more earnest, each leaned forward to listen. "'The Hurons have more curious beasts than that,' said one of the girls, contemptuously, for, like the men, they conversed of the elephant and his qualities. "'The Delawares will think this creature wonderful, but to-morrow no Huron tongue will talk of it. Our young men will find him if the animals dare to come near our wigwams.' This was, in fact, addressed to Watawa though she who spoke uttered the words with an assumed diffidence and humility that prevented her looking at the other. "'The Delawares are so far from letting such creatures come into their country,' returned Hist, "'that no one has even seen their images there. Their young men would frighten away the images as well as the beasts.' "'The Delaware young men! The nation is women! Even the deer walk when they hear their hunters coming! Who has ever heard the name of a young Delaware warrior?' 
This was said in good humor and with a laugh, but it was also said bitingly, that Hist so felt it was apparent by the spirit betrayed in her answer. "'Who has ever heard the name of a young Delaware?' she repeated earnestly. "'Tamenund himself, though now as old as the pines on the hill, or as the eagles in the air, was once young. His name was heard from the great salt lake to the sweet waters of the west. What is the family of Uncas? Where is there another as great, though the pale-faces have ploughed up its grates and trodden on its bones? Do the eagles fly as high, is the deer as swift, or the panther as brave?' Is there no young warrior of that race? Let the Huron maidens open their eyes wider, and they may see one called Chingachgook, who is as stately as a young ash, and as tough as the hickory." As the girl used her figurative language and told her companions to open their eyes and they would see the Delaware, Deerslayer thrust his fingers into the sides of his friend, and indulged in a fit of his hearty benevolent laughter. The other smiled. But the language of the speaker was too flattering, and the tones of her voice too sweet for him to be led away by any accidental coincidence, however ludicrous. The speech of Hist produced a retort, and the dispute, though conducted in good humor and without any of the coarse violence of tone and gesture that often impairs the charms of the sex in what is called civilized life, grew warm and slightly clamorous. In the midst of this scene the Delaware caused his friend to stoop so as completely to conceal himself, and then he made a noise so closely resembling the little chirrup of the smallest species of the American squirrel, that Deerslayer himself, though he had heard the imitation a hundred times, actually thought it came from one of the little animals skipping about over his head. The sound is so familiar in the woods that none of the Hurons paid it the least attention. Hist, however, instantly ceased talking, and sat motionless. Still she had sufficient self-command to abstain from turning her head. She had heard the signal by which her lover so often called her from the wigwam to the stolen interview, and it came over her senses and her heart, as the serenade affects the maiden in the land of song. From that moment Chingachgook felt certain that his presence was known. This was affecting much, and he could now hope for a bolder line of conduct on the part of his mistress than she might dare to adopt under an uncertainty of his situation. It left no doubt of her endeavouring to aid him in his effort to release her. Deerslayer arose as soon as the signal was given, and though he had never held that sweet communion which is known only to lovers, he was not slow to detect the great change that had come over the manner of the girl. She still affected to dispute, though it was no longer with spirit and ingenuity, but what she said was uttered more as a lure to draw her antagonists on to an easy conquest, than with any hopes of succeeding herself. Once or twice, it is true, her native readiness suggested a retort, or an argument that raised a laugh and gave her a momentary advantage. But these little sallies, the offspring of mother-wit, served the better to conceal her real feelings, and to give to the triumph of the other party a more natural air than it might have possessed without them. At length, the disputants became wearied, and they rose in a body as if about to separate. It was now that Hist, for the first time, ventured to turn her face in the direction whence the signal had come. In doing this, her movements were natural but guarded, and she stretched her arm and yawned, as if overcome with a desire to sleep. The chirrup was again heard, and the girl felt satisfied as to the position of her lover, though the strong light in which she herself was placed and the comparative darkness in which the adventurers stood prevented her from seeing their heads, the only portions of their forms that appeared above the ridge at all. The tree against which they were posted had a dark shadow cast upon it by the intervention of an enormous pine that grew between it and the fire, a circumstance which alone would have rendered objects within its cloud invisible at any distance. This deerslayer well knew, and it was one of the reasons why he had selected this particular tree. The moment was near when it became necessary for Hist to act. She was to sleep in a small hut, or bower, that had been built near where she stood, and her companion was the aged hag already mentioned. Once within the hut, with this sleepless old woman stretched across the entrance, as was her nightly practice, the hope of escape was nearly destroyed, and she might at any moment be summoned to her bed. Luckily at this instant one of the warriors called to the old woman by name and bade her bring him water to drink. There was a delicious spring on the northern side of the point, and the hag took a gourd from a branch, 
and summoning Hist to her side, she moved towards the summit of the ridge, intending to descend and cross the point to the natural fountain. All this was seen and understood by the adventurers, and they fell back into the obscurity, concealing their persons by trees, until the two females had passed them. In walking, Hist was held tightly by the hand. As she moved by the tree that hid Chingachgook and his friend, the former felt for his tomahawk, with the intention to bury it in the brain of the woman. But the other saw the hazard of such a measure, since a single scream might bring all the warriors upon them, and he was averse to the act on considerations of humanity. His hand, therefore, prevented the blow. Still, as the two moved past, the chirrup was repeated, and the Huron woman stopped and faced the tree whence the sounds seemed to proceed, standing at the moment within six feet of her enemies. She expressed her surprise that a squirrel should be in motion at so late an hour, and said it boded evil. Hist answered that she had heard the same squirrel three times within the last twenty minutes, and that she supposed it was waiting to obtain some of the crumbs left from the late supper. This explanation appeared satisfactory, and they moved towards the spring, the men following stealthily and closely. The gourd was filled, and the old woman was hurrying back, her hand still grasping the wrist of the girl, when she was suddenly seized so violently by the throat as to cause her to release her captive and to prevent her making any other sound than a sort of gurgling, suffocating noise. The serpent passed his arm around the waist of his mistress, and dashed through the bushes with her on the north side of the point. Here he immediately turned along the beach, and ran towards the canoe. A more direct course could have been taken, but it might have led to a discovery of the place of embarking. Deerslayer kept playing on the throat of the old woman like the keys of an organ, occasionally allowing her to breathe and then compressing his fingers again nearly to strangling. The brief intervals for breath, however, were well improved, and the hag succeeded in letting out a screech or two that served to alarm the camp. The tramp of the warriors, as they sprang from the fire, was plainly audible, and at the next moment three or four of them appeared on the top of the ridge, drawn against the background of light resembling the dim shadows of the phantasmagoria. It was now quite time for the hunter to retreat. Tripping up the heels of his captive, and giving her throat a parting squeeze, quite as much in resentment at her indomitable efforts to sound the alarm as from any policy, he left her on her back, and moved towards the bushes, his rifle at a poise, and his head over his shoulders, like a lion at bay. End of chapter 16 Recording by Bill Borst